Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in approximately five minutes. Please begin taking your seats at this time. As a courtesy to the presenters and the folks that are seated around you, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, our program is about to begin. Please take your seats at this time. As a courtesy to our presenters, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Thank you. Ready? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. It is great in here. Ooh. I can definitely read my notes, thank God. Your mic's on. Thank you. You got your notes? I do have some notes. Yeah. Ooh. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Good morning. I look at the boss. Good morning. Welcome to the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Dave Schmidtlein, and I'm dean of the MIT Sloan School of Management. I want to say just a few words of thanks um, along with the welcome, um, and then I'll turn it over to Jessica and Daryl. I want to say thanks first and foremost to the conference sponsors. They are among the leading organizations moving analytics and sports forward. We're proud to be associated with them, 
And if they don't associate with this conference, I have to tell you the conference doesn't happen, so we're very grateful. I also want to acknowledge the speakers and panelists who have given their time and their experiences and insights to come and share them with you. I hope, I know, based on history, that you'll find them incredibly stimulating and informative. Um, and again, we're grateful for their association with us with this conference. I also hope you know that this is, to a great degree, a student-led and a student-run conference. Um, it is extraordinary in that regard. There is a leadership team of 52 MIT Sloan students um, who had um, and have a leadership role and a role in the um, uh, implementation of this conference, and there are another over 70 MIT um, students uh, who are involved in delivering this uh, conference this weekend. I'm proud of them. Um, two of the leaders are on stage with me, uh, Tim Miller and Jen Whaley. Um, I'm proud of you guys. Yes, please. Uh, there's a motto for MIT. I won't do the long version of this. Um, but the motto of MIT is mind and hand. I hope you think of MIT as a place that might be known for analytics. But it's not only, well, it is chess playing analytics, but it's not only chess playing analytics, it's analytics put to practical use. And this conference brings together the leading thinkers and the most innovative practitioners to design, to look forward into uh, the future of analytics and sports. Um, it's a point of pride for MIT to play this role with this conference. Um, and I hope that that uh, motto of mind and hand, or if you're a fan of Latin, mens et manus, applies equally to you. This is gonna be a fun conference. It's gonna be an informative, interesting conference, but I hope it's a point of action for you also. Do something with what you see here. Get involved in some way. Take what you see and use it to make a change in your own experiences. Now I just want to say a couple words of welcome and thanks to uh, Jessica Gelman and Daryl Morey, who as you know are the co-founders and co-chairs of this conference. The conference is very much continuing to be a product of the vision and the passion that they've shown for analytics and sports. Jessica Gelman is the CEO of the Kraft Analytics Group in work with the Kraft family and enterprises through the years. She's had leadership roles in business operations and marketing and strategy. Uh, she's been named to top 40, under 40, and uh, uh, leaders to watch kinds of lists. She is seen as a leader in the future of analytics and sports. And Jessica, I want to say thank you for all of that. Um, Jessica is also uh, uh, a holder of a Master of Business Administration degree from Harvard Business School. It's hard for me to say that, <laughs> I had to work on that one. But Somehow she snuck in. But we're proud, uh, yes, of her. Uh, Daryl Morey, as many of you know, is in his third year as the president of basketball operations for the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, Daryl spent 14 years with the Houston Rockets previously, 13 of those as general manager. In the 2017-2018 year, he was named NBA Executive of the Year for um, uh, a year in which that uh, Houston Rockets franchise uh, had its best season record ever. Uh, Daryl is a holder of an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management, an undergraduate degree from Northwestern. We're incredibly proud uh, to call Daryl one of our own as well. And so with that, let me turn it over to Jessica and Daryl. Thank you, Dean. Thanks for the continued support from the school and all the, all the student leads. Uh, it doesn't happen without them. So I, I'm here every year because I love sports and I love data. I think that's why uh, many, most all of the folks in the audience are here as well. And I think we love sports for many different reasons, but one of them is because, you know, you never know what happens when you tune in. It, this, this capacity to surprise and delight. But I think what people don't realize is that data at different times can surprise and delight. And, and I'm, I'm remembering, like, there's been two times recently uh, where data really surprised and delighted me in the past few years. The first one, I have to tell a little story that starts back at 1996 at a seminar that I took at MIT, exactly called, I had to write this down, <laughs> Learning Methods for Prediction and Novelty Detection in 1996 at MIT, when I didn't even go here, it was prior, it was just a seminar, 
It was taught by uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who at the time was a bit of a pariah. Uh, he was the lead, one of the leading researchers in neural nets, and it was also taught by Michael Jordan, uh, not that one, <laughs> but the Michael Jordan of prediction, uh, who was openly mocking Jeffrey Hinton for his focus on neural nets and how they would never amount to anything. Fast forward <laughs> a few years. I'm actually going to fast forward to uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, and we covered this at MIT where an MIT grad, again, Larry Kaufman, had spent his entire life building a chess machine starting in the 60s yeah, to beat humans at chess, which happened in the 90s, uh, and had worked and coded tens of thousands of hours of this chess machine called Komodo that was one of the top machines at various points. Overnight, <laughs> a neural net <laughs> that only knew the rules and played itself billions of times completely destroyed <laughs> this guy's life's work <laughs> of a computer and won in ways that surprised and delighted. And when this came out, I, I could do nothing else but analyze how this happened. And Larry came to the conference a few years ago, our first chess panel and was very much a good sport as his life's work was destroyed by, uh, by this neural net. Now fast forward to, I know it's going to be a topic on a lot of the panels, which is the large language models that just recently came out uh, with GPT or DALI or Midjourney, all these, all these approaches, it's finally come together where the data uh, and the approach and the computing power has created this ability to surprise and delight. I'm sure everyone's used these and went like, oh my goodness, what, what is happening? Um, and so that's going to be a big, a big topic. And the reason I point that out that it happened in chess, we're going to have our biggest chess panel ever. We have two of the top players in the world, Hikaru Nakamura and Fabiano Caruana. Um, and the sports, uh, even one as old as chess can be turned on its head, basically. Right now, as, as people look at these sports that we're going to cover, we always cover baseball, we cover, always cover basketball, we always cover the NFL. People are like, oh, you know, baseball is just more walks, basketball is just more threes, football is just more go on fourth down more. Uh, but these new approaches with more and more data, we're going to have a f closing panel that's going to talk about what kind of data, if we have it, and the computing power. Because once the data and computing co power comes, what can that do to different sports? I think it's going to turn these sports, so even the ones that have been played forever, on their head as well, um, both in both in good and maybe like ways that are a little bit. And it's you know, it's not just going to be the new sports like pickleball, which we have this year, yeah. that are going to be turned on their head. It's going to be the ones that that are currently played. Um, so anyway, so I, I think that's going to be a major theme. Like what 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 data when data and computer power come together. At times, you can be mocked, uh, like Jeffrey Hinton was, who's now the number, you know, arguably the number one neural net researcher in the world. Uh, I was at a class where he was mocked, and now he's on top. So you never know. Data can surprise and delight as well. And I think you'll find, as you go to panels this week, that you'll be surprised by the advances. And to Dean's point, you can take that back and apply it to what you're doing. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. That was fantastic. I love uh, talking with Daryl and hearing your view of the world, especially on the team side. And obviously, I think about it more on the, on the fan side. Um, but Daryl and I were talking last week on the phone, and we were talking about um, Chad GPT. And he said, you know, all those things that you see in movies, like, it's almost here. Um, so that's, that's scary, um, but also exciting because it's also our responsibility as people who love data and are trying to leverage technology to improve um, sports or society at large, uh, that we, we are teaching uh, the, this AI the right methods. But this is the 17th conference. Um, as many of you know, we're, we're nicknamed Dorkapalooza. I'm very proud to be one of the stewards of our dork evolution in sports. <laughs> um, but, you know, this past year, I mean, you said why, why we're in sports, and I agree. Like, I love sports, and I'm inspired by sports. And this past year was amazing, especially for, as a fan. Um, you know, the fan demand has never been higher, 
and or we've never had more data to understand what's happening with fan demand. Um, the ability to watch like clips on your phone, the ability to stream uh, the NFL on Amazon Prime, uh, now the ability to stream MLS on Apple. This is opening barriers and markets and we're seeing things like the decline of the RSNs as a result because everything, the local barriers are being brought uh, down, which I think is really inspiring and fun. At the same time, we're seeing the value of sports teams increase rapidly uh, in, in ways that are, are, are amazing. And that's because sports captures our imagination and inspires us. And when I think about inspiration, one of the teams that has really inspired me is the US women's national team, who has used their platform to promote equity and inclusion. And what they achieved this year with pay equity was really inspiring. And, and here with what we're doing, we're very focused on yeah. promoting inclusion and equity. And, and I'll share a little bit of that. Um, at the same time, this year was amazing, but I do want to just take one moment to recognize um, a person who is part of our community who passed away and has come to many conferences, Grant Wall, um, you know, sadly uh, passed early, earlier this year at the World Cup. And I um, just want to acknowledge that he um, was such a, such a champion of, of sports, obviously soccer and analytics, and, and so just wanted to recognize him here. The theme of this year's conference is data for good. And um, as we thought, and really the students conceived of, of, the, of the theme, you know, why? The first is the AI-related component. Um, appropriate use of da data. We have seen misuse. We are aware of misuse. I will not throw any uh, organizations under the bus right here. But in this room, we all need to have high integrity in the use of data. The second is the data insights that uh, for data for good that improve the fan experience, that include, sorry, improve the player experience. We are applying data to make what we love to watch and try to understand better. That's, that's you know, data for good. And, and lastly, it's about creating opportunities through analytics for more inclusion and diverse representation um, in sports. Uh, you know, I think just for uh, something that's, that, I'll, that you'll see here on stage, representation is really important. This year, 51% of our speakers are either women or underrepresented uh, minorities. The 38% of them are women, which is a 13% increase from last year and far up over indexes the sports industry at large, and 19% are underrepresented minorities, a 72% increase. And we're really, really proud of our focus that we've had over the years and um, enabling and also the people in the audience to see uh, leaders that look like you. And to that end, we also increased our mentorship program this year to 70, over 70 students. And I wanna thank Major League Baseball for being our presenting sponsor of that and the Eugene Foundation for supporting it as well. Um, and there's many other efforts that we're undertaking from the women's luncheon tomorrow that Jess Berman, the commissioner of the NWSL, will be keynoting. Um, this, is, this is near and dear to our heart. We appreciate the feedback that we've received and we will continue to use analytics for good and data for good. For the conference this year, um, just so thrilled, we have over 2,500 people here. Uh, we have over a 1,000 person wait list. Hopefully all of those people are live streaming this conference at home. Uh, we know there, there will be thousands live streaming it. 30 panels, over 28 presentations, competitions. Uh, this is gonna be jam packed and it's gonna be hard to pick what <laughs> to go to, but just enjoy it and learn. This is about learning. Uh, I think the panel that I'm most looking forward to, uh, aside from the ones that I'm obviously involved in, is Performance Under Pressure with Sue Bird and Michael Lewis and Brad Stevens and Steve Magnus? Magnus. Yes, Daryl added him. Um, <laughs> but this <laughs> is a sports psychic. Yeah, this is, but this is a topic that Daryl and I love to talk about, um, and it was something that I studied in college, so I'm really interested in it. And so I um, hope you guys will check that out. And there's you know, a great uh, sports and society panel as well. Um, you know, featuring and focusing on culture. 
But I think the last thing here for me is just some thanks. Um, I want to, of course, start by thanking my wife, who is a rock for me. She supports the conference in so many ways. Um, I want to thank the Kager team, who I get to work with every day. We're on the front lines trying to help organizations use analytics uh, to improve the fan experience. I want to thank you, Daryl, for um, everything that you represent in your high integrity and being willing to always speak your mind. And then, of course, I want to thank the students, um, both this year, and I did a little math. It's probably uh, close to right, but I think there's been 142 ish, no, 142 students who have been um, as part of our leadership team over the 17 years of the conference, and they're doing amazing things in the industry, and we are so proud of what the students, who, the prior students have done, but also what, you know, what we've seen from Jen and Tim this year. You guys have done uh, an amazing job as leaders, and, um, and as in communicating, we, we obviously talk all the time, and um, this is going to be a great day, so, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Whaley, and I'm a second year MBA student at MIT Sloan School of Management and one of the co leads for the conference this year, along with Tim. I want to start by thanking you all so much for being here today, braving the Boston weather. We were a little worried there for a minute, but glad it all worked out, and you can all make it here today. I also want to thank the Dean for coming and for your constant support of this conference and for building such an amazing community at Sloan. And then I want to thank Jessica and Daryl. I think you heard from the opening remarks that they're two of the most innovative and forward-thinking leaders in sports. And having the opportunity to work with them daily, as Jessica mentioned, uh, always making the time for us, making sure we're continuing to learn and build our skill set as well as run a successful conference has been incredible. And just both of your leadership has helped me grow so much. And I'm really thankful for both of you. I also want to thank our advisors of the conference, uh, Bill James, Ben Shields, Marie Donahue, Jason Robbins, Nate Silver, Corbin Petro, Sue Bird, and Demora Smith. Without your continued support of the conference, <clears throat> excuse me, and can, being on panels, helping us think what's the most innovative thing we can do next, what's our content gonna look like this year, we wouldn't have the successful content as we have. So really thankful for all the advisors that are here. I also wanna thank Corbin Petro, Tiffany Morris, and Lance Morey. I think they have blocked my email at this point. I have sent all three of them a lot of emails. They help us with all the finances, legal, and AV and operations of the conference. And without them, this conference truly would not be happening. So I really want to thank the three of them for all their help uh, catching Tim and I up on how to run a massive conference like this. Uh, and then I also want to thank the Heinz team. Kate and her team, as well as Lance's AV team, has been so helpful making sure everything looks great. Uh, and we're set up for today. So thank you all so much. And now I want to thank our leadership team. <clears throat> we have a nine-person leadership team this year. I'm going to go through them by name because they're all very important and have done amazing things. So I want to start with Jason Tino, who's the head of our operations. He is an engineering student and an MBA student, second year. Uh, we thought we were busy, and he's writing a thesis on top of everything else. So thank you so much, Jason, for everything. Uh, Fiona Guthrow is the head of our careers. So as you heard, running our mentorship program our, and everything we're doing in terms of advancing women in this field. And uh, she's also an engineering and MBA student and also writing a thesis. Uh, Mike Duke and Gaurav Verma are our two content leads this year. As you heard, we're at 51% representation, largely because they are advocates and continue to push that forward and ensure we had diversity on the panels. Our <clears throat> artist year, so Rob G is our ticketing lead this year. He's done an incredible job, as you heard, an amazing wait list, really making sure we're selling tickets. Uh, Tyler DeGorder is our research papers lead. Uh, we knew he was the right person for the job. He knows everything about analytics. He's the person we go to, and he's done incredible. And lastly, one of my very close friends, Lisa Lyons, I really want to shout her out, has been an amazing sponsorship and events lead. Everything you've heard about is because of the sponsors. That's why we're able to do what we do, and I just want to thank her so much. And then I want to thank our organizing committee. As we mentioned, we have 52 people on the committee, ranging across MBA and MIT programs, including our first ever undergrad who's helping us, and he's a freshman. Uh, so you know he's much smarter than all of us since he got into <laughs> MIT undergrad. Uh, and he's been able to help us this year, which has been great. We also have 70 volunteers from the Sloan community, as well as the larger Boston community, which has been amazing to have their support day of to make sure the event runs. And definitely last but not least, I want to thank Tim. He's been such an incredible co-lead. I truly, there's nobody else I could have done this with. I used to think I was organized. I've never met anyone as organized as Tim, truly. Uh, he's incredibly mission-driven. 
At every meeting, he makes sure we revisit the mission of the conference, what are our goals, how are we tracking, and how do we make sure we're all on the same page to get there. And that's something I'll always take with me as a leader moving forward. And I do want to tell a quick story about Tim. Uh, and the first time we met, uh, I was actually on my way to the first ever 2022 kickoff meeting for the conference. One of the first days of school, my you know, first year, don't know anybody. And Tim stop, stops me in the hallway and says, you're Jen Whaley, right? I was like, oh. Uh, yes, I am. And he said, yeah, you, you have a golf backpack on. I know there's a golfer in our class. We started chatting. We went to the meeting together, and we ended up both talking about how we were going to apply for content together. We got on content last year, worked a ton together, and now we're sitting here today, which is just such a full circle moment. I'm so happy to have done it with you, and thank you for everything that you've done. Uh, and just lastly, I just want to say that this, has, this conference has really given me the opportunity to become a more innovative leader push what I'm passionate about. I'm incredibly passionate about sports. I'm hoping to move into that industry after my MBA and specifically continuing the fight for gender equality. Uh, and this, you know, working on the mentorship program and the women's luncheon and these incredible opportunities we have because we're here uh, has been incredible. And I'm just going to do one last shameless plug. Uh, my mom is moderating the golf panel tomorrow. So please come out for the golf panel. And I'm so thankful that she's here. Both my parents are here to support me, and which means so much to me. Well, thank you, Jen, and, and thanks for, for all the kind words. And, and I want to echo all the thanks that, uh, that Jen, Jen said, Dean Schmidtline, Jessica, and Daryl, um, all of our, our LTOC volunteers, uh, supporters, and especially Jen. I mean, I think Je Jen's a, a leader uh, in, in every sense of the word. Um, her constant positivity has been uh, really you know, something that's driven our team forward. So really, Jen, th it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I'll, uh, I'll say there's there's so many different lessons. It's the, the uh, you know mind and uh, mind and hand you know mens et manus uh, motto we have here at Sloan. There, there's probably too many to to, to really list, but I, I would say that the the one lesson that I'll take away is uh, the power of, of teams and the power of teams coming together uh, around a mission, around a vision to to create something you know so so awesome. So um, again, thank you to to the, the great team we had, and and we really came together to to build a, a great conference. Um, I also wanted to, uh, to just echo uh, the thanks uh, of, of support from our conference sponsors. Um, they're really true leaders in the, in the sports industry, and, and I really recommend you checking out their booths uh, along the, the hallways, uh, as well as looking within our app to see uh, just a little bit more about you know, their businesses and what they're offering. Um, so, so thank you again to, to all our sponsors. Um, and just to close it out, I want to review a, a few uh, logistics and ground rules. So, um, just the, the number one is, is please download our app. Um, Jen absolutely crushed uh, the setup of the app. Uh, I remember in April, it was one of her big things, and basically now here in, here in March to see it all, all come together. So um, that will be the, the source of truth for, for everything going on at the conference. Um, so all the, the updates to, to the schedule and whatnot. Um, also, you can learn more about sponsors, connect with, with other attendees. Um, and then uh, if there's any issues with the, the app, just we have our email, app support at, at sloansportsconference.com. Um, additionally, uh, very important, uh, please keep your badge visible at all times. It is your ticket in and around the conference, um, and uh, you know, make sure you have it around today and, and, and bring it uh, tomorrow. You will not be, be let into the conference if you, if you don't have your badge. Um, if there's any questions that come up, um, Art did a great job making sure we were color coordinated on the badges this year. So anyone with a green badge is a leadership team member, a, a, an organizing team member, or, or a volunteer. So please come, come ask him any questions. Um, some, some last fun things here, just please keep your cell phone silenced uh, at all times. Um, we'll be recording uh, all of the panels um, and uh, they'll be available uh, on YouTube uh, as well as Jessica mentioned, live streamed. Um, and just please, uh, reminder, no, no filming uh, during, during any of the, the panels. So with that, um, we want to really, uh, again, thank you for your attendance. Uh, welcome to the 2023 MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. We hope it's an awesome opportunity for you to learn from um, the, industry, uh, the, the sports industry leaders, uh, an opportunity to, to build your, your networks. Um, but, but most importantly, have fun, enjoy. There's, there's so much going on here, and um, you know, really, really hope you enjoy. So with that, thank you very much. Well done. Yeah.
Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Leo Fondriest and I'm a first year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce our very first panel of the day today. Uh, this is the Bet On It, a conversation in innovation in the sports betting industry panel. And our panelists today are Jonathan Kraft, president of the Kraft Group, Amy Howe, CEO of FanDuel, Tom Rieg, CEO of Caesars. Our panel will be moderated by Contessa Brewer of CNBC. The panel will run for about 45 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Please submit your questions via Twitter using the hashtag betting innovation. We will send the questions to Contessa. She will select from the questions submitted. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Contessa. So you have to make them really attention getting so that you could, I get picked. Uh, it's great to be here today. So great to have an illustrious panel with me. It really struck me that in the years that this conference has been going on, this year, that there are a lot of representatives from the gambling industry in a sports analytics conference. It's indicative of a new era that we're in where sports and, and sports betting are becoming intertwined. Massachusetts is getting ready to launch mobile betting uh, it, next week, it looks like. So Jonathan, I'd like to start with you about how teams think about legalization, how you encourage sports betting in your state. How do you take advantage of the new normal? Well, I. It's a lot, there's a lot to unpack in that question, but what I would say is it, when we first got into the sports business in the 90s, you know, gambling was completely taboo. And even Contessa, when you and I talked for a few minutes yesterday, you know, you asked about the transition over. And some people like to call it hypocrisy now that the leagues are embracing sports betting. I think that for teams, historically, you knew sports betting existed, but it was illegal. You know, when things are illegal, especially if you're an established, you know, you can't embrace something. We, we, at least at the craft sports group, always believed that when an activity was so widespread and illegal, it would be much smarter to have it become legalized, become regulated, and, and be responsibly put into the delivery of our product in whatever way, shape, or form that took. And that's why in the early part of the last decade, when daily fantasy started to become a business, we sort of embraced it because we saw it as the beginning of what would hopefully lead to the um, challenge of pass votes overturning in sports betting. And all it does for us, it, it, we, we love it because now something that wasn't legal is legal, but it drives engagement in our business. And from a data standpoint, if used properly, I think there's a lot of really great information there that allows us to enhance our product. And so March, uh, next week, March 10th, can't come fast enough from our perspective. And the only thing that bothers me as a citizen of the state is that it took our legislature way too long to uh, legalize it. Tackle it. Oh, I like legislators. Better late than never. Better late than never, <laughs> but it, you know, they don't understand that there's a revenue source sitting there and it might be good instead of letting people who are doing it illicitly get that revenue to have the people benefit. You know, I covered the openings of the two casinos in Massachusetts when they launched, the Encore Boston Harbor and MGM Springfield. And it, it has taken, there's been quite a lag time um, between the bricks and mortar and sports betting, and the two of you weren't really a part of that, but now you get to come in and participate. Tom, I know for bricks and mortar for you and mobile, right, and Amy. So what does it mean when a state comes online? And talk to me a little bit about what you get out of the relationships with Jonathan, with the Patriots, with, with the Celtics, with other teams when you're launching sports betting. Amy? Well, it's funny, <clears throat> Jonathan, just listening to you, the the, when the NFL embraced sports betting, I think it was a real tipping point and an inflection point for the industry, right? Um, we, we have an opportunity to, to partner up with the NFL, and then we have 
relationships with many of the teams. And, um, you know, listen, the, it, when you open up a new state and you have those partnerships, right, whether it's, and Massachusetts is a great example, you have four of the biggest professional sports teams here. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's what drives your business. One of the things that has been a hallmark of our success is making sure we're in market day one. And this will be our 19th state that we're going to be online. And so to come into a, a, a market like Massachusetts, it's the, you know, 15th largest state in terms of the population that's over the age of 21. But to be able to do that, we now have a playbook that we know works. And then to have the assets and the integration with sports teams um, and to be able to access, for, unfortunately, it wasn't open in time for Super Bowl. That would have been nice, but. <laughs> Politicians. But, uh, um, but, but to be able to take the playbook that we know has worked so successfully in other states, you know, we just launched Ohio in the beginning of the year, and within two months, 7% 7, 7 of that adult penetration has been reached. So it's, it's a, a huge privilege to be able to partner with the, the leagues and the teams. Yeah, and for, for us, you know, we're looking at a similar opportunity in terms of size of the state. We also have obviously a physical network of 50 plus properties and a foothold in destination markets where we have customers coming from each state and you want to go you want to provide what your customers are looking for you know to Jonathan's point it wasn't a secret that uh, that fans wanted to bet on sports but it wasn't legal so there wasn't a you, you couldn't move there that's changed you know for us we have we've had customers that come from Massachusetts, but we really only touch them when they come and visit us in Vegas or Atlantic City or one of our destination markets. Now we get to bring that that relationship local and really get build a stickier relationship with our customers. When you are looking at the importance of that reward system that players in Caesar's ecosystem have an opportunity to build points and use those points in Las Vegas or Atlantic City or, or wherever. How much does that give you um, a, a competitive advantage, do you think, Tom, against the online only or, or majority online competitors? Well, not enough to keep up with Amy ah. so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, obviously, that's what we tap into. We've got 65 million people in our database, this is something that we acquired when we bought Caesars, and we've got two decades worth of data in terms of how they behave in our properties in physical casinos. And in terms of acquisition cost, that's gonna be our cheapest channel to acquire customers, and we've gotta give the customer a reason to stick with us. And you know what's nice is uh, what we can see is as we provide the experience, you know, Illinois being an example where we were on a legacy technology that was awful and we didn't advertise, we rolled out our Liberty platform, which is our competitive platform, and you can see us start to move up without any real advertising spend behind us. So it indicates that, you know, People are inclined to do business with us based on the relationships we've built in the brick and mortar business. It's our job to keep them in the fold in digital. If it makes you feel any better, one of the biggest questions I get from investors is, are you gonna go out and acquire casinos? <laughs> <laughs> you have a structural disadvantage. You don't have the database. Are you? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't, I don't wanna ever own casinos. That's not the business we're in. <laughs> Good to know, I'm gonna keep, can you just save that way? <laughs> When you're looking at who to partner with for the Patriots, uh, I know that fan engagement is important to you. Does it matter how successful the, the partner is? You, I, well, anybody we partner with in any business, <clears throat> excuse me, if we're putting them out to our fan base and the people who uh, are our most important um, customers, it's important that they have a quality product. I mean, so if they, we're not, if someone came to us with a product and a lot of money, but the product isn't any good, we wouldn't do it. DraftKings started here, I apologize, Amy, and, and uh, DraftKings was a local Boston company, 
And so from early on, there was a tight partnership. But I think in the early days of DraftKings, because the company was so young, 30 some odd employees, they were in the daily fantasy business. We would talk to them a lot and we would talk to them and give them feedback on the interface on the product. Because for us, if we weren't with somebody that had a great product, we probably would rather go with one of the other competitors. And I think if you flash forward, you know, the nine years that it's been, the reason FanDuel and DraftKings are the leaders in market share is because they understood the mobile online sports player. It started in fantasy, now it's moved to sports betting, but they know how to develop the interface. They know what people are looking for. They, it's, it's the way I don't think Amy or Jason Robbins could design a brick and mortar casino the way Tom could have one. It's just two completely separate products. So for us, that was a natural um, decision. When sports betting came to the market, when, when the NFL was allowed to start doing sponsorships with casinos, we then, we have relationships with MGM and Wynn, like we, we have those, but our sports betting partnership is with DraftKings. Uh, so you were an early investor in DraftKings, but Amy's boss just told me on CNBC yesterday They've now grown their market share in the U.S. to 50 percent. We're going to dig did, it out of here. Did, did you back the wrong horse? No, I think I... <laughs> it's a good question. Keep going, Contessa. I actually think we had the right horse. <laughs> FanDuel was teetering and Flutter, they weren't going to exist. I think the people, and Amy was not running it then, so I should say that. Uh, but FanDuel was teetering and it looked, was it four or five, four years ago now, five years ago. Yeah. It looked like DraftKings was gonna really become the dominant player, but a British sports betting company, somebody with a great tech stack knowledge and data on how people like to bet, uh, realized that America was a fertile market and now was the time to strike and they bought a great asset. And Michael Rubin, who is in the front here, who's been for years, he's like, those guys just made the best, smartest investment. I mean, I remember him calling me, telling me that, and, and he predicted what had happened. And actually, if you were to ask me today, I think for mobile, it's a three horse race in the US. It's, it's FanDuel, it's DraftKings. And I really believe because Fanatics is a digital mobile first company with a huge database and knowledge of sports fans and what they want, they started taking their first bets yesterday in Tennessee. If we were to wake up three, four years from now, I believe those are the three people who dominate the mobile, mobile space in our country. And people like Tom and some of his competitors will dominate the brick and mortar space and it'll really be a bifurcated market. That would be my prediction. And you said that like the, the mobile operators don't build casinos. <clears throat> Has it been harder than you anticipated to get into a mobile business? Uh, no, I mean, it, we, we bought William Hill last April uh, and we couldn't close, we, it was a UK based acquisition. So basically you start from a standing start the day you close. So we didn't close that acquisition until April. We were launching our business August the 4th. So we've kind of been running to catch up and build what FanDuel and what DraftKings have built over a longer period of time. But this is a giant opportunity uh, in terms of what's available in sports betting and ultimately in iGaming. Um, you know, and we're looking at it from a, how much of a return on investment can I get? Um, and we're going to keep building the business. We certainly believe that we're gonna be among the players that matter at the end of the day. Um, but it's been, it's not without its starts and stops and uh, twists along the way, but we're pleased with the way it's developed today. Also, I should mention, Amy, Tom, you both have reported fourth quarter near profitability. Amy, for you, only accepting the launches in new states, and Tom, with the well-known mattress Mac uh, bets. <laughs> <laughs> Who sat out of the Super Bowl, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. So, so how does the technology factor into making this a profitable 
business and investors who want to see increasing margins, you know, return to shareholders some capital. I mean, for us, uh, I mean, listen, Jonathan's right. When, when Flutter acquired FanDuel, the reason they did it is, I mean, they had some of the biggest gl global gaming brands in the world, but they, <clears throat> they also knew that those brands weren't going to resonate here, right? Patty Power, Betfair, they're primarily UK brands. But when, when they invested in us, we were able to, the, the technology has been a huge driver of our path to profitability for two reasons. One is we have scalable tech that's reliable, right, on Super Bowl when you're taking 50,000 bets per minute, you need to make sure that platform works, right? Um, and we've been on the Flutter platform now for, you know, for quite some time. So, so that's been a huge driver um, of, you know, of the success, but also it's partly technology, it's also partly the risk and trading capability, all that's done in house. And so that has given us a, a pricing and a structural margin advantage, which has also helped our margins quite. In fact, that seems to be the trajectory for the biggest players to bring all of the technology in house. You probably have people in the audience who have ideas or have businesses and they'd like to do business with you. Is there still room, Tom, for startups to come and get a, an opportunity to sell you their services or is it all going to be in-house from here on out? No, there's no question you're always looking to enhance your tech and, you know, in our organization, we're parsing through these two, the two decades of data we have and building, um, you know, building relationships both on the digital and brick and mortar side, but we're constantly looking to advance. The app in play is, it, it continues to be a bigger piece of the business as it's been in mature markets. And if you can, if you've got something that can improve our experience there, improve, improve our ability to, you know, avoid the, the circle of death while you're trying to get a, a lineup for in play, <laughs> that's of interest to us. And if you can help us improve that, improve latency, all of that makes the, the customer experience better. And you're trying to move to in play to parlays, you know, one of the big uh, things that FanDuel has done a fantastic job of is their hold percentage is well in, ahead of the rest of the space, and that's design a product. That's where um, that's percentage of parlay, that's percentage of in play, and we're all working toward the same thing. So while we want it to be in house, if you come with your idea, we're probably going to tell you we want to buy that and incorporate into our technology rather than have a third party provider, we're certainly interested in advancing the quality of our tech as we move forward. But I think there's plenty of room for, you know, I mean, we, we work with tons of third parties, right? They're, they just are, they're non-core, right? I'm never gonna go build a payments platform or you know, geolocation services or fraud tools. I mean, there's best in class tools. I think the, the trick is we've got this very complicated patchwork of now you know, 18 going on 19 states and the regulatory framework looks different. So you have to build something that is disruptive and additive, but also plug and play, right? So that I can integrate that quickly into a platform and be able to, you know, to do something at scale. But I think there's plenty of room for innovation. I, I just want to explain, in, ca in case there are people in the audience who don't know all of the gaming terms, when we talk about latency, it's this lag time between the live action that's happening on the field or on the court and what you're seeing on television and what gets displayed. And, and for in-game betting, you were explaining to me, Amy, that basketball is such a fast-paced game that you really have to have systems that move quickly. Am I getting this right? Y yes, and, and a like, good example for NBA, one of the you know, very popular player props would be you know, next player to score. If, you're, if you have too much latency, somebody's already scored, scored before you've actually placed the bet. Right? So Jonathan, I was surprised yesterday when we were talking about this, that that is a huge well, hurdle you think for, for how we move forward. Yeah, I think if you're gonna evolve the product to be fully what it can be, and from a, from a team perspective, from a league perspective, Sports betting is an engagement tool more than anything else. We, we, putting aside any revenue, direct revenue, we might get from Caesars or FanDuel, the real byproduct that's a positive for us is the engagement. The engagement 
before the game, people doing their homework, thinking about it, looking at it, and then in-game being even more engaged rather than passively watching, actively watching. And I, I personally believe that the real future of sports betting and the, the majority of the revenue will come from in-game live betting or in-game proposition betting. In order to do it right, you need to be able to collect data on the field in real time, in complete real time, have algorithms process it, and then spit out proposition bets, which in football, you've got, you know, call it 20, at least 25 seconds between plays. So you've got to, A, collect the data, be 100% sure it's accurate, have algorithms that both process new proposition bets and feed them out to the people who are interested in doing it. At the same time, use the data from the prior play to settle up any other wagers that were made on that play and that hit, and, and do it all in a seamless, 100% perfect fashion. And, and, and I think we're years away from really solving it, but when we do, there's gonna be real benefit both to the sports betting companies, the leagues, the fans, because the data that gets collected when you're doing that for every little thing going on on the field, you're gonna be able to improve things like player safety with that information. You're gonna also be able to understand the types, by looking at the types of bets that intrigue people, proposition bets, you're going to understand the things that are most entertaining about the game, help the leagues tweak the games, tweak the rules, and then by driving more engagement and, and, and making it more fun, it, 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 you're going to drive more revenue and that's going to benefit the people to my left. And so if you think about it and you imagine the way you have a crawl at the bottom of the, the, the screen on ESPN today with scores or CNN with headlines, when you turn on an NFL game, an MLS match, an NBA game, et cetera, you might choose to opt into the betting stream and the league will have somebody that owns that right on the screen who we've licensed it to. And if you can feed them that data without delay or with infinitesimal delay, you're gonna be able to have your TV almost working or have whatever device you watch on working like a slot machine where you deposit money at the start and you're making wagers throughout the game and it's just tabulating back and forth. And to me, that's why the latency issue is so critical. But the data that you collect that underlies it is gonna benefit us in a gazillion other ways. And then the opportunity further from an operator standpoint in InPlay is our trading teams are then making a mark, they're, they're setting odds on whether it's the next play, the next player to score. You know, th that's a kind of a mismatch of manual and automated now. And the more you can get that to automated, the quicker your lines are going to go up. But that's where you're, if you're on Twitter and you see a screenshot of, you know, I wanted to bet this in-play bet and somebody would let me bet 34 cents. That's hmm. an automated program telling you they don't have much confidence in the line that they set, so they limit the bet. So the better that we can get at that, the more business is going to happen in play. And that's going to be a mix of how much you could, because the human, you know, I'm going to set a human line here. That's where you get the, the circle where you can't make a bet. So you're kind of in between the customer frustrated. They can't make the bet that they want or they can't bet enough because you can't get the line set in a way that you're confident. That's a big piece of what tech is going to help us with in terms of advancing the product as an industry. We launched a product this year for, for the NFL season. It's a live same game parlay product and 50% of our NFL actives are using that product in, in the first season alone. So the, when you put the innovation out there, <laughs> Jonathan's right, there's a lot, as you describe it, trying to actually get a seamless process like that um, with the latency, the settlement, all that is, is challenging. <laughs> the, the, when, you, when you have great innovations, consumers are, are engaging and we see is when we launch new, new states, the uptake on player props and parlays and same game parlays, it's significantly higher in new states than you would have seen years ago in New Jersey just because they're now becoming such an important part of the actual live sport, uh, sport experience. Are you all right? <laughs> I just you have recall up here. <laughs> That's why I have it, a little frog. <clears throat> I wanna ask you about the, not only the importance of those proposition bets, but 
I also think it's really interesting that the, the industry has been slow to be able to technologically innovate <coughs> how you make marketing promotions particular to the players. You've got a name for it. What's the what's the segmentation? Customer yeah. segmentation. <coughs> how are we how are we doing in terms of those technological advances that say Contessa Brewer is not a big sports better, so we're not we're not gonna offer her a thousand dollars risk free bet because she's not a good value to us. She's not gonna pay back into the system. But you know So I can talk about our experience there. Last year, as we were launching, and as I said, we started from a standing start, and we're launching in all these states, and all these new customers are coming in through uh, the, the new customer promo offers. We didn't have the ability to, to discern that Amy's worth $1,000 and Contessa's worth $10. And so, what happens is you're giving them the same promotion. So, I'm under investing in Amy, I'm over investing in <coughs> Contessa. That's in this football season that was different for us, and that's how uh, you know, we were able to pull back on promotional spend without any degradation of share, because now I can identify my best customers, and that's very similar to what we've done on the brick and mortar side as we've built the business, is you find out who your best customers are, and you invest in them appropriately, and you don't spend money on the customers that won't spend money with you. And so we have that ability and we've implemented that in digital, but in terms of where we are in that, it's early days compared to where we've been in brick and mortar. In our industry, it's, um, I mean, listen, it's such a, a critical capability, especially you mentioned earlier, the focus on path to profitability. If when you're spending, you know, a billion dollars in, promotional dollars, you can't afford to waste it, right? And so to Tom's point, if, you know, to, A, the, the ability to, to identify who that person is and understand their value, um, but also there's tremendous volatility, right, from week to week, right? There's, a, I think, a misconception in sports betting that the house always wins. That's not true, right? So based on how the, the you know, if you have a great NFL weekend or a bad NFL weekend, you, you want to be able to... The Super Bowl being a good example. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so it's not just about identifying who that customer is and, and deploying at a very granular level, but it's also being able to respond quickly to the vol inherent volatility that actually takes place from week to week in the industry. Do you th see how that could come into play for you with fans too? Like once that level of data is available from your gate, your I didn't know it was possible for New England fans to become more engaged because, I, listen, I lived in Maine. I was, a, it, I was in a Red Sox country. We're, we were all a bunch of kooks. <laughs> I, I don't think you, you know, if you feel like people are at their full level of engagement, then you might as well go home, right? So from our perspective, anything that we can do, like when we first got into the football business, you'd watch the game for three hours on Sunday and there'd be a couple minutes on the nightly newscast and you'd read the sports page the next day. And the internet age was just starting to dawn and we figured out quickly that if we internally started to generate articles and content, and I'm going back to the mid 90s now, 94, 95, 96, you could start to drive more time and more engagement with your fans. And the more you drive time and engagement with them, the better the connection's gonna be. In good or bad times, they, people care more. So we, we started that then, and I won't walk you through the whole evolution, but I'll just say this, that in the month of January, the NFL is now doing a, a, a really detailed data, data collection effort around all NFL fans from the most passive to the most passionate. And it involves a whole host of uh, methodologies to get the data in. But one of them evolved, is, is involved around sports betting and we hire third parties to help us collect data and do surveys from around the country. In the month of January, there was almost 100 million hours spent by Americans. So if you think that the adult population is about 250 million, 225, 250, 
And then you realize that sports betting is only legal in two-thirds of the sta states and mobiles in half the states. We had almost 100 million hours in the month of January when we're not even running a full slate of games. And so five years ago, that 100 million was probably 10 million, 15 million. And, and 25, 30 years ago, it was probably much less than that. So it's a long-winded way of saying, I don't think we're anywhere near the top. And the way Amy said and Tom referred to, if you keep innovating and finding more ways through the data to attract and engage people, it's just going to continue to drive up the, the connection to our product. And that's a good thing. And the day we feel like we're at the top of that is the day you should probably sell. So I, 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 I think. I think there's, I agree, completely agree with Jonathan. I think there's a huge opportunity to, we're barely scratching the surface, I believe, on engagement. And you think about, we talk about de-anonymizing customers. Like these are my, my two worlds colliding between ticketing and now sports betting. But what percentage of your customers uh, at Gillette Stadium can you identify now through digital ticketing? Uh, today, virtually 100%. Right. So if you have an integration through APIs and you know, as people are coming into the stadium, I know it's a new female, a, a woman who's never bet before, but she's an avid NFL fan. How do I personalize that experience versus somebody who, you know, is a high value customer? They've been betting for a long time and they're much more experienced. I might want to provide a very different experience. So, Aren't you doing that in bricks and mortar too with all of the... Yeah, I mean, that's the bit, the, what you're trying to do in a stadium, in a digital arena where you've got hundreds of thousands, millions of customers, or in a giant casino that's full of people, is give your customer the experience of they're noticing me, that I'm important to them. And so you're going to do that. You want to do that by touching them in ways that are relevant to them, not, you know, I randomly get you know, an email that has nothing to do with me. And it's, you know, a lot of times it's <laughs> the, the name is it's not dear Tom, it's dear somebody else. Uh, you want the, I'm having experience curated for me. And the more that you can do that with particularly your highest value people, but as many people as you can, the more engagement you're going to get. And as an NFL fan, as just someone who grew up watching the sport, you know, 18-year-old me, 21-year-old me couldn't imagine that there would be wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the combine this week. In, in the sports world, and you've seen the NFL in particular continue to expand. You're not just paying attention to it from September to February now. You're paying attention to it year round. And it's all those engagement pieces that continue to add up, and this is going to be a further opportunity to increase that. So I'd like to put on hats of futurists <clears throat> and talk a little bit about Big tech, uh, first, the metaverse and AR and VR and how that potentially changes or makes sports betting and sports viewing and the marriage between the two look different. Jonathan? You're going to the least capable person. <laughs> I, I was glad three, about but that. I would. I it's would, only because you ask his son that I, question. I would, no, no, no. I, 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 to me, I'm a much bigger believer in AR than VR. And that data collection from the field that we talked about obviously would, would, would put chips all over the field and continuing, continuously collecting data. In my mind, where it goes from an AR perspective is if you're in the building and you, know, you take your phone and you hold it up to the field and you're in, you're in the right app. You could see bubbles over every player's head so you know what skilled players are on the field. The proposition bets could be there and you could create a different experience through AR for people that wanted to engage in the building. Uh, to me, that's where I really see it going. I know there's a lot of talk around the VR side of it and watching the game in a unique position from at home. I'm just not a believer in it, but I might be too old. So, but I think AR is really where the future is for increased engagement and also in the in-venue in 
opportunity of combining sports betting with being a spectator in a building. However, one of the interesting phenomena that's happening is that, and, and you brought this up to me yesterday, right now, mostly you're betting against the house, like FanDuel's taking your bet. Right. But you know how we bet before it became legal was that we would go to the office, you'd bet it with friends, you'd be in an office pool, and that kind of social betting there's a business opportunity there. I mean, can you see one, is, is that something you're focused on, Amy? C creating a place, a space for people to bet against each other and then, the, and then you're taking a fee from it or something like that? Well, social betting already is huge, right? I mean, there's a, there's a huge community aspect of how betting works to begin with, right? I mean, in, in some of these you see on our, we have integrations with Charles Barkley and Kenny Smith on TNT, and when they back a same game parlay, there's, there's a community aspect of that, right? Almost a, um, a social crowding aspect. Um, so I do think, you know, listen, I think there, there's an opportunity. We, we have a product actually in one of our international divisions. It's an exchange. Um, we have not chosen to bring that to the States, but it's, it's a product that actually works very well over in the UK. Um, right now, we're, you know, we're, we're less focused on bringing those types of products and more focused on the innovation that we know works in, in the States. What, one comment I would say on the, on the metaverse, I, I think, listen, I think it remains to be seen how that's actually going to impact the, the, the sports betting experience. One thing you have to be a little careful of is in the metaverse, you actually can't verify your customers, right? So in, in a world where we're a regulated platform, you know, when you're talking about real money wagering, you have to be 21 or older, you, you, just, you have to be a little bit careful around, you know, how you think about the role that the metaverse ultimately plays um, when you're a regulated platform. And that's a key point on the social as yeah. well. The, the regulatory aspect here, you know, Amy and I spend a lot of time getting states comfortable with the, the basics. More than we would like. <laughs> Your, 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 your citizens want sports betting. Here's the way to do it responsibly. And obviously we're gaining a lot of traction there among you know, many, many states. But to move beyond that um, is, seems aggressive at this point from yeah. a regulatory perspective. I, I might, can I just say yeah. one thing though? As, as a person that's not in the business, I do think peer-to-peer -peer betting is gonna be important for people long-term and they're gonna demand it from the social part that Amy described because if you have a group of friends from college and a fee, but going back and forth with each other and betting, I do think that peer-to-peer social sports betting will become a part of the overall marketplace. And I think it's in the, the, the league's best interests to in, encourage that also, assuming people are of the right age and, and assuming it's, it's, it's all properly managed. And I think you'll attract some people to that who would never bet with a Caesars, with a FanDuel, with the Fanatics, with the DraftKings. Also, it's a I, I lot really easier to smack that. talk. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the social <laughs> element of it yeah, when you're right. watching. And I, I really, I do believe that that'll be there. The, it won't, it, the odds won't be as professionally set, obviously, and it won't be, it, the, the, the pie won't be anywhere near as large, but I do think it's gonna be an important and part of it. You see that in the physical casino business, every football Saturday or Sunday, you see it with March Madness. You see groups of people come out together, sit in a book all day, and you know, cheer with their friends. And a lot of time they're on the off opposite sides of the bets. And a lot of times it'll be people that wouldn't be gambling at home on their app. It's that social aspect That's... that draws them in. It's just betting directly with each other from a regulatory perspective is further out. You'll figure it out. I think Tennessee has that wager and there's a couple there's a couple of other businesses. I mean, I pay a little bit of attention to it. You guys know it better. But ultimately, I would think each of you would be in the business of offering a product like that and mm -hmm. and managing it and taking a fee, but I don't I'm not just sure. I'm You're like not the, on your the thank you for managing our business. We <laughs> we like that. I'm going to take Twitter questions in five minutes, so if you have them, post them up on, on Twitter now. 
The last question I want to ask is about the integrity of the industry and the integrity of the game. And Jonathan, because mobile is launching here, I want to ask you, what tools are you using to ensure that your players and, and the staff are keeping the integrity of the game intact? Well, any employee of the NFL has to read a very long treatise on how they are to go nowhere near this and then sign it. Um, so for us, it's just very black and white. And then the NFL um, at the centralized level has a very detailed monitoring policy. You saw, you've seen a couple of our players in the last year uh, get suspended. There haven't been any staff suspended yet, but I think, I think it's pretty well known and understood at, in, in the league staff, uh, among the, league, the teams and the league office, that if you wager, you're going to be out of your job. And, and you, you, you not only, just to, even if you just wager, let alone perform any monkey business, if you do that, you, you have a real chance of going to jail. I think the big leagues have done a very good job. I mean, it's really a zero tolerance policy around this. And, you know, we, this is one of those areas where, you know, obviously we compete, but to the extent that there are any issues, any integrity issues, we'll share those with, with competitors as well. Yeah, that's not good for any of yeah. us. And I can say when I sit down with Commissioner Goodell, always a question from him is, where are we vulnerable? Where, what are we not seeing in terms of where we could have a risk and you know we're heavily heavily regulated and, and um, you know obviously we're we're looking for this to be an activity that's fun for our customers and so we've got all kinds of programs around responsible gaming where you know we're trying to do this in the right way so that you don't stub your toe and all of us are trying to do the same thing. It's not good if we stub our toe. It's not good for us if Amy stubs her toe. So we're all working toward how do we keep this above board and there's no but, question. But in the that. same way that you can't really know your customer on the metaverse, we are, I know that teenagers are getting into their parents' accounts or taking their parents' information and launching accounts that underage gambling and problem gambling, people who are addicted to gambling um, are there, they exist. Is there technological innovations that can help disrupt that? Yeah, well, first of all, that's called proxy betting. And if we identify it, we'll shut the account off immediately. Like in similar vein of what Jonathan is describing, we have a zero tolerance policy on that. The, since we're at an analytics conference right now, I think you know, there's a huge role that data analytics and AI can play in spotting risky, risky behavior. So actually, we're, we're piloting a lot of this technology, and we have the benefit of doing some of this globally. But we can, now the models are very sophisticated, so you can look at betting behavior and you can identify it pretty quickly. And then when you layer on top of that real-time intervention tools, we're, we're using a third, to your question about, you know, technology partners, there's a third party that we're working with right now that once you identify that behavior, we can literally in, in real time intervene and shut an account off. So um, I think there's a, a tremendous obligation and responsibility and lots of great minds in this room that could probably um, help think about how to use those tools more. And, and I think having people like Amy and Tom and their competitors doing that with the leagues now investing millions of dollars in it too is, is really powerful. When I was in college, I had two friends, you know, in today's day and age, they can have real insight into this. I had two friends who got into problems with bookies. And that's, that's the, I, the legalization of sports betting, I think actually helps on this front <laughs> because when you get into trouble with bookies and you're begging your friends for money to pay them off, it's, it's not a matter of you know, getting your hands spanked by the authorities or maybe getting a fine. It's, it's really a matter of physical harm or not, or it was in those days. But I think, I think Wait, you're not kneecapping <laughs> your... <laughs> we closed that division. But to Jonathan, listen, the NFL no, and the I... NBA have done a, a great job. I mean, we spend as much time talking to Roger and Rini about how we create a code of conduct, right? To, to Tom's point, 
if, if we can build this the right way and establish a code of conduct that we all adhere to that isn't what regulated, regulators will tell you the bare minimum you have to do, but there's, there are things that we ought to be doing as an industry above and beyond that, some which we're already doing, and so if we can work through the leagues, the NFL, the NBA, to establish that, I think we're, we won't have some of the same unintended consequences. Yeah, and it, as Jonathan said, that, that with all of that, there was a high profile suspension. So you're not going to design a foolproof system for all of the transactions that, we ha that, that go through our networks, but we are going to make certain that it is as few as it can possibly be. Yeah. I, I should point out, too, that I'm on the NFL Sports Betting Committee, and I can tell you every meeting starts with not a top line of the revenues and our cut or anything like that. Every meeting starts with a discussion about what's going on on the, the compliance front and the security front, and, and that's literally how every meeting starts. Because it is a, a real risk to the bottom line, and we heard that from... Peter Jackson, the CEO of Flutter yesterday, that you know what has happened in Europe is a regulatory backlash that affects how much money gets made. I want to move to the Twitter questions now. Um, what data do you wish you had, Amy, but you don't? Oh gosh, that's, that's a good question. I think the uh, listen. There's certain the the data we have for the big categories, right? The the NFL, the NBA, I think is is very robust. When you start to get into some of the longer tail sports, the, the data tends not to be quite as robust. Um, so I think it may be more from a, a category perspective as opposed to we, there's a lot of data signals that we already have and um, you know, some of them we, we, ha we take over from, you know, from our global colleagues as well. But I, I, for me, it's, it's more at the category level as opposed to we're not getting data that we need to set the odds the right way. Yeah, it's not necessarily a lack of data anywhere. It's are you seeing what everything that the data is telling you? That's really the, um, the biggest challenge for us. We get plenty of data oh. um, on our customers. Do you have data that you want? Other than how to keep players safer and all those things? Well, no, I mean, if the, we, 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 only, we really don't get a lot of their data. We don't get any of their data. So if Tom and Amy and Jason and Michael and others wanted to share it with us, we would love it. So the data we have to get is through, uh, related to this, is through our own means of talking to, to, to our fans and, and our customers. Tom, I mentioned the impact of Mattress Mac on your bottom line when he's lucky. What's the impact that he has on the industry as a whole? He is a fantastic marketer. Mm -hmm. So whether he wins or loses a bet, the entire world is aware of the bet, which obviously didn't work so well for us with the World Series. <laughs> um, but you want, that, you want that kind of organic coverage to develop. That's not me pushing Caesars out to the world. That's someone who's a customer saying, you know, Caesars is great. They'll take these big bets, go to Caesars. And he's now identified, a, he's got to be the most famous sports better yeah. around. So, I mean, larger than life personality. <laughs> yeah. So you're really with him looking at how much are you willing to take of his action. But I think we're all happy to have him as a, as a, with his megaphone talking about our brand. He even talks about responsible gambling in an organic way where he's like, but I can afford to lose it. Mm. You know, you, you should only be gambling what you can afford to lose. And so his way of talking about it is not because of regulatory risk or it, it just has to do with common sense, right? Uh, Jonathan, what relations do you maintain with other Boston sports teams? as you determine how to change and improve fan interactions or experiences with sports betting? That's a good question. Really, really uh, a lot. Our, our organization, along with the Celtics, Red Sox, Bruins, spent a lot of time with our state legislature. Obviously, we weren't that effective because it took a lot of time um, to get it done. But we collaborate together and there was a lot of talking offline between general counsels and the business people who were responsible for this area 
uh, together privately and then going to the legislature with one voice. So it's, it's real. And we're not, we're in no way, in a big market like Boston, anyhow, we're not competitive with each other in any way, shape, or form. So anything that's good for one of us is really good for all of us, and we work collaboratively on a whole host of issues. Outside of spend and betting frequency, what are other factors that determine a high-value customer versus a low-value customer, Amy? Well, listen, at the end of the day, you know, it's a, a function of how effectively can we retain that customer and drive share of wallet onto our platform. And, you know, as, as you look at a, a good, first of all, a good customer is somebody who spends within their limits, for, first and foremost. Um, but, you know, you're also, yes, those are important drivers. Um, the customers that tend to be more engaged in player props and same game parlays um, and also will, you know, will, they'll, they'll bet on the big moments, but they, they may also engage in some of our other products, right? We have an, you know, we have a casino product. We just integrated our horse racing product into Sportsbook. So it's consumers who, who are engaged, but again, they're doing that within, you know, their economic means and keeping as a form of entertainment. So th those, those are, tends to, tend to be our are more valuable customers, ones that go up across the portfolio. Uh, do you think that Amazon and Apple, and, and, and you know, YouTube now has the Sunday ticket, are you concerned, are you anticipating that you will have for, formidable big tech competitors, Tom? I don't anticipate them standing up their own business in this space. But, you know, we are collectively, we're buttons on the first page of your phone. You know, our apps are a place that have eyeball and wallet share. And as it grows to a business that uh, is the overwhelming majority of the population where we're not there yet, if it grows to the size that you see in some estimates, there's going to be interest from others that are fighting for that uh, eyeball time, screen time. This is the first, I've been in and around gaming since 1993. Um, this is the first development in gaming where you've really gotten any attention from companies that aren't involved in, in gambling. Uh, so. As it grows bigger, I'd expect that to be, I'd expect that there will ultimately be some convergence, but I think that would be more of a buy versus build decision. For yeah, I think it's a, I actually think it's a good thing for innovation and more engagement in, in the category, right? I mean, if you think about what Jonathan was describing, some of those big tech companies can actually solve some of the latency issues as we think about connected devices and knowing every customer who's logged in and then the ability to to truly integrate and watch and bet those are those are things that i think the big tech companies can can ultimately help us solve um and i i, I don't know for sure but i'm guessing a lot of those big companies also don't want to have to go through the hassle of getting that, licensed that, and regulated because that has been a standard response that disney doesn't want to go sit in front of regulators mm. in 35 states however i I recently am sensing a bit of a sentiment shift among some of the companies that says it might be worth it. There might be enough money in it for us to go through that. Do you think that the, it is, is that the biggest factor in them not getting into gambling? I think it's certainly been, it's certainly been a big one. I mean, if you think about Disney and ESPN, a big part of you know, of, of, of why they, you, you cannot place a bet on ESPN. They can have a partnership with a sports betting operator, but the minute you place a bet on ESPN, they have to be licensed and regulated. And Michael Rubin's not here now. What do you want to say about the potential of him as a competitor in sports betting? Come on well, in, the water's warm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome more competition. By the way, I always say there's 60 competitors in the market already, so. Oh. <laughs> but Fanatics has some great assets, and... My, I respect Michael very much. So, it, if you, there's a new horse to bet on at this point, Jonathan, you want to throw your bet in? Well, I mean, I would, 
I said to Tom earlier, I think he's got the best ads in the market, so I apologize, Amy. <laughs> but I'm a huge, I, it's sacrilege for a Boston guy to say it, but the Mannings are awesome. So those ads, <laughs> those ads are great. I, I think the two people to my left, I think Jace, I think DraftKings, but I think Michael Rubin, when you look at 100 million installed customer base doing digital transactions with him with knowledge of the sports fans, I think he'll be somebody that, that will be a real player in this business. But as Tom and Amy just said, the market's going to be enormous. And if you have three or four really great, great companies driving this, it's going to benefit all of sports. And it's not going to be a winner take all. It's not going to happen given the licenses and everything else. So I would, I would watch Fanatics. And I think you're going to end up with just a handful of very large, great companies improving the overall industry. And on that kumbaya moment, <laughs> thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you so much for a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Thanks thank for having us.
ladies and gentlemen, our program will resume in just a couple of minutes. Please begin taking your seats at this time. As a reminder, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us here at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Uh, my name is Khalid McCaskill. I'm a first year MBA here at MIT Sloan. And it is my pleasure to introduce our panel, Player Power, Building Businesses and Empowering Athletes, presented by Wasserman Foundation. Our panelist, Michael Rubin, CEO of Fanatics. Tamika Tremalio, Executive Director of the MBPA. Demora Smith, Executive Director of the NFLPA. And uh, our panel will be moderated by Jessica Gelman from Kraft Analytics Group. Uh, the panel will run for 45 minutes, and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please submit questions on Twitter using the, play, using the hashtag, hashtag player power. Uh, questions will then be selected by the moderator. With that, I'll turn it to you. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Thank you all for being here. I'm very excited about this panel uh, in prepping and learning about all of the initiatives that you're undertaking. Uh, I've come to understand just how much the shift or shift there has been for players uh, across the sports ecosystem and all of you have been major players in this. So I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to try my very best to uh, prevent swearing. Uh, and I, I got to go. I'll help. <laughs> Both of them. But well, let's have some fun up here. So just to start with the shifting nature of player power, why do you believe there has been this shift and what was the starting point? Michael, I'd love for you to kick us off. Um, I'd say there's been a few things. I, I think the first is players 
um, you know, have, they make a lot of money from doing their day jobs, but they also pay 50% taxes and they can't create, you know, generational wealth from that. So they're saying, how can I really create incredible wealth? And so I think they're very focused on their businesses, not just what they do as a sport. And I think they have incredible platforms today. If you think about this, 10 years ago, a player did everything through the media. Today, you know, their social media platforms in a lot of ways are, you know, the most powerful marketing vehicle they have. If you look at top, you know, NFL players or top uh, NBA players, the ability for them to use social media to communicate their messages, build their businesses, it's a huge opportunity. I think you're seeing, you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the best athletes in the world are going to create substantially more value from the businesses that they build than what they create in value from doing their day job. So I think it's, um, it, 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 it's a big opportunity for them. And I think lastly, the interest that you see, like if you walk in a locker room today versus 10 years ago, people are excited to talk about business. I mean, I was just saying last night, you know, Robert Kraft and I had dinner with, uh, with one of Tamika's executive committee members, Grant Williams, and the whole conversation was about business. And, you know, he was so thoughtful and he was asking great questions. And, you know, that's the, that, that's the modern, you know, athlete today. They want to build their businesses and they have the assets to do it with social media, you know, to say the least. Yeah. I, I would just sort of piggyback on what Michael said for sure. I think social media has a big part of that. So if you think about LeBron, for instance, he has 140 million followers. The Lakers have 21 million. Steph Curry has half of what Golden State has in terms of followers, or, or double what Golden State has in terms of followers. So if you look at the power that that presents for them, they've recognized that they can use that platform. We've seen it, whether it's in social justice issues, we've seen it, whether it's in global and how they've been able to reach out globally. We have 25% of our players now that are global. And the reach that they would have had only from the media, which would have been predominantly US, they now can expand that. So I think that's part of where we're seeing that shift. Yeah, I mean, I'll come at, uh, at it from a different angle. Um, I, I think it's been about uh, shifts in paradigms. Um, when you think of Marvin Miller back in the 70s was the first person to do a group licensing right around a trading card. Mm -hmm. And that was the first person who said that a group of athletes, to your point, Michael, off the field have a value, have an IP. Um, he took that idea of a group licensing right to a place where NFL Players Inc. right now is generating $300, $350 million a year. One team partners uh, has a valuation of nearly $2 billion. All of that is a paradigm shift of the value of a player's IP writ large. And the first deal that you and I did was a value-based deal on that changing paradigm where the one thing we did differently, and you certainly were, were a trailblazer, instead of the players waiting for the league to do their deal first, the players shifted the paradigm one more time and did the deal first with you, validating the, the perpetual IP value um, of our right. So I think... You know, when you're looking at writ large from the macro standpoint, the macroeconomic standpoint, um, I think the biggest change has been a paradigm shift in the value of player rights and people understanding who has those rights. Um, and those rights are perpetual. They're evergreen. So it is not a commodity that is ever going to decay on the, the shelf. It's, it's not gonna, there's not gonna be an expiration date. Everything that our players are doing on the field um, super energizes the value of their group licensing rights off the field. I mean, I, this concept of empowerment is obviously very, very critical. And um, we're seeing, of course, so much higher engagement from fans because of all of these new channels. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned the social media, which I think is, is so interesting. So when you see a player who's using you know, a platform, their platform, and brand to create change potentially through uh, social media. W what do you think your role is in helping them? Yeah. I'll start with you, Tamika. You know, sure. I think you so, examples. you know, as the union, our role, of course, is to protect, support, and amplify our players. And since we recognize that this has become a platform for them, we want to make sure that they're equipped to do so. So, to Michael's point, our players are phenomenal 
athletes, but all of them have an and. And I've been so um, using this sort of platform for them to push forward what's their and. Because as we look at all of the individuals that are out there, the way in which they relate to their play, our players is by basketball typically, but understanding that many, particularly of our young generations, are not going to get to the point where they will be in the NBA or the NFL, I want them to see what their and is. And many of them are business entrepreneurs. And so even when we, I first took on this role, we did this phenomenal business titans dinner, which Robert Kraft and Michael were there. And they talked to them about creating generational wealth, about having money as opposed to making money. So that's causing that shift. And quite frankly, as a union, we're making sure that we're preparing them for when the ball stops dribbling and using their platforms right now to plant the seeds that they're going to need in the future. Was there like a... I mean, from all of your perspective, was there a particular starting point where the where players made that actual oh recognition? I mean, was it something that you were doing, or was there a particular player or moment in time? We got locked out, <laughs> um, and I mean, we're a labor union, and and we don't apologize for being a labor union. Um, you know, we've got a great relationship with the National Football League. In 2011, we were locked out for 134 days. Um, that's, a, that's a battle over power. Um, our power is inextricably tied to our ability to take care of our players when management decides that we can't play anymore, right? So, you know, we created an insurance policy that was worth whatever it is, $800 billion. We were able to pay for that because of our group licensing right. Um, when we did the deal with Michael in 20... They changed when they 14. Yeah, it was a... That was a bellwether change because it shifted the way in which we valued not only our IP, but valued our power in the market. Um, and then that next iteration was, um, uh, was ultimately one team partners where we brought in uh, group licensing rights from other uh, sports unions. I mean, think about it for a second. The US women's national team got their group licensing rights back because the, the, the US soccer had them. And the only reason they got them back was because U.S. soccer considered their group licensing rights to be worth zero. So again, I mean, I, I hate to harp on sort of paradigmic shifts, right? But when someone tells you that your group light, licensing rights are worth zero, they come back to the union, and then they are in a position to partner with, with you know, our great business partners on the outside. That's, that's a sea change. I mean, it's clearly a sea change. Look what the U.S. Women's National Team has done in terms of pay equity. Oh, well, and again, they, they fund that lawsuit, right? right? They fund that lawsuit and they are able to pursue that lawsuit because they have a union that is funded from their group licensing rights. You know, rights without an ability to effectuate them are meaningless, right? So, you know, I look at, especially, and I, you know, hate to say nice things about Michael, but... Um, it happens. <laughs> It happens. Um, Rick and I committed to just make fun of you the whole time. I figured this it's figure coming. it's coming. Figure just it's coming. Just give me like 10 minutes of uh, more time. <laughs> that. But no curse I'm, words. Um, I'm going to curse you. Um, you proper than me. I can't say how much our deal with Michael changed the landscape. And, and again, you know, we were, we were vigilant about our rights. We're aggressive about our rights. He was the first person to come into the market, recognize our rights, and most importantly, put us in a position um, to value them in a different way. And I think for us, look, we, we see our job as the kind of leading digital sports platform as having a great relationship with the leagues and the sports teams, but an equally great relationship with the players. And at the end of the day, our business is really created by players. Without players, we don't have a business. And so, you know, we've, we've I think, learned over the past, you know, 10 plus years that having spectacular relationships with the players will lead to a much bigger business for all of us. And this is a good thing for the sports industry. There's no us against them in this issue. This is really a question of making a bigger industry. I mean, I was just thinking about it yesterday. The sports, sports teams today are probably worth a half a trillion dollars. If you just look at, you know, NFL teams, you know, call it $150 billion, do the math, add in soccer, it's at least a half a trillion dollars of, of value from sports teams. We gotta get that, how do we create a trillion dollars in value, then $2 trillion in value. And the way we're gonna do that is by working together to create more value. And I'll tell you, for us, working directly with Tamika and her players and Dean and his, his players, um, you know, that's created huge unlock for the entire sports ecosystem. 
And, um, you know, I think we've just got to start. And you asked the original question of kind of, you know, was there kind of a paradigm shift? I think it was like the invention of social. I mean, first of all, it was, it was I think, a couple of things. Like one, the invention, like, we can't minimize social media. I mean, the platform, you just talked about it, Bron having a, a what did what, you say the numbers were? He 140 seven million times. followers. Yes. Versus versus seven times more. the followers as the Lakers. I mean, when we think about doing something, and we partner with Bron on certain things and partner with lots of these guys, we want to work directly with their social media to get, you know, to get it, and them to get out messages that are really important to our fans, whether it's for, for a cause that they care about or we care about, or whether it, it's, um, you know, by the way, a great example, and, you know, some people probably remember it a couple of years ago during the pandemic um, when we did the All In Challenge, we had a million and a half sports fans, um, you know, help, um, you know, create $60 million. It was the biggest digital fundraiser ever, and it was all about leveraging. Um, athletes, you know, incredible experiences they made in their social media, and that drove the entire experience. It wasn't really, to be honest, that wasn't, that was 100% driven by the stars, whether it's the celebrities, the athletes, the football players, the basketball players, who created a great experience that then got auctioned off or, or out for charity, and it went through their social media. That built the entire program, raised $60 million over a few months. So it's amazing what, um, you know, focused uh, athletes with social media platforms um, can really do to make a big difference. I think that's a phenomenal uh, like point in time because I don't know if we had all thought about how COVID it created more player power. And I think um, as, as I'm listening to you, Michael, like you really are a great connector. Like you're connecting the ecosystem mm -hmm. with the players. And then, of course, with Fanatics, y you've done fantastic, even equity deals with all of the leagues. So you're in this really fascinating middle place that you're growing the pie, and that's, that's, that's really. Well, 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 pause on that for one second, because what was interesting is I remember um, probably a decade ago, um, Jonathan and Robert Kraft saying to me, it's great that you're paying the NFL off this money, but we also want to make sure that we are participating in the upside. Mm -hmm. And so our deals fundamentally changed with the leagues at that point where um, the money we pay them what couldn't be the only compensation. They need to kind of be our partners in the business. But when we did that, what that also led to saying is, wait a second, we need to do that with the players as well because if we don't have both sides in our business, we have no business. And so when we bought Mitchell and Ness just a year ago, um, and we got, you know, it was a, you know, look, it's, I'll be public about this. It was a company with, uh, um, you know, called, you know, we bought it for four or five times its, its, its profit, put a little bit of debt on it. So the equity check to buy it was like two or three times profit. So it was a really attractive investment. And our company wanted to do 100% itself. But I said, I actually want to bring in the best athletes in different sports to be our partner. So we brought in, you know, Joel Embiid and James Harden and KD and LeBron James and, and Chris Paul and Devin Booker and CJ McCall and we wanted these guys and Odell Beckham and, and, and then we had a bunch of, you know, and we had Jay-Z and Kevin Hart. We want the people that could help make the brand. And so today we own maybe three quarters of the business, but the business is going to be that much more valuable because the people, and by the way, they put the money in exactly the same way we did. It was all heads up investing, but they're helping to make the business more valuable. So yep. we very much believe we'd rather own, you know, you know, a smaller piece of a much bigger business. And so having both the leagues and the players as our partners has created a lot of value. And today, just to give you real math, um, the leagues and players probably own a five or six billion dollar stake of our companies, you know? So this is not small dollars here. And, you know, the, and, and, and what I see today when I walk into a, you know, when I walk into a locker room, it's not, you know, people aren't looking to BS with me. They're like, hey, how can I get in that deal? I, I, by the way, I hear it all the time. Like it's, it, you know, yeah, I've had you, the, I've had both Tamika and League and D reach out to me and say, hey, this player wants to get you because they want to invest in these things because they want to be part of it. The players are be, they're being very smart now. They're thinking about, hey, we want to create, we want capital gains, not ordinary income. They want to pay 20% capital gains, not 40% ordinary income. And they want to create real wealth over a period of time and invest their money. Last night, our whole conversation was about investing. How can we take as much of our salary and invest it in the right things to create generational wealth? So, Tamika, as you, you are, as you said at the beginning, help looking and focusing on generational wealth. I mean, which player or these young players who are coming in, how do you help them get it, A, and then B, like, who is really, really, you, you've seen 
Like this is a great example of how to do it well. And, and, and you're also, I think it's interesting, you're saying business. That's right. It's a focus on business that the, the players that, like I think, you yes. know, I mean, Shaquille O'Neal in you know, the 2000s, yeah. he was making music videos. And yes, so no, it, absolutely. And he I still makes music is, videos. He does, he does, very diverse. But I will also say that they recognize their power. And you know, even Michael, you know, a couple of weeks ago spoke to our executive committee. He talked about, you are so incredibly powerful. Yeah. And the way in which they can do that is by leading from the front, right? So our players, when you talk about who's doing that, so many of them are doing that well and quite frankly have been doing it well for a really long period of time. To your point, because of social media, I think they have been able to expedite that quicker. So you think about the CJ McCollums of the world, LeBron, Steph, you know, even names that you don't know, right, that are really focused on that in the technology space. Andre, they are really focused on what they're leaving for the next generation because all of that is significant. Even as we talk about the union, and as you all know, as, as Dee mentioned, we have our group licensing rights as well through Think 450. And through that, one of the things that we often are looking at is how do we build equity? How are we making sure that it goes after the ball stops bouncing? So our players are not only focused on the game of basketball, they're focused on the business of basketball and what that means. That is a shift, but quite frankly, it's more of a vocal shift. The reality is they have always been thinking that way. So um, both of you uh, have mentioned the specific commercial entities that you have built and created to drive player licensing, one team and Think 450. And you've approached it very, very differently. Uh, you obviously took outside funding, uh, brought in a bunch of other player associations. As you said, the value over $2 billion, you said, today. Um, very entrepreneurial. Congratulations. I mean, you've been at the MBPA for a year. And so I um, think 450 is, you know, your kind of incarnation of this component. Maybe explain, and you shared a little bit already about how, how you're helping the athletes from this to evolve and think about businesses and um, what they're investing into or what they're potentially starting. Yeah. And, we, and I think the more specific examples of players that you've actually like, okay, here, that will be helpful. Yeah, I mean, look, our, our model, and, and I tend to be really blunt with our guys, and I'll do my best to get through this without cursing. Um, <laughs> Um, the best model they should have for how to conduct themselves as business is what we've done at Players Inc. and what we've done at One Team. Um, business is a tough, tough place. And I know every now and then we talk about all the wonderful things we're doing at dinner and we do these things. Michael and I have mixed it up um, on, on our deals. <laughs> Robert and I have mixed it up on our deals. Um, what comes from that is becoming savvy, confident, um, and having a platform to evaluate not only your value, but the value that comes from partnering with someone else. Um, so what we try to do and, and, and what's been successful for us is um, understanding this business in, in, for, for all of the good and for all of the bad that it is. And it means for certainly the young business people out there, if, if anybody wants to tell you that this is some sort of sing-songy, it's all gonna be great, well, you know, pack a lunch. Um, um, because it's, it's, it, you're going to find out that while you can do great things, sometimes you have to somehow get through the door first. And that first walk through the door is a value proposition between two people. Why is this good for me and why is this good for this person? And then you try to meet, you know, here. So um, when, when we invested in, in Whoop, for example, um, that was our first Tech Day winner back in, uh, I'm terrible with dates, 2010. Um, small company comes in, they say they want to, to replace Fitbit. Uh, they don't have any money, which is fantastic. Um, uh, but we decided to partner with Whoop. We took equity in Whoop, and the primary driver for Whoop was we're going to give Whoop bracelets to all of our players. And, and we took equity in that company. That that is the message or that is probably the, 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 the deal that we talk about most to players mm -hmm. because it, got, it gets them out of this idea that they have to have, whatever it is, $150,000, $250,000, $300,000 to invest in something. No, our IP is incredibly valuable. 
And because our, our NFL relationship means that they can wear things under their clothes on game day, um, you can wear a whoop bracelet on the field. So all of a sudden we realize we've got this huge input of, of value um, and we have our players grow from it. So, I mean, it's that, you know, Jessica, it's that two, it's that two pronged understanding of what this is, but also realizing what your value is and what you can invest into this to make it better. I mean, I have to ask in this case, especially with Whoop, where they're now having access to the uh, NFL players, you know, actual uh, data. Yep. H how do you manage that component and ensure those, those, that data privacy rights? That's one of the reasons we went with them. The first deal with Whoop was that we control their access to player data. Wow. Oh, yeah. When I say that we're a union, we're a badass union, yeah. right? And, and we believe, there he goes. We believe, in, <laughs> we believe <laughs> in protecting himself. our players' rights, and certainly we believe in, in, in good deals. But what was most attractive to us with that partnership was the individual player and the union being able to govern exactly where that data goes. That's, that's uh, I mean, it's incredibly valuable data, and I, of course, would encourage you to think about how to monetize that. Um, so, and, course, and, <laughs> and so, with Think450, can you share some of the, the partnerships that you've done over the past year or so, that, and how they're different, how you're partnering and thinking differently um, in, in scale? Yes, so, you were right on point. First of all, Dee, I think, said, the fact that we have our group licensing has been a game changer, right? So in 2017, it hasn't been that long, we have our group licensing. That does give you the power as a player to make decisions, to not sort of have to settle as historically you may have felt like you had to do because you didn't have the capital, right? It's changed the game. In addition, our players wanted their group licensing because they wanted to do things that were authentic to them. Mm. They wanted to show up in the way that they wanted to show up and not sort of dictated how they had to show up. They were really looking for partnerships, ways to partner with companies, with individuals. And so not only are we obviously looking at our players' businesses and how can we help them to be stronger, grow bigger, have equity in our players' businesses so that we're pushing them forward, but we also are looking for ways to have equity in other companies. So Sorare, for instance, as we talked about NFT trading cards and what are we going to do with that, that was attractive to us because it was an ability to, one, to have equity. It obviously also included cash flow, but it gave us the opportunity to partner with them so that the things that they were actually producing on our behalf represented us reflected what our players wanted it to reflect. And so that's critically important to us as well. And when you own it, you can lead from the front, you can make sure that those things happen. And to Michael's point around Mitchell and Ness, you are all in when it's yours, right? And so thinking about it from that perspective, I think it, it will continue to change the game. One thing I think about is, um, you know, I was a point guard, so it was always, you know, team and there's no I in team. How do we ensure that the players are still focused on the team aspect, even as they're building out their businesses and their brands? And I think, you know, Michael as a one-time team owner, maybe you can like provide some perspective on that? Yeah, well, I think they're doing both. I think first thing is they're winning as a team. I mean, I look at what Dee and Tamika have done with their unions and the way they keep moving them forward from a business perspective and doing bigger and better deals as a union. And by the way, just in what we did in the last two years, we created a trading card company together yeah. where each of, each of their unions have made hundreds of millions of dollars already. And we, we were just starting, okay? And we haven't, you know, yeah. you know I think, you know, the innovation is going to happen in the collectibles industry over the next few years is going to be mind boggling to collectors and so exciting. At the same time, um, what's happening is the individual players and the members of the union are getting so much more sophisticated by watching the unions advance, and that's helping them from a business perspective individually. And like, look, I love to study. You can look at, you know, look at the biggest, you know, stars in United you know, Sports. You look at LeBron. Forget about everything he's done on the court. Look at what he's done from a business perspective. He's created a very successful media company. You know, Blaze. He's got a, a, ch a chicken. I mean, this guy's got business after business that's you know created 
hundreds of millions of dollars of value for himself. Look at Tom Brady in football. And all no, the value. no, not going to look at him. Yeah, yeah. I, it, I know it hurts you to look at such a <laughs> studly man versus yourself. Um, but, you know, look, look at Tommy and, you know, the, yeah. the value he's created. And then you look, but what you look is they're all, you know, everyone's learning from each other. And so I like that the unions win as a team and that the players are learning from that and then taking that individually. I will say the thing that's most amazing to me, there's not a day that goes by now where, you know, a – current player in the NBA and the NFL and in baseball's hitting me up. You know, I'm getting a DM from saying, hey, can you help me think this through? I'm getting questions all the time because they, they want to be students of business because they, they realize, you know, I think 10 or 20 years ago, people thought if they, you know, if they were just really successful as an athlete, maybe 20 years ago, that was enough. Now they're saying, no, that's my, that's my platform to do so much more. And I think it helps every which way. It makes the league stronger because stronger players makes the league stronger. The leagues make the players stronger. Everyone's making each other stronger. So I don't think it's a team or not team here. I think it's they're winning as teams, they're winning as you know, partnerships, and they're winning as individuals. And I think that's great. Well, I think what, and, and Tamika knows this, one thing that we have to preach within our own ecosystems is team. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no I in team, but there is an M and an E, as my coach would say. Um, what we have to do is make sure that while you have your brand as an individual, you are also out adding value to our, our, our team through our group collectibles. And, and so, you know, if you want to use six or more players in the National Football League, you have to do a deal with, with us. If you want to use players in a group, uh, you have to do a deal with, with um, Think 450. What we do, um, and I'm sure Tamika does it in a much nicer way than, than I do, is just remind... I can confirm that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, it's a tough business. Um, but, you know, you take a guy like Tom Brady, who's, well, frankly, Tom Brady, right? Um, Tom, Tom's a union Tom Brady. And, and yes, you know, he makes money off of his number one jersey sales year after year after year after year. Um, but Tom also knows that he is a part of a group licensing right in a, in a wonderful company called Fanatics. And the way that we teach team or reinforce team is, you know, your union owns equity in this company. So no one is, an, no one is a flyer. No one is on a one-off. Everybody can win both collectively and individually. And as long as you do that, you know, reinforce that value proposition, um, I will say, um, you know, talk a little bit about headwinds. Mm. I do worry a little bit about that given the change in NIL mm. um, coming forward. Um, it'll be obviously for, for somebody hopefully younger uh, who has my job um, in, a, in a year or so, but I do believe that that could be a significant headwind because we've never had to deal with um, that type of, of athlete who might have a different journey um, than, than before and, and whether we've never really had an issue of somebody trying to opt out of the group licensing right. Um, you know, whenever it did happen, they walked out the back door and I'm just saying stuff happens. Stuff happens. I don't know. Just fall down. Stuff happens. Um, but I think what's going to be interesting is how we, you, cultivate that sense of team in the next 10 years in an ecosystem that looks dramatically different than it does now. Well, the thing is for us, by the way, we have if you really think about this, both in all of the power we make, so we make you know, all the NFL jerseys yeah. that have Nike's name are made by Fanatics. So we make all those Nike jerseys, we make lots of NBA jerseys, we make all the baseball jerseys. So we have deals collectively with the unions in apparel jerseys, also in trading cards where we make all the trading cards and we'll make the trading cards over time. But then we have 3,000 individual deals with athletes, both to sign memorabilia in our memorabilia yeah. business, in trading cards, we have marketing deals with these athletes. And so, college. Right. And, and college has become very significant. So my point is yeah. we're doing it as a team and we're doing it individually, yep. and that's the business model. Look, that's why, that's why we agreed to do the, the college the deal, right? Because I like the idea of introducing to the college athlete this idea of group licensing right. Mm -hmm. and, and, yes, it's a great deal for us, but philosophically, the reason why I agreed to do that deal was exactly that, to try to cultivate this idea of group licensing right on a college level. Yeah, 
And I think from our perspective, I am incredibly fortunate that our it is never lost on our players that they are standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, real giants, right? And so they recognize that the people who've come before them made incredible sacrifices. So even giving back, you know, to the ABA, making sure that they're taken care of, making sure that our retired players are taken care of. So they get the importance of the collective. You are certainly right, Dee, that there will be challenges, but I, I do think I have an incredible generous and empathetic group that recognizes how important that is so I, I think we should fare well but it is something that we're going to constantly remind, have to remind them of for certain I know Dee's like yeah she might be naive because individuals always but I also appreciate that they do recognize that it took a lot to get to where they are yeah I mean look we we have a our entire business is shifting I think much faster over the next over the last two years and the next 10 years i think there's more seismic waves in our business um within the next five years than there has been in the last 50. um i mean when i took the job there was no instagram right <laughs> um which is terrifying and we're talking about the power of social media w what is that thing going to be in 10 you know in 10 years and i think um you know these challenges um I, you know, I just don't have answers to. We don't have answers to. There's going to be mass consolidation, for example, in the agent market. We're seeing it right now. Um, and that is going to have a significant impact on our business. Um, there's going to be a rise in the impact of marketing agents on college athletes in a way that we've never seen before. So, you know, from where, you know, where we sit, you know, we inherit a player from another, another place. For the most part up until now, we've inherited them in a way where they become professional athletes and then that's a kind of a door, right? Mm -hmm. And then we teach them or have them grow in that door. What's happening now is that door has several or more doors before they get to us. And I think how we navigate this space over the next five, 10 years is gonna be really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what, you, that comment that you made about the consolidation of the agent market, I mean, Look, we have 850 uh, certified contract advisors. I mean, we were the first union to start certifying advisors, I think, in 1975 or something like that. Out of that 850 agents, probably 130 of them have an active um, NFL player. Out of that 130, 40 probably represent 85% of all NFL players. Four, four, might be, four of them might be half, yeah, by the way. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, they're all in separate places, right? Yeah. I mean, but, but yeah, you take that 40, 10 of them are all in four separate agencies. Yep. Um, you know, well, there was a time when, I, I'm just not mentioning anybody sort of, you know, for any reason, but, you know, Joel Siegel was Joel Siegel, Tom Condon was Tom Condon, Jimmy Sexton was somewhere else, Joe, um, Drew Rosenhaus was somewhere else, um, Macklin was somewhere else. What we've seen over the last few years, though, is some of those people have, have joined their practice with larger practices, and there is just consolidation. Yeah. So well, I think that's a good thing, by the way, because from my perspective, I think you're, I mean, look, you may have a different yeah. view from the reaction you had. I sure. think it's a good thing, because I think what you have is, as you know, you have a, smaller amount of, of big firms that, that have real resources across all of the required, you know, things that need to happen. Like yeah. I look and say, it's not just about getting someone's contract done this, you know, I can look and I look at the best firms help their, um, you know, their players with what are the philanthropic things they want to do and they have a platform team just to help with that and what the, you know, who does their marketing deals and who does their business deals and who gets them equity deals. So I, I think yeah. having the quality Firms like I can look when I look at I, I can look at an athlete today and he can tell me who he works with. I can ask a few questions and I can have a pretty good guess of how their business um, career will go outside of, of, of their sport. And so I think it is very important to have the right resources behind these players to get them the right type of success. No, I think that part's good. I mean, the, the, the flip side of it for anybody, you know, the, the, the union problem issue on the other side, though, is when you have that level of consolidation. Right, and I'm just saying, I'm making up a hypothetical because this would never happen. I'm lying. Um, <laughs> you could have leagues make handshake agreements with now four uh, companies who represent 80% of our players. And while we have a 
parallel relationship with agents. We all want our players to make money. We all want them to get contracts. Every now and then, a union might decide that we have to take a labor action. And if there is now only four people who are managing 85% of our players and somebody on the other side of my table, you know, an adversary, first letter N, second letter F, yeah, play along. Um, <laughs> That could create a world where because we only have parallel relationships as opposed to completely aligned relationships, um, that, that could create a problem. And by the way, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's changing. And yeah. that you've thought about it quite a bit, actually. All I do is this um, uh, and watch lacrosse. Um, no, but, but look, I mean, where there is great opportunity um, from that, though, to your point, look, if... For example, I think one of the most exciting things that, that, um, that is on the horizon is the fact that because there is so much consolidation, think about how much uh, of an opportunity there is for content mm -hmm. and for other things because now you can go to four places and frankly get 80, 80 um, NFL players to, to around different things to do. I think that's fantastic from a business. Look, the, re the reality is in business, Nothing is ever just like straightforward, 100%. easy. No. And there's always pros and cons to 100%. everything. Yeah. I think there'll be more pros than cons to consolidation because I think the athletes and players will be um, better represented if the talented agents that get more resources across a different spectrum of things. Look, if someone's a, a one-person shop, it's going to be harder for them to be an expert. It's like, it's like someone trying to create an e-commerce store against fanatics. I mean, we have, we own one point three billion dollars of inventory that we regionally distribute throughout the world, you know, we, we have a structural advantage. I think the bigger agencies, you know, should have structural advantages. Right. So you point out some weaknesses, but that's just that's business. No, it's just business. business. Yeah, but remember, we have two sets of agents, right? Um, so to, just for the folks and for the students, so we're not talking past each other. We have contract advisors. And when I'm talking about consolidation in the market, I'm talking about consolidation in the market for the individuals who are doing their team contracts. Marketing advisors, you know, where we're doing our business is still disaggregated enough where it's fine. There's going to be mass consolidation there. But to your point, I think that's where we're going to see the, the, the massive increases um, in the things that we can do together on the marketing side. What keeps me awake at night um, is sort of the contract advisor side. Yeah, I mean, I think, too, with our agents, what we have seen, especially the larger ones, they are helping them even with their businesses, right? They are sure. assisting them with, are they doing the right thing with regards to their brand? So to Michael's point, I think it is true that they will have more scale as a result of sort of bringing it down, but also appreciate the risk. There is no question that is a risk. It sounds like there's... Um a, a bigger part of the pie to grow here to align yeah. uh, that that agent the agent groups uh, with what's what is happening with the player associations with the leagues with the brands. Um, so you know, Michael, the great collaborator, collaborator, you're up. Um, I uh, I think that I mean this has been really really interesting. Thank you all for the thoughts. One of the challenges as the players have had more power, of course, is that they have more exposure. And what I mean by that is uh, risk. So what are the, what, how are you helping the players protect themselves, you know, maybe from comments that they've made and uh, that could cause controversy and stuff like that? How are you helping them with that part? Yeah, so I'm sure you want me to take that one. I sure do. <laughs> so I, you don't I will, deal with any yeah, of that, I don't right? deal with any of it. But I will say there's two things around that. The first is we are certainly in a cancel culture, right? And so we have to make sure that our players are educated on how they are using social media, right? And that they're setting up appropriate boundaries. And we're teaching them about that, right? They do not, when you have 140 million followers, have the ability to just put out anything, right? And that's where the challenge is. And quite frankly, I don't think our players automatically recognize that, right? It, it didn't seem like a big deal to post something. But now they recognize they've got to think through, you know, the pros and the cons of the things that they post. All of them, that oftentimes the outcome doesn't actually represent the input. And they have to understand the connection between that. And so we have spent some time with them on that. The other part of it, if I, if I may take a few liberties, is the world of social media can be incredibly cruel. Yeah. 
So we have done a study on the things that are happening with social media and the comments and the angst and mm -hmm. the anxiety that it causes our players. Mm -hmm. You know, even from my standpoint, and very limited, and Michael teases me because I don't have enough followers, so I, I was I, say, I'm sorry, I was trying to encourage media. him to help me to grow my followership, but I have recognize that it's important to have these boundaries because some of the things that you read are really difficult to stomach. No, no. And so, yes, oh. yeah. Okay. And I'm the sorry, thing yeah. that's so interesting <laughs> about it is, I know you're sorry. <laughs> the thing that's so interesting about it is, is immediately when the first time that something terrible happened and I said, I can't believe this. I said, you're not supposed to read the comments. Like they all know this rule. You're not supposed to read the comments. I didn't know that rule. Those are the things that we have to teach them. But when we did our study, we looked at the things that people were putting on social media. It is horrific, not only in our sport for the men, but for the women, it's terrible. And I'm grateful that we have partners like Michael, like the partners we have in 2K that immediately go and shut those things down. We can go to them and say, we can't have that out there. This is damaging for our individual player brand. It's damaging for us as a collective. That has been really significant, and they have to recognize that, you know, even with all those things that are good about social media, they have to be protected, and part of it stems from their input as well. Now, here, here's, the, here's the good news, though. This is the definition of a high-quality problem. We have players that have become that much more important and powerful, yeah. that are building much bigger businesses, that have incredible marketing tools that they can go direct to consumer, whether it's in their communications, building their businesses. And as a result, as a result of that, they've got challenges. And so that's like, 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 to me, this is like what you dream of in business. I mean, there's no- This is I, what Michael dreams of. No, I think, I, yeah, this is, this is no, but I, I think if you, you're asked, right. if you asked, if you, you would have asked Braun 10 years ago, you know, if you could have 140 million followers, would you deal with X, Y, and Z? He'd say, of course, that's a high quality problem. The same thing for, you know, really any of the players in the NFL and the NBA, really any sports. I mean, these, they really have real marketing platforms. They use it to make the world a better place. They can use it to build their businesses. They can use it to communicate what they want. They can use it to make fun of D, which is something I enjoy easy. doing. It's easy. To and when you have much. 140 million followers, you don't have time to read the comments. I or, like can actually true. read the comments. Well. I mean, I think what's really also just kind of resonating for, for me is that in part the player associations are, I mean, you're like the coach of everything for the players. It's not just um, here's how you, you know, you're, you're, what's happening on the field, and, but it's like broader. And even like, you know, the, if they need to change agents, the, I, I, it's really fascinating. There's so, these guys give yeah. their players so much help. The amount of times dear Tamika will call me and say, hey, I need you to do this for this person, or hey, can you introduce me to that person? They're working in the front and behind the scenes yeah. every day, and there's no break from it. It's, it's a 24 seven role. Um, they're, they're working their asses off for, for their players. It's kind of amazing to watch. Well, I have, I have a question for you specifically. Um, obviously, Fanatics is growing like crazy. You recently raised uh, $700 million in December, which brings your valuation to three, $31 billion. Congratulations. So what is next for Fanatics, and how does it connect to player empowerment? Yeah, for us, we're in three primary businesses today. The business we started in, which is, is really merchandise, we call it commerce. We, that's a that's a six point three billion dollar business this year. Um, you know that business has tremendous growth ahead of it. We have you know it's mostly e-commerce, but we own thirteen hundred lid stores. We have um, you know we own Mitchell Ness. We have you know we have multiple brands, but the, the biggest business is the Fanatics website, the NFL shop, the NBA store, et cetera. Uh, we have great growth ahead there. We have our our collectibles and trading card business, which. We've only been in now for a little more than a year, and, and I couldn't be more bullish about the product innovation, the market innovation. We think there's great growth there. And then we just started in gambling. Uh, we actually took our first bets um, from mobile gaming yesterday in Tennessee, and uh, we're very ambitious in that area. So really what we think about is creating the only digital sports platform and really giving the digital sports fan anything they'd want to do. Uh, and so we love the three businesses we're in. There's a lot to do in these three businesses. We're not rushing into anything new over the next couple of years. We think we could 10x the company just in these three businesses. So wow. today we're, you know, if you count the rights that are moving into us, um, some of the NFL and NBA trading card rights that will launch, you know, over the next few years, um, the business is about $9 billion in, in, in revenue today. And, you know, there's so much growth just in, in the businesses, in, in the business that we're in. But like long term, we believe it's our role 
to innovate for the sports fan. It's our role to innovate for the player. And I think there's probably no company that wakes up and goes to bed more thinking about how do we do the best job that we can for the fan? How do we do the best job that we can for our partners? And how do we collaborate as closely as possible with the players? Because without everybody, we got nothing. Yeah, and I think there's some, there's some, um, there's some interactivity that you're thinking about too, um, around loyalty maybe, and. Yeah, no, look, we're gonna, you know, I don't think it's secret at this point. We, we think um, we have a chance to create a loyalty program that, you know, every real sports fan will die to be a part of. When you think about all the assets that we have at Fanatics, we have not only the three businesses we have, early access to trading cards and quick delivery merchandise and first releases of products and you know better odds in gaming and we have you know access we have deals with 3000 athletes and we can create dinners and we can create experiences and we can create you know you know you know we're, we're launching there's so many things that we're going to do within our loyalty program so our goal is to have you know fanatics have a multi-tiered loyalty program that um, really gives incredible experiences to fans. It's something we're very focused on. Think about like a company I look at with great admiration is American Express. They have multiple tiers of credit cards and multiple tiers of loyalty and they do a good job with that. And you know, I think we have um, you know, just a massive opportunity from, from loyalty as an example. That's gonna really support not only th the three businesses we have, but everything we do in the future. I think, so like we talked a little bit about the challenges of the, of the or the risks for the athletes and um, the player power obviously is not just on the business side it, and interacting with fans at the trade deadline for the NBA that just passed. We saw the most trades ever, 49. Uh, so, you know, how are you engaging with the league about these changes that you're seeing? Yeah, so it's a quite interesting dialogue. As you know, we are in the middle of CBA, so I won't go into grave detail, but what I will say is that for sure, we're seeing the power of the player, right? We're seeing that they're thinking about making their own decisions, quite frankly, not that they haven't been historically, but we're seeing that tremendous change in that marketplace. 49 is the most we've ever had, right? And so I think it does show the power that the player has. I also think that it shows the competitiveness of our league, right? We had a great first half of the season, and there are many teams that now feel like they have a playoff run. And so as they think about, do I just make an exchange here, make an exchange here, and I could go to the playoffs and then to the finals, it makes sense to do that. So I think it is increasing, too, the competitiveness of the game. Mm -hmm. But I think all of those dynamics are at play. Uh, so as you guys are looking into the future, um, what, what is the innovation that you're hoping to drive, whether that's, you know, fan engagement or technology like that that you you are most excited about um as luck would have it last night i was watching gray's anatomy because i'm that sensitive show. that way yeah. um that makes sense by the way tells a lot about me just me um and then you know anyway they were talking about uh one of the doctors was doing what was talking about an acl repair surgery where for the first time this doctor, instead of replacing ACL from, from a, a patellar tendon or somewhere else, some other tendon from your body, they were using this, this revolutionary technology where they were actually growing ACL, um, your own ACL in your body. Mm -hmm. We own that. We invested in that procedure in 2017 with a fantastic doctor from Harvard, connected with her uh, through, through our Harvard um, uh, medical research. Amazing technology, we put some money into it, a lot of others put some money into it. So, you know, watching that, you know, randomly pop up on this show last night was, you know, a little bit of a weird experience. But where do I see innovation for us? You know, in the same way that sort of Fanatics thinks about it, you know, on, on um, sort of a waterfall of, of opportunities. I think medical technology, medical innovation, things that we find out because of the, the business that our, our people are in, um, and being in an opportunity to, to grow that or scale that, if it's something that we think can have a revolutionary impact on their health and safety, that's what I think is gonna be one of the most exciting things in the future. So different than D, I was not sitting in bed cuddled up watching Grey's Anatomy. Well, I was, stop, I was you could actually, have called. I was actually out called. with Robert Kraft and, and, a, and a very smart basketball player learning from each other and, and trying to see how we can innovate our business, D. Gotta, Thanks for the call, no, yeah. I was sitting there by myself, um, it's fine. But, but, but um, you, you, you know, <laughs> For, for us, um, we're thinking about how to make the 
experience for the fan in everything we do better. Because nothing that we do today is near good enough, and we need to go through every part of our business and say, how do we do it better? And I think as you get bigger, one of the things you need to do is keep breaking shit to make it better, okay? And so we got a lot of that to do. I look, even in our biggest business, in our merchandise business, there are a thousand things that I look at that bother me. We figure out how to get packages faster, how to have more diversity of products, how to communicate with our fans better, you know, how to, so, and you can just go through business by business. So I think, you know, that's the job of our leaders. You know, we have 18,000 people now at Fanatics, and, wow. and people need to wake up and go to bed and say, how do we innovate for the fan? And I gotta tell you something, you know, we're, we're, you know I'm not remotely satisfied, we're never gonna be satisfied. Yeah. This is our 10-year anniversary at Sloan. You're, Happy anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, that's a, wow, that's 18,000 people. That's unbelievable. It is. And I, I would say for me, the technology that we are most excited about is what we're going to be able to use to grow the pie, right? Grow the pie for the league, grow the pie for the players. That's what's going to be significant for us. So using technology in that way will make a huge impact. And I think the other piece of that is growing our MBPA brand. You know, I just being in this role for the last year, it was shocking to me to learn that people didn't know about the PA. They didn't recognize that, that the PA is the players. That's the players. The league is the governors. And so the many times I've had to tell people what that is, so if there's some data analytics, et cetera, that can help us to grow our exposure, help us to grow the brand for the PA, that's something that I'm incredibly excited about. And I, I'm hopeful that the next time I can talk about the shift that we're seeing for our brand. I'm gonna take a couple questions from the audience. Uh, so this one is really interesting. As we know, some players choose to repre represent themselves. How does this affect the relationship with brands and how do leagues ensure these players are able to successfully market themselves? I mean, look, I, I, I've seen several players successfully represent themselves and I've seen several players unsuccessfully represent themselves. So I'd say it's a question of, does the player have the sophistication and then do they lean on uh, Tamik and Dee's organization for help? So as an example, Joel Embiid, who played for the team that I used to own part of the Philadelphia Sixers, represented himself in his last negotiation, but he leaned heavily on the, the um, Tamika's organization for help to make sure that he didn't miss a thing. And by the way, he was impossible. He represented himself really well. He didn't miss a thing. He drove us crazy and he got a great outcome. And so uh, that's a very successful outcome. I've also seen people have done a horrific job that I won't name. So I think it's a question of, does the player have it? Many do. Um, and then do they lean on the right resources, you know, whether it's from the unions or from other people, but it could definitely work well. Yeah, and our goal really at the union is to represent and assist the individual, mm -hmm. but it's also the collective, right? And so it is, our success is tied into their success. So whether it's in representation of them in determining their own contract, or quite frankly, whether they're partnering with, you know, Fanatics, for example. And then we have a deal with Fanatics as well. Like we've recognized that we do have to work together because all of that has to grow together. So I think we have found a really good way to combine our efforts there because the success for them individually is the success collectively as well. So do you have a specific question for you? Fantasy and sports betting have been huge drivers of NFL viewership, but many players seem resistant. Do you view this as an opportunity moving forward for players to lean in and build their brand as well as the NFLPA's group licensing power? Um, you know, I, I think that gambling, um, talk about headwinds, that's a whole nother conversation down the road. I, I think gambling certainly has driven fan engagement. Um, I think where, I think one of the reasons you see um, fan uh, uh, players staying away from even dipping a toe in that for a lot of reasons is because there is such a ambiguity between what the rules are. Like we have a gambling policy that has X, Y, and Z, but yet on the other hand, we've got a commercial agreement with the league where we're partners in gambling. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think that I think that in reality, we both, both the league and, and the players, are probably missing out because of the ambiguity um, in the rules. Both of us are missing out because no one really knows which rules, which rules govern. Um, we tell our players, obviously, to be very careful about the gambling space. Um, fantasy has been something that, you know, from, from the beginning of fantasy, man, just for some reason, our players just aren't 
like really into fantasy. And I think there's a couple of guys who, who like it, but as far as engaging fans on fantasy, weirdly, we have found that fans who are big fantasy sports people mm -hmm. really don't like real athletes being involved. I think part of the fantasy thing is you are the GM, you're the coach, you're the person making the decisions. And this idea that you would have an active player like advising you on those things kind of is a buzzkill. Um, so, I, you know, I, again, it, it's a growing category for us, but going back to the gambling piece, I think that's why there is such a hesitancy to, to, to even do it. I mean, we're, we're working through a morass of a issue right now, you know, between the league and us on where does the gambling policy start and where does the commercial uh, um, uh, agreement begin? But you know, that's the wonderful vagaries for boring lawyers, right? So here's another one, uh, maybe Tamika, you could, you could uh, take this one. Uh, what are the specific ways you are curating educational space, sorry, spaces to teach your athletes how to manage their money and build their platforms? Oh, that's a great question. And you know, that's the finances near and dear to my heart. So, you know, in addition to, we have our chief of player engagement here, Krista Chen, they are looking at how do we make sure that they can relate? How can they be engaged in terms of understanding finances? And again, as I started today, the difference between making money and having money, right? That's significant for them. So we have the experts come in and talk to them about that. Even at our Business Titan dinner, we had the CEO from Goldman Sachs, David Solomon, who came in and talked to them about that. I have also learned from our players that they love hearing from the governors. They want to hear how they've made money. They want to hear what are the things that they're doing. So practical application has also been significant. It's one thing to sort of teach them about credits and debits because they actually have people that are doing that, but they need to know how to ask the right questions. And so we're preparing them such that they can ask the right questions, but they also need to be able to relate. And part of their educational experience, from my perspective, is the exposure. By the way, and being able to meet with people like Michael gives you that. I was going to say, Jess, within, so Tamika took her job, I think, last January. Dee called me up and said, hey, I'd like you to meet a good friend of mine. Can we come see you? Dee brought Tamika to meet me. And within an hour of meeting her, Tamika informed me that the All-Star Game, which was next month, that, she, that I was going to be helping her to set up a dinner. And could I get great people to come to this dinner to meet with her players? And I had. Robert Kraft, I had David Salmon who runs Goldman Sachs, I had Magic Johnson who's obviously been very successful from a business perspective, and I had Andrew Sorkin who hosts CNBC, and I had Robert Smith who's richest African American you know, business person in the country actually, I think in the world, uh, at this dinner. Um, and that was Tamika's way of saying, hey, I've been, you know, I've been on this job for about a second, I've known you for about an hour, and by the way, I need you to help get great people to meet with our players. And I get calls like that from Tamika, from D all the time saying, how do we foster this learning? And that just makes everyone smarter, everyone better. By the way, I get a lot from that too, because I'm learning, I'm listening to these discussions, I'm taking takeaways from fanatics. And so every one of these are great two-way interactions. Yeah, it's not, I know, will it's also from each say, other. Michael, for sure, leads from the front, right? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons that we are in business with them is because they're innovative, but also that they're a partner in every sense of the word. He understands what our objectives are and he helps me to make sure that that's happening, right? He also exhibits the same values that our players exhibit. So when they think about what can they do to give back to the community, when they think about social justice, Michael is in there. When they think about you know, philanthropy, Michael is in there. Those are the traits that we want. And so teaming up with partners, because we get to choose who we want to do work with, right? That's why we have our group licensing. And so to be able to have partners that really, truly want to partner, I, I'm hoping I'm, I'm going to say that word partner and power to the player a lot today. I say family. Family that people are getting kids. That's the distinction. I'm not going to say anything nice. I was going to say, I was say nothing. 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 Nice. No, 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 no. Never come out of I don't want to say anything nice about Michael. Done. Yeah. Well, this, this has been a fantastic, sorry, a fantastic discussion. So I'm going to just share my takeaways because I learned a ton. So let, let me start at the top. The first is um, the comment about the impact of NIL. And that's kind of remains to be seen and I think is collectively something that the professional sports industry needs to be thinking about. Yep. So we continue to have this growing of the pie, Michael, as you said, to bring people together. 
Uh, the second is around this learning from challenges. The fact that one team, in many ways, <laughs> generated out of a lockout, then the group licensing and the partnership with Michael, that's just really powerful. And I think seeing that growth is really amazing. Um, the investing that you all are doing that is going to support the players into the future with, with player safety, your ACL example and so rare is just really, really powerful. And then um, uh, the last thing here that I took away, I love that you did that study on the social media of mental health. And I think we should all be reminded, don't read the comments. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Hey, can I say one more thing? Hey, for the, sure. students, for the students out there, because I'm a, I'm a degenerate, I just keep teaching and teaching and teaching, yeah. hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, I think one of the best things that you do, uh, Jessica, not only with this, this event and uh, what you've always done is have a large input of students being a part of this. Um, so, you know, if there's questions, comments, uh, if, if they're nice comments, send them. If they're not, don't, don't send them. Um, but you can find me on LinkedIn and um, I think we're looking to all of you to really take us to the next level uh, in the business of sport. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Thank Jessica. You. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, our program will resume in just a few minutes. Please begin taking your seats at this time. As a courtesy to the presenters and the folks seated around you, please do take a moment to silence your mobile devices.
Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Uh, my name is Khalid McCaskill, and I'm a first year MBA at MIT Sloan. It is my pleasure to introduce our panel, Entrepreneurship for Impact, Athletes Making a Mark. Our panelists today, Sue Bird, WNBA champion, Olympic gold medalist, and co-founder of A Touch More and Together. Brian Westbrook, Managing Director at Athlete Entrepreneurship Network. Lindsay kagawa Colas, Executive Vice President of Talent and the Collective at Wasserman. And our uh, panel will be moderated by Michelle Steele from ESPN. Uh, the panel will run for 45 minutes and we'll leave around 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag Athlete Entrepreneurship and uh, questions will then be selected by the moderator. And with that, Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Khalid. Good morning, everybody. Um, so because the NFL Combine is this week in Indianapolis, and I have a bunch of colleagues who are in, Indi in Indiana right now, clearly the Combine is about the NFL draft. I decided to start this panel out with, wait for it. You guys, just be on the edge of your seats here with the sound. Do you hear that? That? There you go. I do my own sound effects. <laughs> Brian, when you hear that sound, does it, you get a little chill? I do. It took <laughs> me back to 2002 when I got drafted. Oh, yeah. A long, 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 long time ago, but it was a great and exciting time of life, of course. And 18 years ago when you were in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I know. Don't remind me. I saw, okay. Some, okay. I saw Robert Kraft in the back, so <laughs> not a great memory for me. A little you trash talk backstage. Of course. But the reason that I started out with that draft sound is because if you could draft people to talk about our tit the title for this panel, which is Athletes Making an Impact, I think you would take all three of these people in the first round because they all have amazing and interesting and different experiences to bring to the table when it comes to what is next for athletes after their playing career. Sue Bird, how is retirement treating you? Pretty good. <laughs> I'm not saying I should have done it sooner, but it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, so for two of the athletes on the panel, Lindsay, I know you're a college athlete, but I'm, I'm, gonna, focus, I'm gonna focus on the pro. <laughs> that, that's news, I'm gonna tweet that out. Lindsay, Lindsay Cole. Yeah, retired, Zero not retired. coming back to the game. And by the way, if either of you, <laughs> if either of you are close to pulling a Tom Brady, maybe like back in, back out, you know, let me let me know now. We're, Absolutely we're, not. No. Okay. These knees aren't meant to play football anymore. My like, Brandon Stewart <laughs> left the storm. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> so when I, I used to live in Boston, I'm in Chicago right now, but I was here from 2013 to 2016, and Tom Brady was someone that we did cover quite a bit with the Patriots, and. At, at the beginning of my tenure with uh, New England, he sort of wore it as a badge of honor that he wasn't really on social media, he wasn't doing a ton outside of football, it was all about the championships, and I feel like that was the mindset inside, certainly inside the Patriots locker room, but things have changed quite a bit uh, since then. For both of you, the pro athletes on this panel, at what point in your career, you know, during that tenure also, he started getting on social media. You saw TB12 pop up at Patriot Place, which is his own branded you know, lifestyle and fitness and nutrition um, outgrowth. But for you guys, at what point in your career did you think, I'm a brand, I wanna develop this, I'm thinking about, I wanna think about the future and what's next? Um, so the quick answer to your question is, um, very quickly, the life of a women's basketball player is usually that you play in the WNBA in the summer and then you go overseas to play in the winter. So it was around 2014, I stopped playing overseas. And that gave me this unique opportunity to keep playing. And I obviously ended up playing for another you know, six, seven, eight years. But I had my off seasons now to, to maybe start to figure out like what else am I interested in? So that's the quick answer. Um, it's a little more complicated mm. in that at that point in time, what was I seeing? I was seeing women's basketball players go into coaching and I was seeing women's basketball players going into broadcasting. I kind of knew I didn't want to coach, simply we were joking about it, simply because of the life of it all. Like I just didn't want to have like the same exact life that I just had. So I was like, all right, let me try some broadcasting because was, it was like one of two things. 
Yeah. And that's what I did. So I dipped my toe in some broadcasting, tried some college stuff, um, did that in my off seasons. And that's when I started to think to myself, all right, again, like what can I try to do now that'll, that'll help maybe give me an idea of what I want to do when I actually do retire. Um, but then, oh, actually I'll add the, Dev the Denver Nuggets front office position that I had. That was part of that kind of exploration as well. Can you talked about that a little bit? Yeah, it was literally just an opportunity to do something in my off season that I never would have been exposed to otherwise. Um, m very much a learning experience and I learned that it's really hard and <laughs> I don't know if I want to do it forever. Um, but yeah, what I was going to say was, um, oh, but then life changed. Times changed. I think how we look at women's athletes, especially in team sports, has changed, and that has directly impacted me and what now is possible. So really the answer is I did start to think about it. I had no idea what was possible, and now that's all changed. So I look at it much differently now than I did even just, gosh, even just three years ago, four years ago. I think the Nuggets experience is, even though you know, it was something that you figured wasn't for you, that is still beneficial. That is still helpful, oh. you know, in terms of informing, okay, I don't want to do that. It's right? not that I don't want to do it. I'm actually still open to it. There, there, were, there were things I really, I think if I did go into professional sports, it yeah. would be in some sort of GM front office position. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I totally steal, I stole some stuff, took that right back to Seattle. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is how you do it? A lot of times in the WNBA, we're just not exposed yeah. to some of the, for lack of a better, higher level because we don't have the amount of people that they have on staff. You know, I want to get into the businesses that you are in a little bit later on the panel, but when you were talking, um, it reminded me of a, a Steve Jobs quote where he said, he talked about entrepreneurialism and running your own business, and he says, you know, don't get into businesses that you're not passionate about, because running a business is really hard. And if you're not waking up and you're excited every day, you're not going to be successful, or you're much less likely to be successful. So we'll talk about your passion mm -hmm. projects in a little bit. Brian, how about for you? You know, when you were playing in the NFL, of course, glorious career, Eagles Hall of Fame. At what point, I mean, when you're in it, football is your life, right? You know, at what point and how challenging was it to kind of not think about that and try to plan for what's next? You know, when you think about professional athletes, and Sue and I were just talking about this, your whole goal in life, your whole objective, everything that you're doing is pointed towards being a professional. And when you reach that level, that's all you're thinking about. And I'll never forget my, my rookie year, I'm walking into the facility during training camp, and one of my mentors, Troy Vincent, who's, who's in the league office now, stops me and says, listen, you need to start thinking about what you're gonna do next. On your first day. Yeah, we were, we were still early. We were in training camp, and I'm like, well, Troy, I've literally just achieved my dream by getting drafted <laughs> and being able to play in this league, and I'm trying to figure out how to stay here. And he was like, well, you have to start figuring out now what you want to do next. But here's a problem. At 22 years old, you don't listen to that. You say, okay, I hear you. You just don't listen to it. And then as you age in the league, you start to see guys that you play with, and they start exiting. And you see what happens to them. Mm. Some of the guys go on to great careers and other things, and some of the guys just kind of flounder. And at that point, you start to say, okay, what's next for me? What's the thing that I want to do? Where do I want to head with my career, how do I want to position myself? The, the stats are kind of crazy. The stats say that it takes professional athletes between five and seven years to figure out what they want to do next, which is a long, a long time. The, it's longer than the average NFL career. Absolutely, it's much longer. The, the, the staggering stat even added to that is most professional players only have two to four years worth of savings. So there's a gap between how much money you have left in your bank account and the time it takes you to find what you want to do next, to find that purpose and passion. And that's a lot of problems for a lot of professional athletes. Oh no, absolutely. And you know, you're talking about um, the pathway, right? Of what other guys have done. You know, in Chicago at least, the sort of tried and true path for athletes after retirement, or even a little bit when they were playing, you'd see Michael Jordan having a restaurant. Now he has his own business empire, but you know, Walter Payton had a restaurant, Ditka's was a big thing. Like those are very capital, you're talking about savings, those are very capital intensive businesses that are also hard to sustain and yeah. like don't have a very high level of success all the time. You know, you see car dealerships sometimes, um, endorsement deals. Lindsay, when you were advising uh, Sue in 2014, when she was starting to think about this, how did you guys weed out the business opportunities and how did you figure out, okay, this is, this is our plan, right? Yeah, I mean the hardest thing about representing Sue 
and she won't blush here, is that she's actually good at everything <laughs> that she does. And so, you know, there's a pickleball demo later. Oh, I saw it. Are you going to be involved? <laughs> I saw it. Okay, I'll we'll see what happens. So that's the hard thing, is that right. whatever comes, if Sue decides, oh, this is sort of interesting. Sue's too good. Yeah. It's, it's possible she's going to be really good at it, but then it's about how much time, right? So Sue had done a really good job of saving money mm -hmm. from having played in Russia, played overseas for a really long time, which is not easy. You miss birthdays, you miss your family, right? Like, did you miss the birth of your nieces? I did. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of stuff, right? And it's a huge sacrifice. But I think a lot of women's players who went overseas for all those years, best case scenario, you've saved enough to do what you're passionate about when you're done playing, mm -hmm. right? So, so you, I, that's what you advise your clients. Like, have a little bit of a cushion, right, so that you can have some time to you want to you want to do that what was the phrase I think Diana used it a lot about we're doing this so that we can do what we want but it was very catchy yeah I don't remember yeah me neither <laughs> so you know in the best case scenario you have that flexibility right where you exit your playing career and you can take time to figure it out starting that earlier is smarter right because it's easier to get your next job when you when you're in your job but it's also when people want to talk to you when they want to offer you opportunities so Sue always has a ton of opportunities it's just about what's interesting and then being able to follow that, right? And then figure out how it all fits together. What Sue sort of ends up doing, or the puzzle of how those things fit together, may not exist, mm. right? She's actually like a pilot. Women, women athletes, by almost every measure in everything they do, and the business that I operate every day is at its core entrepreneurial. Because you are mostly creating from scratch. A lot of those guys you mentioned, right. maybe it's their money, Maybe it's not. Yeah. Sue Maybe said it, earlier, there's, there's no blueprint. She's right. making the blueprint exactly. as she goes, which is it's, it's hard to do. And we're doing it without a lot of funding. That's right. We're doing it with people who have to be convinced to invest by showing them the numbers. They have to feel it. They have to believe in it. They have to see it as an investment and not as charity. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what we fight really hard to do. And people are starting to see those returns. But it's, it's a growing and young business around women. You know, I want to get into the branding opportunities and building your brand and how you identified your passion projects. But you mentioned Russia, and you were on a panel right before this about Brittany Griner. You know, Lindsay represents the elite talent um, in women's basketball. And uh, I was so taken with the story, and I think everybody in the country was, with her detention in Russia. Two, two things on that, which is, this is a life-changing, I mean, you are in, you're in an international hostage. It is a life-changing, game-changing event. How is Brittany, how has she changed? And how does she, the, the, the ecosystem or the landscape of how she saw her career playing out, how did that change as a result of this? So that's a, that's a lot to cover, but. Well, I wouldn't be a really good agent if I didn't say you gotta wait for her first interview because that's gonna be a really interesting question, I think, for her to answer. Maybe it'll be with you, we'll see. <laughs> Figure it out. Yeah. Um, Barbara Walters right here. But having been around her quite a bit yeah. since she came home, you know, and having been there in the moments when she first set foot on American soil, she's still the same person. Mm -hmm. um, I think that being a hostage for 10 months has a way of focusing you and helping you understand what's really important, and I think that you can feel that in her. I think there's a joy, and she's got more good days than bad days, but you know, it's a battle. She's been through something really, really hard, but what she's also done, and I think what she realizes, you know, when, when I first had a conversation with her when she came back, about her statement just saying thank you to everyone who had worked to bring her home, she is the one who said, I am coming back to play basketball. My plan was to not talk about it mm -hmm. that day. We were not gonna talk about that. She brought that up and she wanted to do that. She wanted to get back to her team. She wanted to get back to the WNBA that supported her, that showed up for her in frankly ways they always have. But now we have, and on the last panel I gave Elizabeth Lindsay, who's here, credit for I think explaining it this way that the WNBA and its athletes have been incredibly cool and a great product for a really long time, but it's almost been in a bubble. The problem is not the product. The problem is the visibility. Mm. And what Brittany has done and what people like Sue are doing 
in other ventures and being at places like this is, is piercing that bubble, where people now are seeing the greatness that has existed. And so the opportunities that we're pursuing with Brittany now, with right. you know, wellness at the center of that, she has to be well, she has to feel good, she has to be okay, and that's work. The like my, mental health? Yeah, absolutely, sort of? absolutely. Okay. But the projects that we're pursuing, at their core, she's still the same person. Mm -hmm. You know, the campaigns we built early on around We Are BG and about the, the campaigns, the, um, the Heart and Soul Drive, which was around collecting shoes to distribute to unhoused folks in Phoenix, that became a 12 WNBA team market strategy. And part of it was because we needed to have a campaign that wasn't specifically about her case because of so many of the layers we were dealing with. But also, it's exactly who she's always been. She just didn't have the media coverage. And so here we are at a moment where she does have quite a bit. And she is really invested in using that and using these opportunities, whether it be book or doc or scripted, all kinds of offers to make the world a little bit better for other people. That's WNBA players, that's women athletes, that's black women, that's queer people. It's anyone who's been marginalized and it's also specifically detained Americans. Right. Because through her campaign, what we were fighting really hard to do is make sure that people understood this is an American problem and it is a patriotic act to care about bringing Americans home and all of us should care about that. That's nonpartisan. That's for everyone to care about. And so we're going to continue that work, and that's going to continue to come to life through what she wants to spend her time on. But to answer your question, that's not the hostage part is new. We all learned about hostage diplomacy when Brittany was taken on February 17th, and the rest of the world found out in early March when it became public. But it's exactly who she's always been. It's frankly who WNBA players are. Um, I was telling Lindsay this backstage. But uh, I was watching one of the interviews with Roger Carstens, who was the ambassador, who was the representative from the Department of State who rescued, rescued her, yep. right? And one of the line he had, you know, I am Roger Carstens, and I'm going to butcher it right now, but, you know, I'm a representative of the Department of State, and on behalf of Joe Biden and Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, I'm here to take you home. And it, I just, I, I read it and thought, this is out of a movie. You know, this is going to be like the ultimate scene one day. And, and anyway, I can get into this more. But on the rush, playing basketball in Russia and playing basketball overseas, we know basketball is a global sport for men and for women. Are you seeing fewer players? Period, go overseas. Obviously not Russia. But like just not doing that anymore or doing that less. Yeah, I think it's, a, and Sue can speak to this too, it's a function of a few different factors. The market overseas, because of the economy generally globally, has constricted. Mm -hmm. There's less opportunities. You know, now Turkey, we've seen all these earthquakes. We just lost one of the highest paying teams in Turkey, in Hatay, which is, has been devastated by these earthquakes. Right. That team is gone and was driving a lot of the market there. There are still players that do go overseas. Brianna Stewart is considered by many to be the top player on the planet right now. And she's right now playing at Fenerbahce, you know, in Turkey. People can you know, talk about the safety of that decision, but it's definitely about the money, but it's also, it's a really long off season that especially for the younger players who need to program that off season with training, you know what it's like as an athlete. If that's not built for you, it's a long, the WNBA off season is about eight months. Yeah. To maintain a high level of training and fitness and just attention that's a lot, and so some people do choose to go overseas because they just need to play basketball and have some of that structure. She went for a shorter season, so we're starting to see that. There's also a lot more movement you know, in the WNBA to try and compensate players in other ways to keep them home. Right. We can talk on another one-hour panel about whether or not that's working, but really the marketplace is also starting to provide more opportunity just from a commercial standpoint because people are finally coming to understand that these women are terrific investments. Um, Brian, I want to bring you into the conversation because you work with startups and entrepreneurs. Can I ask you what sort of got you into that and why that sort of is a passion project for you, tra transitioning athletes to becoming entrepreneurs and doing their own thing? Yeah, you know, but just for myself, becoming an entrepreneur, you know, I saw my parents work 40 years. My mom worked for the government. My dad worked for a bank. And after 40 years, they were like, they shake your hand and say, thank you. See you later. Sure. And you just wonder those 50, 60 hour weeks, you know, if you were putting that towards something that you owned. 
something that was yours, something that you had direct impact all the time on, where could we have been? And for so many minorities, that, for a long time, that wasn't even an option, that wasn't even a thought. It was go work for someone else and figure it out. And now, you know, just because the times have changed, you're seeing more minorities become entrepreneurs. And when you think about players, I saw guys transition out of sport. I've seen guys go into the good things. I've seen guys and, and girls go into the bad things. And I wanted to make sure that we were having conversations about athletes, both male and female, transitioning properly. Mm. About them transitioning and using their network, building their network so they can be successful after the game, after the sport. And truly, as we all kind of understand, that starts while you're playing. You mentioned it, Lindsay. You, that starts when you have all the attention on you. That starts with building your network when you have an opportunity, when people are calling you back. I tell these young guys all the time that um, as soon as you retire, your phone stops ringing immediately. And it happens very quickly. Sue, so it hasn't happened for you yet. It won't happen for you. <laughs> but it happened for me. As soon as I retired, the phone stops ringing. And now you have to have an opportunity to go out there and find work. And so with that, we've built this network. It's called the Athlete Entrepreneur Network. And the whole purpose is to help educate, to help empower, uh, to help connect our athletes so that the transition is smoother. We want our athletes to understand uh, entrepreneurship. We want them to understand business. We want to connect them with thought leaders, business leaders, and it's led by athletes. So it's that, that locker room feel. So now we have women and men that can leave the sport and jump right into something. And they're not worried about how much money do I have in savings. They're connecting the dots from the people that they've met and the networks that they've built while, while playing. Are you seeing the coaches around the game, the front offices, change in their approach and their mindset as it relates to athletes wanting to build their brands? I mean, I thought it was mind blowing to me to see Travis Kelsey and Jason Kelsey doing a podcast about the Super Bowl, a game in which they were playing in the week they're preparing for the Super Bowl. Now, would Andy Reid would have let you guys do that in no. Philadelphia? Is that like Andy? Andy was always—he probably still is anti-social media, anti. Andy's old school. He's he's the old school coach. But some of these young coaches, they have to accept it. They have to. Times are changing. Players are now in business much earlier. Players are understanding that instead of paying me a check for an endorsement, I want equity in your company. And so now that I can organically promote. Aquafina water as I drink it and I'm taking pictures. That's what <laughs> ownership looks like. That's what players have to be educated on. And that's what we're seeing now, both in the, the female game and the male game. That's what's going on. That's what we should be doing, trying to find ways to not just collect checks while we're getting rich by playing the game. We need to create a legacy. We need to collect checks for a lifetime. That's what we need to start thinking. And coaches, they'll, they'll adjust to it. The old school coaches will be phased out at some point as well. That's what happens, right? The transfer portal hits harder. That's it. Too. That's it. That means something. And it's starting at a younger age. Mm -hmm. It's starting at the college age. You know, forget about the pro. I mean, maybe by the time you reach the pros, it'll be too late to start your own brand. You start high school. Yeah, you start in high school, right. maybe even before that. But how much is NIL changing the recruiting game for the college athlete? I think social media changes it too. Though. I mean, I think part of yeah. it is social media, part of it is NIL. And the name, image, and likeness, how do you control that? That's super important, but Melinda, you see it all the time. Yeah. I mean, the transfer portal too, right? Yeah. And, you know, different collectives that are just funneling booster money. And look, I'm, I'm an athlete agent. I want athletes to get paid. But I also was a college athlete who only really came to understand the resources available where I went to school as a junior senior and stayed for a fifth year to really figure out how to take advantage of that network. Going to college has value beyond just getting paid and I'm not trying to make an argument for kids not getting paid, I think they should, but we need to provide some structure, right? The companies they're investing need to understand what it means for their business so it's not just a one-off. And the athletes, I think to the work that you do every day, need to be educated yeah. about simple stuff like you gotta file taxes, mm -hmm. what are the questions I should be answering, but like am I passionate about this? And Again, to your point, is it just about collecting, for most of these kids, a $500 check? Or should they be making sure they get an off-season internship? Right? And I see it as a vehicle for the, for the most elite, and we represent a couple of them. They do very, very well financially. And their business plans function the same way you know, as a Sue Bird with a little more input from you know, a head coach, because we have to work around that schedule. But the athletes we represent at NIL, we sort of treat and build their businesses the same way as our pros. 
But I think by and large, the piece that's missing is really helping kids understand the opportunity holistically, not just collecting the check. Are we going to see a change in the elite of women's college basketball as a result of coaches, as a function of coaches embracing that aspect of it, embracing I, I think for the players sa becoming for the fans. savviest kids and, and for the kids who have agents coming into school, I do think we'll see that effect because some people are doing a lot better. Some environments and at certain schools are better. Right. You know, is it a better royalty with their group licensing deal? Is it more integration? Do you have a section at your bookstore that's dedicated to you? There are ways to do this. It's not just under the table, sort of funny money. You can do it in a way that builds the business and the kid gets a heck of a lot smarter. Right? And that connects to boosters in ways that are meaningful long term from a legacy perspective, like your job when you're done playing, not just a check to collect and make sure you have to file for $500 that year. Mm. But so, I, yes, the answer is yes, I do think it's, it's going to affect and already is. People are getting paid to go places. It's beyond just who's the shoe brand. Right. Right. It's beyond just do they win. Kids are looking at this like a business. You know, staying on the uh, women's sports landscape. Uh, there's a stat here that women's sports only receive 4% of all sports media coverage. And you're in that space now, uh, right, Sue? Can you talk a little bit more about what you're trying to do to counter some of those uh, headwinds and the, your media company? Yeah, so the media company is called Together. Um, underneath that is um, the production company that myself and my partner Megan are a part of, which is a touch more. Um, and that was the reason that Alex Morgan had the idea. It's the reason she called myself, Simone Manuel, Chloe Kim, to start this production company, which is now more of like a media commerce company. Um, it's to get women's stories out there. It's to tell stories of girls. It's the see it, be it moments. It's to create those because the you know, historic media wasn't doing that for us. I, you know, when people ask me all the time, like, oh, who was your favorite player growing up? I didn't know any women's players' names. I was lucky that somebody took me to a 1995 women's national team game and I got to see Jen Azy for the first time. Otherwise, I would have said, you know, Larry Bird for natural reasons um, or, you know, He's John uncle, Starks. Right? Yeah, because my uncle. Yeah. Um, I actually got to tell him that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so it's to change all of that. And, you know, kind of circling back or touching on what we were talking about before, when I was kind of, sort of, realizing I, basketball wasn't going to last forever, and I said there was coaching and there was broadcasting. Who at that point was creating content as a former female athlete? Who was you know, in that position to do that? And to be honest, I actually I love being in front of the camera. I enjoy it. I find that broadcasting kind of, when it's live, it gets your juices going. Not quite the same as like a national championship game or anything like that, but there's something there where like you have one shot. You can't mess up, and that's exciting, and I have fun. I love producing. It speaks to me. It's, it's, it's something that was a part of my career. I'm a point guard. I orchestrate. It's like what I do. I've got my fingers over it. That's what producing is in my mind. I discovered this when Megan and I did um, our IG live show over the pandemic. But we started to have like segments and like we were on the clock. I was like, you know, I'd be nudging her like, hey, you have one more mini. You better wrap, wrap it up, wrap it up because we got to move on to the next, <laughs> you know? And it really, that's when I really realized. And how amazing would it have been if there was somebody else whose footsteps I could have followed at 34 when I stopped playing overseas and I could have already started this process, but I didn't know. I had no, like, I had no idea. So together, and a touch more, what it represents is a way for, yes, for me, as now a retired player, to help you know, create a path for others, to get people's stories out, to be behind the camera. Absolutely, it's my way of um, I think all of our ways of paying it forward in these ways. But it's also like I get to creatively kind of like, you know, have fun with it. I now, you mentioned being passionate. Yeah. If I woke up every day having to do something else, I don't know. But when I wake up, I'm like, ooh, that would be a good story. They like hit me all the time. And I really enjoy that part of it. So that's the long answer to your question. And with the media company, are you guys doing deals with larger, you know, let's say an ESPN or any other, any other of the networks? How does that actually work and how do you guys fund yourselves? Yeah, um, well from the start we got funding and that's how we started, so that was great. Magnet's been an amazing partner. Um, and Magnet? then from there, it's, yes, Magnet. Okay. And then from there, it's, it's pretty much operates the way I feel like you would think of a production company operating, right? Like you might have a story you wanna tell and then you try to find either maybe a brand sponsorship situation where you know 
Are we using Aquafina today? Yeah, Aquafina. Maybe Aquafina, Aquafina shows up. Right. Hey, yeah, there's a water. lot of <laughs> you know, oh, water yeah. sponsored That's us. Right. Yeah. Um, and we can get it out that way. Or we're starting to get into longer form. Um, and that's where you start to do, you know, pitch meetings with different networks. Um, so it can, it can, it can show itself in, in many ways, but we're, we are definitely on that train full go. And uh, sorry. Sorry. Are there other pro production companies that you're kind of following in their footsteps or who have done it the right way that you want I mean, to model yourself after? I do, I do think the, the natural comparison is with uninterrupted because right. it was right. started by an athlete. It's telling all these stories. You can go on their platform and see a story about X, Y, and Z. They also now have you know, longer form things. But I think what we're finding is we're so much different and more dynamic. And it's not to, I, I, we're partners with uninterrupted with Love Is, so it's not to hate on uninterrupted. But I don't know, there's something special about female athletes, about women's athletes. Um, there's a lot in that, in that recipe mix that we've all, the, the lives we've lived and we've gotten to experience different things. And I think it's important to have those women in the room that experience talks and it has value. And I think that's what's gonna end up separating together. Mm. Uh, and for both of you guys, how do you sift through, and, and did you sit down and say, uh, these are the top five things I like. These are the top five things I'm passionate about. What is that process for both? I can answer very quickly. Like, I mean, my agent happens to be up here. Like, I'm very lucky to be <laughs> <laughs> represented by Lindsay, by Wasserman, in that they ask you these questions, they let you mull on them, and then they also provide direction. I mean, you can't, there's no way. I, what are I, these, I want to know these questions. Just, <laughs> what are you interested in? Okay. I mean, we were actually joking. It's like, as athletes, like, we are used to getting... You said this, Brian, like Ask we're used to getting asked the question. Right. And so then when we have to be like the one thinking of things on our own, it doesn't always come so naturally. But then at the same time, we do have this value and this experience and this like wealth of knowledge in this whole other way that has nothing to do with a boardroom or anything corporate that we bring to the table. And it's just about like taking that all and finding ways to like mold it into this path that what is unique to each athlete. But again, I'm really lucky. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> for like people around me that help like guide me and nudge me and like push me and like well this might be good or that might be good or I don't know if that would interest you it's a, it can be as simple as that what's so funny with that that's rooted in sorry if I cut you off no, you're um, fine. you know representing women athletes we'll take the credit when it's given thank you and thank you to our team who's here supporting um, you know representing women athletes is complicated it, it's it's beautifully complicated but it's always had to be about the whole person by necessity, it, things were not easy, right? Like we had to cultivate and think about what matters, what are you interested in? We have to be, as I said, very, very entrepreneurial. And, and we are, you know, have to wake up every day being, just by nature of our existence, political. So a lot of our work is around social justice, political action. It's about rabble rousing and, you know, getting people to pay attention to what we know matters. And so we get to know our clients as people first mm -hmm. because we have to do that work, right? To make people pay attention, right. we have to be in that work together. So we probably have the advantage of coming into a relationship and you know, transitioning to what's next, knowing Sue and what she cares about pretty well. And, and that, I think, is, I'd like to call it a luxury. It comes with work, obviously, but we've worked on stuff that it's not about transaction or commercial value, it's about purpose and values. Right. I have a great example. Brian, we will let you talk, I promise. <laughs> um, when the WNBA was in the bubble, you know, very famously, we wore the Boat Warnock t-shirts. Um, when that idea was kind of like just getting going, the, my first phone call was to Lindsay, because here was a situation where like, I think I knew this was the right thing, and I felt like it was, but at the same time, like, I needed guidance. and. In that moment, boom, I get to call Lindsay. She gets to help me like whittle it down and figure things out and ask tough questions. And you need that guidance, I think, as an athlete because, like I said, clearly we had the idea, we were on the right track, but then you need someone to help you like mold it and fit it in. And I think that's like a nice little, it's analogous to what you, and, and this is where I'll hand it off to you, to what you might come across when you are starting to figure things out. You kind of know, mm -hmm. you need somebody to like help you out. You know, it's funny you say that because, you know, I'm, I'm part of my athlete entrepreneur network is part of a bigger business called Underdog Venture Team. And when you talk about molding it, you know, as athletes, we kind of, we know we need to get to 10, but we're at a one. 
We got to figure out sometimes how to take that first step. And my, my neighbor, Dan Mannix, who's our co-founder, you know, he, he built a branding, a marketing, a, a, a business around being able to help. We, we have advisory. You know, we, we do a lot of different things. We do events as well. And then we have the Athlete Entrepreneur Network. But when we thought about it, we said we want to help minorities. We want to help minorities have ownership. We want to invest in 66% um, of our companies will be either female-led or BIPOC-led companies. That was important. That was important to us. That's important to our CEO. Mm. You know, those are things that when you talk about finding your passion, right. you have to dig in deep inside and see what's important to you. To me, what was important is helping empower athletes make better decisions, help athletes be prepared for what's next, make sure that athletes are ready, and use what you have. Use your social media to your advantage. Use your endorsement. Use your sponsor. Use your network to your advantage. And unfortunately, and I'm sure you've seen this too, so many athletes don't. So many athletes are like, you know, I'm just kind of floating. And then when it's over, they're stuck. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's, it's just too late. Yeah, finding, finding your passion and knowing your why is so important. And the how is almost not irrelevant, but you can figure out the how once you know your why. That can inform everything else. You know, one thing you're also very involved in, Sue, is fashion. I'm not going to ask you who you're wearing. I do like your sweater. Thank you. <laughs> um, but how did that come about? Uh, so, yeah, not, not in necessarily like a traditional way. Um, it's not like I have from birth been like all about the fashion and, you know, on the websites and looking at the next trend. It's not that. For me, what fashion represents is being uniquely yourself um, and finding comfort in your clothing that then allows you to branch out in this other way as your authentic self. So mm. that's where I get excited around fashion and that's now what has become kind of my, for lack of a better lane within it. Um, had a lot of help from, again, my partner Megan who helped open my eyes because I feel like a lot of times um, what we all come across are all kind of you know, bang our heads against the wall of, oh, I don't know, I'm nervous, is it me? I don't know if I'll be, and it's like, you just need someone to, to nudge you again, and to like just, maybe this is like the story of my life, I need some nudges. Um, <laughs> but I think a lot of people can resonate with that. And, Respond to coaching well. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so that's really, that's really where, what fashion has become. It's about me really fully representing myself, and then with that, I'm able to sit on a panel up here and be comfortable. I'm not worried about if my feet hurt, I'm not worried about what I'm wearing, and I can just talk to everybody and kind of be natural in that way. So that's really the bent, and I would love to, so you bring stuff up, there's definitely some stuff in the works, whether it's with Together or Touch More, we're working on things where I would love to be able to not only give that to other adults, because I think it's been wonderful for me, um, but also trying to get to younger generations in that way. Like I think about my draft pictures. I mean, Lindsay, you kind of brought it up. It's like earlier, like some of the clothes that, that I was in earlier in oh, my I career. Oh, I wish we had the pics. Oh my God. <laughs> like so, I can see the discomfort. Really? And yeah, and like who knows? I mean, it all is, it's like, it's just clothes, right? But Megan always says, it's like, but we all wear them every day. So some people are like, oh, fashion, what's the big deal? You wear clothes every day. It is a big part of how you present yourself, right? And I think with that, when I speak to myself, I think of those early years, and I'm like, yeah, no wonder I didn't come out as gay. Like, clearly I was just a very uncomfortable person. Like, look at that face. She just looks like, oh, what am I doing in this? So I, like, wasn't comfortable with myself. But I'm like, oh, imagine somebody had helped me figure that out earlier. You know, um, and this actually does tie into this panel because, again, this is another way in which I would love to pay it forward, not just to, you know, former athletes, but really anybody. And this is part of, like, what I'm really excited about in terms of creating content. Yeah, I, and um, I feel like fashion and basketball just go, have gone hand in hand oh, yeah. for so long. For football, I think it's starting a little bit more. I can't, uh, the name of the running back escapes me right now, but there's a Washington Commanders running back who did the big hat. Um, and, you know, everyone laughed when they saw that photo of the big hat in the locker room. And then, like, 24 hours later, SVP had the big hat on yeah. SportsCenter. You saw, like, every other media person. You actually saw other, other football players latch on to that. And you realize when you're playing, that is why you need to think about the future when you're playing because you have your peak leverage at that point and your peak visibility at that point. 
At first, I thought it was a joke. A joke. I don't think it's a joke. I think they are selling those big hats. I don't know what brand they've uh, partnered with. Of course, they're selling them. If it's on TV, there. Of course, but, they're selling them. Yeah. Isn't that? Why? I mean, when you were playing Brian, would that have would that have been okay? Like. No, 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 I wouldn't have been wearing it, but that's, you know, my fashion is, is designed right, by my wife. Whatever she puts on the bed, that's what I wear. That's how my fashion is determined. She's the, influ the ultimate influencer. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think sports and culture and fashion are all intertwined at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you, you watch, when you watch TNT, they're watching guys come into the locker room. Same type of thing when you watch the pregame shows. They're watching people and girls and, 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 and then the guys coming into the locker room. So you can see what they have on. They're making fun of them. They're saying it's a great choice. It's all part of it. And again, that's some of the athletes now saying, I want to be in the, you know, the, the, the New York fashion shows. I want to be in these types of environments. They're expanding. They're expanding their network. They're expanding what they want to do. And they also are saying, this is something that I'm in there, interested in. And I want to do it right now. I don't want to wait till I'm done. And that's, I, I personally feel that's a great thing. I think that more athletes should do it. Um, before I was a sports reporter, I was a business reporter and uh, covering tech and enterprise and a bunch of other things. But I remember when I was covering tech, we would talk about unicorns, right? Uh, you know, companies that can scale up and become essentially multi-billion dollar entities. You guys are the unicorns. There are millions of people who play sports at very young ages. Almost nobody becomes a pro. You are those unicorns. How are you able and what are the qualities and skills that you cultivate as an athlete, right, that can make you successful after your playing career is over? I think Sue's a unicorn. 20 <laughs> years, she, she said something earlier that made me laugh. She was like, yeah, I'm just going to play for a couple years. And she ended up playing 20 years, which is uh, nuts. Um, you, you know, when you think of athletes, and I'm sure Sue, Sue would share this, you're dedicated, you're disciplined, you're hardworking, you're coachable, you're, you're resilient. You're able to say, it's the next series, it's the next play, it's the next possession, it's the next quarter, it's the next game. Mm. And those are the same things that you have to say in business, in life, period. Those are the same things that you have to say. So we're built for that. Here, here's the problem for athletes. When we left college, those people that were 21 when we left and we, we finished playing in 10 years, 20 years for Sue, those people have 20 years of experience working and we don't. Oh, okay. And so now for us, we go into the work world and we're like, all right, we don't know any of these things. All the things that we learned in college, I, you know, I got a management information degree, I got an executive degree from Wharton. I don't remember any of those things. I need practical knowledge in the real world and that's what we're missing. So I, I, truly we have to find employers that are saying, hey, we see your skill set. We see all the things that made you a great player and we want to be able to teach you the practical stuff. Let me teach you about work. And then for the employers, you have a great employee because he has all those skills that you learn from the sport, he or her, she, man or female, you have all those skills that you learn from the sport, but now you understand the business and you can be very successful that way. Um, and, and those are the types of people that I think we want to breed and build. Yeah, to your point, um, you know, let's use us. Like they can teach us how to use Microsoft Excel. Yes. And I don't know that the things that we picked up as athletes are always easily teachable because it's been, I mean, you say a, a, a pro career, your, yours 10, mine 20. I mean, I was playing since I was like seven. Yes. I'm sure the same for you. So this is like lifelong skills. Um, I kind of joke, us athletes, we're all just like little Jason Bournes running around out there. Like we've been like, <laughs> like brainwashed in this way to oh, like right. be coachable and discipline <laughs> yep. all these things. And we get out into the real world and like, wait, what, you know? Um, but it can be, I think. I, I, like, I'm actually proud that I don't know how to use Microsoft Excel. All my friends are jealous. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I'm like, why would I ever need that? Like, can you run a pick and roll? Like, right. what are we doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, the one thing I'll just add, because I, actually I can't even really add directly. I think um, Brian hit it. The one thing that's interesting about, and, and, and I know this is like a certain percentage of professional athletes who then go on um, as retired athletes to continue to be themselves, I guess, in this world. I've been in a lot of rooms, right, with a lot of different athletes, like the greats, whether it's the Serena's, LeBron James, you name it. And I've been in the room with a lot of like top actors, like legit actors and actresses. Mm. And I think we can all kind of sit here and be like, if LeBron, I'll use a few, if Serena walked in, you're like, whoa. And maybe if, I don't know, Jennifer Aniston walked in, you'd be like, whoa. Jennifer Aniston is asking for Serena's picture. Yeah. 
and not necessarily the other way around. Not that it never happens, but I just feel like in my little observations, I've noticed like the athlete, because you're yourself, you're out there performing as yourself, I think it's a little different than other celebrity in the world. And that gives you this like cultural cachet, this capital oh, yeah. that you can then use. Like there is something different about being an athlete. And I think that's why combined with all the skills that we've learned, like there's something special there to be tapped into when it comes to then entering the business world. Well, I think especially now too, and what sets the great ones apart is that like competing, showing up to compete is a skill, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. To take those risks and you guys do that. Right, you take these huge risks in front of millions of people. It's all on the line. Right, we represent Olympia, uh, you know, specifically Olympians too. If you don't win that race, you're not going to the Olympics. Crazy. Like that is so wild. You've been training for four years. You've got million dollars of sponsorships. You're in commercials that are going to air at the Olympics, and if you don't win that race, yep. you're not going. That's not. There is something really special about the person who gets up on those blocks and goes out and wins, Yeah. right? I, it's greatness that cannot be denied. It is, it's And it's absolutely incredible. objective. And it is and it's terrifying. Well, I mean, I could not stress. be an individual athlete. Yeah. It is. I look Crazy. at individual athletes, I'm like, whoa. Yeah. That grit and the That's ability cool to show it. up on time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My favorite uh, track Very event important. to watch is hurdles. It's important. <laughs> Insane. Not gonna be late. <laughs> My favorite track event to watch is hurdles because I just, oh, you'll put your, you put yourself heart. in those shoes and you're like, yeah, I would not clear the first one. My heart. Um, we've got live questions now, a lot of good questions from the audience. Um, this is interesting. What current athlete is the best business person that nobody knows about? Oh. Um. Undercover. If I say nobody, I can't talk about my clients because then I'm terrible at my job, right? Yeah. I think well, Andre Iguodala is a good athlete. Yeah, we, we, see, oh, okay. see how that works? So, see, it's not yeah. good, I know. See? Great we're minds, like, great minds. Andre Iguodala, why? Well, I, I think what a lot of athletes don't do is what Andre did. He took a little bit less money, went out to the, the Golden State, got involved with VC world. He learned, first of all, he had to educate himself. Um, then he got involved with the entire culture of the VC world. Then he found ways to get in deals. And that's, what, that's really what athletes can absolutely do. Sue can do it, I can do it, a lot of athletes can do it. Find ways to get in the deals. And it's not necessarily about putting money in the deals. It's about sweat equity, it's about promoting, it's about giving those opportunities to, to, to those founders um, to, to get celebrities around. People want to be around athletes and so, um, it, it's a great opportunity, and Andre has, he, he's just done it in a great way. First of all, he educated himself, that was number one, and now he's figured it all out. And then you see a lot of the athletes, LeBron and Steph are, are kind of doing the same type of thing. KD is in, v, in the VC world as well. They're using what they have to be able to get much further than what their athletic career can get them. Right, and with Andre, he's in a space that's a little bit more behind the scenes. Yeah. And he put himself in a place where you know, and he's a great player, but he's not, he's not LeBron, yeah. he's not Steph, he's not KD. Right. I mean, he has a bunch of championship rings, but he's not a top 10 type of player. Anyone can do it, but it takes some, some, some work. I would just say the, the, the stories that, that I would tell are a lot of my former WNBA teammates. And the, the big difference there is, you know, a lot of the names you name, like they already have money. They got big money. <laughs> like it's easy to get in those rooms. You got money. Like, yeah, like, of course, you know. Um, the, the one that comes to mind, just because I had a front row seat to it, her name's Tanisha Wright. She's currently the head coach of the Atlanta Dream. She was a longtime Storm player. And she, at age like 26, mm -hmm. took some extra classes in real estate, started buying and flipping properties. She's been doing that, so she's probably like 36 now. Uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> so for 10 years now, she's been buying and flipping properties. She has a, an amazing, successful basketball career. She's about to be an amazing head coach. She already had a side hustle. Mm -hmm. It was already in place. I mean, I was watching her take calls on the bus. No. Yeah, like literally. Um, and she's been doing that from, from day one and has built an amazing business. And again, that's to the question. It's like things you don't hear about. And there's a lot of WNBA players with stories like that. The good news is we're starting to build the bank now too, right. where we can get into those VCs. That's right. Well, and what women athletes have that some of the male athletes who do have, you know, the pocketbook that these early stage companies are just looking for investment. Mm. They have a unique experience as women, right? There is a whole flood of early stage opportunities that are speaking to women, they're speaking to black women, they're talking about fertility, they're talking about wellness specific to women, they're talking about parenthood or motherhood, postpartum. These are all places that 
our clients, women athletes, are uniquely qualified to lead and provide service. In exchange, another name, I, I represent a woman, Ibtiaj Muhammad. She's the first American to wear hijab in competition at the Olympics. Um, and she sort of came onto the scene and qualified for the Olympics during the rise of Islamophobia, right? right? And, and Trump pushing this agenda. She has a really successful, modest clothing line. She dresses very modestly, she covers, she wears hijab all the time. And for years, predating her Olympic fame and becoming a New York Times bestselling author, she's had this modest clothing line. And just recently, there was a lot of writing about the Middle East specifically being one of the most lucrative places mm. for the development in and around fashion. You see a lot of the most innovative and successful places like net porte You can search by modest. You'll see Nike doing a lot more. They have the performance hijab, which is about innovation and about inclusion, but it's also about in a huge business that Ibtihaj has a specific connection, an authentic connection to. One, uh, one thing that, real quick fun fact that I learned, um, and this is a little bit related to the NBA All-Star Game because it was in uh, Salt Lake City this year. Salt Lake City is apparently a, the capital of modest clothing also because of the Mormon population in Salt Lake City. So they have a lot of brands and retailers who specialize in like V-necks that are like not too deep mm -hmm. and skirts that are a little bit longer. Anyways. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Athletes are susceptible to losing money on bad investments and business ideas. If they don't have the right advisors, right? How can athletes ensure they have the right support system in the entrepreneurial and venture capital space in place. You know, the first thing that I would do is you know, find yourself a great mentor. Find yourself someone that you can look up to that's in the lane that you want uh, to be in. And because of social media these days, you can touch anybody. You can touch whoever. You, can, you guys can touch Sue, she's right here. She's in person. I think that we have the ability through LinkedIn through any social media channel to be able to get in contact, ask the right questions. One of the things, and Sue mentioned it earlier, was that you have to become great at asking the questions, mm -hmm. asking the right questions. And our, our CEO, Nicole, just continues to say, ask the right questions. If you ask the right questions, you'll eventually get to the part that you really are looking for. And so I, I just think that, you know, find the right mentors, put yourself in that right space, but you have to first study your craft a little bit to be able to do that. Mm. Uh, if they know their why and find their passion, how do you recommend post-athletic career athletes monetize their passions? I feel like the answer is similar. Yeah. That, to be honest, they already did the hard part. They figured it That's out. That's the hard part. Right, yeah. right. Finding like, yeah. what you're passionate about, it kind of can sound easy and it comes easy to a lot of people, but that's definitely the hard part. And I think the answer is similar whether it's like the people that have already helped you through your career or probably people that you trust, lean on them, but then ask questions, yeah. connect with different people, ask your teammates, hey, like I'm interested in this, do you know anybody? You know, it, it can be that simple. You know, I have a teammate named Trent Cole and all he, he's from Ohio, all he wants to do is hunt. We, went, we go to the Pro Bowl, he, we're, we're hunting the hogs like crazy and that's his passion, that's what he did. And so he bought a couple farms in New Jersey and he has this thing called Blitz TV. He was a defensive end, got a lot of sacks. It's called Blitz TV. It's all about hunting. And all he does, especially with the aid of social media, is show people how to hunt, how people, how to you know, trap different animals, deers and hogs and things like that. Makes a bunch of money just doing that. That's his passion, that's his lane. That's where he wants to be successful. You know, these days, you put social media up and say, this is how I'm making dinner. This is how, and people follow you. It's, it's, it's a lot easier now than it was 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of uh, Blake Martinez who just retired, I think from the Giants, he used to be with the Packers and he uh, uh, is going into Pokemon cards full time. And he retired in the NFL just this year and he sells Pokemon cards. He has his own, you know, different channels for it. I think he made five million in seven months mm. just Jeez. from Pokemon. But Pokemon is his passion. <laughs> it's interesting that it's not sports trading cards. Why are we playing sports? We should just do that. Yeah, I know, just go into, just go into yeah. Pokemon. Speaking of savings, and Lindsay, you were talking about, you know, encouraging the athletes you work with to have that, you know, cushion. Um, are there things that when you guys, or even now, you know, what are the things that you're indulgent with that you'll spend a little bit extra on? And what are the things that, not that you're cheap about, but you know, where can you find savings that you're, you're not gonna spend a lot of money on? <laughs> that you don't care about, right? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Start down there. Um, I'd have to think. I mean, clothes. Is Those are the things that you'll pay a little that, bit more Yeah, for. I'll pay a lot for clothes. Because um, they last. 
I'm a big, I repeat, I'm not like anti that. I wear my sneakers, that's always like a big question because I have a big sneaker question, I wear them. Um, so that's probably what I'm, maybe, that in cars, I don't go, like I like having a nice car. Yeah. I like the, the comfort and the luxury of that part. And home. You said like A. You said A car, not 10 cars. Yeah, I have two. Modest. <laughs> Susan's expensive. Susan is expensive, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I would, there is no, actually that's a great point. There is no amount of money I wouldn't have and probably even still wouldn't spend on like my health. Mm. So Susan Borchard, she runs Athlete Blueprint. That is the woman that trained me throughout my career. If she would have said like, it's a million a year, done. I would have spent it. I, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's like divide by a lot. But I would have spent it. That's like something I would not um, pinch pennies on. Yeah. I'm trying to think what I do pinch pennies on. I think, I think for me, I, I spend money on experiences. I have three kids and so it's about right. me building opportunities and experiences for them to see different things, do different things. Um, and, and you know, we pinch pennies on everything else. I live in New York, so we got to <laughs> pinch pennies all the time. But, you know, experiences, opportunities for the, for the kids and myself as well. There's no right answer to that question, but um, for me, it's got to be travel. Like, if I'm too far in the back of the plane, I get a little claustrophobic. Uh, for me, mm. that's like the little, the little thing that I spend a little bit. First more. class. Yeah, not all the time. I, some of, sometimes those upgrades kick in. It works. You know, Lindsay, do you have an answer to that question? Um, I spend a lot on private school. <laughs> 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 on but that, it's funny in in Oregon. Education is, you know, foundational. I also wanted my son to learn to speak Mandarin because one of my big regrets is I don't speak another language. I'm fourth generation Japanese. My grandparents were interned and they didn't speak Japanese at home. So that was always something that I struggled with that I really wanted for him. Mandarin seemed like the right play. and That was where we could do it. Um, but also in, in Oregon, you have to pay to find diversity. Mm. And so that was something that was really important to our family is to be somewhere that that was centered um, and important and that he could be around more kids that look like him. So we have to you know, fight to create those types of experiences in a state that is predominantly white. There's you know, socioeconomic diversity within that, but yeah. that was something that we were willing to invest in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, time is the most valuable thing. Yeah. I spent a lot of time working Ed education, yeah, yeah, absolutely, education. Um, speaking of education, thank you to MIT for having us today, and I hope you guys enjoyed the panel. You can touch Sue Bird, maybe don't get, no, I'm kidding. Ask first. <laughs> uh, but just ask first. But uh, thank, oh, wait, thank you guys for coming, right? and enjoy the rest of the conference. It's all bad. Yeah, I actually dropped. <laughs> we already did that.
Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Nick Holmes, and I'm an uh, LGO student at MIT Sloan. Uh, it is my pleasure to int introduce our panel, Partnerships 2.0, Data, Dollars, and Digitalization. Our panelists will be Paul Kane, President, Endeavors, IMG Events, and On Location. John Sheeran, Director of FanDuel. Elizabeth Lindsay, President, Brands and Properties, Wasserman. Jeff Price, uh, Chief Commercial Officer, PGA of America. Our, our panel will be moderated by Abe Madcor, Publisher and Executive Editor, Sports Business Journal, Sports Bus Business Daily Global. Our panel, the panel will run for 45 minutes and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag PartnershipsV2. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. With that, we'll turn the time over to Abe. Give it up for Nick. How about that? How's everyone doing this afternoon? I know we're going up against lunch, but we appreciate you spending your lunch with us. We've got a great panel. I would encourage you to ask your questions early and often because I will get to them. You heard the bios and the introduction, so we're going to get right to it. We have a very, like I said, august mm group of panelists who have been in sports a long time and who have seen different aspects of the sports business. So I'm going to do a jump ball because this is the session title. I'm going to use sponsorship more than partnership right now, but how have you seen the sponsorship relationships change in your years in the business as we sit in 2023? Liz Lindsay, I'm going to start with you. <sighs> Me first. Yes. Huh? So first of all, I think you just called us all old. No, <laughs> I said... <laughs> August. August, and been in the business a long time. We have. We are old. Um, yeah, we are old. It's fine. I lived. Um, so, look, I, I think I'll say what is the pat answer first, and then I'll get into a slightly more complicated one. The pat answer is I do actually believe we have finally broken th free from the era of Execuim. My chairman is a F1 fan. We sponsor F1. There's still a little bit of that that's going on. But it might be the only thing I ever attribute positively to procurement officers inside corporate brands is there now is a little bit more rigor behind, okay, well, yeah, okay, fine, you're a fan. I still got to make that work. So we've gotten from an evolution away from two-dimensional uh, and execuim chairman's choice kind of decisions into the thoughtful, robustly measurable, effective, three-dimensional kind of partnerships that are in and of themselves 360 campaigns, not just a collection of tactics. That arc has happened. What percentage, though, are still executive whims? A lot less than it used to be. Seriously, when I started this industry 25 years ago, <laughs> it was probably 75, 25. And I would say now it's less than 25. Right. Like it doesn't happen anymore at the, at the big brand level because it can't. There's got to be more rigor behind the science of the effectiveness of it all. My longtime friend, Mr. Price, what have you seen? So, Abe, you know I started 30-something years ago. Uh, and I started at the NBA. And just to put context, we didn't communicate via email. With our partners, there was no such thing really work in the work environment. Think about all of the digital suite, social tools, analytics tools that exist for brands to understand. And I think about the portfolio brands that we work with our partners, from Rolex to Corbridge to Cadillac, different categories, different brands, different objectives. But the measurability of what can be done, the engagement from a B2B perspective, a B2C perspective, is so much further along than when we started mm -hmm. in this industry where CEOs made decisions. And uh, it's now become a much more rigorous process. And you've got to make sure the ROI is there for each partner based on what their KPIs are. Other perspective, I, other changes. Ours is very different, right? The sports betting industry is so immature compared yeah. to the other businesses represented here. I think we're in a slightly different position. Um, the biggest changes are very obvious when you look at the league's position on sports betting. Five years ago, if you told me that we would have an integration on TNT when LeBron James is chasing down the point scorer record uh, and they interrupt his free throws to talk about um, live betting on FanDuel, I think that's in itself a perfect example of how far it's come in just a, such a sport, short space of time. Um, where that goes, who knows? You know, we, we're interested in obviously everything we can do to promote our business. We want it to be additive in a responsible way as well. So a lot done in a short space of time, but you know, nowhere near the evolution that the guys have spoke about it yet. 
I'll just add, you know, two, two things to everything that you all said, which I think is exactly spot on, is there's an enormous, there, there's been a shift from uh, sponsorships as it relates to the company pr sponsoring to the consumer on the other side of it. So there's a, a tremendous amount of analytics that goes to understanding the value of that sponsorship and partnership through analytics, number one. And number two is there's an expectation of return from both the sponsor and the consumer. It, can't, it has to be organic, it has to be smart, and it has to be connected. So the sponsor wants to know the consumer is going to take an action, and the consumer wants to know the sponsor is authentically involved. Years ago when I got involved, 94 or so, it was about signage, uh, branding, probably some media. Yep. Let's talk about some of the assets that are new and interesting to you in terms of what are part of partnerships now. I'll so I'm also fortunate to oversee our foundation, PJ Reach. I think one of the most interesting things that I've seen are the brands that are focused on corporate social responsibility and making sure that the partnerships that they're engaged with are making a difference in people's lives. So whether it's what we do with PJ Junior League and our partnership with National and making sure that every kid who wants to play the game of golf through PJ Junior League has the opportunity to do that in National Car Rental engaging all of their business customers who have a passion for golf to realize that they're giving back. And so I look at it through the lens of what, what are we doing to make an impact on lives and how can the companies that we're working with benefit and help us to achieve those objectives. And that's a pretty significant shift over the last 10 years from my perspective. For the brands, the ROI is different than traditional. Correct. It's it, it really is about the impact that's being created. What, what is being done to better the lives of the individuals who want access to our game for National Car Rental, it's been an amazing platform to watch them help us to grow that and serve thousands of kids who otherwise wouldn't pick up a club. Other assets you see? Well, if I really honestly, what's interesting is the year I graduated from college, which on, is the moment I decided becoming a marketer was probably a bad decision, but the, the, the number one marketing innovation that year was the do not call list the year I graduated from college. And it struck me that the career that I had picked was literally the number one innovation and it was something designed to avoid it, to avoid marketing. And that's what I think is so interesting about how, how sports sponsorships come back into play is because it's the last bastion of what does not, no consumer wants to avoid them. They welcome the brand partnerships in them. We don't fast forward it, we don't speed by it without not reading, we don't care, if, like we don't ignore the brands, we invite them in. So as a result, you know, it's the last bastion of these little mini contained 360 campaigns. It's not just a sign. It is signage and media and CSR and youth programs. And it's the same, if you look at parallel timelines, it's the same time the leagues began, started talking about the 12 month calendar yeah. and we're yeah. gonna add all these events. I think the NFL was probably the first to progress there because when you have something in a sea of do not call lists that say, don't talk to me, don't market to me, when you have a place and a time when the consumers invite you to do so, you're gonna grab a hold of that. So all of those little elements that are in there are because of that, I think, everything that's come out of the sponsorship. What I will, the evolution over the last 20 years, the what I'm the most interested in, though, are not any asset that any property has come up with. They're all there. There's all these new innovations. The ones that are really interesting to me are the brands that are taking it on their own and making their own bespoke platforms out of it. Give me an example. One of my favorite recently, I don't know if any of my NBA friends are in the room, but one of my favorite recently was uh, American Express, the NBA and Fanatics came together and they did American Express as a boring benefit on their card membership which is really cool because I use it all the time of insurance you trip and fall and break your phone they pay you your phone back if you bought it on the American Express cards insurance they came up with the idea they created their own platform to do jersey assurance if you buy an NBA player jersey on your American Express card and the player transfers right they'll buy you a new jersey it's just some interesting little amazing thing. The creative for it is awesome. Didn't exist. It's not like that was in a prepackaged deck. We invented it, took it to the NBA, had to bring Fanatics in, and it's one of the best things we've ever done. There's a lot more of that sophistication in our world now. I like that. Created, new, different, right? So I was on a call with some brands recently, and their biggest frustration was, with all due respect to the properties on this panel, was that the properties still come with the same set of assets at, this, at, the, at just a higher price point and not a lot of different creativity and not a lot of new things that they can bring to the marketplace. Yeah. Thoughts? 
Well, they, there's, there's no shortage of opportunities to slap your logo on something at this point. There are so many stadiums that are available for sponsorship. There are too many patches to count there are. that are available. Yep. It's, it's an, that, that is not the game or the business, nor frankly valuable to anybody unto itself. You have to go deeper. So what you're talking about is what I love about it. It's the 360. But I'm going to twist it a little bit and say it's about going as deep as 360 around and as deep as you can possibly go. So the depth of it is the inventiveness where it gets really exciting. What you described for the American Express NBA relationship, it's perfect. Great example. It goes right to the ground on it. And that's ultimately what we all have to think about as it relates to this area of the business is how deep and how far can you go with the consumer. Well, to understand it, you have to understand what the consumer wants. And it's really getting to the real detail of what the consumer buying pattern is, what they want to attend. Because if you offend them or don't become organically connected to them through understanding that consumer, ultimately, you're, going, you're not going to uh, be successful. So the reason why Liz's example is so <clears throat> perfect is because they understood the consumer psyche of that hesitation. Do I buy the jersey? Are they going to get you know, traded? Was that going to matter? That, to eliminate that concern, to understand and respect them, not only are they going to make the decision to purchase, which is good for fanatics and others, not you, sorry, um, is, uh, is, but also uh, it, it's good for the, uh, the card relationship because the other car, the competitive purchase opportunities, whatever they are, are don't offer that. That's a, that's part of the consumer choice. It's a fantastic example. I think we saw with Gronkowski's kick in the third quarter of the Super Bowl. That's a really good example of how we're thinking about trying to bring it to that deeper level that everybody's spoken about already. Yeah. You know, gone are the days of us needing to splash Fanduel as a brand to make people aware of who we are and what we do. Um, getting $17 million in free bets given away, even though he did miss it. I did he miss you. it? It was so hard to tell. I know. I knew you were going to ask it, me It really that. was so... How many... <laughs> raise your hand if you thought he made the kick. Yeah. No. Okay. That's he, hard def to say. he definitely missed it. We have a video from behind him. He, he went 8 for 8 the previous day, actually, so... Uh, we all saw a lot of value in the minus 500 on them to kick it successfully, but didn't account for all the wind. But I think it's a really good example of how we're thinking about trying to be innovative, trying to be different. And we've had that feedback some, from a lot of our competitors. Oh my God, what an amazing idea. And again, to go back to my previous point, to think that that could happen in the middle of a Super Bowl broadcast four years after yeah. we've legalized is insane. Yep, yeah. it, it is. Uh, we would never have thought no. that would be the case. I do like the idea of new, different, creating a touch point with the customer. I love what, for instance, like Allies doing around women's sports in particular and really, really connecting at that level. We do have a question from the audience. I want to get to it. A lot of talk this morning. I thought it was a great question of Amy Howe. Uh, uh, what data can she not, th th does she not have yet? that she really wishes she had. The question here is, what are two data sources that you can't live without? <laughs> so anything about data that you want to share, or data you don't have that you wish somebody in the audience would be able to provide for you? The, the data I don't live, at, live without are the brains that are in every one of those people sitting mm -hmm. right there who know what to do with that data. I'm a big believer in the concept, and it's a line I stole from Mark Cuban, but I'm a big believer in drowning in data, starving for insights. I don't quite frankly give a shit what the data says. What I care about is if you know what to do with it. What's the so what of it all? That's right. How do you make it impact my business? And you know, I, I used to talk to John Slusher about this all the time about some research we did for Nike and his answer to me every time was, Does it, do I sell more shoes? Yeah. That's it. What is that one asset? So drowning in data. Data sources from everywhere. What I can't live without is the ability to interpret that, simplify it, put it on a page, articulate the to what end uh, in a concise manner that helps sell more shoes. Yeah, I, I, I think that, first of all, we all use data to understand what we've done. We often use data to figure out what we want to get others to do or to sell, but there's also the element of what people are going to want in the future the predictive data, mm -hmm. very hard to get. Yeah. And uh, the, there's that old adage is people don't know what they want to buy until you show it to them. <laughs> and uh, you know, and data, so data into itself can't be relied upon to be predictive because the data originator won't necessarily indicate it completely. So you need um, a little bit of the art and science balance to understand and interpret the data to be able to build it into a predictive model. It's not easy. I, I don't see a lot of predictive models that are perfect. 
Uh, I, you know, there, so that's where it becomes really important to have that gut feel, to be that excellent marketer, to know how to use data to your best advantage. But I would love to get it to the point where you More can predictive. get as predictive as possible. Yeah. If I'll go, you know, we're, we're in the process right now, and I think Fahad uh, Zahid, who runs marketing and digital for me, there's 41 million people that picked up a golf club last year, either on a green grass, 12 and a half, 15 million off course, which is amazing now more than on, and then a bunch in the middle that did both. Our database right now is about two and a half million of that. So our goal is to get, how do I know all 41 million of those people who love golf, the other 15 who say they want to play, and what mindset are they bringing so that when we go back to one of your clients, mm -hmm. we are very able to engage a conversation with the brands that we work with that is meaningful, relevant, and engaging versus kind of coming over the top at the consumer. So for us, it's about the data and insights on those golfers and what can we do with it to drive engagement for the golfer and our partners. And that kind of gets to this next question. How are you using the data to either drive new programs, create new programs, new activations, new elements? So if you saw trends of golfers wanting shorter play times, maybe you could do 12-hole golf or something to that component. The 10-hole right? short course that we built at PJ Frisco was exactly because of that insight. People want two-hour experiences, not necessarily four-and-a-half-hour experiences. Other things that you all have seen. <laughs> I was just going to say, that's why I want to play golf. Uh, Jeff, you're going to get me to play golf again. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, here's the thing. Is I'm going to flip to my on-location business, which is an experience business. Is that, um, it's, it's a, it had been an under-differentiated business of a ticket plus hospitality, and now we've turned it into an experience model where we, get, we make people's dreams come true. That understanding of what is the dream, understanding what people really want from an experience, what they want from their live sports experience, that using data and analytics to drive that decision helps us not only deliver better product, but increase our margins for our, our partners. To, to, if you aren't familiar with something on location, for instance, the Super Bowl, you had so many programs going, people were paying you know, so premiums for premium experiences. They could get concerts, they could get cooking demonstrations, you know, very, very nice high-end player appearances all throughout the week before the game. And so you're using your data to see what they want to do and then yeah. instruct the and, programs? And even during the game, we're doing it all across the board. So our experiences for the Super Bowl start even uh, way before the Super Bowl. It starts from the moment someone decides they're going to go. That moment, we call that the purchase moment, all the way to the day they come home from the Super Bowl, the memory moment, has, is our product. So it's that purchase to memory product. Now, when they're on site, we understand what is it that they want to do and how, what makes them excited. For some people, it's hiking in the mountains. It's yoga with an athlete. It's a shopping experience. It's immersive, in, in this case, Scottsdale. But when they get to the game itself, it's understanding the parts of the part of what they want from the fan experience. We had, for example, in partnership with the N the NFL, we had 16 people who were part of the coming out of the tunnel experience mm -hmm. as part of the broadcast with their teams in uniform. Very cool. Very cool, right? Very cool. We had people on the field after the game to be part of the Lombardi Trophy ceremony. Did they slip? There. Right. <laughs> did they slip? They did. Yeah. Uh, um, so oh there's my. there's that's those are the kind of experiences that we create. Um, and we do that with all of our partners. Jeff is a phenomenal partner for us. The PGA is just an extraordinary partner who understands not only through the analytics that Jeff shared before, but the partnership that we bring to the party to really take not only the on-site experience at a PGA event, but to take it to the next level where they're getting in a completely once-in-a-lifetime experience. Because what we're seeing, uh, and I think you would, we'd all agree, we're seeing that fans will pay. There's an elasticity of pricing that they will pay more for these premium experiences, right? You're seeing we, that. We live in an experiential economy. Right. The consumer is looking for something that they're passionate about. They'll, they'll love a brand that will provide that for them. The on-location experience that we're building for Rome in the Ryder Cup is phenomenal. If you want to go to Rome and have an unbelievable experience packaged by on-location, there's anything and everything you could imagine you want to do in Rome that'll be available through on location. And that, that type of packaging is exactly what the consumer is dying for. And, and a lot of people get afraid of that because they think it's expensive. And, and, the, and what I, we compare it to like the Disney experience. You can have an on location or an immersive experience at any price point. So we, and that's what we try to think about. Because to some people, they'll save a lifetime to go to the Ryder Cup. To others, it's what they made that morning. 
And by the way, that price point can flip in your mind of what they made their morning could be the most expensive product, and they saved a lifetime for the, most, the least expensive product. We have to respect that completely. Another question here from the audience. Confused about not really wanting more data, but what KPIs are really of interest to all of you? It's a little different. I mean, KPIs are different than data, but I mean, they can be. I mean, so Liz, let's drill into this, or John drill into this, in terms of you obviously want to see people sign up for your service and become, so you're looking at it as a retention tool. Mm -hmm. For sure, I, I think I would go an back acquisition to acquisition tool. Acquisition, obviously, click through and making sure that they make that first experience and deposit, place a wager, and have that really immersive experience. For us, it's much more simple. It's about how does the event become more entertaining? Because we think about our business now as an entertainment uh, product. So same game parlay, for example, in the NBA, the every bounce of every ball means something to that product. So to be able to get all the way through to that's super important to us. Just to go back on the data question, because I think for the audience, particularly around analytics and data collection, Amy said in her answer earlier, which was correct, like we feel like we've got robust, robust data sets, particularly from the collection point of view, as we think about generating odds and markets and lines that we offer our customers. I would say that process right now is actually pretty archaic. If someone told you in 2023 that you have a scout sitting in the arena typing into an iPad who has possession of the ball, right. In 10 years' time, we look back at that and go, man, how did we run that business at all? So I think for the audience to think about areas of opportunity, that for me is one miss that we badly have in our industry that would make a huge difference. Think about a latency. Anytime I talk to the league, I say to them, what is, they'll say to me, what is the most important data that you can get from us? What's the biggest issue you have? One, two, and three are latency and accuracy, fourth. So for me, that's a good, you know, for the audience specifically, a good area for them to start to think about rather than, we all have tons of quants applying for every single job that ever goes on their website. That might be an area for some people to think about differently. And Liz, for your clients, I know you're looking at different things for different yeah. clients, but is there... Yeah, look, to be clear, what I said earlier, not that I don't care about the data, is that the data itself is not the KPI. Think about what KPI is, key performance, I don't even know what it is, Indicators. performance indicator? Yeah. 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 Um, that's going to be different for every brand. The data is, comes, that funnel is wide. Like somebody said, or I think it was you, we got so many different uh, like options coming at us now. That's, not, that's, the, that's the it. The art of what you do with it is what makes it actionable and readable as a performance indicator. And quite frankly, everybody's is different. When you come at me with awareness numbers for a startup brand that matters, for American Express, it doesn't. It's the eighth most recognized brand mark on the planet. They don't need that. Let me interrupt. When when the property comes to you with mm -hmm. awareness numbers, right? I'm just clarify. Yeah. So it's that it's the it's not that it's not like a good indicator. Sure, great. I'm glad there's good ratings, but that's not the point for that brand. We have a brand. I was like talking about my grassy brand as much as I talk about American Express. We have a brand, literally Scott's Miracle Grove, grassy. And if you look at their business model, what's really interesting is. That period of time when planting happens is during spring, spring training in baseball, right? They are a baseball partner. Their entire year can be made if we get one more week of end cap shelf space at a big bucks retailer during that window. That's it. So you want to talk to me about ratings, you want to talk to me about awareness, you want to talk to me about all these other data sources, great. In the John Slusher, do I sell more shoes analogy, That's I need that week. Right. And so what creative can I make around their asset with baseball to get that week? And That's the performance. Everything else is just data. Great point. And I think as properties, what's evolved is understanding. We, we've got a tremendous, our team does a great job of renewals. I think we have a 95% renewal rate on our partners. We have Pepsi for 30 years and mm -hmm. so customers, club car, that's been with us for 25. You have to understand those KPIs that mm -hmm. matter on a very granular basis. We were going through a renewal with Cadillac. There were 20 odd various KPIs that we had to measure up against yeah. to make sure that this property made sense for them. And so it's the KPIs that matter to me are what KPIs matter to, to our partners. Yeah. So they provided the KPIs. They tell us and we have conversations. It's not about what we're trying to bring to them. It's how do we develop together something that's gonna move the needle against their KPIs. And if it's mm -hmm. shelf space, Great. During a right. That's Let's fantastic. Go. Let's right. focus against yeah. it. And, and to Jeff's point, it may not just be selling Cadillacs. There are other points where they need either displays or some other. Or their dealer network. Their How dealer. does their dealer network get incented to move more product? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That becomes a key part of the B2B side of golf. Real quick follow-up then. For Jeff Price specifically, do ratings matter to the PGA of America? 
Of course they do. Ratings matter first to our broadcast partners, CBS, ESPN, NBC. So that's critically important. That's the lifeblood of kind of the underpinning of our association. Remember, we represent 28,000 PGA professionals in the field. We're fortunate to have these great assets that are the engine that fuels the mission that we have to grow the game of golf. So yes, ratings matter. They matter to our partners, but there are a lot of other metrics right. that matter as well. Right. We, we think about full swing, which is doing incredibly well right now. The exponential growth of audience that we're getting out of a property like full swing, hopefully is gonna help us drive ratings just like it did for F1. So yes, do ratings matter? Absolutely. Give Jeff Price a focus group of how many people here have watched full swing. Raise your hand. If you haven't, you check it out. Breakpoint, full swing, drive to survive, they're, they're fun, they're fun. Uh, a question here for the entire panel. How do you see the advances of AI and machine learning, such as chat GPT, playing into partnerships of the future? Woo. Uh, you gotta be, first of all, I think AI is always gonna play. A, it, the whole notion about AI right now is so hot, but it's been around for a little bit now. Um, uh, in, in the sense that it's just all about under, uh, faster learning, faster processing, and ease, ease of creation. I do worry a little about the chat GPT moment here because you're actually pulling from existing source, which isn't always accurate, and if we rely too heavy on it, it's, sometimes you come back with wrong information. And I think that's the important part about data, too is that we gotta be really discerning of what we're seeing and what we're digesting. Is it real? Is it true? Is it honest? And then uh, before you make your decisions or move. Any other thoughts on AI or chat? I, I would just say from our side, you know, personalization of our apps is something that we've, as an industry, done really badly at. The app looks the same to everybody. Uh, certainly an area where we think that that could potentially move a future where you know, it recognizes who you are, what you're doing, what you're interacting with and automatically promotes it to you. If I would just say, Chat GPT is really fascinating, but if you haven't read the New York Times interview with Chat GPT, it's worth, it was really frightening as to what the end result of that conversation was. To Paul, to your point, there's amazing opportunity, but there's also risk, and as we dive into it, we've gotta look at both sides of that equation right. and make sure that we're understanding the veracity of what is the output. I think we're, your, your we're point the, is... We're at the early part, though. I mean, yeah. look at, like, right. 94, when we, right. the Internet came out. I right. remember uh, launching a website in 94, and I was the only person who had a modem in my house, in my company at the time, in my brand at the time, and the then publisher came to me and said, uh, you know, what was the experience like? I was like, well, it'll take me 45 minutes to download the homepage. And the answer they gave me was, oh, that'll never work. And it, the reality is, you know, like you look at for the future, we don't understand it yet. And we have to embrace it. We have to excite about it. What we know it to be 10 years from now will not be what it is today. But, we, you know, it's all, it's, it's, you have to keep riding with it. A couple years ago, we did a session, and I asked uh, brands what they wanted from properties. Much of it was focused on access and content. Has it changed, or are there other elements? And maybe talk a little bit about both of those. Content's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. And so Liz, maybe jump into that, what type of content you'd be looking for from a property for a brand. So access and content is still very important. Obviously, it's about the experiences. You need the access to do it. But what I think content, where content's really interesting to me, is the push-pull effect that it gives. It's a, I need content, I need to pull your content into my brand world, which if you're a property, you should appreciate because then that extends your 20, you know, your 12-month calendar and opportunities to do more with your brands, which invariably you guys will figure out how to charge more for. So that is the, the interesting thing. But then what's, what, what we're starting to see now is brands wanting to bring their content in. in. So not just pulling it out, pushing it in. The kick in the middle is the same yeah. thing, right? It's an, an example of that. So to me, it all comes down to the, the, the true fundamental truth in all of it is this is people's passion. Yeah. And when it's your passion, you want to share what you think of it in and pull what you have back out. And it blurs the line that exists currently at the front of the TV or the phone screen. And so there's a lot of that going on right now. Yeah. We, have the pat we have the privilege of working in an industry to do things that people want to do in their personal time. Like we're not selling B2B products. We're selling, we're, we're selling consumer passion brands. Everything we do is what people want. So for that reason, uh, we, there has to be a level of, de of um, excitement, fun, fresh energy to get, people, to get people into it, to get people to engage with our brands, to, be, to buy more of our products, to, be, to walk out with a better experience, all of that. 
Really I also want to add, I do think, from a pandemic perspective, the one thing I've always said is that it, you know, necessity is one hell of a mother of invention. We all got real creative <laughs> when people couldn't get in the stadiums. Um, what I love about the content and the way is that it's, it's broadening the pool of people who can experience that passion. Yeah. Like, it's inclusive. It's baseline level inclusivity. And I love that. There are people who are, you know, Sacramento fans in India, they want to be able to feel like they're sitting courtside. They're never going to get on a plane and fly all the way over here. How do we pull content into their lives or put them in the action? And you saw a lot of that during pandemic because we had no in-person audiences. So sports had to f go get everybody. And we have a tendency now that the in-person audiences are back to forget about the everybody, but it's really baseline level inclusivity, fan growth, audience growth, brands love it. You, yeah. you get a higher level of return and impressions. It, it all works. We, we saw that with one of our sister companies is the UFC. And we were one of the first sports to be back live during the pandemic, during that time. And then we do the immersive experiences with the UFC. We saw an uptick of demand of the kind of experiences people wanted because they became newly passionate about the UFC because that's what they were watching when they were in their homes. And it, that brand I've got enough of cornhole and... Cornhole. I, 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 I learned yeah, a lot I about cornhole fan Belarusian up. soccer during that period. <laughs> yeah. though, for sure. yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, you know, content is full swing. Yeah. Full swing is a great example. I'll give you another one. Aon is a terrific Worldwide Ryder Cup partner. And when they came to us and wanted to extend what they were doing with the PGA Tour and the LPGA through the Ryder Cup, they had a risk-reward platform that was running on both tours. They wanted something unique in the Ryder Cup. One of the most unique attributes of the Ryder Cup, Jack Nicholas giving the concession to Tony Jacklin 50 years ago. It is about the sportsmanship of the, what the Ryder Cup represents. So we created the Nicholas Jacklin Award that Aon partners with us on. So there's, a, going back in history, all of the archives of sportsmanship from the Ryder Cup, teamwork from the Ryder Cup, performance, all of the key messages that Aon wanted to kind of explain to consumers what their brand was about, they're now using Ryder Cup content to tell that series. And then at, during the Ryder Cup itself, have that award, which did not exist, now being presented by Aon to the athlete who represents those metrics and brings it to life, what Tony and Jack did 50 years ago. So. It's from a content perspective, it's taking into all of our archives, everything that we've had historically, and then the of the moment opportunity to be a relevant part on that Sunday green at the end of the Ryder Cup, having that be a part of the ceremony has been something that really differentiated and the, the results that they saw from a consumer engagement standpoint, they launched their, relaunched their brand at the last Ryder Cup around this award. Every metric that they were looking for was met, but it was built off content and storytelling. And they can use that for, for, so, for such a long tail. Correct. Um, this question here, building off Abe's question to the other three, I think they, they mean you three, what are you, what's one thing that hasn't been mentioned that you want from a property? So obviously you three. What, 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 when you go to a property, what is it that you still aren't getting that you would like? My answer would be a little bit the same. Like we, we just really want the leagues in this case to lean into what it is we're doing. We've partnered with the PGA Tour recently around a responsible gaming initiative and used Jordan Spieth, who's one of our athletes, to kind of promote that. Um, I think the pro leagues, the NFL, NBA, MLB, have all been great partners of ours and we have great relationships. I think there's more we can do to lean in together, particularly to remove some of the stigma around gambling try and focus on the entertainment value, build that together and have a really good end case entertainment um, property, which is exactly what you spoke about earlier, where people just enjoy that experience. It's their own time, it's pretty valuable, right? Yeah. Friday evening, eight o'clock at home, I'm supposed to be putting my kids to bed, I'm watching some NBA game that I've got a bet on. That's pretty important use of my time. My wife might not agree that it's good, but that's what I decide to spend it on regardless. So I would want more lean in from the leagues to understand that our industry can be entertainment, that we're building a really responsible industry together and, and contribute towards that. I'll tell you, John, in the Super Bowl last year and this year, we saw more of our guests um, uh, using FanDuel in the stadium than before. In fact, in the rows in front of me at the game, I was watching people in, you know, doing it in real time. And that's because the connectivity in the stadiums have gotten so much better yep. and the engagement's been- and The first time we had it in a legalized state as well. Right, yeah. right. Anything in particular? I, you know, I would want, and there are some that do it. It's not that it doesn't happen. There's some that are really good at it. I, my friends from the USTA here are here and they're phenomenal at it. I want the properties to realize that the brands bring more than a check. That they, yeah. that they can be 
extensive, effective ex like extensions of your marketing, ambassadors for your brand, ways to increase your audiences. So stop saying no to everything. Um, USTA is phenomenal with American Express. American Express wants to provide service. The USTA wants to provide a phenomenal customer experience for their spectators on site. We do the experience every year at the US Open. I'm sure many of you have gone. It's a win, 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 win to be very cliche, but that doesn't happen if the properties don't realize like, well, I just need a check from Amex. No, you need their expertise on how to host people because they're really damn good at it. It's a really good example because we have that exact issue with the NBA where we believe that we've changed how people consume live betting in the NBA. Um, people who have placed the same game parlay who were invested in the entirety of the game historically would have switched off in a blowout situation. They're now 40% more likely to stay engaged through the end of the fourth quarter. And that's the exact conversation we're having with MLB. How do we do the same with the new rule changes? How do we get better at keeping people engaged for longer within their two, three hour uh, spend of their own time? I will say that I've seen a big shift. We work, uh, the on-location side of our business has 151 different rights partners. So we work with all the major leagues and associations basically around the world. And with that, um, we have seen a shift where people are starting to look at the complete package of what they, what they offer for consumers. There used to be a line drawn from, the, from whatever the stage is, the field, the court, the, the pitch, whatever it is, versus the stands. And there was an, a separation, a church and state between them. Now they're seeing that as the full experience. The athletes understand that, the fans understand that, the leagues and conferences and associations understand that. And everybody is trying to make it work for everybody so that it becomes a much more engaged and connected product. Um, the welcoming into products like FanDuel into the environment and making it part of the environment as opposed to just a logo on the screen. Those are the, those are the great examples where I, I see incredible inventiveness. I, I, uh, I really don't think we have a rights partner who doesn't spend time thinking more innovation now. Uh, Jeff, is a, what we're doing at the Ryder Cup is a perfect yeah. example yeah. of that. Yeah. Things we would never have done 10 years ago that all of a sudden we're starting to bring to the market. Yeah, and to, to your point, every property cannot begin the conversation with no. Yeah. We have to say, well, it may be this, but let's think about that. Yep. Yep. And those conversations have changed. It used to be we started with no, yep. and then maybe backed into something. Today, yeah, it's your a la carte list, pick three. Pick three. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's, what are your objectives? What are you trying to achieve? How do we mutually find a way that's good for us, good for our consumer, and hopefully yeah. powering the brand? And that's the evolution of the conversation. I also think the relationships with properties, the people still matter. You know, our relationship is really strong because you have an unbelievable point person who understands everything about golf, about what a PGA Championship or a Ryder Cup is, and comes to us with innovative solutions. So people still matter. The data, the analytics, critically important. They help us make better decisions, but the right people building the right relationships yeah. with the right knowledge still the fundamental aspect of this industry. I, I, I'm gonna, I actually believe that there's a lot of onus on the brands too. It's not just a property problem. I agree. Like, you know, I, the brands are like constantly at me about, I need them to say yes to this. I need them to give me this. I need them, why won't they just do this? But the flip of it is, I'm like, do you know what X partner's struggling with? Did you know that they had their owners meetings last week? You know what their challenges are? Can you tell me the effectiveness of their ticket sales? Is their per cups going up or down? I'm like, well, why is that my problem? I'm like, well, you want your business to be their problem. Well, then their business needs to be yours. Mm -hmm. A partnership is not one way. Mm -hmm. And so that, that understanding and facilitating, and I like to think we do a decent job with our brands and getting them to understand that, is that there's, sometimes there's just a cost of doing business. Sometimes you have to lean in and say, as a good partner, I'm going to let you get this done because I know you'll be there for me when I need it. And that mentality is lacking in our industry. Just because you write a check doesn't mean you are God. It's, we need to have that spirit of partnership in it. A little better, though. It's getting well, Yeah. I mean, this question here is a quick, a good follow-up to that. Who takes the first step? The brand thinks about how to infuse into a property or the property invests in experiences that pulls in a brand. Oh, boy. Chicken and well, an egg? Why, why, why does anyone have to go first? It should just be lead with innovation. It could come it, it, either side. It could come from the start. side. Yeah, but I think it's important that both sides of the table come to it with, a, with an open mind to drive the ultimate success invention's not going to come uniquely from one side. There's no rights holder who knows enough 
to, of what the brand ultimately wants. And there's no brand who ultimately knows what the limits of the rights holder can provide. It has to come from a mutual place. 100%. 100%. We're under 20 minutes, and I know after lunch, sometimes people can get a little sleepy. So we're going to go a little bit more quick hitter on our questions, some specifically targeted to certain panelists. I'm going to go with Paul Kane. Paul, we've come off of two challenged Olympics, I would say. Why are you excited about Paris in 24? And I know of the logistical challenges of an opening ceremony on the Seine River is going to be a big, big beast yeah. for anybody to... I, you know, I've been around um, all these kinds of businesses for a really long time. Jeff and I have been doing this together for 30 years, I yeah. think, right? And um, this is a, a, this game, this Paris game, is going to be the most complex but most exciting game of all time. First of all, the Paris games, I love the Paris uh, organizing committee because they're approaching the games by saying it's a game for all, meaning every sport is gender neutral. It's, there, there are a lot of symbolism around the, the games. It's going to be an exciting game. It's the first time we're all back in, in venue for a very long time. Uh, so it's going to be really exciting. However, we are about to embark on the most ambitious uh, experience I think ever contemplated in sports, which is the opening ceremony of the games. Typically, the opening ceremony is in a stadium uh, in a closed venue. So you think about closed venue, limited seats, everyone can see it, and it's secure. We're going to a six kilometer run across the Seine, starting by Notre Dame and ending at, uh, at the Eiffel Tower. And it's gonna be 206 boats along the Seine that goes up along, that takes all the athletes in the countries up along a parade route that is not only open to the public for free, in addition to premium seating, and then it ends, and it's all, and it ends at the, uh, um, underneath the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower, all broadcast on television. Imagine the security that it's going to take to accomplish that, to keep everyone safe and secure, and also how to create the right kind of experience in venue and then also at home. So the amount of work that's going into that is, is equal to the rest of the games itself. Why I'm excited about it? Because we are going to create, we are creating what will ultimately be the landmark of most immersive game experience of all time. LA28 is going to take it even to another level. The LA28 innovation plan is extraordinary. You haven't heard any about it yet. Um, frankly, we probably don't know a third of it, but the end of the day is we're seeing the evolution of the Olympic games to be more than just game in sport, game in venue, to be a completely uh, immersive. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's the plan. That's the goal. That is the goal. That is the goal. And so we'll see if they can we will execute. Do it. It, I, 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 like the, I like the energy and the <laughs> attitude. I, I'm with you. I'm rooting for it. But for everyone in the audience, you keep your eye on that because it's going to be one unbelievable execution. Uh, this question is so good that I don't want to ignore them. First, for anybody on the panel, how do you evaluate social media items such as branded content and sponsorship and partnerships? How do you evaluate or value? Go ahead. It's part of a full-scale cross-channel media plan. So it's part of us. it. A hundred percent. I just uttered the phrase cross channel and half the people on my team just had a heart attack because it's a very complicated process. But yeah, no, absolutely. You look at in venue, on TV, on social, in full, in part. Is it so it's content? Not a pull out. Is it organic? Absolutely not. It's okay. a full measurement of cross channel. Good question here. Value and price, return and investment. If you had to prioritize one element in ROI, which would you choose? The return or the investment and why? property and brand perspective, please. So you would, you would probably value the investment. Maybe. Well, the investment is critically important, obviously, to fulfilling our mission. But if we're not delivering the return on investment, yeah. it's a very short-sighted conversation. Mm -hmm. So it has to be that we're looking through the lens of our partners and are they seeing the value that they're getting? So if we're not living up to the expectations of our partners, that revenue stream is gonna fall off a cliff. We're fortunate, even in this tough economic time, that we're seeing renewals, we're seeing engagement because we're paying attention to what matters to our partners. Any thoughts on return or investment? Yeah, I think you need to, I think I focus on return because I, the better my return for a consumer or a partner or a sponsor, then, the, then the, the least amount of attention they put to the investment. Like I want, no matter what they spend, I want them to think they got more for their money, more for their value, than they've ever than ever before. If I focus more on the investment, it's about me. If I focus on the return, it's about them. Yeah. I would say investment for us, given the stage where we're at in yeah. terms of maturity, where 
more focused on partnering with the PGA Tour, investing in them to build the properties out to give our customers a better experience, innovate and lead the marketplace and keep our market number one position ahead. And then obviously medium long term, you're going to change to the other side. For any of the panelists, how has the advent of influencer marketing and athlete empowerment impacted partnership strategy? I mean, obviously, influencer market. I could call Gronk an influencer. I mean, mm -hmm. he, yeah. Look, we we built an amazing partnership with um, with Pat McAfee over the last few years McAfee, as well. He's been amazing, and you know, uh, yeah. I think from our perspective, being able to invest in up and comers in that space has been important. I think honestly, our entire industry is a little too scattergun, but that's inevitable. Um, when you have the success of people like Pat, our partnership with Gronk is another one that we're really interested in. Amy's been very clear with our view on uh, female sports as well. I think that's a space we're going to be more active in as well. So yeah, a little bit wary of the scattergun effect, but generally pretty invested in um, influencers. Yeah. The concept of barred equity from celebrity endorsers is not a new thing. Nope. You know, the fact that it's now we're just redefining what is a celebrity endorser. It's just as easily a NIL student in college as it is an influencer, as it is an actual celebrity, a current player, a former player. We're just redefining the parameters of what the definition of that is. But the impact of that barred equity is clear. I think the only thing that's interesting right now, we're seeing a ton of it in the NIL space, is uh, just like anything else in marketing, if that's all you're focused on, it's a tactic in search of a strategy. You have to have a commitment. In terms of NIL? In terms of NIL. Yeah, yeah. If it, or any endorser, if you're like, well, I'm going to hire an influencer to wear my hat. Okay, and? Like, if that's the only tactic that you're employing, just like NIL, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hire a student. And, and quite frankly, on the NIL front, again, redefine the parameters. I always joke we run a very successful college business and, and market on over 1,700 college campuses day in, day out, every single day of the year we're there. And the one thing I notice is if you look at the list of who are the most influential people on that campus, just as often as you will see the star running back, you will see the soul cycle instructor at the student rec. Mm -hmm. So it's about finding what that really means and then putting it in context of a campus strategy. How am I 360 wrapping that strategy? How am I talking to these students? Who are the ambassadors that I'm going to hire from my brand? How am I going to show up day in and day out and show that I'm there? If I think writing a $10,000 check to a kid to tweet about me is going to get my marketing plan done, you're relegating yourself to a tactic in search of a strategy. D. Smith had a couple interesting lines where he fears that the influ uh, impact of NIL may be that they opt out of group licensing. I guess I'll ask you, Liz, do you hmm. fear that the interest in NIL by brands would make them less apt to sponsor and partner with properties, teams, and leagues because they're going to be more focused on individuals? Not any more than we are already moving in a little bit of that direction. Like, there's so many ways you can get involved in sport now. You can do an athlete deal, a media deal, a betting deal, a league deal, a team deal, a whatever, whatever, whatever. So the, the, the diversification of channels is not a new phenomenon, and brands will go, especially with the advent of you know, the prob problem around exclusivity in sports. If I can't get at it one way, I'll go at it another way. Um, you know, look, personally, my sandbox in the industry, and I'm gonna, that's going to cause some follow-up questions, is that I think category exclusivity should die. I think that's a ridiculous element in today's day and age. Yeah, yeah. Um, but putting that aside, it, most sophisticated brands realize that if you're going to partner with someone from a, bar, a borrowed equity perspective, there is great stability in partnering with a team or a league. Yeah, yeah. There is great volatility in partnering with a human, especially if it's one human at a time. Your fortunes rise and fall yeah. on the back of a 17-year-old kid and what decisions he makes on the weekend? No, thank you. Good point. Uh, John, do you think you'll see any of the retrenchment that we've seen uh, in the UK around gambling sponsorship in the US over time? And for those, John's from Ireland, he knows the space well. I mean, you've seen gambling companies, you've seen properties refuse gambling money because of regulate concerns in the UK. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier. I think being responsible about how we build our business, and frankly, that's something that was a bit of a misstep in Europe historically. Gambling Commission there have gotten incredibly aggressive and made some really bad decisions in our view to be to basically fix the mess that we've left behind and we've been very clear since we launched in 2018 in the US we don't want to make those mistakes again. Uh, you allude to the fact there in the Premier League sponsorships of, of gambling companies on shirts are now 
uh, are now gone once the existing deals are, are, are all out. And yeah, I think we're being very careful about the spaces that we enter. We're probably not going to see the FanDuel brand a whole lot on college campuses. Amy's been very clear about that, and I think that's a step too far for us, where you've got on-campus kids that are not 21 years old. I think the tools, Peter spoke about it with Contessa on CNBC this week, and we spend 60 to 70 million dollars a year, pounds a year, um, investing in responsible gaming tools, and we're very, very much at the forefront of building that responsible uh, industry so as we don't have to follow the same steps that have taken, taken in the UK. So a lot of focus on responsibility. Okay, less than 10 minutes, so we'll be a little quick here. A couple of questions from the audience about how to get involved in the sports business. So these are more advice questions. Jeff Price, I'll start with you. Advice for a young person who is at Sloan or in college looking to get in the sports business would be? Don't sit down and say, I'm a sports fan. I'd love to be in the industry. Please, God, no. Please bring to us what it is that you're going to bring to add value to our company, to our brand, to our mission, and have a really developed plan and be ready to ask great questions. You and I talked about this on the iFactor discussion. I always look at the individual that I engage with and I leave the, the conversation open at the end. I wanna know what questions you wanna ask me because I'm gonna really understand how well you've thought through where you wanna go by the questions that you ask. I do that too, I don't even ask, I just like, what do you wanna know from me? Yeah. Only question I ask. And if they have nothing. Then it's, you it's, too, you've just told me everything I need yeah, to that's know. That's exactly right. It's not a good, it's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. Other advice points for you, Liz, for young I people. I wish there was a fast path. There is not. Yeah. Show up, work hard, do more, be there, be smart, be curious, be relentless, be tireless. No one knows you anything. You, you get the opportunity to be there, take advantage of it, and work hard. John. Uh, I'd come at it a little bit differently. I think I agree with them being core fundamentals of everybody we all want to hire. But from my perspective, particularly given my background in odds making, Enthusiasm for me is the most important thing, and being a huge sports fan actually really is important. Uh, it doesn't have to be a requirement, but it certainly helps. I'd rather have somebody come to me with less ability and all the enthusiasm in the world than rather the other way around. I, I can do more with that person, particularly if they're young and entering the workforce. Paul. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to add a different, because I agree with everything they just said, but I'm going to tell you, you can do it because you just seize the opportunity. Like, we're hiring. We're hiring like hundreds and hundreds, almost thousands of people for events all the time. We had 500 temporary employees at the Super Bowl, for example. And we, these people come in either after undergrad or, at, or in their MBA programs and work for us for a period of time. Um, and, and they use that as a way to meet all these great people in the yep. industry, all make these connections. And by being present, by being curious, by being uh, aggressive in that front, they find their way into jobs. The woman who runs the NCAA relationship for us started as a volunteer during an NCAA tournament, and now she's the number one person as the relationship uh, expert for us, as a good example. And we have many of those examples around our company. Question for the panel, I'll start with Paul and work our way down. Outside of a sport that you're affiliated in, i.e. golf, what's a hot sport in 2023 and four? <laughs> You've asked this question before, and I love it because it changes every year. Every this year. one is pickleball. Pickleball. And um, I, everybody is all about pickleball, but it's not even just about the sport of pickleball. It's that we have not even scratched the surface of exploration of what pickleball is going to be in terms of an ex, uh, a, a spectator sport. Raise your hand if you're actively playing pickleball. Well, this, for, okay, okay. John, any sport you're particularly paying attention to? Um, the Ukrainian-Russian war hadn't happened. I, I, I think we would have done about a billion dollars in handle on uh, ping pong in, in Moscow, um, which is pretty amazing. So I'll never write anything off ever again. Um, I, I probably have to go with pickleball. We're about to do a deal with uh, the PPA. Um, we will have betting markets in the next two months on it. Um, it got, it's got a lot of similarities to ping pong, obviously, in tennis. Yeah, um, I probably will have to pitch for that one, too. Liz, your pickle? Paul stole my answer. Oh, he did? Yeah. Price? NWSL. It's I'm amazed at the growth and the evolution from where they were. Jessica's done an amazing job. I think that the leadership, the, the value of franchises, 100%. it's women's sports is real and it's a meaningful place in, in our sports ecosystem. 
And what's happened with NWSL to me is one of the great stories of the last year and hopefully this year as well. Liz, will more brands come to you and say specifically, we want women's sports in our portfolio? Uh, you, you know what's even better than that? The best brands come to me and say, I want a complete and total sports, sports portfolio, and they don't even distinguish between men's and women's. They are now starting to realize that my sports That's fine portfolio, as long as they invest in women's sports, though, 100%. right? 100%. And the evolution is happening that people are – people used to do it for the longest time, and it was fine. Check the box. Fine. We'll take your money when you check the box. That's all good. It's getting the visibility we need. It is now decidedly moved into the era of um, you can do good and do good business at the same time. I see, you, you see the power of like WNBA, what Jessica's doing with yep. NWSL, Molly, and the LPGA. There's a lot of amazing opportunities to invest in your business by investing in women. I see Susie Willie sitting right there who was part of us beginning the partnership with KPMG and having a women's championship in addition yep. to a men's championship. Nine years ago when we started that, we had to bring our partners over to that event. I will tell you today, two of our broad partners, if we had not had KPMG in our Women's PGA Championship, we would not have had a deal. 100%. So it's a complete flip over the course of nine years. Name a person, company, or organization that the audience should be watching in sports business in 2023 24. Jeff Price, start with you. Or no, Liz, I'll start with you. I've, I started on You're the gonna, There's so many. I love all my children <laughs> equally. It don't have to be a client, it could be someone totally different. Uh, you know what? I'm paying a lot of attention to Apple. I think okay. what Apple's doing with the MLS television deal is yep. interesting. I think the way that they're treating the Apple being involved in the NFL and the Super Bowl, shot, uh, quite frankly, I'll be honest, shocked the hell out of me when I read that. Um, so all of a sudden, when Apple wakes up and starts realizing sports, which historically they've done a little bit of this too, is where they want to play, all of a sudden I'm interested in Apple. Good stuff. Yeah, I'll double down on that as well. We're going to do a lot with them. They've opened their doors to integrations. They've done some with MLB already with probabilities, and we see the expansion with MLS that was mentioned, the NFL, and I see us being a big part of that uh, proposition as well. I agree with Apple, but I'm going to add similar, another one, which is watch what happened uh, at Amazon the last three years. Marie Donahue and that team Amazing. have done an extraordinary job a queen. creating a business and a industry process. I mean, I've, I've seen so many players try to do what Amazon and Marie have done, and no one succeeded quite like her. And I think Apple has taken notice of that and is actually following, which is mm -hmm. amazing. Um, it's a good example. I'm going to throw another one in. I'd watch Jeremy Gorman in Netflix. Everywhere that woman goes, I agree there happens. too. Watch and Jeremy. I agree with that. And, and also, and they all play different places in the, in the ecosystem, but that, yeah. yeah. I'm going to go for maybe a more niche one, but it's one of our partners in PepsiCo with Gatorade and their partnership with the NFL to launch a product, Fast Twitch, together. Mm. The fact that they have created a product mm -hmm. that has gone to market, launched at the Super Bowl, and will hopefully serve a broad sp spectrum of athletes all across the world is a really fascinating evolution of how brands, when I was on the Gatorade you team, work there, right? you know, we were worried about sidelines and trainers and right. the efficacy of the product. To go all the way to having the property help you co-develop a product is really interesting. So I'm fascinating to watch, see how that unfolds. You all see the clock, so you know your answers have to be short. Does Tom Brady stay retired? <laughs> you know yeah. that's a close to my heart one. I know, that's why I asked you. Yeah, Tom is, uh, I think, uh, finally going to hang it up and uh, go on and do a lot of new things. Anybody have an opinion uh, on that? Yeah, please. Yeah. Really, I say he comes back <laughs> and plays again. This, okay, I know some. Pickleball. I know Maybe. someone who yeah. won't answer this question, but is Live Golf competing in 2024? No. No. Okay, very good. Finish this question for me, please, and we'll end with this: The sports industry needs to do a better job of. And John, I'll start with you. Uh, stumped. Um, Honestly, just engaging and leaning into betting, it isn't the stigma people think it is. It can be additive. We're trying to do it in a responsible way, and I think it'll get better. Paul Kane, sports industry needs to do a better job of? Continue doing something they haven't done the year before. Mm -hmm. So innovate. Absolutely. Liz? Broadcasting women's sports, valuing women fans, and paying women athletes equally. And Jeff Price, you get the last word on the sports industry needs to do a better job of? Recruiting diverse talent to be a part of our workforce. 
Well, listen, I think that you all know why we have such a, why we have such a great panel, because we have great panelists. So I know you have a chance to come speak to them after this session. I want to thank Nick and all the students for putting on such a great program. Special shout out to my friend Jessica Gelman and Daryl Morey for putting together such a great event over these years. And so everybody have a great afternoon. Enjoy Boston. Thank you all. Partner. Oh.
Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome once again to the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. We have another great panel today, investing in global sports, creating value while building dynasties. Our panelists today are Mitch Lasky, partner at Benchmark and co-owner of LAFC. We have Jerry Cardinal, who is the founder and managing partner of Redbird Capital Partners. We have Steve Paliuka, who is the senior advisor at Bain Capital, co-owner and managing partner of the Boston Celtics. Moderating today is Saj Cherian. He is the head of Fanatics Ventures, um, and I should have introduced myself earlier. I am Bob Hayes, a second year MBA at MIT Sloan. So uh, you know how this works at this point. 10 minutes for questions at the end. Our hashtag, as you can see up here, is sports investing. It'll be on the side TVs the entire time. Get those questions in. We'll do our best to answer them. And with that, I will turn it to you, Saj. Great. Thanks, Bob. Excited for our all-star panel of sports industry leaders, each of whom is a team owner and an investor. Uh, I call them all-stars because I've had the privilege to uh, interview uh, each of them each of our esteemed speakers over the course of my seven years as moderating this panel on investing in sports. But today is the first time that I have all three of them, Steve, Jerry, and Mitch, on the same stage. Uh, we'd like to discuss skyrocketing valuations, um, evolving ownership models, and uh, increasingly global investment opportunities. Uh, now this room, as I look out here, is full of aspiring sports investors and perhaps even some team owners. Uh, so let's get to know our panelists and how they got their start in, as investors in sports. Uh, Steve, Garden fans know you as the managing general partner of the Celtics, and, uh, but uh, how many know that you got your start uh, at basketball at Duke? Well, hopefully not that many because I was the worst player on the worst Duke team ever, uh, and uh, that, that record won't be broken like Bob Beeman's long jump. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was really into basketball in, in high school and, and uh, went down to Duke and was fortunate to play in the freshman team there. It lasted a couple of years. Then I realized I, you know, at six feet tall and, and uh, with limited athletic ability, the only way I'd get involved in sports was to get a team. So, so I, I, I bared down and got an accounting degree at Duke. Got it. And then, so when did you start investing in sports? Well, I, I had looked at a lot of things. I was looking at, at, at football teams actually and then um, um, a good, good friend from my kid's school, Wick Grosbeck, called me and said that he had a line in and buying the Celtics, and would I partner with him on that? And I immediately said yes, because I love basketball as well. And back then, uh, as you guys know, the landscape was very different in 2002. Uh, we, uh, we had a deal to purchase the team was a record price at 360 million people. The Globe didn't help us because we were raising money, and the headline was, venture capitalists pay record price for team. And the team was basically break, breaking even, losing money. So people thought we were nuts because you, you, know, you paid infinity times, you know, times the earnings. But we really did it because we wanted to bring back a championship to Boston. We both love sports. Right. And, uh, and it was kind of a labor of love. Did we ever think it would climb to these heights? We, we didn't. But, but we had a gut feeling it was a great thing. It was a great community asset. And certainly the, the Boston Celtics, as I grew up, um, was, was just such a storied franchise, and, and we wanted to bring that back. Got it. So now, Jerry, we're a stone's throw from the Charles River. So um, tell us about your start on the water um, as, uh, as a member of Harvard's crew team. And uh, how did such success you know, lead you uh, to become an investor in sports and an owner of two, now three teams? Yeah, well, like Steve, you know, I was, I was uh, only six feet tall, and in rowing, that's a fail. Uh, so, you know, I was always being seat raced to get out of the boat, but, you know, uh, what you'll learn with rowing is more of it is mental than it is physical. So um, that, that sort of gave me the, uh, I, I think, the, uh, the pathway into finance and Wall Street. Um, you know, I, after Harvard, I went to Oxford and rowed in the boat race and, you know, really uh, found the love of, of that kind of competition. Um, the great thing about rowing is it really is the ultimate team sport and it's the ultimate amateur sport. I mean, it's like you, you spend all your time practicing for a six minute race or in the case of the boat race, a 20 minute race. Um, and if you're not, if you're not, if you guys know up here in Boston, if you're not rowing in sleet and rain and, and, and terrible weather, you know, you're not really doing it right. So all that kind of stuff, I, you know, they say, you know, participating in team sports is a, is a great way to sort of, you know, enter the, the work life. And I, and I t definitely subscribe to that. Got it. Now, Mitch, you grew up in warmer climes down in, uh, in South Florida. Um, how did you find soccer then? And um, 
I guess, uh, how did soccer find you more recently as the owner of uh, MLS's LAFC? Sure. So in the 70s, I, yeah, I was growing up in outside of Miami near Fort Lauderdale. And this was the era when the f sort of the first attempt to bring soccer to the United States in the form of the NASL when Pele came over to play for the New York Cosmos. And we got a team in Fort Lauderdale, the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. And in those days, South Florida was not the South Florida it is today. It was, we were talking about this backstage, there was really nothing going on. So we would, my dirtbag friends and I would just go watch soccer on weekends. Um, and it kind of got into my blood and I followed it ever since. And then interestingly, my path into ownership was really prompted by the Sloan Conference. It's like I used to come starting in 09, I started coming just as a fan, just to learn, thinking, hey, maybe there's some interesting thing going on in soccer that there might be a money ball approach to soccer that we could, be, that we could potentially try. So I spent a couple of years just sort of hanging out on the back benches at Sloan. And a friend of mine, Bennett Rosenthal, who was putting together the deal to bring LAFC to market, he called me up, he said, hey, so you go to that nerd conference every year in Boston, Why don't, can you come in and educate our new GM on best practices in soccer analytics? So I went in for a 30 minute uh, meeting that ended up going two hours. And at the end of that meeting, they called me in and said, hey, you really need to join the ownership group with us and be a part of this. And so that's how I ended up. So I owe a lot of it to Sloan. Wow, so that was an expensive trip. Very expensive. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's hope for you know, some of the folks in this room. You could be sitting up on this stage uh, soon enough. Um, well, uh, Steve mentioned, uh, what, $360 million was, was how much you paid? Now, if you think about valuations, over the last year, we've seen record deals across leagues, including for another basketball team, the Phoenix Suns, selling uh, a record $4 billion. And the Commanders, from my hometown, potentially fetching a multi-billion dollar price um, tag, starting with a six. So Jerry, what's, what's driving these soaring valuations? And are we in a bubble? Um, how do you value team assets? Well, there's a, lot, there's a lot there in that question. We're definitely in a bubble, but it's not something that's new. I think we've been in a bubble for some time. Having said that, you know, um, I remember when the guys bought the Bucks at 550 and Tony bought the Hawks at 850. And I remember every, at every one of those transactions calling them and saying, what are you guys doing? I mean, I think I even said to Facitelli, I said, can you imagine the bucks being worth a billion dollars if you just want to make a double and, and look at where we are. So on the one hand, I say that, you know, we've been in a bubble for a while. On the other hand, you know, it's defying Darwin. I mean, it just keeps going up, right? And so the question really then is, well, why is that? And, he, and, and what's happening that I'm not crazy about is there's, there's this facile notion that I'm starting to hear. And it's always around this concept of, you know, sports as an asset class. And I would be, I would tell you that at least from my perspective, the moment you start talking about sports as an asset class, yeah, I, everybody's got to stop for a minute and just say, hold on, you know, what, what's going on? Uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, I hear these, these very facile notions of, you know, it's non-correlated to the market, uh, relative to the S&P, the growth has been, you know, differentiated, uh, valuations keep going up, and yet, you know, when you look at the analytical rigor around these things, I mean, the equity research in sports is Forbes magazine, right? And it's kind of like LIFO. It's like you look at the last trade and you put a mark up on it. These things now are, that may have worked 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I think today these are multi-billion dollar live, live event entertainment assets and I think there's got to be a little bit more rigor. This concept that these things trade as multiples of revenue, I also think is, is somewhat concerning. I think these things should trade as multiples of cash flow. And that's the investment thesis ultimately that, that I try to apply when we look at these things, which is, you know, can you work your way into the money on an overpay and it's got to be cash flow driven. Yeah, well, so Mitch. Let's, let's go to Forbes. You know, your team, the defending MLS champion LAFC, is worth a billion dollars, um, which I think is the distinction of the, the, the highest, you know, price uh, that they've put on an MLS team. Um, yeah. So you're probably not complaining about the run-up in team values, but I guess my question for you is, related to kind of Jerry's point, um, are you worried that we may be past peak sports and and, 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 and sort of hit, hit the peak? Yeah, two different questions. So first, I, I totally agree with, uh, with the last comments. And, and I think, look, Forbes, the, you know, saying that we're worth a billion dollars, these are the people that told you Donald Trump was worth a billion dollars, right? So I'm not sure that I necessarily put that much stock in Forbes' valuations of the football world. But um, nonetheless, I don't know that necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say we've gotten to peak sports, but I think there's some troubling things we need to be concerned about, particularly if you know, we are going to be valuing these things on a cash flow basis. It's like viewership, and again, media deals have driven a ton of the revenue in this space historically. 
you know, viewership among younger viewers is much harder to coalesce around things like cable television, et cetera, than it has been historically. And I think that's a concern we need to think about sort of long term. I mean, it's clearly affecting a lot of the sports other than the NFL, where I think they're, they're pretty solid in, in that regard. But certainly basketball and baseball um, have, have been affected by that. And we actually went to a pure streaming model in, in MLS this year, where Apple is going to be doing our, our, uh, all of our media. So, um, yeah, in that regard, I, I, I don't think, I, I still think that these things trade, you know, more like fine art, at least the ones in, in, uh, in the North American markets where there's some protection. Obviously, we, we're going to talk about this later when we talk about soccer globally, but I think promotion relegation puts a discount on anything but sort of the top teams in some of the, the first divisions in Europe that we don't experience as much in, in the United States. And while I can't really defend the billion dollar Forbes valuation, I do think that the US teams trade at a premium given that they're sort of protected assets. Well, Steve, um, how should we kind of reconcile sort of this debate? You know, on the one hand, you've got, you know, sort of as Jerry kind of no, no, noted, the, it's the scarcity of, of, of the teams on the, on the one hand, but then you've got you know, sort of as, as Mitch noted, the fragility of this kind of media business model. It's not going to go up and to the right forever. Um, you know, how do, how do you think about valuing sports assets? Well, I think Mitch made and Jerry made great points. And, and one of the most important points is it is different in the United States than it is overseas. Uh, in the United States, you basically have a monopoly on the city of, of, of what, what, we, what your sport is, and you can't be relegated, um, which is great for stability for the investment. I, I think the second thing is um, we have been in a general bubble for assets and interest rates, money costs nothing. And that has kind of also driven up the cost of, of, of any kind of trophy asset, which, which sports teams are, the kind of the diamond ring value has gone up substantially. But I think Jerry's right. Eventually it's got to come back to some cash flow modicum because there are only so many um, uh, people that have 60 billion or 80 billion or or sovereign wealth funds to buy these clubs, and you're gonna run out of that at some point in time, and therefore you're gonna have more problems with liquidity. So it's gonna be driven cash flow. Now, on, the, on the positive side is the, the really interesting sports teams have now, the technology has changed the world, so instead of having tens of millions of fans, you can have hundreds of millions of fans. So you, know, you, look, at, you look at a club like Chelsea, um, you look at clubs like the Celtics. I, we, we played in Spain, we had a sold out arena, there's there 10,000 people in, in Celtics uniforms at the game and they knew all of our players and they knew us so so I think the globalization and the technology of globalization where you can watch Italian football football games you can you can watch uh, uh, Premier League games you can you can watch Celtics overseas that's really also driven the, the size of the market and, and and the monetizable base for the fans so there are puts and takes I think in general assets assets have, have blown up because of the low interest rates and the the, the kind of quantitative easing for the last 20 years and, and, and sports has benefited by that. So at some point, at some point, there will, there will be some kind of reckoning. And I think the teams that are, are managed solidly or disciplined and have cash flow will be the most valuable ones. Got it. And so we talked a little bit about um, kind of the media models uh, changing. But um, are you bullish, Steve, on um, new revenue streams such as online sports betting as you know, a source of future values? I, I just think there's many, many revenue streams yeah. uh, from, from streaming to, to online betting. Um, to, to monetizing you know, fans with extra shoulder programming and all those kinds of things. And so and certainly the NBA and new geographies, we've seen every year increases in, in those ancillary revenues, which used to be very small, and now they're a big, a big part of the mix. Um, I do think that you're going to have to be talking about some structural change for, 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 for many of the leagues where uh, cer certainly some of the leagues have no cost controls, no caps. Uh, overseas, you develop players and, and people buy the players, you know, on, on the come. And I think that's just, that's just a, a really hard thing to, to sustain long term because you're going to need competitive balance. Uh, part of the reason the NFL is the world's most successful league is they've ensured competitive balance and they, they by, by having uh, appropriate salary caps and ways to operate the club and, and having a strict set of procedures, which I think has benefited all the clubs, um, the values of all the clubs. And I think other leagues are going to have to look at going in that direction. Got it. So, uh, you know, we, we started talking about, uh, you know, kind of going global. So let's talk about yeah, the teams across the pond. So, uh, Jerry, Redbirds deal for AC Milan broke the record for the largest um, 
uh, soccer club ever, only to be shattered by Chelsea, you know, shortly thereafter. And now all eyes are on, on, so he got a, he got a huge on discount. Manchester got United. A huge yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Talk to the guys at, at Man U. So, but, so Jerry, sounds like you're generally pretty bullish on European soccer. Uh, talk us about your journey, you know, through buying Toulouse in 2020, I guess, uh, into Fenway Group uh, with Liverpool in, in right. 2021, now AC Milan in 2022. Um, you know, love your thoughts on, you know, kind of your general thoughts on, you know, how, how bullish you might be on yeah. European soccer. But also talk to us a little bit about, given that you've done these three club investments, are you, do you have like a grand vision for this multi-club, you know, sort of platform play, or are you looking at each of these as individual assets uh, on their own? Okay, so I, my, my euphoria around European football is relatively recent. I, for years, was not interested in European football. Uh, my business model investing-wise in sports was always around the business of sports, and it was always partnering with the rights holder and creating terminal value businesses around those rights. And so it started with the Yankees, as you know, and then the Cowboys and the Yankees with legends, and the NFL with on location, it's, you know, and the players themselves with one team, and it was the same model. And then five or six years ago, we, we said to ourselves, you know, why don't we look at vertically integrating and, and becoming the rights holder ourselves? So it was 20 years after Steve, and, and um, so we're always late to catch up. Uh, and, you know, there's ownership restrictions in the U.S. It's harder for institutionally formed capital to do that in the U.S. Uh, and, you know, there's none of those restrictions in Europe. But what the counter, though, in Europe is that you've got the transfer market and relegation. And then when you see an ecosystem that attracts sovereign states and, and oligarchs, you have to ask yourself, what are you doing? Uh, and I got to give credit to Billy Bean. I mean, Billy was the one who educated me. Billy's been around European football for 20 years, and he said, you know, you're not looking at it right. He said, you can do European football if, if you approach it with the money ball mentality. And that's great because, it, you know, that basically says that, you know, you don't have to sacrifice performance on the field for cash flow or vice versa. And so that, that got it, you know, we spent five years basically uh, apprenticing and learning. And we thought we knew a lot about sports, but over there we felt we had to really do a deep dive. We met with close to 200 teams across basically every country, made our first investment in Toulouse, uh, you know, and it was really data analytics driven. That was a great experiment. You know, the price talk on, on the team was 60 million euros. It got relegated. We bought it for 15 within, you know, the first year we sold our first player for 15. And, you know, we built it, and now it's in the middle of League One, um, and we got it promoted again. So that was a great experiment. We learned a lot, great team. Then Fenway, something similar, you know, sort of migrating up to the larger teams. And then finally, to your point on, on the control buy at AC Milan, look, I mean, I think AC Milan is one of the biggest brands in European football. It's, um, you know, Berlusconi was really the first oligarch, uh, and, you know, he was the George Steinbrenner of his time. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that surprised me was that AC Milan has the second most Champions League trophies behind Real Madrid. I, I hadn't really kept up with that. Um, but it's an undermanaged asset and, you know, everything in Italy and around Serie A, there's a, that, you know, Serie A has a right to have a seat at the world table and AC Milan, I think, and some of the others have a right at that table. And it's our job to go do that. And so we're going we're gonna to look at this thing, you know, the benefit for guys like Steve and me and others who you know have cut our teeth over here and can bring really best practices and a you know and a, a mentality to Europe, I think, can be very helpful. And you have to do that because what you're navigating over there is, I mean, it's it's a little bit of the Wild West only in that there is no uh, regulations on ownership, so anybody can go buy these things. And so you're seeing a pulling away of England from the continent and right. the institute and the corporatization of ownership in England versus whereas on the continent, the only two institutional owners on the continent, I think, are Redbird and Qatar in Paris Saint-Germain. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's definitely a navigation that needs to go on, but we like to invest around arbitrages. It's actually a yeah. really interesting, and I'd be curious of everybody's view on it on the panel, but you, to your point about, uh, about ownership in Serie A and, and bringing some professionalism to, to it, which it, it was my experience as well, like having looked at a number of clubs to potentially invest in prior to doing LAFC over in Europe, mostly lower division teams to go through the, pro, the, you know, mm -hmm. the promotion idea. And actually, interestingly enough, Billy Bean was, was had advised me as well on yeah. some of the on, on, on some of those things. So it's funny to hear that he was also advising you when he was at AZ in, in the Netherlands. 
Um, but I, I think I think we're now at a point where American ownership in I, I don't know what it is in Syria, but I think it's more than half of the, it is of, of the eleven teams. of the twenty. Right. I think a couple got relegated, but eleven of the 20 eleven of the American. twenty there, and there's a there's a, a a large number of American owners in the Premiership. Although obviously, to your point, it, it is becoming a sport of kings, and, and and I don't mean that necessarily even in, like sort of metaphorically anymore. It's becoming a sport of you know the king of Bahrain, the king of Qatar, right. the king of Saudi Arabia. Um, literally a sport of kings. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see the American influence, I think, mm -hmm. on, on sort of club and organization, and whether or not we, it, it, it leads to a more rational salary capped, potentially, uh, probably not in the premiership, but maybe, maybe in some of the other European leagues. I'm curious what you, what you think about that. that look, I, I know that we, we can control what we can control. And so we're, we're certainly going to run this with a tremendous financial discipline. I'm, I'm a big believer in, in Billy's view that, you know, we don't have to sacrifice performance for cash flow. Um, and, you know, the biz, there's the on the field, you know, performance and there's the off the field performance. And we can bring a lot to Syria. Steve and I are effectively our competitors, but also partners in Syria. We were talking about this. Um, the Premier League is different, but, you know, there's also a very interesting dynamic in terms of the continent versus England. And, and how we all want to, I, I look at this as two levels of arbitrage. I think there's an arbitrage within Syria and there's an arbitrage, you know, in the continent and, and England. And, you know, we love that. Um, that's a huge opportunity for our kind of capital to be transformative in those settings. Yeah, I agree. It's, a, it's an incredible brand of football in Syria. You know, clubs like AC Milan, you know, Napoli, Napoli today can beat anybody, mm. could, win the, could win the whole thing. And uh, the, the saving grace is, is with good management, there are plenty of soccer players out there, plenty of football players out there, and if you're disciplined, you get the right ones, you can compete. And I think directionally, the Premier League and these leagues are stepping back saying, we've got to keep competitive balance. And so they beefed up financial fair play rules. Um, they're, they're, they've beefed up investigations and making, making sure people are playing by the rules. So we're going in the right direction. I think we need to go in the right direction quicker. Um, and that'll benefit all the teams, you know, both at a, both at a Serie A level, yeah. which I think is under marketed and, uh, and undervalued because of the quality of the soccer, and and then and then the whole the whole European football. It's hard, though, to have it, the, the the big issue is it's hard to do it in one market because players are fungible, to the Premier League, back to the Italian yeah. league, and so there's going to have to be some kind of global global situation that, that benefits everybody. It's also chicken and egg. I mean, the, there's a three to one media revenue differential between England and Italy. Yep. There's a two to one media revenue differential between La Liga and Italy. That's, that, it, you shouldn't have that disparity, but we got to address that because that's, that's the sort of tip of the spear of why this thing then circ it, it just snowballs into then all the money, all the economics, all the players, you know, get, go to England and then everyone else gets flying behind. So, you know, and the, but, but the good news is it, it, it may happen on, on an England basis because they're concerned about it as well. The issue they have is, is having you know, six perennial contenders or seven and, and, then, and then nobody else and everybody going up and down, which, which that wasn't the fundamental premise of creating the, all the different leagues in, 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 in Great Britain. And they've done that, that, that big study on it. And they may reallocate money to the lower clubs and, and, and also have rules about having, uh, you know, it's kind of sad not to have a lot of homegrown players. Right. It's great in Italy that, you know, you know kind of 60 or 70 percent of the players are from Italy. We have a mix of, 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 of foreign players. But if you get to a situation where, where no one is from the country, I think it's probably not great for the league, not, not, not great for the thing. So, so you, may, you may see um, some movement More just in the career league to, to yeah. protect the lower teams, to protect the players from England who want to play in England. Yep. Yeah, the le the valuation to your to the earlier discussion, I mean, I just took a look at it at an English club sort of maybe bottom six currently in the Premier League, that's uh, had an opportunity for a, for a significant investment, and so I did the di the diligence on it, and the valuation distinctions between the tiers, even in the Premiership, is remarkable. Like the top six are four billion and up, from six through twelve, it's sort of 800 million to about 400 million, and then below 12, it's under 400 million, which is, I mean, it's just an incredible disparity within, within, within a single league with, with, you know, with roughly equivalent revenue sharing. Obviously, there's distinctions based on where you place in the league, but still, it's remarkable. Yep. Yeah, at Fanatics, we see the same, like in terms of the jersey sales, right? You know, the, I mean, it's just extraordinary uh, dis disparity uh, between that. Uh, Steve, you, you talked uh, a little bit earlier, and you've been talking at Sloan for years about owning the Celtics as owning a community asset. Um, and so now you, you, know, you obviously have plenty of experience you know, here in Boston. 
But tell us about you know kind of the journey to actually going to a historic city, you know, in Italy and um, uh, in, in a historic club and, um, and and going you know as an American and uh, you know what does it mean to to have that community asset being an American and and how do you feel um, you know you're you're able to kind of shoulder that responsibility. Well, it's a great question. Uh, I, what I really liked about uh, Atalanta, and I think AC Milan has aspects of this as well, is it is a fabric of the community asset. And so the, all those, the, you, you have, you have uh, AC Milan, Inter Milan, um, our, our club Atalanta within 45 minutes of each other, and people live and die with the clubs. And, and so uh, we, we know it's more than just a, just a football team. It's part of, part of the community. So at the Celtics, the first day that we owned the team, I think they had $150 in the charity account. And so we formed uh, Boston Celtics Shamrock Foundation. And we've now, I think, give, given out you know, more than 25 million to the community. We've, we just started another thing called Boston Celtics United for Social Justice. Um, and our, our ownership group has, has committed uh, $2.5 million a year for the next 10 years to really, really focus on, on areas of social justice. Um, criminal, criminal justice reform. So very powerful community asset. I think that same thing is going to happen in Europe and going to happen in, in Italy at, at, as we come in and say, say we've really got to give back to the community. And the fans are just as fanatic. Uh, you know, Atalanta kind of is like the Boston Celtics. The, the Boston Atalanta is the same for Bergamo, the community there. And so I think you're going to see more and more outreach, more and more working with the community. And you get into a virtuous circle because the, 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 the community benefits by that, and then you have more fans, so it's, it's great for everybody. Yeah, that's great. So, and, and luckily, J Jerry and I happen to have uh, names with vowels on the end, so I, don't, I, don't, I, think, that, I think that helped us. I, I, when I got off the plane you know, to go to Bergamo, and I looked around, and, and like everybody looked like me. I felt at home immediately. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Came back to my grandfather's roots in, in Italy in 19, 1918. Yeah, so you're, uh, you're able to kind of you know, kind of sort of link, uh, link your, your heritage, you know, sort of, sort of back. Did, did, did the fans, does that resonate with the fans? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you know, as Jerry knows, Italians, you know, you know lo love Italians from all over the world. And, uh, and so it, it resonated uh, greatly. And, and it's just a fantastic culture. I love every, every second that, that I spend there. And uh, they're very open, you know, they're very open to, to, to new ideas and creativity. And, and, um, and they're some of the most passionate, passionate fans in the world. Yeah, no, it's great. Sometimes so, too passionate, right, Jerry? Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> and the media, the media, yes. the media is. You can uh, never have too many passionate fans, right? The media, uh, you know, the media in Europe. Uh, I, I know when I looked at the Chelsea Football Club, I, I think that was the whole in the whole auction. It was front page headlines yeah. every day yeah. globally um, because there's such interest in in football globally. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, the evolving ownership structures. Um, we've got new entrants joining, which was once the. Uh, you know, sort of the preserve of billionaires, right? So take private equity funds like Arctos, Dial, Dynasty, they're all buying minority stakes uh, in the teams. Uh, you know, Steve, let me start with you. Um, is the NBA and your fellow team owners, are they uh, embracing this evolution? Or do you see this as another driver of maybe this boom in valuations that we were talking about? You know, absolutely. I think Adam Silver has been uh, just a visionary commissioner. I, I can't say enough good things about Adam on how thoughtful he's been and progressive he's been on all, all aspects. Um, you know, part of the constraint, and, and certainly constraint in other leagues have been that if you don't allow institutional investors with these values being so hard, I, it's hard to find enough, you know, market people to buy clubs for three and a half, you know, $4 billion is a very, very small market. So having that liquidity provided by, by firms like Arctos, who, who's a very knowledgeable and, 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 and great firm and Redbird Capital before that, um, is, is, is very good for the leagues, and Adam has recognized that. So there are, there, are, um, there are structures put in place to protect the clubs and what they can do and can't do, and you have to make sure if you have an investment firm that's multiple uh, clubs that, that they can't be sharing information. But the NBA's put on those, all those appropriate pr protections, and, uh, and, and then that has an, an increased the value of the clubs because there's more liquidity, more capital available. So Jerry, what's your take on this new strategy in private equity? Well, I, I, you have to define private equity too. Right, there's, right. there's different types of, of of these these asset aggregators. Look, I mean, part of the job of the commissioners, and I agree with your comments on Adam. Um, part of the job of the commissioners is to continue this linear progression in valuations. Um, I, I think it's going to be hard to do that um, at these valuation levels unless you institutionalize 
the capital. Um, and so there's only so many deci-billionaires that can show up and, and you know, keep this, this progression going. So I think there's, I think this is, I don't think, you know, the leagues are going to turn on a dime, but I definitely think there's room now with the, given how sophisticated these assets are, given the scale and breadth of them, given what the opportunity set is going forward, I think there's absolutely room for professional investing uh, and institutionalized investing. Um, but, you know, I think they're going to, they're going to walk before they run, so you're not going to see it on a dime. Some of these, so the, these some of these asset al aggregators that buy minority stakes and teams do provide a liquidity function. You know, one of the, the tough things about Sports, you know, sports is only what it is today relatively recently. It, it wasn't really that way before. These were hobbies for relatively wealthy people. And so, the, and, and there's a lot of minority owners in these things that really don't have an ability to get out. Um, there's, no, there's no liquidity in, 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 uh, for minority investors. And so that's the first step towards maybe the entry point for professional investing. I think it makes an important point about differentiating the funds as well, because uh, funds like Arctos, um, Redbird, um, Dial have specialized in the area, and they, they know the ownership, they know the, the, the ball game. I think when, when general private equity gets involved, you know, you have to have a line, certainly bank capital, we would not buy a sports team uh, because we have to have a line with our investors. And, and you know, we're telling our investors we're gonna get a 20% rate of return, we're gonna look at the fundamentals, we're gonna look at cash flow, we're gonna look at, 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 at transforming businesses. So, so I think to, to buy equity investments in sports teams, you, you, have to, you have to have an investor base that says, we're buying into a, a rare asset class, more like art, and you're looking at, at, at appreciation more like art than you are at, at, at business building. And so, so funds like Arctos, their clients know that, and they look for capital preservation and a lower rate of return than you would as a general private equity firm. Now, I'm not saying it would never happen, because maybe there's some, some great turnaround situations where you can make the numbers work, right. but it's very hard to make the numbers work on a private equity basis to, buy, to control the club and buy equity when you're buying a club for $4 billion, $5 billion, because to triple your money, there's not much debt involved in these things, so to triple your money, the club's gotta be worth $15 billion, and maybe that'll happen someday, but that seems like a large number to me. Yeah, that makes sense. So I Mitch, what you guys. Uh, look, I, what I'd say is yeah. I, I agree with that. You know, we, we won't make an investment. In, my, my, our investment in, in the team side is we don't treat that differently than what we do on the business side or the business of sports. And so, you know, we, we won't make an investment where we're passive. We don't have our hand, uh, at least on the co-control. And, you know, as I said before, you know, we underwrite business plans going into these things so that we have an eye on how we're going to generate cash flow and we're going to rely on, on that and the way we do in any of our other companies. The only question is, you know, liquidity or monetizing. And right, and you're, and you're a specialist in the area, so you, you know exactly. where the pitfalls are. Right. It's hard for a general private equity fund to look at one sports team. Totally agree. Yep. So Mitch, last year on this stage, uh, we were talking blockchain and sports, and both Steve and you talked about the high likelihood of a DAO um, owning a, a major sports team. Um, and a DAO, for, for those that don't know, is a decentralized autonomous uh, organization that lives on the blockchain. So uh, one year and one crypto market downturn later, uh, do you still believe in the potential of DAOs as sports owners? I think it's less likely today than it was. I think. Um, Wait, did Mitch say that, or I said you said that, right? No, I don't know if I said. That. <laughs> I, I thought just, I was the skeptic. I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, well, we, we were talking blockchain, and I think I think there was some agreement that that. Um, yeah, a DAO we'll have to was, roll the tape. There but. was a, a DAO actually yeah. buying a club, or actually participating in a second right. division Mexican club at the time, and right. I think that's what we were talking about a year that's ago, right. which was that concept of sort of selling. The, the tokens as basically a governance token for uh, for a potential club. I think it would work potentially for at a community level where some of these clubs like you know what the if you if you've watched the Welcome to Wrexham documentary for example like clubs at that level where they're really almost community assets and you could imagine sort of ownership at that level for the kinds of things we're talking about. I doubt I don't think that's really very likely. Any any. Uh... A any views I would say it's, def it's definitely less likely, you know, given, given the crash. I think a DAO is, is an interesting concept, though, because uh, it, it really is fan ownership. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, 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 I remember way back when the Celtics were a limited partnership and people bought the shares not because of the value of the Celtics, it's because they wanted to have a share. I think it was $18 a share. The club value was maybe $30 million at that point in time. And, and it was $18 a share, and they have the certificate. Yep. And even when we bought the club, I think lots of people still have those certificates, never got, never got the money for it because they wanted the certificate versus the, the $500 you would have gotten for, for a share. So, so, so a, a DAO is 
maybe, maybe in the distant future when we really settle down in terms of regulation of crypto yeah, sure. and, 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 and the whole uh, digital money class, a DAO might become more acceptable and it might be a liquidity vehicle, not unlike a mutual fund. So a fan would have a small piece of a team and a representative you know, on, on an advisory board to the team. And that would you know, get our fans closer to us. If, if, if everybody, if a million people in, in, in Boston wanted on a small piece of the Celtics and a DAO could facilitate that, and we do that with, with, with still running the club in a, in a, in a disciplined way, you know, I, I don't think it's out of the question, but I think there's a lot of wood to chop in general. Uh, we, did, we just talked about this at the NBA Tech Summit uh, in general with regulation and, and what is digital money and separating digital money from Web3, separating that from tokens, and how do you regulate that so that actually this doesn't become something where, where fans get ripped off. Yeah. yeah. So let's move um, beyond sports ownership and talk about investments outside of teams and leagues. Uh, Jerry, Redbird's been investing in sports for years before you pursue the ownership angle. Uh, what non-team investments, you know, um, in the sports space hold particular appeal uh, to you right now? And, you know, maybe walk us through how you differ your strategy of sort of non-team investments versus kind of the, the team ownership investment. Yeah, look, the, the, the non-team investing, as I said, is, is really what our, our bread and butter has been. Um, and the model hasn't changed since we created the Yes Network back in 2001. Um, you know, this, uh, things were, I'd say right now, more and more, there's a convergence of sports, media, and even a third leg of the stool, culture. Um, you know, culture in America is urban, culture in Europe is fashion. Uh, and, you know, it, it's all part of, as, as Steve said, I mean, the, you know, in, particularly in Europe, you know, these assets are now, they're, they're public-private partnerships in Europe. Over here, it's a little less that. Um, but, you know, you're seeing, it, it all comes down to monetizing intellectual property. These are great intellectual property assets. Uh, and you've seen the, the fragmentation, you talk about the Dow, I mean, you, you, the fragmentation of intellectual property down to individuals now, right? So we've even gone as far as, you know, partnering with Dwayne Johnson on the XFL or, or, or partnering with LeBron on Fenway or even his media company, um, you know, Spring Hill. So we have, so I'd say our, our non-team stuff involves a lot of media. Um, you know, we've been playing the streaming phenomenon and the supply-demand imbalance coming out of original content production in Hollywood for a while. You know, the FANG stocks have disintermediated, you know, entertainment consumption, and that's dovetailed with the way consumers want to consume content. And so Sky, with Skydance, you know, the, our production business that we own with, the, with Larry Ellison, we did a joint venture with the NFL uh, to create a global sports production company called Skydance Sports. And so you should, you'll see a lot more of of that kind of programming coming out of that collaboration and around other rights. Obviously, we've got a great collaboration with LeBron and Maverick Carter on Spring Hill. Uh, and, you know, we own the Yes Network and we own Nesson through Fenway. Uh, and I think there's a tremendous opportunity there to help um, the commissioner think through a range of issues around the, this RSN phenomenon and how we might want to use that to not only fix the media uh, dislocation that's going on around the Sinclair assets, but also, you know, be a catalyst for how baseball might want to restructure itself. Drew, how do you, how do you think the Sinclair thing, you know, plays out? Look, I think, um, I think that, well, there's macro and micro. On a micro basis, I think uh, the, it's the creditors. Uh, and the question really is how do you get through this season? Uh, and I think they will find a way to get through the season, meaning that the games continue to get broadcast and the, and the teams, particularly the small market teams, get their media rights payment. Um, as part of a bankruptcy reorg. But then the question really is, how do you defease the RSN model to a national model? I think that's where it's going. Um, and um, I think that, you know, we're going to try to be a catalyst for that. Yeah. Um, so it all comes back to uh, media. Um, so, Mitch, at Benchmark, you guys have largely avoided investments in sports companies. Um, is it because you fundamentally don't see the ROI in sports? Or Not is there so something fundamentally different, you know, with a more Silicon Valley model? You know, our model is very early. I mean, we're primarily earliest early. of early. I mean, not seed investors, but sort of first institutional money, essentially. So um, our model really hasn't proven that susceptible to a lot of what's happening in sort of the startup culture. And really, you think about it, there's like maybe four categories of companies that we've, that we've looked at over the years. So there's like, you know, your employer, um, you know, e-commerce merchandising type stuff that's that, that's sports related that we've taken a hard look at gambling betting fantasy has been sort of a category and there's been a couple of interesting uh, companies that have emerged out of that but 
you know, re regulation is never our friend in the, in, the, in the early stage venture business. So we've always been a little reticent to, in, at least in the, in, the, in, in the past where fewer states had legalized it, you know, you were really talking about almost a state by state campaign to try, to try and go to market. And those things are tough to do with the limited capital of, a, of an early stage startup. Um, you know, there's been sort of some of the analytics and uh, kind of sports performance companies, training, those kinds of things, even fitness to a certain extent has been a category we've taken a really hard look at. And then some of the, the sort of more outliers, you know, we talked about the, the NFT stuff. We, we did a collectibles thing called So Rare over in, 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 uh, in Paris, um, which is, again, sports related. It's more on the intellectual, you know, sort of a way to monetize the intellectual property side of sports. So mm -hmm. I think those are the kinds of things we've looked at. And I would just say that those things have, haven't been as susceptible to investment, let's say, as some of these media businesses or even a, a team ownership for that matter. And those are places we really can't play. So I think that's part of the reason we've stayed on the sidelines as a firm. Yeah. And we, yeah, we've invested in bank capital in a, a company like Del Tatre, which is, which is a, a, a streaming infrastructure software platform, which I think is going to be really big as, as these clubs want to do their own yeah. thing. You know, right now, um, Bamtech was the leader in streaming, and Disney bought them, and they don't sell to other people. So right now, like, for example, Paramount Plus had to go out and, and as a TV station, build their own system to stream, which, which kind of sporadically works. Um, mm -hmm. It's not the greatest. But, but Del Tatre has, has built a, a package system, not unlike 30 years ago when I started, every, every company had their own accounting system custom built for $20, $30 million. You could buy a package now to do all that for $5 million. And so Del Trotri has done that. There's also payments companies uh, like TAP, my family office has done, that, that's a startup company that's doing um, cards that you, you, can, you can use to gamble or you can use to buy uh, one or two NBA games. So, so that's the whole financial services part of the sport area. And then obviously the merchandise and the products. My family also invested in a company called um, Noble, which is a, a niche um, growing very quick, quickly, a niche uh, uh, training shoe company, um, you know, for workout, workout fitness. Got it. Um, so let's talk about the, the leagues as, as, as sports uh, uh, investors. Are, are, are they good at investing in sports companies? Um, and the NBA seems to be slower than maybe some of the other leagues at actually taking equity investments or investing uh, in, uh, in, in sports companies. You know, I actually Thoughts? think the, the NBA hasn't been slower. Um, they, they've had investments in the, the theory at the NBA level with Adam Silver um, is if, 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 if a company can benefit by the NBA association, you know, we can, we can put some funds together and ride some of the equity upside. So, you, you know, as anything, you need a diversified portfolio. The NBA doesn't purport to be an expert on what's going to win or lose, but if it gets through the screen that the NBA teams want to use it, and the NFL has done the same thing, so then why, why don't we invest into it as well? You've got to do it on a diversified basis. It can't take over the league operations. But I think net-net, it, if, if, if it gets through that screen that it's appropriate for the NFL or the NBA, it's probably something that's interesting on a diversified basis to invest into. Got it. If, Look, I think the NFL has done a good, very good job. They have an entity called 32 Equity um, that each of the 32 owners contributes to. Uh, and they've, done, um, they, they've been very active. And we partner with them to create on location. Um, but look, I think this also goes back to the dynamic between the leagues and the teams. Uh, and I personally believe that the leagues in and of themselves, right now the leagues are portals for media deals. Um, they're sort of pass-throughs. I actually think it's a missed opportunity. I think, but you know, you, you would definitely have a view on this from the NBA side, but I think the league should have their own balance sheet, their own P&L, and, and they should be able to, but again, you had to figure out what the right balance is between that versus the teams, because you know, there's a, there is a subtle tension between the teams who, you know, these team valuations have, have, have escalated to such a degree that, you know, I always joke that it's like Putin and the oligarchs, except in this case, the oligarchs have taken over, right? And, and so what's the value of the league? But I do think there is a value that the league can, can uh, you know, importantly um, uh, develop relative to the teams where they can have a balance sheet, they can do investing that maybe, you know, the individual teams wouldn't do, but in aggregate, you know, it, it, it helps put some of these investments. And look, at Adam has done some of that in David Cern. They were early in China. People, you know, many people complained when they invested in, in China, and China then became, you know, a large opportunity. Right. They invested in Europe, the games in Europe, pretty early, money losing, but now, you know, yep. highly, highly, highly accretive. So um, I think Jerry's right that, that there's a place for that, and, and we ought to continue to go upward and outward. Look, we're in a completely 
like bizarro world in MLS because we're a single entity, right? So we, we don't even technically own our own club, right? We own a piece of the league. There's, you don't have that subtle tension that- Right, exactly. Like we have, we, well, we have a different kind of tension, right? We have the tension between the ambitious owners, which I would put mm -hmm. us and a couple of, of, of our peers in, in the category of, and the owners who have been riding the valuation wave and who don't really want to invest who just want to own the, the That's true of all sports, by the way. I'm sure. Of all leagues. Yes. Right. No, no, no. Right. But it's particularly <laughs> you're not, acute you're not, for us because you're not we, unique. It's yeah. definitely acute in, in MLS. Yes. Sure, it, it's right. really acute in MLS because the league, you know, the, the, the product strategy committee, the, the people who make the rules about how much we can spend essentially include people who don't want to spend. Right. So, it, you know, right. we, we, we get a lot of, we have a lot of friction yeah. in terms of, of the league's governance. It's, it seems like the big, you know, strategically for the MLS, the issue is going to be, it goes way back to Pele. Everyone is watching Serie A, Premier League, mm -hmm. because the best players in the world are there. Everyone's watching NBA because the best, best foreign players. players come to the NBA. So the MLS has to figure out how you get a mix of those stars in there. And certainly before some of them are, are 45 years old, how do you get those stars in there, either by development or, or, or attractive packaging? Yep. That's probably hard to do with a with everybody voting on on, on a full league basis. Yeah, it's true. In some sense, like, you know, it, we do have a little bit of a kind of what do we want to be when we grow up problem, right? Which is, do we want to be a selling league? So for example, I mean, you, you know, you have clubs like historically Atalanta or Udinese in Serie A, who, whose whole business model is not to try and compete to win, but it's to compete to sell players onto the Premier League or to- We've changed that now a lot. I, I, I appreciate <laughs> that. But that has historically been the case. And similarly, you have clubs in Spain and clubs in Germany, et cetera, who's, who, are never, who know they're not gonna compete with Bayern Munich yes. or Dortmund right. for, the, for the championship, but who are, are gonna play to sell players on. And that may be a function, that may be a way that MLS plays in the global market on a, on a, broader, on a broader scale. Hmm. Well, this is the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. So I want uh, to talk about the value that uh, you brought um, in terms of analytics you know, to your teams. Uh, Jerry, when you bought Toulouse, it was uh, playing in France's second division. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you get the team? How did you leverage analytics to get it back to League One? Yeah, look, I, I'd say there, there is also a, a facile notion about analytics. Uh, just to be clear, everybody uses that data today. Um, we have a data company called Zealous uh, that, um, you know, we all get the same data feeds, but I think the way they use that data, I think, is somewhat proprietary to them. It's really interesting at the end of the day. You know, when you look at Toulouse, um, I think we have players from 18 different countries, and really that, that, that squad was put together solely through data analytics, not, not a lot of scouting. Um, and it was an experiment to see, and, and within a year, you know, we got promoted. We're playing right now. We're middle of League One, and I'd say we probably are, uh, we're playing at a level that is two and a half times what our net transfer uh, payroll is. Yeah. And so that, also, Skynet is running Toulouse, huh? Right, right exactly, <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. But, but look, I mean, that's, it's a smaller team, and, right, and, yeah. and but it is instructive, though. I mean, right. I, I, think, I definitely think that, um, uh, data has more and more of a role to play, but it's going to be a hybrid, particularly at the bigger teams, it's going to be a hybrid between the, the, the human touch and the data touch. Yeah. So Mitch, what role did you and analytics play in the run-up to your recent MLS Cup victory? Yeah, we, we built a, a data practice. Um, interestingly, you know, I went on kind of a tour around the league when I, when I joined the ownership group and sort of all the friends I had made here at the conference, I had sort of picked their brains about best practices and they were probably overly generous and probably regret it in, re in retrospect, given how competitive we've been. Um, they sort of opened the kimono and told me sort of what, what, how, what, what I should do, basically, in terms of building that data practice. And interestingly, it was, I thought they were gonna tell me, oh, develop a game model, figure out how to, be how to, how to analyze your competition, et cetera. They didn't, they said, look, you're in a ruthless salary cap league with, where, you're, where you really can only afford 14 or 15 decent players, you need to keep your best 11 on the field at all times. And so over invest in sports science, over invest in uh, you know, sleep, tra physical training, uh, nutrition, other things like that, that you wouldn't think you, you would need to invest in necessarily. You would think that you'd be applying sort of the sexier kinds of analytics that, that we talk about at this conference. And in fact, 
that's paid huge dividends for us because we've been able to keep our best players on the, on the pitch and, we, and, and it makes a lot of difference in a league with the kind of constraints we operate under. I think that's a great point. You know, when we bought the Celtics in 2003, um, they didn't have any data analytics and we had all read the, the Billy Bean book and we said, can we apply this to basketball? So we hired actually Daryl Morey from hmm. MIT. Yeah. Um, Co-founder of this conference. Co-founder of this conference and, and uh, and then he hired Mike Zarin, who's with us still today. And we started to build these kinds of models, uh, proprietary models, and, and Jerry's right. The data's out there, but I think the key is how do you analyze the data and, and, and what's relevant and what's not relevant. We're, we're on model 20.0 now. And the first one was very rudimentary. Yeah. It kind of said rebounding was undervalued, you know, was the, was the output of that. Now it's, it's incredibly sophisticated, proprietary with where does somebody shoot from? What are the percentages? How, how does that help a team? So that's been enormously valuable. I think football has started to do that, and certainly in Italy it hasn't taken wide scale yet. But we actually, we actually have hired analytics, an analytics person in Atalanta, and we brought the whole sports science team over to the Celtics, and they met with their counterparts. And there's just a lot of similarities between basketball and football um, in terms of conditioning, uh, load management, all those same, passing the ball, accurate passing. So we're porting those over to Atalanta, and the Atalanta management's been very open to that. Lee Congerton, our general manager, and Luca Percassi have been fantastic. So we've got a great, and I'm, I'm sure that happens in the multi-club strategy that mm -hmm. you have as well. The one thing you can share is, is, is how you look at players, how the analytics are, and, 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 what, and what that, how it affects the club. So I think it's huge. Great. So I have some questions uh, from the audience. Keep the, your questions coming. Um, uh, it's, this one's for, actually for Jerry. Uh, it says, in what ways does the possibility of a European Super League affect your view on the operating model and the exit strategy for AC Milan and uh, Liverpool? No, not at all. I, look, the Super League as a phenomenon was a failure, so it's not as instructive to talk about that. What is instructive is to ask the question, why did it happen? And it happened because, you know, it's the same phenomenon you have in the States in certain leagues. In baseball, there's a big market, small market tension. Um, you, you noted the tension in MLS. It's the same thing in Europe. Uh, the tension in Europe is uh, the Premier League versus the continent. That's why it happened. You know, the thing about sports is that um, you, you can't buy championships. And as much as I would love to win the Scudetto every year and win Champions League every year, if we did that, that actually is counter countered to what our job is. Our job is to make a return on this investment. And if the same groups won every year, that would not work. Right? Um, that, would, that would actually be value um, dilutive. Um, what we can control is the, to lower the amplitude and the volatility of performance. So the thing I find phen phenomenal is that a lot of guys get into sports and they think that the goal is to win championships. Well, yes, I mean, we all wanna win, but that's not, if you're looking at it purely unemotionally as an investor, the goal is to be consistently performing. The only person I've seen who sort of has been able to get away from that a little bit is, is Jerry in Dallas, who is just a phenomenon in, in, in and of himself and a genius in the way he, he does what he does. But, you know, he, that's one of the most valued teams in, in history and, and they haven't, had, they haven't got, won a Super Bowl in a, in a long time. But so the, the thing on the Super League or answering the question is that it, that, that is a distraction. What, what, what we have to focus on is being competitive not only within Serie A, but also helping Serie A be competitive relative to La Liga and, and England. And as I noted, the media revenue differential, uh, you know, guys like Steve, myself, a handful of others, we should get together in Serie A. We were talking about this before. And we should think about how we can help Serie A you know, get the right kind of low, uh, domestic and international media contracts to lower that delta. And if we do that, you know, it'll enhance the entire, you know, FIFA system because, you know, the continent will start to, you know, become more competitive to England. Yeah. Uh, another question, uh, it says, as we're talking about the growing valuations in sports, how are you as investors thinking about women's sports? Mitch? Yeah, yeah we, I, I, I'm really encouraged by a lot of what's going on, particularly the NWSL uh, in, on, on the football side has been really interesting and we have a, a club that plays in our stadium that we share a lot of facilities with angel city um prim but it's 100 percent woman owned um and it's a, a really a kind of a great community asset in, in in the way you were talking about before so um i think that's really interesting i've, I've taken a look at the wnba just uh through through some friends but, but is there an opportunity there 
I'm not really sure as much about that as I, I think I think soccer is maybe potentially more viable as a, in, at least in the U.S. And certainly we've seen what's happened in Europe. I don't know if you followed the the Euros, uh, the, the women's Euros, but the attendance in England was off the charts. The the viewership on television was off the charts, and I think that's super encouraging for the future from a value perspective. Yeah, I'm 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 bullish on on that as well. Um, you know the the uh, the need for programming. People love you know, real-time programming and competitive sports, and and the women's certainly the women's soccer leagues have been fantastic. You know, viewing experiences, and I think all these leagues can do that. So that's, that may be the next wave of creating you know more compelling programming beyond the beyond the ones we have today. The the other aspect is. Um around that dynamic, which is something we have been thinking a lot about, is what we're doing with the XFL. I mean, the XFL, the Spring Football League, we launched with Dwayne Johnson and Danny Garcia, is the first professional sports league owned by an African-American and a woman. And if you look at our front office, um, it, it, the diversity there, particularly with women, um, is pretty profound. And so, you know, given our relationship with the NFL and our relationship with Disney, I think that's another great way to sort of get more uh, women involvement in sports. So uh, another one from the audience. How does the apparent trend of younger fans focusing their support more on players than teams impact your outlook on sports investing? That's an interesting question, a very interesting question. I think the, the good thing about that is it's now made all the NBA club, clubs competitive. So it used to be every single star wanted to be in a large media market because that's where they got extra ancillary revenues uh, with, with – um, the internet, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, they've, they've made players from all sorts of teams global players. And, and therefore, there's more fan interest. And, and, and so I have no problem with that. I mean, I, I would like a system where we could develop and keep the players longer. And I think that that's would be really great for the, for the NBA um, because it just creates that bond you know, when, when we grew up. The same players were on the Red Sox and on the Celtics for Bill Russell was you know 13 years and Havlicek and and uh, all the all all the players stayed their whole careers, so we've lost some of that. Uh, but but I, but I think we can get some of that back with with structuring it so that the players can make ancillary revenues and be, be in the smaller markets and 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 have a career with the community. So uh, I, w I want to you know ask you guys to take a step back and because um, we have many. Uh, future sports investors uh, in the room here. And, um, you know, I want you to kind of think back and kind of knowing what you know now, um, what would you have liked to tell your 20-something self? You know, again, with, with respect to, uh, you know, how you got to be an investor in, in sports. What, you know, what, what have you learned, you know, kind of, you know, through it all that uh, you can impart uh, to, to the folks here? Maybe, Mitch, I'll start with you. Well, I keep coming to the Sloan Conference would be my, uh, would, would be my short answer. But uh, no, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I necessarily have a good answer to that one. I, I, I think um, le learning to be a good investor generally, learning sort of the, the nature of, of these things and understanding valuations. And I think Silicon Valley has been really useful for that because valuation in Silicon Valley is historically very seldomly correlated with discounted cash flows, right? Like, um, it's, a, it's a lot about, you know, the... Although we're kind of back to the future now on that. We're coming back, but we're still not there. Uh, <laughs> trust me, I'm, I'm living through the AI boom in Silicon Valley these days, and it is non-correlated with discounted cash flows. So, um, so I think that's been actually, that was good practice for sports, um, weirdly enough. Jerry? Look, I mean, the, I got lucky with the model that we developed with Steinbrenner and, and just kept perpetuating, which was to partner with the rights holders and build these businesses around them driven by cash flow and long-term contracts, right? Um, if I, you know, my, the advice to my 20-year-old self would have been, I, I, did, I created Yes with Steinbrenner when I was 33 years old, so that's my 33-year-old self would have been um, the inkling that we had a few years later to go buy Liverpool at a $350 million valuation. Um, Goldman shut me down on that, and um, you know we, we we would have done that a lot earlier, and and that would have been that would have been pretty good. Formula One's another one. I mean, yeah, I couldn't yeah. get comfortable with the Concord Agreement and the, and the situation with with the pre-Liberty formulations around Formula One, um, but you know the, the, that period you could make you could take an uh, uh, irrational risk to your point on on the private equity uh, involvement and do really well. Yeah. I'd say today you can't. Right. Uh, so. 
I would say, you know, follow your passion, and there are lots of different avenues into sports and sports ownership. And so um, you can come up through the analytics side, you can come up through the media side, you can come up through the legal side. So, um, but you really have to be passionate about it. And if you're passionate about it and, and uh, really, really study and, and care, there's, there's, there's going to be great success. Great. So I have one final question um, for each of our panelists. We've been talking a lot about valuations. What team will command a higher price, Manchester United or the Washington Commanders? Steve, I'll start with you. I say Commanders. Yeah, Jerry? It's going to be close, but I'll probably agree with that. Yeah. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll check back in a, in a year and uh, see, uh, see who was right. Well, please join me in thanking our all-star panel for their wisdom. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Saj.
Ladies and gentlemen, our program is about to resume. Please begin taking your seats at this time. As a courtesy to the presenters and the people seated nearby you, please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. Thank you. Can y'all hear me? Awesome. I hope that you're all excited. In my opinion, this is the best panel of the night. So get really excited about this. So hello, everybody. I'm sure you've been welcomed many, many times. But welcome to the Sloan Sports Analytic Conference 2023. My name is Diego Carrasquillo. I'm a first year MBA student at Sloan. And it is my pleasure to present this all-star panel here, um, the future of fan innovation, data, and always on engagement presented by Ticketmaster. So our panelists today are Mary Donahue, Vice President of Amazon Global Sports Video, Renee Anderson, Chief Revenue Officer and Executive Vice President of NFL Partnerships, Valerie, oh sorry, Valerie Camillo, President and CEO, Spectacor, Spectacor Sports and Entertainment, and then Jessica Gilman, CEO of Crass Analytics Group. Our panel will be moderated by the awesome Shelly Pissarra, Executive Vice President, there we go, Global Insights and Strategy at Wasserman. The panel will run for about 45 minutes and then we'll leave 10 minutes for questions. Please submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag Fan Innovation and then we'll be feeding those to Shelly. So Shelly, take it away. All right, thank you. Here, let's hear it for Diego. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Good? Yeah, good. Um, we agree with Diego. We think this is the best panel of the day as well. Um, how can you deny that with this rock star group we have up here? So our topic today is fan innovation. Um, and we're going to come at it from all sorts of different angles, different channels, um, the behaviors that we've seen accelerate over the last couple of years, um, what's, what's staying, what's going, what's a fad, what are we going to capitalize on, and frankly, how do we just keep putting the best dang product on the court, on the pitch, on the screen that we possibly can. So let's get started because I think everyone wants to hear from us. So we're going to start with what are the shifts we're seeing in the expectations around a fan experience, no matter the sport, kind of no matter the location. And we're going to start with kind of the queen of the fan <laughs> ecosystem, Ms. Galman. Um, we would love to hear from you what you're seeing in the shifts of the expectations. Well, one of the great parts about the work that we do at Kager is that we get to see across all of the leagues and industry players how, how fans are engaging differently. And the shift post-pandemic has been pretty significant. You know, we, uh, we did some work with a client earlier this year, and we learned that 60% of uh, sports fans have uh, multiple teams within the same league that they consider to be their favorite. I think about, you know, when I was young growing up, like the teams I was a fan of were the teams that my parents were a fan of or the city that I lived in. And we're seeing today often that in the same household, the, the children and the uh, parents have, have different teams that they're rooting for. Earlier today, um, I moderated the panel discussion on player power. And I thought the comment that um, Tamika said about how many fans or people, followers, LeBron has versus the Lakers and it's 7X ring so true. Mm -hmm. We're seeing like the demise of RSNs. And so in short, fans have more access <laughs> to data on a much wider uh, level. They can engage in it in many different ways. We're seeing incredible things that are happening. And uh, fans also have more power and agency. And they're engaging differently and following teams differently. And it's, it's powerful. And the results of all of this is we're seeing higher attendance, higher ticket prices, in part because fans are traveling 
out of their markets to see the teams and the players that they want to see. That is a massive, massive shift that is being driven off of all of the work that we're all doing mm -hmm. to engage the fans better and differently. Mm -hmm. How are you tracking and trying to understand these changes? What are you guys doing to better listen to, to what these expectations are? Rainy, I'll kick this to you. <laughs> to me. To you. I'm paying attention. You know what's <laughs> interesting as we think about it, and I was, as, as Jessica was saying, rather than some of the tracking is you see, but you try to test and learn. And so we've spent a lot of time with some of our partners, Amazon is one of them, on the alternate broadcast, providing you know, shoulder programming to really, mm -hmm. that supports that traditional linear broadcast. You know, the Mannings really started that with the Manning cast. Sure. Uh, Amazon was doing it for a few years before, uh, although it was just audio. Continue. Yes, <laughs> and Amazon, <laughs> the barbershop with LeBron and, and Mav Carter, which they've done some great things, our Nickelodeon broadcast. Uh, for kids to really bring it to life. We have a, um, and also a broadcast for specifically for sports bettors. I mean, we have 187 million fans, and so we need to make sure that we're feeding the appetite for that fan um, differently, mm -hmm. not all the same, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's been really interesting as we, as we have done some testing and learning and to see um, where we can continue to grow those areas. And, and, and look, some things do really well, other things don't. I think what we learned during the fan behavior shift from COVID is just fans, everything was really accelerated. Fans wanted more collectibles, you know, trading cards right now, you know, and, and NFT business, which has been volatile and we've all seen that, really increased so much. And so for us, we've tried to test and learn. Um, and now it's a little, I almost say too soon on how we're tracking and how that's going because there's still a lot of testing that's happening. Yeah, would you agree that COVID gave us almost more of a safety net to do more testing and learning? I don't know if it, like, it, it pushed us off forward just pushed us quick. quick. And it's like you either, well, you either are going to jump in or you're going to be left behind. Right. And so I think it's an opportunity. We talked about doing things prior to COVID that we're going to be a little slower. We're always slow at the NFL. We take our time. We don't need to be the first because when we do something, we got to get it right. And I think what happened is we moved forward really quickly on a lot of things. Sports betting is a great example of that of really thinking about not obviously just the, the integrity of the game, responsibility, which are important, but the engagement for those consumers and how that's going to circle back to the engagement of when they're watching. Are they buying tickets? Mm -hmm. Are they buying merch? Are they, are they betting just on their team or other teams? And so that, that part of it's been really interesting and probably did move faster than we would have done. From the, so I run an arena, so from the live venue experience, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm Sick of talking about the pandemic, so I'll lead by talking about the pandemic, right? <laughs> um, for, you know, we had assumptions um, when, we were during, when we were during our shutdown phase that, you know, what's going to happen afterwards? And it, everyone, myself included, there's probably quotes from me in media, we're like, it's going to be the roaring 20s. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be party and crazy and people are going to come flooding back. And in fact, if you look across society, what's really happened is people have become more homebodies. They've got their home delivery, they've got their streaming. Um, you know, you can't find a restaurant open after eight o'clock at night in many cities. The malls are shut early. Like we become lame as a society in many ways. So I, so I, and it, like I've Instacart. heard. I love Instacart. I wish I had invented it. I love it. I don't have to ever go to a grocery store again in my life. It'll be it's okay. Like, love it. So, you know, so, for, so for, for us, like we are, we have to think really carefully about how do we excite people to get them yeah. to come out to live, to live events. And it's returning for sure. But we are being much more um, aggressive around our, our data capture and analysis around guest experience. And so we're doing NPS research in a way that we never did before. We're doing uh, multi-factor guest satisfaction surveys. We're doing focus groups almost every game. And we are, are, are taking that data to inform practically what we do to improve the guest experience. Mm -hmm. And because otherwise, like, who cares? You do all these surveys and you don't change anything. You know, we learned a lot about our, our ingress and egress experience. We implemented Evolve technology to speed fans through the gates. We um, changed the way our, our parking flows and how many, how many uh, parking takers do we have. All of this stuff, and I think you have to have a really seamless experience to, to, for people to come, pull them out and then say, hey, that was great, and I'll come back. Yeah, absolutely. Are you seeing, given the behavior we just talked about, where maybe folks are traveling further, they like multiple teams, are you seeing more first-timers in your building? than you did before, even if we're becoming lame as a society and 
it's a lot to get them there, but are you seeing more first timers? So in Philadelphia, what you described does not happen as much where the, the kid and like everybody, like Philly is like Philly for life. Philly. Like you, you're, <laughs> your teams and you're not really diverging that much. Now, maybe kids are in, in, in different ways, but like Philly is a very, very specific sort of place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that, you know, for, for, for us, when, when, when we are looking at um, what we're doing, like we, we just did a massive transformation of our, mm -hmm. of our arena. Uh, putting Second biggest, right? Yeah, it, it, th over yeah. three hundred fifty million dollars, and as we've thought about, you know, we've made that custom, customized and personalized to very specific segments, and we use data to do that, and recognizing, you know, hey, how do we evaluate whether or not we were successful in what we did? Mm -hmm. And our NPS data shows we're up thirty percent pre and post transformation. Our guest satisfaction scores blended are up twenty two percent, and so that's a way to validate to what you've done yeah. to like yeah. uh, enhance the fan experience. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's amazing. And congratulations on that, by the way, because what, what an amazing thing to have done all that work and, and drive that experience. I just want to point out, though, like what Val is saying that she's doing, she, the, the work that she's doing, she's combining both the qualitative mm -hmm. data of what the consumers are saying and the quantitative data that is, is more enriched now with the Evolve and the other different uh, mechanisms that you're using to then make decisions to move things forward. And it has to be both what the consumers are are saying and what their actions are doing to make those decisions. In, in fact, our process was very driven in what you just said, like a marriage of data mm -hmm. and story. So I started um, in 2019, and we were just getting ready to launch the major uh, internal enhancements to the, to the concession, the fan-facing areas of the arena. And um, I saw the architect renderings, and they were beautiful. It could look like a, a, you know, a boutique hotel anywhere in the world, fantastic. But it lacked. Um, like, what was the story? What was mm -hmm. the creative narrative behind it? And so we, you know, I pulled together a working group and I said, what does the data show? We have phenomenal data on our customer segments and, and who, are, who our guests are. And I said, I said okay. And I put, pulled together a working group that looked a little bit like our customer segments, as much as we were able to from, from within our employee base. And I said, if we had to pitch this to our, to our guests, what would that sales pitch or that press release look like? Mm -hmm. And it was hard because there was no, there was no story. It was beautiful. But, and so then I said, let's begin with the end in mind. Like, write the press release, write the marketing materials to describe the spaces that we're building. And in doing that process, the spaces got incredibly creative. And it didn't necessarily change the bones of the architecture at all. It changed the story. And so um, we began at the end, worked our way back, and I think we created something really special. That is art and science really coming together. That's fantastic. I do have to jump in for a sec. So at Amazon, we do these things called PR FAQs with all our major decisions, anything that's going to be customer facing. And it's a, it's a press release for what your product will bring to fans. So it's a way to really start with the fan or the customer yeah. instead of, and it, it's, it's an exercise when you get there, it's kind of a little strange. Why am I writing a press release about a product that I'm going to launch in two or three years? But it really does get you to focus. You, you really realize, oh, this is like a good business, not a great fan experience. Right. So mm -hmm. it's a great way to, to focus on the customer. As you write that, is that giving you then almost your roadmap for the data you need to make the decisions? Yeah, I mean, we're in a slightly different situation than these guys because I love, I love um, the way they're using data and what they've all been doing um, at their companies. We are streaming first property. You know, we're part of a, a prime, member, prime membership. So we had to literally start from scratch. Mm -hmm. How do you stream live sports? So when I started a few years ago, every, no one thought you could actually do it. Yeah, you can do it for a couple hundred thousand. Good luck with a couple of million. So we've really focused on building the infrastructure, um, incredible investments, incredible work. We, we really um, got our sea legs in Europe where we've served you know, millions and millions of fans in the Premier League and then Champions League. And then when we had, um, when the NFL was nice enough to trust us with Thursday Night Football, and Rini's been a great partner, obviously, um, we really had, to, what were we going to focus on? And yeah. for us, it was assume success. Assume we're going to have 10 million or so fans come. We ha it, it has to work. It has to be easy to find. It has to have low to no latency. And so that was, you really have to get that credibility. And then we said, what do we know, what do we think we know about OTT users? Right. We kind of assumed they'd probably be younger. Um, we'd learn from our TriCast that they stay longer. Um, so we designed an experience, number one, 
the best broadcast we could possibly do. We have state-of-the-art trucks. We have more cameras than any other NFL game except the Super Bowl. So really invested, and we said, how can we reinvent without distracting fans? So we really focused on the talent and what we were going to put in the main broadcast. So we've got, you know, when you hear Al and Kirk and Kaylee on the main broadcast, you just exhale. That, that's what we needed people to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the pre, post, and halftime, we started from scratch. We put draft picks. We got three guys right out of um, out of the NFL, had never worked on camera before, and you know, Carissa Thompson, Taylor Rooks, an you know, incredible group of young, diverse talent. And we're they knocked it out of the park, by the way. Um, and also, we're really excited to see the audience, them grow, and the audience grow along with them. And so we've been really happy how it's gone. But for us, it's like, what do fans want to see? How do we create this huge big tent? We can talk later about different, I tease Rini, because we did do audio. The, the ESPN was the first to do the video all broadcast. Video. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Potato, potato. I know, exactly. <laughs> um, but we did do all broadcasts and things like that, which we can get into. But first and foremost, we're, we're offering live sports. Don't mess it up. It, of course, of course. Were there any big surprises? So as you went through year one, were there any big yeah. surprises? In, um, how great our talent was, because when you okay. get three guys right off the field, I mean, we knew they were amazing, and we knew Carissa should get producer credit on the show and Taylor had never done NFL she just did she, but she was so incredible on NBA so um, I'd like to think we knew it would all play out as excellently as it did that was a little so that was a happy mm -hmm. coincidence I mm -hmm. wouldn't want to say a surprise because we were really careful who we picked the other thing that's not it's probably not surprising but the data all shows it um, besides, like I said, the audience is younger. Our NFL fans are seven years younger than the other NFL, uh, than the average NFL fan. Um, they watch longer. Um, also, uh, those who engage, so we have a thing called X-Ray where you can engage with replays and stats and things like that. If people who engage in the broadcast watch longer. So anyone who plays with the stats and replays, they generally watch 30% longer. So none of this is, I wouldn't say it's surprising, but as an OTT broadcaster, we've been able to customize and personalize and offer these options. Even when we did Dude Perfect, and then I'll be quiet. Um, when we yeah, did Dude Perfect, Perfect was yeah, which was Dude Perfect. I don't know if you guys know the dudes. Mm -hmm. They have a huge um, YouTube channel and huge social media following. And so we're like, how can we, um, one of the reasons we partnered with the NFL, well, we both really want to innovate and focus on younger fans. How could we make that, yeah. that interactive? And it was just a linear feed on Prime Video, but they had interactive challenges and things like that where you could watch families um, watch the game together and engage with the game. So it doesn't have to be high tech, but mm -hmm. if they're engaging, they watch longer. One thing, one, if, for those of you on Twitter, I always tell people, if you want to totally cleanse your Twitter feed, search the dudes and Thursday Night Football, because it's like hundreds of photos of kids and their families watching football. It's, it's really sweet. That's awesome. So, Rainey, as you think about that, and the two of you obviously are working really closely together, and you see the role that Amazon's playing in seven years younger, you just mentioned, right? So, Thursday night, check. So, as you're thinking about kind of continuing to grow your fan base, keep that loyalty going, does it allow you to focus then elsewhere? You're like, great, we know what we're doing here. This is working in year one. How can you kind of shift the way you're thinking about fan engagement and the rest of the time that they're engaged with you. Yeah, our big focus, and we're always really encouraged to not be complacent. And, and that means that even though, you know, we're killing it in a variety of places with all of our partners on through television and through, through um, our digital partners, um, that we can't take our foot off the gas. And so as we think about internationally, how we can continue to grow, um, that's a huge priority and a focus for us. And we've been playing internationally for a long time. We've got games in London. Um, we have played in Mexico. We just this year played a game in Germany. And I think through what we have learned from those experiences, we know that that's not going to be enough, just yep. playing games. Like sometimes I'll go, if a, if a European soccer team comes to New York, I'll, we'll take our family, we'll all pick a team, we buy merch. It's like the circus is coming to town, right? And it's, it's a great experience, but I don't follow that team any longer. And what we want to make sure is that we're building from the ground up. And so we've worked with our clubs. Uh, it's called international home marketing uh, uh, area where teams are going into markets. Really building that fandom from the ground up doesn't mean there's going to be a, a game played there. Right. Never say never, you never know. But to 
to start to build uh, from the ground up that engagement and that fandom from teaching the game, kids playing flag, for, and possibly player development. And we have a, you know, a big uh, effort right now going on in Ghana and Nigeria for player development. And there are so many opportunities that the game itself from on the field um, into the home when you're watching it have the opportunity to expand. And, and international is a place where we're really spending a lot of time. Yeah, that's fantastic. You were saying a bit yesterday in the prep, like how vast is the levels of development of the game itself? I mean, you're mentioning Ghana, and then we're talking about Germany, Mexico. Well, it's the so UK. funny. We always, everyone talks about what you know. What are you doing in Africa? And we're like, guys, that's a continent, not a country. <laughs> um, yeah. And so we're really going in and thinking about where we have deep roots, where our players are, where they've been born, where they're coming from. We also know where there's deep fandom. Germany loves American football. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had, had a league there years ago. And, and having the, um, the footprint in the, in the game this past season was a huge success. And that appetite that we know is there for football is huge. And so how we can continue that is, is it's really important. But I think the work that the teams are going to be doing in these key markets um, is going to be really important and very valuable for the future of global American football or global football is what we would say to really have an impact and 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 I think we're really excited about that it's yeah. but it's going to take a lot of work I mean and and I think that's from you know teaching the game playing the game I mean you know a lot of times trends will go around the globe a lot of times even begrudgingly people might say they 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 hate Americans but if they hate us, but then you see our music is there, our food is there, our celebrities are there, the music is there, and our sports are there. Yeah. And so I think there's some real opportunity to grow there that we, that we maybe our expectations will be um, completely exceeded as our teams start to really dig in. But that's local market, um, in market, like grassroots takes a lot of time. And yeah. it takes a real productive patience. Yeah. And so we're not gonna see that overnight, but in 10 years, the way that we look globally, I think we'll look, you know, it will, it should have an impact. Yeah, that's fantastic. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Hope, guys. Exactly, we hope, we hope. So sticking a little bit with the international theme, I'm gonna go back to you, Marie, in terms of you guys are building quite a global roster now at this point. Talk a little bit about how you have to approach things differently, you know. Yeah, I mean, sports league. are ultimately local, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we've had some great experiences. We have the U.S. Open in the U.K., and then we were lucky enough to get Roland Garros in France. And if you want to see two different types of coverage, mm -hmm. you know, in the U.K., they want a lot of U.K.-focused announcers, unless it's Martina or McEnroe, someone that breaks through. It's otherwise very similar, more about the local players. It's very similar to how we cover tennis in the U.S. You go to Roland Garros, they talk through every point. They're practically sitting there smoking, having conversations. <laughs> so what, what we found, what, uh, that's a joke, so. You're not lame in France. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what we found is we, really, we hire and we work with local production groups um, to make sure we get that right. So that's why I'm so fascinated what you guys are doing with the home market, because you really do mm -hmm. have to, we, we try to bring we want to be um, younger, um, more diverse, um, bring more, more interactivity, but, but we never want to distract the fan. It's always about optionality and something that's intuitive and, and additive if they want it. Right. Um, so we've, we've had a lot of success in Europe doing that, but ultimately you have to start to understand um, the local fan. And then we've got, we just signed a deal a few months ago for the NBA in Brazil, which is a great opportunity for us because the NBA is still growing in Brazil. So even your business partnerships, as you guys have experienced, are very different um, country to country. We have, we have huge success in Japan with a boxing deal we did that we convinced top rank to give us local boxers, like people who people in Japan, boxers and ex-MMA artists, MMA fighters who are becoming boxers, which is one of our biggest boxing matches, um, who's really relevant in Japan. And so working with your partners to really make sure it's relevant and something that excites the local market is something that's really fun and I think necessary table stakes. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, so I think what, what I'm hearing across all of this is that it's very focused on personalizing the experience for the fan, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to do that, we have to have a great understanding of who the customer is. We have to know how they want to be engaged from a channel perspective. Mm -hmm. And we need to know what specific product, whatever that is, uh, what type of ticket they want to come, do they want to have a game, what type of broadcast they want to watch. 
And like the heart of all of this is can we harness the data that's out there in order to give our fans the best experience possible? And I think And that's the journey that, that we've been on. So, you know, one of the things when I started was we had we had data, we had analytics, but you know, it was an on site server. Um, it was very difficult to pull anything useful out of it. And our anal our analysts were spending their time cleaning to even try to get a data set rather than really analyzing. And if you're an analyst in the room, you know the difference. And how many hours you're spending on the former versus the latter really matters to the outcomes. And you know, let me brag on Jess for a minute here because you know, through Kager and the work that we've done with them, we now have a really clean, clear, single view of the customer, about 2.5 million unique customer um, data sets. And we have the ability to, to, to use it in a, in a variety of creative ways and drive sales that we didn't have before. And I'll give you two just you know, specific examples of that. One's kind of funny and, and one's kind of sad. I'll start with the sad one. So we have, <laughs> we're, we are, you know, Philadelphia Flyers, not a secret. Our team performance has been down um, his, <laughs> historically, to say the least. And so, you know, we have a lot of disengaged fans. Mm -hmm. And um, we have people who haven't opened our emails or, or engaged with us in years. And we're trying to find ways to have them turn their head back to us and pay attention to us as we continue to struggle on the ice. And so through some of the data that we have, we've been able to say, OK, we have a, we have a clean look now at people who've really disengaged. And we're going to approach them with a different campaign. Instead of just sending a buy a ticket or this event or that event, we sent them surveys that said, why are you disengaged? We didn't use those words, but that, mm -hmm. that's the theme of it. And, through, and they answered us. Right, because right. now they're they're getting something tailored, and a lot of them want to tell us. Like if you really want to know, they're really going to tell you. You're right. <laughs> but 2,500 fans in this test campaign we did came back and bought again, because like we listened to them and we heard them, and we would not have been able to do that before. And then the last one I'll say is, so we just hired a very senior um, executive into the Comcast family, and they were they were coming uh, to games quietly and and sort of watching and looking. Well, our data is so good now, we knew, oh, there's a new person in the building. <laughs> yeah. And we can do it now to approach them not after the event where we pull the list. We can do it before the event. So I had junior salespeople on my team reaching out and saying, I'd like to meet with you at the seat. And they were like, oh, my God, they know, blah, 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 blah. And um, we, we did not know, but we knew that there was a new person in the building. So that's how accurate it is. That was a story I didn't tell you. That no, I, it's amazing. But, yeah. the, but the point here is that like, it's this application that yep. someone like you is able to do is like, I mean, that, that's what's happening. And I mean, Marie, you're doing the same thing, obviously. You're hearing and Yeah, we constantly, I mean, we have to listen to the customer. That's what we do. I mean, we do try, we know a lot about customers. We try to keep it on, you know, from getting creepy. So I'm not saying that was creepy, but. <laughs> he thought it was creepy. He told me, he was like, oh, do I have to like call this person? I'm like, it's good. Yeah, so you, okay. you absolutely have to listen to fans. Um, and, and that's what we do. We just, we're constantly listening. But I will tell you, and I think folks, especially students in the room know this, there's so much data now yeah. that it can be overwhelming. And so the, the way you can actually clean it and to what you were saying, have people analyze it. We have tons of data. We have data dumps every hour. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is what, is what does that help me going forward? And so that's really the skill set that I think we're really focused on empowering and hiring. In One our thing groups. for us that was fun, you know, when we first started playing games in London, we were really focused on how will fans there in the UK how will they react to football? Because there are certain standards when you go to a European football game, like it's just different, right? They don't drink there. They don't, they don't, they, when the game, when the match is over, you leave immediately. And so it was, has been interesting as we are in, in London doing games and how we try to educate and we, mm -hmm. you know, we try to evolve. When we went to Germany, it was really interesting because it, it, what, was, what was fun at the end of it, I don't know if you guys read this, but like the fans wouldn't leave. They were all swinging, singing uh, Sweet Caroline. They wouldn't leave. And, and, the, and, and they, were, they were drinking. It was very much like, we don't want this to end. Yeah, and so it's very interesting country to country, yeah. uh, you know, the adoption. Although maybe the data said, like, you know, again, there, there's, there's, you know, soccer's happening. You leave immediately when it's over. Not these guys. 
They're like, keep playing. We yeah. want more yeah. of this. Yeah. And so it is what you do with that and then how you take, you know, the data of a person who may be an American football fan living in Germany and how you compare that to maybe like a Philadelphia Eagles fan. Maybe that intensity is just as insane. Yeah. But you don't know until you go try and you, and you have to, there's the trial and error. And so we're really excited on that, that international side of it. You can do more testing there. Here domestically, mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to test because excellent is expected for us all the yeah. time. And that's, you know, yeah. Marie even said when they first launched, they had to get the broadcast right. It's simple, but it was so hard, right? Like that first part, like how much, and no bells and whistles, we're just doing it. The, you know, we're showing you the broadcast and it was spectacular, especially as you hear Al, you're like, oh, yeah, Thank I, you. know, I know this guy, <laughs> yeah, exactly. thanks. And so there is a different level of excellence expected and then opportunities where you can go test, learn, and figure out, and then what that does for the consumer, which is, ends up being great for everybody. And I do think with OTT and, and you know, watching through streaming or apps, mm -hmm. living room devices, so much of our use is through living room devices, that's an advantage. We can actually test and learn. We can give you five different streams that you can choose from. Because a lot, a lot of this is you don't want to, I, I definitely think season ticket holders and, and fans like that, surveys make great sense. For us, it's more what can, we, we want to always um, be trying to, not necessarily asking them a ton of questions or s sending them a ton of emails, but how can we actually figure out through AI and all sorts mm -hmm. of things, watching and listening and learning, how, how they want to behave and then try to delight them. So I feel like in broadcast a lot of times it's not necessarily what are they looking for, but it's almost can you use different things to help to inform, make some good guesses, and then really listen and be really, you have to be able to change on a dime. That's why we did so many different alt broadcasts because we didn't know what would work. Um, and it's been great to learn what, what has worked and some has really surprised us. Yeah, how have you used AI? I mean, do you have do you have anything in particular that you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, AI? well, for us, AI is th runs through the lifeblood of Amazon. So it's everything we do when we personalize, we optimize. And, and obviously, with all the replays and the, the instantaneous stats and everything we're doing, uh, there's a lot of AI and, and machine learning, obviously. Obviously, obviously. I, I, th I, I think, first, like, like, we could take a few steps back. Yes, we're going to talk about AI because we're at an analytics conference and we're at the forefront. The example that Val gave, which is, five years ago, four years ago, like not having this clean database. And yeah. You can't do anything with AI if you don't have a clean right. data. And I would say the majority of teams in sports are like not really there yet. Um, it, is a, it is a process. But, um, but I think teams and leagues, are real, they're not Amazon, but they're really starting to invest and figure it out. Um, but it's still, it's still super early days. But when I think about what AI could be, yeah. I mean, it's really, really exciting because the challenges that most teams and leagues have is the amount of resources both um, to, for staff and for the technologies that are needed. And um, they, they want to do this personalization that we're talking about, but to do that at scale in the way that, that we want and need, it's, it, we're not there yet. But AI can help solve that, mm -hmm. you know, helping to write personalized emails at scale, helping to do, yeah. I mean, there's lots of apps out there, Copy AI, Maverick, um, that would enable video snippets at scale. And we're, they will be great when we can do that in several years, maybe five, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but right now, we just need to get the data into a good place to be able to apply it in the right use way. It. Yeah. And we, for us, there's sort of that two paths. So the, the consumer path that Jess is talking about, where we spend mm -hmm. about what that is going to look like, the data that we can get, and how we can serve fans better. And then, then there's the football path. Yeah. And we think about, we, we work with Amazon on next generation stats and how we track players, but also that takes another step to um, the you know the health and safety and thinking about the digital athlete. Mm -hmm. and how, does that in, how does that help inform the production of equipment? How does that help inform rule changes? How does all of that help inform the future to keep the men and, and women involved in our sport as safe yep. as humanly possible when they're on the field? And that's something that is a huge priority that we work on with um, Amazon in a variety of ways. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, Al, you want to say something? Um, for, for AI, I heard something earlier today on another panel that, that, that struck with me in terms of what we're doing. So we're using AI and machine learning on our clean database. Sam Ebb is here who came through this program. He's, our, he's informing our sales campaigns with all of this. But we're also playing around with some other 
AI related technologies, including deep fakes and some other and some other stuff. And what I heard earlier today that, that has been on my mind is like, for example, we're looking at personalizing mm -hmm. content mm -hmm. to reach bigger audiences. So as a practical example, you know, this year we had um, very focused on our renewals, renewing our season plan holders, and so we had a player record a personalized message. Well, he did 250 for us, 250 times like, wow. Marie, come back, <laughs> Rini, come back, like that's a lot. Wouldn't it be better to scale that and reach every single person, all 10,000 yeah. know, plus season plan holders with this, with this message, but he can't record 10,000, so we could do it through deep fake. But what I heard earlier today was like, how do you feel as a customer if you find out that you got a deep fake right. personalization? So we have to figure it out. And I think over time, it'll become so, you know, entrenched into how things are done that it'll lose that sort of like, I don't feel good that mm -hmm. this, is a, this isn't real. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and some part of the message will be real, like the main part yeah. that he read would be real, but it would just be your name may not be. So we're, we're thinking, thinking through all that, but the fact that it's even a possibility is exciting. Very much so. There was actually on another panel today. Wow, what a conference we are at uh, today. And uh, what a day we've had. It was on Partnerships 2.0. We were talking about chat GPT. Mm. And one of the things that that's doing is going out and gathering information that's available, but some of it might not be accurate. And so as you're talking about AI and the application of it moving forward, it's very much like what you said earlier, too. It's the qual and the quant coming together. It's the AI with the validation, verification, almost the quality control that sits on top of it. Um, it gives us room to test as we're validating too, but I find that fascinating and that will, you know, take time to evolve. I mean, the, one of the things for, <laughs> about the conferences is data for good, which is right. the appropriate use. That's and that's right. really mm -hmm. what, what we're trying to, to figure out. And so much of it is around the governance, yeah. right? What, what of this data is, should we be using? I mean, Marie, what, what you said about people who are more engaged in your broadcasts are watching longer not, isn't mm -hmm. shocking, but what is shocking to me is that the people who are watching longer are younger. It's just yeah. so contrary to everything <laughs> that I've heard. Mm -hmm. And you know, selfishly, I would love to have that information so that I can say to Val, hey, here are the, here are the young people who are really engaged and that are in your you know, in your ecosystem, go and target them for tickets, they're probably more likely to buy. And that, like, that's the connectivity that I think we all, well, maybe you don't want people to have, but they <laughs> <are>. <laughs> But I think that's gonna make it, make it better. And we're, I mean, it's happening, obviously, but, yeah. but for the teams and the leagues to be able to serve and service the fans, that's, that's um, in the experience, that's where I think we'd like to get to. Absolutely, from a targeting standpoint. I think one of the things as we talk about localization, personalization, whatever, there's also, we're, we're doing a lot of and, 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 and. Are we worried about there being too much choice? Mm. Five different stream options. Are we worried that it's going to become, hold on, I need a minute. I need, I need to retrench on exactly how I want to see this. Yeah, Have we, we reached that yet? Are you worried about it? It's, no. it's, it's definitely something we're conscious of. It's yeah. one of the reasons why we create this big tent experience. You can come in and just watch the main broadcast and sit back on your couch and, and not engage if you choose not yeah. to. But, and everything is fan initiated, so we don't mm -hmm. force anything on you. You can choose more interaction. You can choose different feeds. Um, but in, in general, it's, it's, it's choice. And yeah. so as long as you have it be fan initiated, it's not that big of a deal. Um, it, it, it's generally not a negative, but, but we, we, you don't want to overwhelm the fan. It, it's very, it, there's a lot of science to how you actually offer choice. Like you can offer way too many choices. So we're very careful about having it be intuitive. They understand what it is. One of the things, it relates to what you guys were talking about earlier as well as the choice. I also, I'm a, ultimately what I love about my job is content, we're storytellers. So all of these things can add so much to the broadcast, whether, and you know, we may be, we have a prime vision, which is one of our alt um, broadcasts, which is a lot of data and analytics. It also, for the nerds out there, it has the alt 22 camera, which people love, because you can actually see the whole field, which is what the broadcasters actually watch in the booth. So we found that if you offer that as an option, it actually, it, it, it's, if you want to sit back on the couch, you don't care whether that pass was difficult or not, that's mm -hmm. fine. But if you actually want to learn a little more about the decision making and, oh, that had a degree of difficulty of, you know, whatever percentage, sure. that, that we actually think you can enhance the broadcast, if it's done right. And you'll start to see us bring more and more of that into the main broadcast. 
but we're very conscious of not having people do homework, not having people yep. distracted. That's our fear. That was my, always my biggest fear, is that we actually distract people with something. We have a, um, we have a, a Black Friday game, first ever, for the NFL, um, the day after Thanksgiving. It's the biggest shopping day of the year. It's Amazon's biggest traffic day of the year. So we are going to have a lot of fun with that. We'll do things before, after, and during the game. You'll probably see some shopping opportunities. You may see some <laughs> other things. And that's you know, my entire team. We're just pounding the pavement at work. We cannot distract. Our biggest fear is a headline that someone missed a play because we right. were selling something. So it's a lot of fun and it's a great opportunities, but you're absolutely right. You always have to, it's, you go back to the PRFAQ you guys are working on. How is it good for the fan? We know how it's good for the business. Let's first make sure it's good for the fans. Sorry, go ahead. Can I, I just wanna ask one question because I'm, I'm, as you're thinking about oversaturating, so how, are you able to see how many people are watching on two devices? Because like I, I like the women's, I'm a huge women's basketball fan. I watched, and again, I know it was ESPN, but I was watching the game on my big screen and I was watching uh, the Sue uh, Bird and Tarasi broadcast on my phone, right? Like, are you seeing that at scale? So all of our users, just... because we're an OTT service, all our users are in a logged in state. Mm -hmm. So if they were watching, if they, if they were doing it on both, Fire and you know, if they were doing it on Prime Video in both places, yes. Yeah. I mean, if they were doing it on another site, no. You wouldn't see it. But that. yeah, that's OTT. Generally, people are lot and are logged in state, so you can. You, but they could watch on both, right? Yeah, absolutely, and we would know it's the same account. And if they had profiles, we would know if it was the same person. And depending I, I how mean, they're using each medium, yeah. you may want more information on one and less on yeah. the other. It's, I think yeah. people want more, I guess is what I'm saying. But it's one of the well, And I think we're trying to figure out how much more, right, but it's right? And we don't know that quantity, yet. We haven't hit that right? yet. Like it's like, like yeah. more of crap, nobody wants that. <laughs> right. And I think that's the thing where it's like really making sure that it's, what is it's it? quality. And then mm -hmm. also if you're adding more, are you also taking away? And that's a little yeah. bit for us. We, we like to look back and see, are we doing things because we've just always done them? Or are we doing them because it's actually adding to the fan experience in a positive way? Because if it can be replaced by something that's better, but may not have exactly the same attributes, that, that's okay as long as we're still feeding that appetite. Yeah. That's why we're incredibly careful with the main feed. So when people ask how we've innovated on the main feed, besides all the cameras and, and things like that, and hopefully I would say the best broadcast, um, <laughs> but we, that's, that's our bar, so that's, we, we, you know, we're never satisfied, and we think we're pretty close, if not there. How can you pick, pick your favorite child? You know, they're all great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but as long as, as long as you're not, that's why everything has to be fan-initiated fan. Like, if someone's, it, it's, we're, when you offer something in a, 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 an ancillary app or a secondary app, that doesn't bother me so much because you can either go access, the, access that or not. Right. I'm very conscious of when you're watching the game, you're here for the game. So a lot of what we do is we've innovated around the talent, around um, the storytelling. You'll see us do more and more in the broadcast, but the first year, as, as Rainey knows, because she lived through this with us, we just had to knock it out of the park and um, the actual broadcast and not, not ruffle too many feathers of right. One thing when, when we first started to work on next generation, uh, next generation stats, we did that with uh, AWS. And most of our broadcast partners initially were really hesitant because they're like, how do you tell this story? This, we were talking about this earlier, like integrating stats into content is you have to be, you know, how, how you choreograph that it has to be authentic, yeah. has to make sense. And by the way, you have to know you have, and sort of understand it. And, and the folks at AWS, man, they loved it. They loved stats. And so it was really great to partner with them on that. And then, like, what do you do with them? And we do great things with you guys on how to tell the story with stats for the consumer that cares about it. Data, and that's the thing that's so important. Data without story is useless. Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter because you can't explain it. You can't do, do anything On camera it. or behind the scenes. Any, anywhere. Um, you know, even to make a business case and get convince someone to make an investment or, or anything like that. But we... Um, you know, when we think about too much, we think about it a little bit different because we're the yeah. live experience. The live experience, right. And so uh, sometimes I, uh, you ever walk into a meeting where you're like, oh, if that happens, it'll completely destroy the industry and eliminate my job. I was in a meeting like that the other, <laughs> the other week. So, um, <laughs> okay, I, tell us. An exaggeration as I want to do. But like, I, that was like a thought that went through my mind. And so we were, I was looking at, they were talking about a new technology that basically would be like a VR technology you put on in the arena and it would make your your seat view is good as like the court yeah. side. I said yeah. the best view, like almost 
right on the ice. And I said, wow, that's, that's amazing. And if I was selling a ticket to it and it was gated to the arena, great, because now my upper bowl is as good as my best seat, blah, blah, blah. But then I was like, but that's not where it's going to stop. So my head went to, it's going to go to the home experience, oh, right. and then you don't need to come anymore. Right. Um, and you know, I, there's a lot of people in the industry that have talked about the future of the arena and what size should that arena be. And you know, it's, is it 15 to 20,000 seats, or is it really like three to five? And you could see a universe where, if, if that's the universe, maybe you, maybe you don't need to spend $1.5 to $2 billion to build an arena, because you can deliver that experience without physically needing to show up. Yeah. And so that's, as a venue operator, like, huh. Um, and, I, and, you know, I would also say that, um, you know, it, it, it makes me, it does make me worry about the future of, of sport as community. Because I think we all know yes. that from our youngest experience, we were talking a little bit about this yesterday, like mm -hmm. our way to unify and connect with the community yeah. often came through the platform of sports. Mm -hmm. And there's something to the live experience that's part of that, that makes you more passionate. And will we lose that? And I, you know, I was talking about this with someone uh, you know, a couple weeks ago after we saw the, the, the description of the tech. And they're like, oh, that, that'll never happen. Like, live will never go away. And then I talked to my niece and nephew, and I'm not so sure. Yeah. Like, they, yeah. they don't like, like in to... the metaverse. They don't yeah. even have to go anywhere. They're like, there. Did you see that movie, Don't Worry, Worry Darling? It's freaky. No. Yes. And the whole thing, you're like, wait, that's in like the virtual space. Are you spoiling like, the end? No. No, so, <laughs> no, I, okay, no, well, no, no. Watch it on the plane. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. let, me, let me just like. It, uh, you're, it's very dire what you're talking about. So I think what we're seeing. <laughs> yeah, I have a positive aspect. matter if it's going to yeah, be too positive positive aspect. Is, is a true bifurcation mm -hmm. of who is going to games. And venues are renovating or building new stadiums. I mean, I think, I mean, it's the, in, from 24 to 27, it's going to be the most money spent ever on new venues. So. He, the innovation is happening because fans either want luxury from a product perspective or they want to get in the door and see the experience. Mm -hmm. But they want the experience to be simple. They don't want to sit in traffic. They don't want to ha wait in line. And they want to be able to multi-screen watch. So I get, like, I get it. But at the same point, all of this investment in why there's this investment, it's happening in college, it's happening um, multiple NFL stadiums, the Bills and the Titans, and, and it's because the experience has to evolve. That's why you made your renovation. So yeah. I'm not suggesting it isn't, but the stadiums are getting smaller, not because there's less demand, because people are watching more than ever before, and there's other ways to engage on social and small snippets. It's because they want a different experience. Yeah, it, absolutely. And the other thing, I, I, we hire you, Val, so don't worry about it. But, um, but, <laughs> we. <laughs> in a second, we'll be thrilled to get you. Um, but I, I would ask you, I mean, when I think of, when I think of that, what you described, I think of like, how many fans actually see an NFL game live. Oh, very few. Yeah. Very few. And then when you look around the globe, how many millions, hundreds the, of right. millions has, of people who can on. have that, ex, you know, yep. what I want to say, courtside, uh, sideline yeah. experience. That's unleashing an incredible yeah. opportunity. Just yeah. the streaming broadcaster. Uh, let me say one more stat. <laughs> one more stat yeah. that's really, I think, really interesting, though, because where there used to be, or at least we didn't know who the people were before because the secondary yeah. wasn't available to the yeah. team, teams. Uh, today, new fans that are coming to sporting events, 90% of them, the people who are the first time, are coming from the secondary, going to the games. And so it's really upon the teams to say, okay, let me go grab those new fans and convert them into passionate. What we are seeing is the, there's less avid fans because they have multiple yeah. teams that they're favorites of. So, like, we, there is this, here's, the, here's what's happening, how are we adjusting it? And, and I, I am, like, a long-term thinker because I think there's way too much short-term thinking in sports, mm -hmm. like working at a team. It's like, win this year, get my renewals, get my sales, win my sponsorships, okay, then next year. So I try very much to, like, pick my head up and just think, you know, with, with some eye towards, towards the future. And, and, I, and I will say the other thing that worries me, as long as we're talking about dire, because I'll keep going down that path, um, <laughs> is like, is, our, is sports becoming to 1%? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we look at, at the, the yeah. cost of a ticket and the cost of coming to a live event relative to inflation, it's like 2x. Yeah. And we look at the data, and that is a concern, because again, I get back to like, 
kids and community and what does sports mean to society? And there's this argument out there like, let's just build a 5,000 seat arena and Uber price it. And that's the, you know, yeah. I don't know. Like, is that good for America? We're talking about America. Like or, or even cool. like, fandom. Is it good? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're, you're going yeah, to fandom overall. Absolutely. I'm more focused on just sports fandom. And I, I think that's a great question. I mean, there are studies that how do you create sports fans? And at least a few years ago, it was, it was very dependent on going to a live event or um, no, going to a live event with someone important in your life or competing. And so the tickets are so expensive, it's really hard. And then a lot of sports and schools and things like that are pay to play. We're not doing a good enough job. Don't get me on my soapbox, but about kids in sports, particularly girls in sports. And so but that's also right. where it starts. Yeah. Like yeah. for me, I think about I grew up in Kentucky and we had just awesome. And this is going to sound silly, but as a, as a high school kid, like our pep rallies around our football team and our basketball team and that loyalty and that mm -hmm. fandom and just the the insanity around that where the fandom started. Because there is a bit where, I don't know, and, and maybe this is a data point, where does fandom start? Does it start with the Flyers? Or does it start when you're a kid and you play? Yeah. And we all we know that part of it when my dad was mm -hmm. a fan of this or that moment. I didn't have any professional teams that were near us at the time when I was a kid. So I don't, it's like, I don't know what, that, what it's like to have that passion other than for that moment where I grew up as a kid. So, but do you think if that doesn't go away, so we help foster continued youth sports and all things from for girls and boys and basketball and hockey and, and all of those stuff, you hope that it doesn't get to that point, but we are making it tough. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's quite Chase expensive, Chase, right? Chase so. Yield, there's no question. And, and I mentioned Sam is here. Sam convinced me by, by, through data and through smart strategic advice, like, hey, like we're not, raising, we're not raising yield for a few years. And that's uncommon because winning teams raise yield because they can, yeah. they yeah. maximize revenue. And losing teams raise, raise uh, chase yield because yeah. they have to make up the gap because right. they're you know renewals and other things are down and so you really have to have that long-term view when you're thinking about it but um but yeah it is interesting it's like what is it coming because that's from? where data sometimes it, it hits the rubber meets road where like you can't measure passion like that gut fire so in our high school i grew up at is there are um cornfields all around our high school and there's the town next door, which was Henderson. And they would, when we would beat them, or when they would beat us, they would tell us, start the tractor. Like, it was insulting, because we were all <laughs> farmers. And like, like as, as I think about that burn and that passion mm -hmm. to beat those guys, that's something you can't necessarily measure, and that fire. And so that's where it's like, those of us is, is, that have the privilege to work in sports, yeah. And, and I know this is a data conference, so it's all great, but that's something that none of us can ever lose. And you want to make sure that you, can't, you don't lose it because of the data. Because what's the data tell you? Because I have seen Eagle fans, and, and that <laughs> stuff's insane, right? And that's something that you can't measure, but you can take advantage of it and use the data of how do you take that, right? You so can you measure it. It's an, it's an app. Of, it, I, well, then, of course, well, everything's Jess, measurable. Jess can measure it. There you go. Right? It's like Minority right. Report of, of Deep Soul. That's, I think what do you say when you won? Well, uh, to, to the, the colonels? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. We probably swear. We yeah. probably were cursed. You can't repeat it. It's hard yeah. to say. All right. No, Cursing. you don't need to answer. Yeah. So we're, we're under 10 minutes at this point. Can you believe it? Time flies um, when you get everybody talking here. But I think what you're, you're um, getting to, Rini and, and Val, you're questioning, like, where is this really going? This does come back to an experience. That passion is coming because you felt something. Right at some point, yeah, we can ultimately measure that. But imagine we're kind of raising this next generation that may or may not get to have that feeling in a venue right. or believe that being a sports fan is something different through this only or, you know, friends and, and three, four, five steps removed through social. Who knows? And we're all working on that. We're working on that. You're working on that. I think as you continue kind of on this journey and balancing. Um, or maybe just considering the whole spectrum, we're going to have to do both, right? It's not an in-venue yeah. experience and an online or streaming experience. It's both. And figuring out where one stops and the other one picks up, I think, Rini, you talked about it before, too, just seamless. And as you show up as a brand and, you know, the fans are having that experience, it's seamless. What else do we need to be asking, Jess, to well, get to that seamless experience? So you're, you're seeing all the data. What else do we need to be looking for to get to that? I mean, the, the properties, they have the, this information about what their fans are doing. And the information that the brands want yep. is 
the, it, the, they want more information about the fans than the teams and leagues, frankly, are collecting. They want to know not only your demographics, they want the psychographic, they want the survey information so they can say, okay, if I target and sponsors what you do and, and associate with you, am I going to meet, reach my customers and drive my business? Yeah. And today, that connective tissue, maybe it was covered in partnerships, but that, that connective tissue of the fan at the property, it's kind of a guess today. It's kind of a guess. I'm going to sponsor this team or this league, and I hope it drives the business. Where we, where we will wow. come, it's so well, okay, much yes. of a guess. But, it, but I think to actually, on a one-to-one -one basis, to say, here's the, here's the fan, mm -hmm. and we can target them, and we can say how, how much or to what degree they then became and were spending with you. That, yeah. My life story is a representation of what Rini said about yeah. data and the experience and motion. Like, I'm on this stage because as a little girl, I used to collect baseball cards pre-content, and I would look at the front. When I started, I used to look at the pictures, and I would look at all the different guys, and. And then at some point, I, I liked math, and I turned the cords over, and I started to think about the, about the data. And I was interested in sports. And so my mom and dad, but, I, but it was, again, like I'm looking at cords in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, data, piece of it. Then my parents, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. suburbs. Um, we didn't have baseball it, there at that time. Took me up to Baltimore um, to see a game at Memorial Stadium. And, we were late because my parents were often late, and it was you know it's far, so we're, we came. We were rushing in, and the game was already underway. I believe it was Memorial Day weekend. We came out of the vom, the vomitory, into the stadium, and at that moment, I sort of got like a movie. Reggie Jackson had hit a home run, and the ball was going over the fence. I'm this little kid, and I'm watching it, and in my head, I was like, "This is it. This yep. is the, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I don't know how I'm going to figure out. It stayed with me, carried me all the way to the stage, and it's both." It's both. It's yeah. both. Thanks. There you go. It's a case study. It is yeah. a case study. Well, I think, honestly, your description of it and what you're talking about, that's what we have to find, is where are those moments, to Rini's point, like, where does fandom start? We're not sure. You're saying that you just described your exact point. Now we have to figure out if we can measure it, then how do we kind of track back? If the genesis is different, well, the, what does that translate And then to Jess's into? point, for brands, yeah. like, if a brand is selling soft drinks, they want to sell more soft drinks because of that fandom, or tires. 100%. Like, all of a sudden now, if you are a tire retailer, you're, like, going to go spend money in order to sell more tires because you believe that fandom, yep. how avid it is, if it's avid, will sell those tires. Because yeah. you it's help give kind of them right? that experience. Right, it's sort of, yeah. and it's an interesting, that's frankly how all of our businesses are, yeah. you know. Well, and you funded. want people to feel a particular way about your brand because you're associated with Amazon, with um, the NFL, with the Flyers. I mean, ultimately, all of us became fans in some form or fashion because of the story and the connection that we saw. And, you know, for me, I was growing up outside of Chicago and, you know, heyday of, of Michael Jordan. Yeah. And it was a fun and I was like, how is this guy able to perform so well under pressure? Mm -hmm. And it became just a fascination for me that, you know, so I think like, what is the connection? What is the connectivity that's going to? Yeah. And I think for every person, it's going to be different. But what I what I think is so inspiring or amazing is that there's so many different ways that all all parts of our society can now touch sports. And so, yes, you're right, not that many people get to go to sporting events. I went to two in my childhood. Now I work in sports, I've gone to a lot more. <laughs> um, but, I think, but I think the concept of more accessibility is something that I'm personally incredibly excited about for fans. Yeah, and I don't see it as competing, the live events versus the VR, AR, we're, we're streaming. I think it's incumbent on all of us to make them the best, you know, the best events. I think in streaming, we're trying to create community. You know, you can create great community online. It's a way to connect with people. We want people to feel, feel the passion when they're watching in a streaming event. And so what can we do? We even did this a few years ago in our Premier League coverage. We had all um, audio streams, and one of them was just the live, um, live sounds of the stadium which, you know, you'd have to hear, there'd probably be some cursing and stuff, but at least in the UK, they're singing songs, and it's some with curses, mm -hmm. um, but incredible passion, and we found, we didn't even promote it, and a bunch of fans found it and really enjoyed it. So I think there's some combination. I don't necessarily yeah. see competition between the different ways to access fans, to access sport and that passion, 
But I think it's incumbent on all of us to work on every stage of that fandom and every presentation yeah, of that game compliment. and the event. Got a compliment. Exactly. You're even yeah. simulating my smells and sounds now? I'm just, <laughs> I'm doomed. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to have any control over no, anything. No, it's all right. It'll be like long, long after my time. <laughs> so we are about to wrap. There were lots of questions from the audience. I've been reading them as we go, other than a couple pretty specific ones. I think everybody covered most of these territories. But with the last minute, anything, what's next? What's next? What do you think the next? big things going to be, or the next big unlock in data, anything you feel that's kind of up the sleeve that we're not talking about? I don't know if it's an unlock in data, but I just think you're going to be um, blown away by how many people move to streaming. I mean, when we, you know, people in this audience know it's, it's so hard to get a million people to do the same thing at the same time. The fact we were able to get over 10 million a week yeah. um, was, amazing and will only continue. And that's with folks, that was our first year. And so especially with living room devices, so much of our use is in the living room. You're gonna get the silver streamers, you're gonna get all these other, it's just, I just think people are gonna be overwhelmed by the online usage as, as the events go there. I just think it's a huge unlock and we, we've seen it this past year. Yeah, I would only add that, but just again, the international unlock I think is, for us is a huge opportunity. I'm excited about that. That's fantastic. Whatever it is, it'll come through this conference and you'll hear about it, so keep coming. That's right, right? I think the depth of data um, that is being shared with the properties in terms of like, so like when someone buys a ticket or is unable to buy a ticket, what do they do next? Yeah. So do they go to a different game? Are they then going to try and buy a ticket on the secondary? Are they then gambling? I think there's so much more connectivity and insights that we're just starting to scratch the surface on. And that's what I'm really most excited about. That's awesome. Well, thank you, thank ladies. Thank you, guys. Jess, thank Val, you, guys. Rini, Marie. Thank you, everybody. Should we take our water?
Hello and welcome again to the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. I am Bob Hayes, a second year Sloan MBA, and we have a fantastic panel today, performance under pressure. Starting with Brad Stevens, president of basketball operations of the Boston Celtics. We have Steve Magnus, performance coach and author. We have Sue Bird, deep breath, we got a long title here, WNBA champion and Olympic gold medalist, co-founder of A Touch More and Together. And we have Michael Lewis, author and journalist. 10 minutes of questions. Our hashtag today is performance under pressure. We're gonna get to as many of those as we can. Submit those questions via Twitter. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so thank you, the three of you, for showing up. How, how nervous are you? Are you feeling, is your heartbeat, you feeling anything? Steady. Is it, are you more or less comfortable than you are at the end of a game when it's close and you have the ball in your less hands? Less comfortable. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I want to start with you. I want to start with Sue. We have, so we, have, we, have a, we have a player, someone who's worked with players, and someone who's thought about people who work with players. And, and, <laughs> and, and th th we're going to go in that order. Okay. Um, and just your, your relationship to this subject, uh, particularly the upside of the subject, uh, being clutch. Mm -hmm. At what point in your life does the thought cross your mind that I'm good under pressure? Um. I have a lot of memories from being a kid hitting big shots. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember, is there a moment where a narrative started to form? Like, yes. And what's that moment? So my AAU team <laughs> was trying to qualify for nationals. Right. And back then, nationals was where you got seen by college coaches. Right. Mm -hmm. so there was a lot of pressure even at an early age to, to make this tournament. And we got upset. And we had to do the whole, like, win 18 games in one day just to qualify for the finals. We get to the finals, and my team was down one point, and I got fouled. So I got to go to the line to shoot two. How old are you at this point? I'm like, probably like 14. OK. Yeah, 14, 15. Yeah. And I make the shots. If and you... then it was like, Sue's clutch. All right, so if, you, <laughs> so, so, so if you'd cool. missed those shots, yeah. do you think Sue's a choker would have been the narrative? I don't, hopefully not to my face. No, no, but you think, do you think that like your whole life turned on that moment or do you think that this was, eventually this was gonna, that was gonna be, the narrative was gonna be what the narrative was gonna be? Um, I wanna say it was gonna be what it was gonna be, but who knows if that gets implanted in my head, maybe it changes. Do you believe there's such a thing as clutch performance? I do. You do. I mean, we're in the Bill James room, right? And Bill himself, who's here, uh, has misgivings about the whole idea of, of clutch performance, and you look at statistics and data, and it can, you know, we're going to put that to one side because there's no point in having that argument up here. Okay. But um, no matter how much data I showed you, you would still think that, Ed, do you think there's such a thing as choking? So here's my, my, my quick little ditty on this. I think that I think that when a, pl a player is who they are, right. and they perform a certain way, right. I think clutch performers tend to just like continue their performance. Yes. And I think those that choke, when they, don't, they do worse. Right. So, so it's not like you're getting better under No, pressure. it's not that you're getting better. But so I guess, I, I guess the answer is, yeah, they do choke. And, and to be honest, I've seen players that when the ball gets in their hand, I've had people on my own teams where I don't trust them because the ball gets in their hand and like in late game moments right. and something changes. Right. Like their demeanor changes, the way they, their eyes look changes. And I'm like, give me that back. <laughs> <laughs> Get it out of their hands immediately. So I, I don't, feel that I way hesitate sometimes to use when I see people, other people with a pen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but choke it's, is such a, choke is like such a tough word. I, I hesitate to use the word choke. Right. That it sounds just, like awful. I don't think it's as dramatic as choking. They just don't do as well. And you see that at the highest level? Yep. Like even in the WNBA, you saw that. that, that I'd have thought it would weed it out. Mm -hmm. That any, no, it doesn't. No. Nope. So you're, you actually answered a question I had for you just there. So you don't actually think exactly there's clutch before. Clutch in your mind is you're still just as good as you always were. Yeah. You aren't, you aren't, you aren't being affected by the pressure. Right, right. exactly. Because the question I always have is like, if you're better at the end of the game when it's a clutch moment, why not just be better at the beginning of the game so you never have to have a clutch moment? I have an answer for that too. Okay, I wanna hear it. <laughs> I do think there are, and this, uh, this is for me personally, 
The beauty of the, the late game moment is, um, for me, my personality, who I am, I'm usually like out there orchestrating things, setting everybody up. In the clutch moment, I can finally be selfish. I have permission to just go do what needs to be done. Huh. And that permission for me, this player, right. I don't know if this goes for every player, that's all I need. Huh. That's all I need. And then everything just goes, it's like a calm, right. very, very calm place, a very right. clear place. My head's almost empty because I don't have to worry about all the other things I'm usually worrying about during the, the regular parts of a game. Did you, a last question before I, we go to, Move on. to the coach. <laughs> um, and then we're all going to talk. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, did you ever in your career, and, and maybe, maybe we'll even broad it out from basketball, mm -hmm. but it's hard outside of basketball. But did you ever have a coach or a situation or a team where the narrative got screwed up and you weren't thought to be the person who should have the ball at the end of the game? Kind of. I, as I got older, and now we have younger players who are more of the go-to players right. can just carry the load, I noticed that plays weren't being drawn up for me as much. Right. And I mean, I'm gonna pat myself on the back, but I just finished my career. We were in a series against the Las Vegas Aces. It was game three. We were 1-1. This is a big, pivotal game. Right. And we were down two. And the play was not drawn for me. Huh. But they, we couldn't inbound it to who we wanted to go to, and so it just went to me. Right. And I still hit it. And I feel like what that tells you is they should have drawn it up for me. <laughs> So, well, like, no, but I, know, I noticed so, in my last couple of years, okay. the play was being drawn for me less, but it didn't mean I didn't get the ball because that's basketball right. and stuff doesn't So happen. there are a million questions I still want to ask. <laughs> okay. right? But, but when, you, when you're in the moment, in the moment, like when you're about to take the shot, when you're taking the shot, do you have any self-awareness, like what's going through your head? No, not much. No, you're not, you're not thinking. Mm -mm. It's just, you're just being. You're just doing. Are you feel any special tingle when you know it's a big moment? No, not until after when it's not until there. after. So it's just it's just being the same. All right, Coach Brad. Wait a minute. So I just realized I was an inconsistent Division three player, <laughs> and the way that you define choking, you have Sue Bird and a choker and a mental skills coach in between us, <laughs> and I'm I'm a little worried that I'm the choker up here. No, we don't use that word. <laughs> it's a bad word. No, it was good. No. I mean, I, I agree with everything she said. I would have given it to her, though. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> well, let's talk about you. you, you never mind your playing career, which was distinguished, uh, but you're just your coaching yeah. career. Distinguished. Um, so you're in a position of having to figure out who should be put in the spotlight in difficult moments. You're in the, actually, do you think, do you, when you have a team, can you see that some of the players are better in these situations than others? I mean, your best player is usually on the court at the end of the game. Right. But have you ever had your right. best player not respond well to pressure? Well, I think everybody has had their moments, but there's a lot of factors that contribute to that. Yeah. And the other teams out there, too. You know, we're not just, um, you know, working in an, in an empty office. Right. right? Everybody, there, there's a physical element to this that is very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, and, but I think that, when you talk about the people that are out there, I certainly have had moments where I've like, one of our players has had it, and I'm like, give it to Sue. Like, we, that, let's go that way with it, right? right? But I think you build, you know, from a coaching perspective, your whole job is to take the luck out. Your whole job is to do everything you can to make sure you're prepared for everything so that your team's prepared for everything so that you can make sure you control everything you can. Right. And the special emphasis on the end of the game is important in that, in my opinion. And there are things that you build habit-wise that hopefully your super talented players who don't have that variance as the game gets clutch, right, can lean on. And the people that need to be in role playing next to them, you know, right. they know what their role is if the ball finds them. When you, I'm thinking about, I don't know if it, this even applies at the NBA level, but when you're coaching Butler, you're famous for taking these teams that no one expects to do that much and they do the great things. So you're bringing stuff out of players that people maybe didn't know was there. Did you feel like you were cultivating in players the ability to, to perform under pressure? I think you can teach, I think you can teach, um, 
tasks you can teach doing your job really well. You can yeah. hammer home the idea that this is your role in this moment. This is your task in this moment. Yep. And if you operate it well, if you do everything that you can, then you're going to do well if you focus on that. And you know, I do think that we had several times over the years where I felt like, you know, the, I actually said give the ball to Sue or give the ball to Tatum or give the ball to whoever, right? But it's also good sometimes if they're the screeners and somebody else has to get it because everybody's solely focused on them. So your team can be clutch in those moments if you can take advantage of the extra attention that they are getting. But right. again, that, that requires you to prepare for those moments, to make sure that your team knows what their roles are in those right. moments, and that you believe in them, that if the ball finds their hands, they're gonna make shots. And right. it, is, it is really fun to be a part of a team when you look at it at the end of a season and several people have made last second shots to win games. Yeah, That's when you know you've got a unique situation, I think, because you've got a tough-minded team, but more so a job-focused, task-oriented team that can focus on what they can control, can block out things that don't matter, and can operate under that pressure. Do you agree with what Sue's definition of clutch here, that it's just maintaining the level of performance in spite of the pressure, as opposed to actually finding some weird reservoir and with yourself to, to be better than you normally are? Yeah, I was talking to Mike Zarin about this, and Mike told me, you know, obviously people's, the best players are the clutches, right? So they, they're probably the same the whole time. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, they probably don't change a ton over that time, but you do have a ramped up intensity, you do have a ramped up focus, and you also in an NBA have 46 minutes of information, right? You don't know at the start of a game how they're gonna guard this, this, or this, but a lot of teams don't throw you something new in the last two minutes, right? right? You may have seen it before, especially as you get into a late seven game series, and you know, the intelligence and the emotional intelligence to operate and do your job in that moment too is a, a part of that. Right. I think the, the character trait that I've, I didn't probably have that is so unique are I cared a ton, and I think all these players care a ton, but then there's this thing about some people where it's like they, they miss it, they miss it. Right. You know, they're not worried about it. They have, they have guts to take that moment and handle that moment, whether good or bad. Right. Have you had players who you could see couldn't handle the moment? I don't know about handling the moment. No. I, I think, let me, let me just use me as an example. Like you would, really wouldn't want them on the free flow line because, they, they, because they'd be uncomfortable. With no, I, the, I would go the other way. I mean, obviously, if you're in a, like game seven and you, you know, like, but I would go the other way, especially in the regular season. I'd be like, I want everybody to go through it. Uh. I want everybody to experience it. I want everybody to show themselves either to come up short and to come back the next day and handle that or to nail it and, you know, build You're cultivating off it. of that. Yeah. yeah sense. So that last question before, because I, I know Steve has something to say to that, but I, did, there's a quote that, that um, Bob, who prepared me for this, he pulled out of one of your, like, from, from your past. It was a Butler player who was explaining your 2010 Final Four run. And he said that when the, there were big runs at Syracuse and, and Kansas State made, it, made you call a timeout and brought them over. He said, coach called a timeout and said a few calm words. Then he said he believed in us, he loves us, and we're going to win the game. And I, I, I just love that. And I, I thought that Sometimes you're introducing you a kind of emotion there. <laughs> but, but some of my, but I wonder if, it, if you try to create an emotional kind of climate well, around think, those yeah. situations. So I'm not up here because I'm clutch playing. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm pretty, I, can, I'm, I know that, right? Uh, but I've coached in a lot of games. And I do think just like players have to build those habits in those moments and know where they're going to be and feel confident that they know how we're all going to function as a team, yeah. a coach has to be prepared for that. And for me, when I wasn't even, or when I was on edge, it was maybe when I didn't feel as good about my own input right. and preparation. I learned that early on as a head coach, and um, you know, I, I made sure that I was always prepared for every scenario, especially at the end of games, because that's where 
You know, you need to know how people are going to guard you. You need to know how you plan to attack, and you need to know what you are going to be facing on the other end. And if you don't, then you can't expect your team to perform well in those moments. But so that's my job. Was it, was it part of your job to sort of manage the emotional states of the players? Sure. And I think what I, I guess what I was saying, a long-winded version, was if I'm even, they'll be even. Right. Or we've got a better chance. If I'm on edge and running all over the place and I'm, you know, late to make a decision, if I'm scattered in a presentation in the huddle, right. then it's probably not going to be helpful. Right. All right, Steve. Um, you're in your bio, I don't think that Bob said this, but, but you know, you've written books and good books and they've done well, but there's a little item in the bottom of your bio that made me wonder if this was what attracted you to this subject. It said you once ran a four minute and one second mile. And now that's a very fast time, but there's something about that time that just jumps out at you. You missed it by just that much. You and, know, thanks for and, reminding me. No, no, and I'm wondering whether, um, like, that, that has been li you've been living with that and trying to understand it ever since. This, uh, is, this is why you're the master. No, I just, it's just a thought. I because mean, just, you don't. Everything Sue said about, you know, when I was 14, I made this shot. Well, let me give you my athletic career. Um, <laughs> actually, that's what we're here for. Yeah, yeah. Not, not anyone who's actually good, just me, the runner. Um, so here's what happened I was a good runner. When I was my freshman, sophomore, and junior year in high school, I missed the state meet by one spot. When I was a senior in high school, I missed making nationals by one spot. My senior year in track season, I, I ran that 401 mile, missed it by one second. I then ran between 401 and about 404 20 times. So I'm really good at getting close to yeah. being good at yeah. something. <laughs> But then falling short. Yeah. So I think you're absolutely uh, We're onto something right. here. Yeah. OK, so you want to know what was going on in your brain. I, exactly. And I think that's where I was getting at is like my own failings. It's almost like teaching, right? The best, at, the best people often don't teach. It's the level below. Like that's why I wanted to explore that. So talk a little bit about like just the physi physiology of performing under pressure. Like what these two just said that resonates with your work. What's yeah. going on? Yeah. What's going on in my brain when, when I've got the ball in my hands and when she's got the ball in her hands? Yeah. And so what I love what they both said because it, it lines up perfect with the psychology and, and neuroscience really of it, which is that whenever we get some sort of stress or pressure, at first it's almost like an inverted U. Like at first it helps us. And what happens is it narrows our focus. It's almost like a filtering mechanism. It puts our focus on what actually matters. So when Sue says, like, all I can see is this, everything's blocked out, that's our brain going, OK, high stress situation, like, focus on the things that matter. The problem comes when we go from, like, pretty good, optimal, and we go over the edge. And that's where we see the quote unquote ch choking. And what happens in the brain is that as that kind of physiological arousal goes too high, it turns off this area in our brain called the prefrontal cortex, yep. which is essentially the thinking, executive function, the skill part. And when that goes off, it gives free reign to this area called the amygdala, which is essentially our, our threat sensing, danger sensing, emotional area that just goes through the roof. So when we look at choking, it's often we've gone too far, that amygdala is going wild, and we experience it as like this catastrophizing spiral right. where we just you know, can't get out of it. And we all know it when we see it. When the, Absolutely. When the Dallas Cowboys place kicker is coming to kick the extra point, you just know that's going on in his brain, it, right? Yes, and I mean, it's really- It's funny, because you see, I mean, nobody, I think nobody would deny that choking you don't like the word, but sorry, we just got to use the word. All right, okay. I just, probably, I'm, probably, I just felt bad. I'm probably offending you at some deep level. No, no, not okay. me. The other people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, is this true? Is this true in your life? Have you ever choked? Yeah. Okay. When? Well, I've missed. Yeah, that's different. <laughs> but you, there's a difference, right? You're, you you don't make every shot when I when. Choked? Yeah. Have you choked? Have you ever felt that? What he's just like saying. Someone's gonna find the. <laughs> where my you went no, the other no, no, way? Yeah, where, where your brain went, oh, you knew afterwards I clutched up a little bit there. I, I, it went too far. 
Not in basketball. I have a soccer memory. Does that count? Yeah, that counts. What is yeah. it? I missed a penalty shot when I was in like, I don't know, eighth grade. And look who you're married to. I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> don't tell her that. Yeah, you, so you, and you actually, but you felt the thing. Where, where you were thinking about it. Oh, uh, no. Oh, I just well, missed. So that, well, just missed. That doesn't, that doesn't I don't remember what we're really the, talking the, about the here. The choke aspect. What about outside of sports? God. Where you have, where you. There's an outside of sports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, I'd have to think about it. Right. I'm sure it exists. I'd have to think about it. Well, ex I, uh, just to, to continue with the brain for a minute. Yeah, sorry. How do you explain why, why would this happen? Like, what possible purpose could this serve? So it's to, uh, to have this choking moment. Yeah, it's a survival mechanism. It doesn't look like it. Yeah, it, it, well, what it is is think of it, it's, uh, it's almost like our freezing response. Right. Where it's like, oh my gosh, like we're in this situation, like what do we do? Our brain just kind of shuts down because it doesn't want us to think. Right. It just wants us to escape the danger that right. is there. So in sport, and this is why if you look at the research on choking, when does it occur? When we have like an audience, when we have others around us, we actually are more likely to choke when our, our family's around. And the reason behind that is because our self goes into protective mode. So instead of going like physical protection, our brain goes like, I'm protecting my sense of self because I don't want to be the failure. That's wild. Yeah. That's interesting. You just explained why I pitched poorly when my father was at the game. <laughs> so, it, yeah. you know, more, yeah. more than one athlete, especially college level, I'd have to like go to the parent and be like, hey, you know, they got the championship coming up. Can you just yeah. like skip this one here? <laughs> <laughs> like, don't show up, and the player performs better. It also, I mean, when you see, explain why, does this resonate with you at all? Like, I, even in your playing career, do you, did you I'm ever? i more about my parenting career. I know. I was like, uh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> really, like, a game day. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, uh -oh. Brad is going to leave early to go see his son play in a state, <laughs> state playoffs championship game? Not championship. State, pl state Play playoff game. Yeah. So you're going to go, and he's going to go choke. And now, you, <laughs> and, now, and now you'll know why. Now you'll know why. But it, it, it's, um, so. It, Hopefully there's a lot of traffic then. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> but does this, you know, you, you kind of skipped over a little bit. Like you, like you just sort of assume your players will all learn to function under pressure. You put them in the situations. You have them have, six, uh, you know, eventually some success in the situation. Um, and I could see how that would really work. I mean, I, I, when I think of it, I think of, you know, you, when you're 14 mm -hmm. and you hit the free throws, and that's the beginning of a story. And the story just never changes, right? It's, but once you get the story, you're kind of set. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how the story will carry you through lots of situations once you've got that story in your head. I had, when I was a kid, similar situation. It's made a huge difference in my life because I let that story happen and I tell that story over and over. And it stops me from, in moments of you know, horror, from like going to that place. Uh, but a lot of people don't have that story or a lot of people have the opposite story. Now they never become NBA basketball players. Maybe they never even get the butler. But I'd have thought, I'd have thought you'd have some experience with like player, mental, mental coaching. Like you have, to, you have to help a guy along. Uh, to get to a place where he feels confident under pressure. Absolutely. Um, How do you do that's it? That's part of coaching. Yeah. It's part of, you know, if, if you need to, um, you know, tap into the experts like Steve, right? You, um, I think. Do you have such people around the Celtics doing? Sure. Yeah. At this and level. A, and, a lot of, and a lot of our players work with people outside the Celtics in, in talking about that. I do think that one of the things that we try to do is, is when you're talking about performing under pressure, I do think if you have a thousand messages, it's hard. And so like being on one page, making sure again, we all understand what our role is, our task is. We all understand that whatever happens, you know, we're gonna put our best foot forward and we're gonna live with the results as long as we control what we can. And I think that that's, that's what you do and that's what you talk about. And, and I think you're consistent in objectively reviewing how you did. Right. Because you know, if Joel Embiid's shot counts that he threw in last week at 75 feet, that has no bearing on how we played up to that point. Right. In fact, Derek White did the right thing by making him turn and take another dribble. 
Right. Right? Like it had no impact. That either went in or it didn't. Right. And I know that they always say make or miss, and, and I argue the shooting luck thing to death, right? Because I'm a coach and I think we could challenge a little bit better, or we could do things a little bit better. But there is some of that. And so for me, it's again, take the luck out, make it as clear cut as possible what our responsibilities are, and then get better if we come up short. You're, you're kind of sh like how you do this. You're a calming presence. You make everybody feel, I mean, I've watched I you. Would, yes. yeah, I would guess. Yeah, I mean, guess you don't look like, several. you don't get all worked up. You're not screaming and yelling at them in the huddle at the end of the game or anything like that. So it's interesting, the Butler thing. So I got that reputation. I'm right. not sure I am that reputation. <laughs> um, but I think part of it was, especially when you're coaching at Butler in the NCAA tournament, first of all, we weren't playing with pressure. We weren't playing with expectations. We had just played two months of that in our smaller league, in the Horizon League, where we were expected to win every game. Right. And so our pressure was really off. Right. And, and then also we're playing against teams that have bigger, stronger, faster players. And right. so part of what we wanted to make sure we were was as prepared as possible and as even as possible across the board. And so that was a conscious choice not to be demonstrative, not to lose my mind you know, because I didn't want them to be affected by that. And that probably ha was how a reputation that wasn't really true was built, right? right? But, um, but I do think like, that you have to think about those things. And, and it is, it is, there's a big difference between winning a bunch of WNBA championships and doing it again and again, or at UConn again and Where you're again expected to again. win. That, yeah. That's an extra burden yeah. that we certainly didn't have at Butler. Right. You know, certainly when you, coach or play for the Celtics, there's a responsibility and a burden that comes with that. That's right. a good thing in my opinion, but it's, it adds to it for sure. So I'm looking at you but because I'm kind of, I'm curious. I mean, in a way, your relationship to performance under pressure is boring because you just did it and you always did it well and you never thought about it. And because you never thought about it, you continue to do it well. And you have a very simple, clean story. Uh, I hear what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. you get, you see, but, so we're, but let me. Yeah, I feel like I can add, though. Okay. The, the, you want me to add? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, like, you do try to control what you can control. And I think as an athlete, you do try to prepare in ways. And preparation is a big part of this, this lifestyle. But I started going to therapy. Ooh, now I, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> As I was entering my retirement season, <laughs> yep. more so for like post-life, making sure I was ready, you know, talk about some things. So sidebar, that's the answer to your question of the times I've choked. I found that I choke in my like um, personal life in ways. Huh. I don't always show up in the right way or say the right thing. I don't, it doesn't always happen. And where, what I learned in therapy is what helped me succeed as an athlete isn't always what's gonna help you succeed in a relationship or as a partner, as a sister, as a daughter, whatever. So that's a whole other panel for, no, we for can, next year. We can work some of that <laughs> in here. But anyway, I say this to say, my therapist said this to me and I was like, oh yeah. And as it turns out, she just gave words around what I've always done, right. which is you really are just preparing for the spontaneous. Yeah. And a lot of people like to control and be, and, it, and I think a lot of athletes, maybe it's lack of talent or maybe it's fear. They control when they get scared. We all do it in our own ways. Right. We like to control. And I think what I've always tried to do in my workouts, in my practice, in practices, is just try to communicate to my teammates even, like, this isn't going to be perfect. Like, so they're going to draw this play, and we're going to try to get it to Brianna Stewart on the block, but we're probably not. Right. So be ready for that. Right. And be comfortable in that. And I feel like the more, so I don't have an answer on, like, how do you make somebody more clutch? Right. But I have found in my own experience, and I was lucky to have those experiences at a young age that right. did tell me that story. I found like, oh, the more I'm like, okay with this not going the way I think it's gonna go, yep. the more calm I'll be. It's, yeah. Oh, this is no surprise. Mm. Of course the play doesn't work. Right, that's a meta it. level of this. It's, yeah. it's, it's an awareness of having to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes, so that's definitely a big part of it. Athletics, Every game winning shot I could yeah. tell you about, it, didn't, it did not get drawn up that way. And, there, and some- Except yours, yours get drawn up and they work. <laughs> Yeah, but other teams are out there too. Keep going right. back to that. Like, yeah, Brianna Stewart's going to be the, the focus of their huddle. Sue Bird's going to be the focus of their huddle. I, I love that. 
idea that you prepare for the spontaneous. And that, again, goes back to like an emotional intelligence in the moment and an ability to read in that moment. Right. Like, and that's part of repping, too, and, and building, a, building an understanding of how to play and how to read different defenses and understanding what the other team wants. And Did you ever that. find yourself in the position of having teammates who had discomfort with expectations and pressure and discomfort mm. and did you ever have to help them through it ish uh, like as in as a teammate um at some at some point there is a ceiling on what you can do because uh, you're you're their counterpart you're their equal yep. there's no real authority but as i got older and I became more of a, like, just this veteran, this coach on the floor, and I got looked at differently. You know, for a long time, I always, I mean, I'm sure I've said this joke on this stage, it's like I was the dazed and confused guy. Like, I, you know, I was getting older, and they were all staying the same age. Right. I've, so, seen, I've seen your interview where yeah, you meet where one of the mothers of, yeah. the, of your teammates, and she's exactly, she was born on your same Yeah, we were the same birthday. Yeah, yeah. I was like, 1980? Yeah. Like, yeah, I was like, okay, great. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a little odd. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, so now these players are a little younger. For me, as a teammate, not a coach, not any kind of authority figure, if you will, it was just about giving them belief. Like that I, this player on this team, this Olympian, whatever you want to call it, believed in them and encouraged them to continue to take the next one. Right. That's, that's how I saw it play out. Right. Yeah. But I think what I've learned, and I think this is, for, again, specific to me, Somebody said this to me recently and it really clicked. It's like, I can have, and there's a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, it's like, I'm having multiple conversations like with myself at the same time, like at all times. I'm just holding a lot in my head. And I think that has helped me be a clutch player right. because I know, again, the, the, the prepare for the spontaneous. If they take away my jumper, okay, I'll go to this. If they take away that, I'll go to that. And I can handle that where I think some players, when you tell, when they want to do one thing, but you take it away, they, don't, they can't just go to the next. It actually probably shows up more, to be honest, defensively in clutch moments. Really? When you have to get the stop. Because now you, you are not dictating anything. Right. So you're, you're just reacting. You're trying to maybe force this player left or whatever. Right. But the minute it doesn't happen, you know, and the minute it changes or the minute the clock goes under eight and you've, you're up three and now I can foul, to like have that moment where it clicks in, I just think there's something to like being able to, to carry a lot of conversations at the same time. Right. So, you, I was, yeah. I'm like, so what there, do you think? No, there's some great psychology <laughs> behind that. And if you look at the research on clutch performers, is that there's a couple of, of different traits that stand out. One is a sense of control. And what you're describing there is like you found a way to take this uncertain, uncomfortable situation and have some sense of control because like you know what you have to do, but you also know what you have to do if it goes this way, this way, or that way. So it's, you don't get caught off guard and have that almost alarm reaction where it's like, oh, it didn't go as drawn up. Now it's time for my brain to spiral out of control because you've already got like option B, C, and D there. Well, I think a lot of people don't prepare for that. So once option A is done, it's like, oh, it's done, spiral out of control. I don't know what to do. When you, you worked with athletes who've got, who have performance under pressure problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when it happens, it can be so dramatic, right? Rick Ankiel or Chuck Knobloch or catcher, catchers with the yips or Ben Simmons at the free throw line or whatever it is. I mean, it, but it's just amazing when you see it and you know the field goal kicker. Yeah. I don't know why anybody wants to be a field goal kicker. Yeah. It just seems to me like that is just like, it's all downside. It, it, everybody's waiting for you to have that moment and then you're, the next thing you know, you're an Ace Ventura pet detective, right? And, <laughs> and it's, it's uh, so you're working with people who, who are living this problem, and it's a horrible problem. And it, it takes many forms, right? Stage fright would be one of them, right? Just like para paralysis in front of a crowd. Um, what do you do? Like, how do you, how do you kick them out of... How do you get the Dallas field goal kicker, Cowboys field goal kicker, after the third miss? off to the side and, and make him more comfortable going in to kick the fourth, fourth. In the game? Yeah. OK, so two things. First off, you've got to figure out how to give him some foundation because yep. his brain is just spiraling, like catastrophizing like crazy. Right. So you've got to, it's kind of like what Brad said earlier. It's like, if you're anxious, they're going to be more anxious. So you want to be that calm right. presence because emotions are contagious. There's some great research on that. 
the other thing is you want to get them to have like some of the foundational like sense of control, like decreasing that worry, um, letting them know that like this isn't the end of the world. You're trying to get them to zoom out. Right. So that's number one. Right. And that's hard to it's do okay in to that moment. It's okay to miss. Yeah. It's not the, so that, that at the bottom of your thing, I bet, it, you kind of thought you're going to miss some of these, and that's okay too. You're still clutch. Yeah. Right. Okay. And the yeah. second thing that is, I think is harder in some ways is like their brain, their, if we could look at their adrenaline levels, they're already through the roof. Right. You can't just instantly go back. So you have to almost use like tricks to get them to... Uh, think that their, their brain and body are calming down. So if I was at Dallas Cowboys kickers or standing next to him, I'd like right before he went up to that fourth kick, I'd take his face and just dunk it into ice cold water. Really? Because what happens is a physiological trick. Huh. It's called the diving reflex. It will plummet your heart rate for an instant. And because your heart rate goes down, you think like, oh, okay, I'm a little more calmer, I can get it done. Wow. All right. Cool. So, and then you just, you know, there's a couple different things like that, but in that moment, it's really freaking hard to get out of that spiral. All right, what about out of that moment when you're just working with people who have, the, who, are, who are living, yeah. living with a problem? So what I a loved of what both of these guys said essentially is that um, the brain is predictive. So if you've got those reps that are pretty good, you're always gonna go back to that. Your brain goes, yeah, I've kind of been in similar situations, like we're okay, we don't need to sound the alarm. Right. If you have missed three field goals in a row, instead, it's like uh, someone who's afraid of heights because something bad happened, right? right. Mm -hmm. It's like the brain goes instantly towards, no, we're in danger, sound the alarm, like, you know, go crazy. What you have to do is you have to dislodge that a little bit. Uh. And the way, hey, this sounds really weird, but the way I like to phrase it is, you have to do crazy things while doing that skill. So for oh, instance, yeah. if you have a pitcher, there's a wonderful example with a professional baseball player um, where he was suffering from the yips and the performance coach had him pitch at a gun range while a gun is going off right next to him. <laughs> And what does that do? Well, you have the gun that kind of signals that like internal like alarm, right. then you're pitching. So what you're trying to do is like dislodge that like predictive mechanism a little bit for you to realize, oh, I can still perform, I can still pitch in this situation. So how much artillery would you need next to Ben <laughs> Simmons while he's practicing free throws before this ceased to be a problem? You know, there's other things you can do too, which is, so I said the brain's predictive. So um, one of the things, again, doing crazy things is the environment tells them to like perform in that way. Yeah. So one thing you can do is like just totally change the perception to dislodge that like connection. Right. So something like shooting free throws um, in the pitch black, uh -huh. because that will shift your perception away from like what you normally pay attention to and force you or your brain to pay attention to other things which kind of dislodges that connection a little bit so that hopefully you can like start forming new patterns. Have you ever done this with a player? Anything like this? Uh, no, no. Um, but, <laughs> I, but I love it and it made me think about, we had a speaker, uh, I used to do a round table in the summers and we had a speaker, a, a really neat guy, Noah Kajiyama, he's, a, he's at Juilliard as a psychologist and, and he said, um, if you want to talk trash to a musician, praise their technique. Yeah, make them think about it. That's right. So well, like every time, I, I, don't, I don't play an instrument, but when I play tennis, I'm always like, man, that was perfect height on your toss well, that's... and your elbow looks good. <laughs> you know, I, I've tried to do it. It hasn't worked great. But, you know, I, we've all sat there at the free throw line and said, do you breathe in or out when you shoot? Oh, yeah. right. Everybody grew up doing that probably. And certainly that was one of the more famous ones when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, but... <laughs> Anyways, Making I've, got people to, think I've, got to, I've got to go soon. I'm sorry. You, you know, the pressure is getting kind of hot. The pressure is getting hot. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking about being on this panel and, like, I'm not clutch. It's getting towards the end. Sub me out. Yeah. You know, there's probably a lot more clutch people right. out here. But thanks for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank yeah. you, everybody, for having me. Yep. I appreciate it. Great to meet you guys. Great to meet you. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. We'll need it. See you. See you soon. Okay.
So this is, you're a highly intelligent person. You're very articulate. Um, I, I, I would have said, as a rule, I'd have thought, um, the ability to perform under pressure is inversely correlated with intelligence. That the more you're- Intense is bliss? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I grow, playing with the kids I played with growing up, that was always pretty clear. You were better <laughs> off not being too bright. And that the brighter you got, and I'm wondering, is there any truth to this? That th is that connection with the, you know, the thing that runs, thinks, is sing, thinks the bear is running after you? Is, that, is it related to IQ? Is it related to anything else? I have no, no idea, idea if it's related to IQ, but I, I mean, I see where you're If you were a little you stupider, go. you think you'd run 359? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I actually do. I mean, that, because like- yeah, There we go. Part of it is like, so part of that, like, is being able to shut that, that mind off. Yeah. Or focus it on things that actually matter. Yeah. Yep. Instead of things that like don't. So in, in endurance sport, we call it, like you have the angel and devil on your shoulder that are talking to you. Right. And if you can keep the angel talking, you're going to be okay. But too often what happens, especially if you tend to be an overthinker, yep. that devil just keeps talking, talking, and eventually you give it attention and then you're done. Right. What do you do with that kind of person? Is this room full of them here, I bet. <laughs> what do you do with someone who's overthinking? So you've got to give them coping strategies to um, shift their attention. Because all it is is like we tend to overthink when we get caught up on the things that cause us that pressure, right. like we focus on so in running. I would always, you know, I'd come by three quarters of a mile and you'd look at the clock and you'd see it be maybe a little bit slower. And what does that do? It gets you going crazy thinking. Right. So instead what you have to do is kind of what Sue does, you know, naturally, I right. guess, is like make sure there's somewhere for the brain to go that is productive. Right and not destructive. Right. So we got some audience questions here. Can we do those? Yeah. I'm just gonna read them. I'm not gonna evaluate them. Uh -oh. right. um, what's the most pressure you've ever felt in your career or life in general, and how did you handle it? Mm. We'll start with you. Um, in my career, um, I, think, I think the free throw scenario is always the one that has the most pressure, because there's more time to think. You think about when choking happens in sports, it's always when you have a little time to think. Yeah. The field goal kicker, the pitcher, the catcher thrown back. You know, it's like, it's, 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 it's not the things that are just reflexive. No, it's the, right. it's the free throws. And I have, I have made game-winning free throws. I have missed game-winning free throws. Right. I've luckily made more. And right. that, that's what makes somebody clutch, is that right. you've just done it more than you've missed. Right, or you do it the level you normally do it. Right. Right, yeah. you're, not, you're not worse. But so, but that can't be in your, sitting in a free throw line, can't be your- For the most pressure, am I? Yeah, you're- No, I'm sure. You, you probably didn't feel the pressure even when you missed. It depends. Have I you ever felt pressure? Yeah. Where are they? Of course. Like, where's oh, the pressure? This does feel like they're- we're here, we're here to talk. <laughs> yeah. We, um, the most pressure. Well, I'm very fortunate in that I don't have the pressure of like feeding a family. Right. I, I grew up middle class. I didn't have the pressure of providing after I made it. So I feel very fortunate in that way. So financially, I haven't had some of those pressures. Um, I think the time I felt the most pressure basketball wise was going to, um, you know, Brad brought it up, going to Connecticut. Um, but even then, like I like to say, like when I got there, the University of Connecticut, they had only won once. So I didn't go there when they had won eight, nine, ten times. Right. You it's created pressure game. for other people. Yeah. Basically. Sorry about but that. But you kind of dodged that because we were all, we, we, we'd moved on from basketball to life. Yeah, no, no. Oh. Yeah. And I, and I was just like the most pressure you felt in your life. In my life. You, I don't feel any pressure. moment. You don't feel okay. <laughs> all right. No, I'm sure there's things. Um, huh. I don't know. All right. I mean, now we're getting real personal. I don't know. Okay. How, far, how deep I want to go here. Okay, you can think about it. <laughs> Aside from the the 20 times you ran a 401, uh, uh, what, what was the what, what's the most pressure you felt in life? Yeah. Oh sport. man. You can are do we, sports uh, if you want to do sports. Are, uh, People are going to be much more interested if you have some sort of screwed up life story. Great. You're gonna. Yeah. That's where I'm do. not trying. That's where I'm trying <laughs> not to go. <laughs> All right. So we'll just go there. So at, at some point my running background, um, I was involved, I was a witness for a anti-doping case in, uh, for USADA. And part of that 
was you had to sit down for about 10 hours and get grilled on all the evidence you were, were giving from the other side. All right. And that was the most pressure, anxiety, whatever you want to call it, in, I've ever felt in my life. Huh. How'd you, did you manage your pressure like self-consciously? Did you know I need to do this so that they don't, don't go to the... Uh, yeah, you know, fortunately I failed enough in running, so I was prepared for like <laughs> how not to fail. So I, I did a much better job in that, but uh -huh. it's, it's, you know, it's difficult. Uh, this is a question, I think about it, because I've, I've still got a kid who's an athlete, and I watch, I watch the, the, the way he, res the way the environment actually is, doesn't encourage always bring the best out of him. Um, where do you think existing training approaches fall short of supporting athletes' ability to perform under pressure? What can be improved that you think actually is within the, well, within the realm of, improve, of possibility? I think it's probably what they meant. Like what's, go, what's bad about what we're doing, especially with kids, and what's good? And what do you, how do you make it better? Sure, kids, um, lots. So I think, you know, it's, it's, again, I'll go back to what Sue experienced. Like that story that occurs is really important. And that story, where does it start? When you're a kid. That's right. So with youth athletes, we have to think about, are we engendering or engaging the right view of like performing under pressure and failure? Or kind of are we, you know, pushing negative ones? And often because, you know, I don't know, youth sports, youth parents, we put so much pressure on them, on kids, and then have the wrong view of failure, seeing it as like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you lost. Like, look at, look how you messed up, blah, blah, blah. Right. And all that does is make you like predict the wrong thing in the future. You're like, oh, you know, if a 10 year old misses the whatever game winning shot and coach mom or dad or whoever yells at them, all that kid ingrains in this story is like, don't screw up. Right. And you don't perform well when that's you screw exactly up what you thing. don't want to be thinking. Exactly. Right. Right. You have any thoughts about this? I mean the only thing that, that came to mind was was something I touched on earlier, which is I feel like in practices, I'm sure sometimes coaches just want to get it right so they feel good about themselves. Mm. You know, or they feel good about the day. And it's like you have to set up practices for failure to be able to like feel that too. Cause you, it's very difficult to. What do you mean by that set of practices for failure? Like make it hard and make it where it's not gonna work out. Right. If that means you have to add an extra defender. I right. mean, I don't, I've never coached. So I don't really right. know that the answers to it. To create discomfort in practice. Yes, yes. And I feel like a lot of people just wanna feel good about it. Right. But that's not what's gonna happen in the games. Right. So you've gotta simulate this environment. Yes, yeah, I feel like it's the only way. It's hard to simulate because you can't do the crowd and you can't do the, the, the pressure. So you try to maybe create it so people can, can get a taste of it. Huh. And then they have to figure it out on their own. Have you ever had a coach who did it well? Yeah, Coach Ariama did that really well. He did? Yeah. What did he do? Throw out extra defenders. Really? So Just make played. it so yeah. impossible. Right. And then when you got it, you were like, it was a big F you to him. And then it was also like, oh, I can do this now. <laughs> I have confidence in myself to do this. And at a young age, that was really important. It, it's so easy to tear a kid down and so hard to build a kid up. And it's uh, and the the power. It's so it's so easy to get them think to create the bad narrative, mm -hmm. and so hard to create the good narrative. It's an interesting way to create the good narrative is to put you in those situations that are really really hard until you figure it out. Yeah. That was my experience. Huh. Yeah. Huh. All right. What's the biggest tip for developing self confidence to take, to stay calm under pressure? I'm still working on that. You don't know. You you were born with it. You kind you know. Of. No, you have a little bit of the problem that you don't even know. Do you? I'm curious. Do you do you even recognize in other people when they lack the thing you have? Yeah, you can. See, like I said, you can see. You can it. see. It. But by the way, I don't want to sit up here. I don't go through life like la la la. I'm confident. No 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 no. I mean, but you but you but I. I like at the Olympics this year, I actually told this story. At the Olympics this year, or in, sorry, in 2021, my last Olympics. I am known as a great three-point shooter. You can pretty much count on me. I'm like, look at my 20-year WNBA career. It's like pretty consistent, yeah. you know? Um, and I went to the Olympics in our first, I don't even know, two or three games. Oh my God, I was like two for 18. And the Olympics is six games. You don't, it's not like you have a season to correct this. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. It was, I was very stressed out about it. It well, here really we took go. a ding. Yeah. Is this the most pressure in my life? Yeah. It really took a ding like in my confidence to be like, and everybody's already, now, this is a therapy session. Everybody's already talking about me. Should I, 
There were some conversations, should I even be there? Yep. 41, uh -huh. or an aging point guard, let someone younger show up. So I felt a lot of pressure uh -huh. that I needed to perform. I knew why I was there, so I, luckily I did have that. And I know what I do, nobody else does. I was very confident in that. But then when you go out there and people who love stats yeah. don't see your stats, don't see the proof in that pudding, right. it, can, it can build a stress. Right. I was very stressed. But at that point in my career, I was also very lucky that I had a lot of experience to draw on. Right. I've gone through slumps. Right. Every athlete does. Yep. And I know the only way to get out is to not think about it. Yeah. It's so the you only keep... way. You just got to throw it up there. So I was, you I did, was you... splinging that thing. That's great. So, you, so you, at no and point. eventually. It, yeah, it went in. Eventually so it, it turned around. And yeah. I finished the tournament the way I would have liked to have started it. But eventually it all evened You're out. Shoot, I bet I hit my averages. Shoot to get hot, shoot to stay hot. Yeah, exactly. Right. All right. So you, you, didn't, it didn't, you didn't really adjust your behavior in response. No, but that's because I had experience. Right. So I'm lucky that, that I could call on that in my own way. Right. Something like I actually felt. Right. Not just somebody telling me like, hey, this one time I had a slump. That's not working. <laughs> right. I'm like, good for you. Like, that doesn't going to help me. I didn't feel it. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, she's spot on. Confidence demands evidence. So the more evidence we have, the more confidence is going to grow, and we're going to have different scenarios where we can look back on. I think the other part on confidence that sometimes we get wrong is that when we're talking about these like high-pressure situations, the like external bravado version fails. Like the fake it till you make it doesn't really work when it it's like the game on the line. What you have to have is that like deep internal you know, confidence that comes from like putting in the reps and doing the work for a really long time. Right. I thought of something. Okay. In life. You just under, you, you, this it's was quick. clutch. It's quick. It's this quick. was clutch. It's quick. <laughs> All right. As a female athlete in today's world, mm -hmm. every time I'm on this stage, pressure. Every time I'm in front of the camera, pressure. Huh. Forget basketball. It's like every time I have to speak about things as a female athlete, there's pressure. More pressure than a male athlete. So the pressure exists in that you're, try, you're, you're trying to get people to invest in you and you're trying to, and by the way, this is an experience for a lot of people. Right. In, when you're trying to get people to see you a certain way, to value you. Yeah. But I'm speaking for a lot of people. Right. And so the pressure that, that you feel there, and again, this is no different from anyone in this room. Right. The pressure you feel there, that's the life pressure that exists for me. Right. Being a spokesperson. Right. You don't want to mess it up. Have you messed it up? Oh yeah, I'm sure. Do you know when you've messed it up? I do. I'm not going to tell it, though. No? <laughs> come on. You could probably Google it. Oh, come on. It's like every outfit I wore from age 21 to 25. <laughs> <laughs> one big mess up. No, I do have one moment where I don't even want to say it because you're going to Google come it. Come on. <sighs> you're going to Google it anyway. We only have four minutes. I, right. I, 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 did, I went on a local talk show, and the guy wanted to make some dumb bet, and I agreed to it. I was a kid. That's not the excuse, but I, I was 21. I don't even want to say it, just Google it. <laughs> oh, come on. He bet me, uh, it's like, I can't, I'm sitting here. He bet me, he was like, I bet you can't have a two to one assist to turnover ratio. Uh huh. And I was like, well, yes I can, I, that's like easy. And he was like, I can't even say it. I can't say it, you're gonna have to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Because someone's gonna tweet that I'm saying it, I'd rather just be a Google. I kind of like seeing you uncomfortable. It's, I'm very uncomfortable. It took a while to get you there. <laughs> But we're, we got you there. All right. So um, you kind of answered this, but maybe okay. this will take your mind in a different direction. Uh, it, says, it says, all of us here have encountered high pressure, pressure situations outside of sports, key business meetings, cru critical deadlines, major life decisions. How do high pressure, pressure sports situations compare to those outside of sports? Why don't you start with that? What's, is there a difference? in what goes on in an athlete's mind, what's going on in a business meeting? So I think there's a lot of similarities, and I think performance is performance, because the, the underlying like, brain activity, the underlying like, hormones are, are the same, right? So getting up and pitching a big business, you're gonna feel that adrenaline and cortisol and stress hormones and all that stuff. I think what differs a little bit for athletes is, like, you grow up in this situation since you're like, I don't know, you start playing from six or seven where you, there's an outcome, you know if you win or lose, and like you get this long training on it. Yeah. Where I think often what happens in the business world is you don't really experience that to a high degree right. until you get in your 20s or 30s or whatever have you. Right. 
Yeah, I agree. I think um, the greatest thing about sports is like you won or you lost. You did or you didn't. It's not as it's not as nuanced. It's not as what's someone looking for? It's People, cleaner. Yeah, it's yeah. cleaner. Whereas like in a business meeting, you're being judged on a lot of things that you know aren't as tangible. Right. So you don't necessarily have control. And the only thing I would say is, as the athlete sitting here, I, it's way harder in a business meeting because I didn't prepare my whole life for that. Right. So it's all, it all comes back to that preparation. And you don't even know at the end sometimes whether you won right. or you lost yeah. or whether what you did could have been better. Or yeah, it's, it's easier to manipulate the story in your head if you're in the business world. It's harder to do that in sport because like, everybody can see the result. Right. You are what your record says you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Which can also be bad. <laughs> all right. These two want to come up. Um, they have a surprise. Hi. Hello. So, this, uh, Sue, we're going to honor you with the Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, wait, let me give the background before, though. Or you can get, you can I, wanted, I wanted to hold oh, it. It's, hold a good, it's sure. for the visual. I'll come over here. Get out of the way. Um, <laughs> here we go. So, so, what year is this? This is an alpha award. Seven? Seventh. Okay. So, Sue came to the conference the first time seven years ago and was worried about talking about analytics. And then, what Sue did is the next year she came, she wrote an article in the Players Tribune about how women's sports, there wasn't enough analytics around it. And as a result, it raised awareness of how little was being done about women's sports. And as we like to talk about, data and the creation of data is so critical. And now women's sports is certainly getting a lot more attention because there's the data to drive interest and engagement. And so we wanted to recognize you, you. Uh, as a, one of, you can explain what the Alpha Awards are. Well, the Alpha Award is, uh, it's about creating true value. So that's, it's like a term that means you have your, what true value you're creating, and then you have your beta, which is like the variance around it. So you have created true change uh, in data analysis and to your career and you being, as you just talked about, the pressure of being someone who represents a lot uh, and we wanted to recognize that. And to, to give the NBA some credit, because of Sue's article and lots of people's work, the WNBA has the same, just as good information as the NBA does now, so, uh, which is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So, so well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, obviously. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Woo! Uh, Unexpected, first time I've been called an alpha. Um, <laughs> no, but obviously with moments like this, you know, you can't create or ha write an article, you can't talk about these things without the platform that you guys have provided. So thank you for always inviting me back, for allowing me to do all these kinds of panels. Um, it is also a creator of change, um, not just for everyone in this room, but myself included. So thank you very much. And you're retired, so this happens And I'm retired. Now. Is these cap and water. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to thank you. Michael Lewis and Steve yeah. and Brad uh, in Abstentia. Yeah. So. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the end of day one. Hopefully you've had a great day so far at the conference. We're so excited to end the day with this incredible panel. Um, so I'd love to welcome you formally to the Chess Renaissance, Modern Challenges for an Ancient Game. My name is Tal, I'm a first year MIT Sloan student. I've been part of the organizing team for this conference, so we're so excited that this panel is now finally here in person. Um, I'd love to introduce our, our panelists. We have Fabiano Curano, chess grandmaster and founder of C Squared Podcast. Jennifer Shahade, chess champion, professional poker player and author. Hikaru Nakamura, chess grandmaster, time US champion and popular chess streamer. And Daryl Morey, president of basketball operations at the Philadelphia 76ers. And the panel is moderated by Danny Wrench, International Master and Chief Chess Officer at Chess.com. To give you a sense of how we'll do this, we'll run the panel for about 45 minutes and then save about 10 minutes for Q&A. You could submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag ChessRenaissance. It's up on the screens in case you forget. And please spell Renaissance correctly. With that, <laughs> I'll pass it over to Danny. I was just about to say, I think the test is whoever can spell Chess Renaissance faster gets their question answered. Thank you, Tal. Uh, well, we're excited to be here. This is, uh, this is pretty awesome. And we've done a few chess panels here at Sloan for a few years, but maybe never, never during a time of so much interest in, in the game. Uh, a little something happened this year, Hikaru. I don't know if you know anything about it. There was a, there was a scandal of some kind, right? Well, the scandal was actually last year, but certainly, um, there was a very big scandal, of course, in recent memory involving cheating in chess. And um, it's something that I think took many people by surprise. Chess is a game that traditionally it's had a very pristine reputation. We don't generally talk about such things, but I think certainly due to the nature of it involving the world chess champion and happening at such a high level, everyone was talking about it. I think that um, going forward, we're probably going to keep on hearing more and more about such topics. I think uh, now that it's out there, um, it does need to be taken seriously by the governing bodies, and kind of we'll, we'll see where it goes. Well, the way you're talking about it makes me want to ask, was it inevitable that something like this would eventually happen at the top, that cheating has existed in chess ever since computers got better than humans, it's been a thing. Do you feel like what happened was inevitable and maybe ultimately because of that could be a good thing if it's dealt with the right way? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, well, the first thing that changes, chess has had a big resurgence ever since the COVID days starting in early 2020. There's much more interest now. And so if there had been a cheating scandal maybe like four or five years ago, it would have been very minor. The media wouldn't have picked up on it. But now due to this popularity, um, everyone's interested. And I think, yeah, it was inevitable because it does happen. It's the first time I think it's happened maybe at the top level. But we, we will hear more about it. I think that certainly the game will be better off because of it, uh, the fact that people are aware of these things and, and we treat it like a serious issue. Yeah. Fabi, I wanted to throw to you next. You were, you were at the tournament where this, where this uh, scandal went down, but also you, you play high-level chess. I don't know if you know that. You play high-level chess for a living. <laughs> That's something you do. What, what is that? Podcaster, apparently. Uh, that's right. Well, we'll get to that career in a second. But what is the experience like in chess where we could draw, draw comparisons to other sports that, you know, if someone's accused of PEDs, it happens before the event happens. Or in a team sport, it's not as intimate as a one-on-one -on -one game. What goes through a top player's mind when he thinks he might be playing someone who's playing unfairly? Yeah, that's one of the biggest problems with the online chess, especially. And this is a problem that became known to the outside world following the whole Mag Magnus against Hans scandal. But before that, it was festering beneath the surface for a lot of players. And I think at many levels of chess, from beginning levels, this is something that affected online play up to the very top level. Even if maybe it wasn't there, the suspicions and the paranoia was there. And organizers, in large part, turned a blind eye to it because it's a very difficult and uncomfortable problem. And a problem which doesn't even have a clear solution, if it has one at all. So many organizers preferred to just not address it, which is in some way why it was a good thing that now people are forced to address it. And right. organizations, uh, the people responsible for chess, are now forced to address it because the public wants answers, or at least wanted answers. Uh, that being said, yeah, from from a point of view of someone who thinks they're being cheated against, even if you're not, it really dramatically lowers your level because it gets in your head. You don't know if you're playing against uh, a real opponent where you, right. can, you can deal with the normal psychological thing or if you're playing against someone or something 
that will beat you no matter what, because the best chess engines, or even not the best chess engines, will beat the best humans 100 out of 100 times. Yeah. Well, that, that dovetails with the clutch panel that we just had before, which is that the, the reason people play well in the clutch, the researcher was there, was, it was their level, is their level of confidence in those moments, and they can keep their brain active on positive things. So you can imagine a cheating scandal does, the op, does two things. One is, you know they win 100 out of 100, so now your confidence drops to zero. And at the same time, you're thinking about, oh my god, is this person cheating? Not like, you know, analyzing the position. Jen, Fabi touched on something I wanted. It's a good cue to throw to you, because he, he said, you know, it's a difficult topic to deal with. And what actually can you do about it? You're a professional. You've been a professional chess player and a professional poker player. So poker has dealt with its fair share of scandals and tried to develop different things. What, what, what would you say on the topic of how the chess world dealt with it? And maybe some things that maybe the chess world could learn from how poker is dealing with anti-cheating. Well, I think that, you know, it's interesting to see chess and poker converge in so many ways. You know, chess has become so much more glamorous and lucrative and psychological, while poker is now really studied almost exactly like chess is, actually using a flattened grid of all the possible poker hands and using AI to study it. So there's that kind of corollary where you're trying to see if somebody's matching the computer moves too precisely, whether right. it's chess or poker. Um, I think that poker players, because of the nature of the game, they think very probabilistically when it comes to anything, and that includes cheating. But obviously, whether it's chess or poker, you ultimately want an answer. And I'd like to throw it back actually a few hundred years ago because there was a massive chess cheating scandal in the 18th century. There was this uh, chess automaton called the Turk. And it would tour around Europe. So it was like a chess board with like a mannequin attached. It would tour all over Europe. It played against Napoleon. It played against Catherine the Great. And you can imagine, like, it just kind of seemed to make moves by itself, by magic, like centuries before, you know, we had Deep Blue and uh, even early chess computers. Eventually, it actually came to the United States in this very city. So in 1830, the Turk played in Boston against the very best players of Boston, clobbering most of them. And you had to pay an entire dollar to watch it. That was considered an outrageous price at the time. <laughs> That's the scandal right there, <laughs> big money. But OK, eventually the secret was unraveled. It took them 80 years. But they were able to deconstruct the Turk. And they found what many had suspected, including Edgar Allan Poe, that there was actually a secret sliding drawer for a human to like, make the moves surreptitiously. Yeah. So, I mean, hey, we got through that scandal. I think we can get, <laughs> we can through, get through this one. <laughs> whatever chess drama brings us. Well, if anyone else wants to weigh in on the scandal, as Tal already said, there's a hashtag. We're going to get to that. I'm sure a lot of people wanted to know that we were going to talk about this topic. And Daryl, before we move off it, what, what, you know, from the outside looking in, in some ways chess has been ahead of things because we've had to be because of the computers. But maybe the chess world's been young in terms of dealing with a scandal of this level. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's just the rise in chess that made the scandal huge. And then, unfortunately, I you know, become very versed in the press because of my job. And the press always needs a hook. And this one had a hook that mm -hmm. I, I can't say. It looks like Sue, say it's, Sue, Sue Bird on, on the last <laughs> panel. Couldn't talk about her scandal for the same reason, it turned yeah. out. So, um, so anyway, it went viral. It got on every, every newspaper. And everyone actually started to believe that yep. some of these crazy things. But I wanted to zoom out not to 1830. My goodness, Jennifer. Yep. I, so, yeah. I, I, I'm not, I was going to zoom out to <laughs> chess has always generally been ahead. Like, they were the first to use computers in a significant way in their sport. They were first to be able to do systematic chess detection, uh, cheat detection in their sport. And yeah, you were, you were sort of late to a scandal that was on the front page of every mm. uh, single newspaper. And I think a lot of times the, when those scandals happen, the mistakes happen early. Uh, right. So I, I did feel like um, I, I know enough about cheat detection. I'm no expert. We have experts in the audience and, and on this stage. But I knew that you couldn't tell if someone was cheating just from one game. So while I knew, I knew some background that uh, he had cheated before online, you, you, it, I, I felt it was behooved that you needed to like, still presume innocent until guilty in an over the board situation and sort of let it play out. Because yeah. if someone's cheating, eventually they'll be 
discovered. Like it, it, you know, just like in every other sport, there's been steroid scandals, there's been uh, doping scandals, there's been everything. Eventually, these people are found out. It's better to let them hang themselves yeah. than to jump the gun. Because are you saying you want to run PR for Chess.com going forward? <laughs> because we might need. I, I like my job, but okay. uh, well, you think know. about it. Yeah, we um, need you in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's fair, and yeah, it's uh, it's been complicated. So. This but I feel like the chess community got it right eventually, it feels yep. like to me. So yeah, Even in that case of the Turk, they actually, there were two boys who saw a, a human climbing out of the machine, um, but they weren't believed at first. So it, well, took, some, it took some time, yeah. There you go. <laughs> eventually everyone's discovered, yeah. So. Well, the, the topic of, of technology may be affecting the game as far back as the 1800s, but more recently with some of the negativity. Technology has affected the game in a lot of positive ways. We'll shift a little bit to the online scene with uh, talking about streaming, talking about the, the investment into online tournaments, right? The, the opportunities for a top player are more lucrative than ever. Maybe that makes the incentive higher than ever to cheat. But Hikar, let's talk about the positive and, and where you've been a trailblazer. You've been someone who's turned as a professional player into a professional content creator. But will we, will we be talking in 20 years about Hikaru Nakamura, the pioneer? who was the first of top players who did it, or will we be looking back and saying, I miss the days when we had top chess players also streaming their thoughts, because there really aren't a lot of other top players doing what you do yet. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, it's very hard to know whether it was because of the circumstances with COVID and what was happening in, in 2020 that sort of changed the world of chess. Um, being able to stream and create content or whether it would have happened anyway, first of all, you know, I think, I first started playing on the internet all the way back in the late 1990s. There was a site called the Internet Chess Club, um, and I would actually play games and write out, write out like comments. So it's called kibitzing um, in general terms during games, things of this nature. Now, of course, these days I actually talk, I don't type, so it's a little bit different, but I think that um, it, it was a long time coming, and certainly there's so many people who love chess, but being able to share that, you can't really do that when you're simply competing. And so what has happened with myself, there are some other careers like Gotham Chess, uh, the Botez Sisters. Um, it's just amazing that we're able to share the game with so many more people in a way that we weren't even 10 years ago. Um, as far as what the future holds, very, very hard to judge. I mean, there aren't many top players who are doing it. I think that's because when you look at the landscape of creating content, it's pretty much... I would say the odds of having success are actually lower with that than even a startup. You have to put in a lot of time and work. And even then, it's still, I think, a bit of a lottery for, for those of us who were doing chess during the pandemic. Many people got stuck at home. They, they, they sort of returned to, to games and topics, things that they really liked when they were younger. And in chess, a lot of people who pick up the game, it's, it's one of two things. Either you learn it in school from, from your teachers, or you generally learn it from a parent or a grandparent. And so the, all the circumstances were great, and everything worked out. But I think that going forward, probably it, it, will, it will have just been a very special time. Um, I don't like being super negative, but I think it was just a very special time. Interesting. Well, Fabi, you're, you're a top player who's becoming a content creator yourself in a slightly different form. But building on that, so Hikaru is saying like, there really aren't a lot of other top players doing this live commentary. Chess has been anti an anti-social game in many ways for many years. You're one of the first top players now giving at least insights and thoughts into how he's viewing a lot of stuff while you're still actively competing against people you're giving opinions on. So what, what are your thoughts on the content career you're building and does chess need more people doing what you're doing? Yeah, I think one of the reasons that chess became even more popular, and obviously there was an explosion in popularity, but one of the great things that chess fans can learn about chess from is that there's a lot of ways to hear the thoughts of top players. And it might not be in the way that Hikaru does it, which is in a very regular format, playing on, online every day and sharing his thoughts about blitz games or rapid games or, or classical games. Uh, but there's also, you know, you can hear Magnus uh, talking about his games in a re less regular way, but still, you can hear Anish talking about his games. Uh, so it might not be in quite, at quite the same, uh, at the same level, but, uh, but a lot of people are doing it. And so if you're a newcomer to chess, in a way that, that wasn't possible, let's say, going back 20 years or, or 30 years, you can hear in real time about the thoughts of top players and, and their thought process during a game. So, so that's a very special thing. Yeah. And uh, I think, yeah, that's one of the, the ways in which uh, technology has, has brought chess to every level, not just, uh, you know, to, to the top level, but, but for beginners as well. Yeah. 
I'm incredibly optimistic because if you if you zoom into the macro of like how where the growth of uh, especially like real time and gaming type content, it it just continues to grow and grow on Twitch and uh, YouTube trying to compete with a lot of places now trying to compete with Twitch and TikTok and essentially that growth is explosive and and it's a across a bunch of games, but if you also take the step back and say that. Uh, this is more of an opinion, but I think it's a pretty valid. The chess is most likely the best board game ever invented. Uh, it is. I'm here to confirm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the chief chess officer says that. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, but, yeah. but it's incredibly, incredibly rich, and, and you can, at every level, you can continue to learn, and it's interesting, especially for being able to hear folks who are better. Like, if, if, if James Harden is describing to someone like, do do the do these kinds of things they uh, many times they can't physically do that they right. don't have like the base level of athleticism but you can it's it's also nearly impossible to ever get to any level anywhere close to the few folks on the stage but you can at least like at least envision yourself almost like you have with golf where you'll sometimes hit a shot yep. that that tiger also hit you can also make a move that sometimes that these folks will hit and can feel that moment, even though you're probably going to make a mistake after right. that. And and so I think the <laughs> the proof is in the the growth. And obviously there are things that supercharge that growth. Uh, Chess.com was part of it. The pandemic was part of it. Queen's Gambit was part of it. The the scandal was part of it. Like all these things drove growth. But I I, I just see I just see continued growth uh, in, into the future and. Also, young people want more small consumable things. They want, uh, I'll, watch, I'll watch Hikaru analyze something for five minutes uh, that he clips out into his channel from his longer Twitch, or I'll watch Fabiano for five minutes versus, you know, I'm two and a half hours watching right. a baseball game. Well, we're talking about the, the creators that are helping with the growth and all the other things you said too, but you mentioned chess is kind of dominating in a lot of ways on Twitch and YouTube, but there still hasn't been that breakthrough into mainstream. And, and Jen, I think of poker in that, in that way. What because, is mainstream? What do you mean? Well, I think of mainstream traditional TV, linear, linear TV, whereas poker... Yeah, but that's like but, dying. Yeah, that's kind of dying. I mean, okay, I, so like, it's, you know, you're aspiring to a thing that's going down. <laughs> that's, that's my argument, too. I was actually going to say oh, that, sorry, but sorry, I also sorry. think that there's been some things poker has done to make a breakthrough to a larger audience, like the pocket cam. It's the first time the fan, in theory, had more knowledge than the professional in, in dramatic moments. And Jen, what do you think the game itself could do to give the fans a little more, a little more dramatic hooks in the way that poker has presented itself to broader audiences? I mean, I think chess is doing a fantastic job of presenting itself. And I mean, I guess the most direct corollary is that people can kind of like choose their adventure in that they could try to watch chess with like no engine analysis. So they're totally using their own brain. They could like watch it with great commentary and no engine. They could watch like the analysis bar go up and down. So they know even more than the great players playing. Right. And so I think that's probably the, uh, the most direct corollary. But I think that Another thing that you know, chess has done that really caused um, the boom in so many ways is the, the pog champs, right? Because you right. had people who were not great chess players, but who were fantastic creators who suddenly um, were in the spotlight. And I think that inspires people that you know, they don't have to be Fabiano or Hikaru, but somehow one day their names could be in lights if they could also amass a million Twitch subscribers. Well, this is your way to remind us that we never let Daryl play in Pog Champs. Is that what Pro <laughs> 2 was? Thank that you, yes. Daryl yes. didn't get invited to Pog Champs, and he's still upset. You never invite me. I, I never invited yeah. you. That's yes. right. You're too good. Um, no, yeah. but. I want to add something too, though, because I mean, like, when you ask a question, um, not because I would sound a little bit negative there about whether I'm going to be like an aberration, the only one. I think for top players, I will be, but I think chess itself will continue to grow. And one of the big differences with chess versus, say, a lot of the esports or games, and this specifically applies to YouTube, is that most games have changes. They have like patches and buffs and all these other things. And so when a game changes, if you watch, I mean, I, I, I'll just use Fortnite. I know there probably aren't a lot of kids in the audience who play it, but like, if you look at the Fortnite of like 2018, 2019, um, when, when Ninja was playing, he had this big rise. Um, 
you know, you could, you could watch those videos, but now if you go on YouTube and you watch a video of Ninja playing Fortnite from that time period, the video is just, it's irrelevant. No, n there's nothing about it that's applicable to the game today. And yeah. with chess, a video that, like, say there's a video of me from 2017, that's still relevant even today. And the fact that chess is very evergreen, and you can watch a video now, 10 years from now, and it will still be the same, that is a big advantage that chess has over just about any other, any other game, really. Um, and I echo so that, that it yeah. also makes the data super useful and right. allows these longitudinal we can actually compare better than any other sport. You know, we can't really compare Will Chamberlain to we can actually use the Joe Allen Bead. Yeah, we can data for <laughs> Sorry. exactly. Go ahead. And I, and I want to finish my rant on chess's growth. Is that the early games that were getting lots of views uh, on Twitch and other things were horrible games. And I'm like, <laughs> why? Why is the best game not winning? So I'm like super excited that. We finally have this game that is evergreen, has great data, amazing champions, all these things all like coming together. And I, I just continue to see it going up. I totally agree. And I want to throw back to you, Fabi, because I want to double down on Hikaru's answer to the question, which is that no other top players have jumped into the world of streaming. It, why is that? Is it, is it that streaming, you feel like it makes you a worse player? Is it distracting? I, with Hikaru, it, for some reason, it seems to make him better, right? Like he's not as focused on the result or, or something to, to touch on the, uh, the clutch psychology theory, right? But what do you think it is that prevents more top players from jumping into live streaming? Yeah, I think Hikaru might be unique in that sense because I think it would negatively affect a lot of players if they were speaking during the games. While for Hikaru, it doesn't seem to really affect his level at all. But he's explaining <laughs> the moves. How do you do it? Right. But I, I have to say, is there any other sport where you have someone just explaining what they're doing while they're doing it. I, I can't really think of anything else. So the basketball tournament, which is this like unique basketball event, they'll have everyone mic'd and they'll have the coach in real No, time. but you're right, Fabi, not at that it's, level. It's super level. rare, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's and, the only one I can think of. And that's quite unique. But I, I think with top players, it is also a bit of tradition because traditionally uh, the approach to chess has been you have to study for very long games, you have to study this, this, and that. You don't mess around with Blitz and Bullet. I remember my coaches when I was a kid saying, yep. you know, don't play Blitz and Bullet late into the night. And, and also I, you have to be super quiet and focused to play your best chess, not talking yeah, while you're playing. That as well. And there, there are stories about uh, champions. I remember the story of Botvinnik, who was preparing for matches where the atmosphere would be very quiet, but people would smoke during the games. And so he would practice by having his opponent during training games blow smoke in his face <laughs> wow. so that he would be ready for that during during the actual championship, yeah. which of course is not at all applicable to, to modern chess. So well, Fabi, they say don't play Blitz and Bullet, but how did the greatest chess computer get created? It played itself very fast, billions of times. Now, of course, it's like a neural net. So, but there could be something to tons of pattern matching, lots of rapid games. No, I, I think that's true. We've, we've learned that Rapid and Blitz does seem to help players improve their chess. Like we've learned this mostly from the young players who improve at such a rate, which is pretty much unprecedented for, in chess history, we have players who are 16, 17 years old uh, competing with the best players in the world. While although players have been very strong at 16 and 17 years old, we haven't seen them being able to play against Magnus, for example, and hold him to a draw or, or fight for the first place in super tournaments as, as we've seen even this year. Is that the next challenge? Have someone blow smoke in your face while you're playing and streaming and commentating? Uh, that sounds like the next yeah, video. Yeah, so, so, it sounds like some, some content some idea. <laughs> well, speaking of different formats and distractions, the other thing we wanted to touch on in this panel was talk about the other thing that's happening with the game is, in addition to technology and the online world blowing up, there are different formats being experimented with. The Fisher Random World Chess Championship, we have a Fisher Random World Champion here. Experimenting with Armageddon formats, for those who don't know, that's designed to, to break the evil tie of chess. People don't like ties. Bobby, you played 12 games of classical World Chess Championship chess and you didn't lose. Did you know that? That was a big deal. I, this is the first I'm hearing of it. You didn't, you didn't lose a single classical game. But there's the argument that maybe there was something wrong with the format because it wasn't as exciting as maybe it could be. Do, do time controls need to be faster? Are there things that over the board chess could learn from the formats, the faster time controls, the Armageddon style of the online games? Well, this is the reason essentially why Magnus is not playing the next world championship because he doesn't like the format. But that might be for purely personal reasons, just because he doesn't like all the preparation that goes into it and, and the amount of time that he and, and stress that he has to put into it. But I think there's a place for uh, bullet chess, for 30 second chess up until 
the long classical one game a day matches that, that we're used to historically. And I think where the interest comes in is mostly in the stakes. Like nobody's going to watch a one game a day match if there's no, nothing at stake. But if it's the world championship, if there's a lot of money and prestige and the historical relevance for that, that the players both have invested in the match, yeah. then everyone's very interested. And we see that the world championship consistently pulls the biggest numbers in terms of viewership because people want to find out who's the next world champion. Jen, what are your thoughts on that? Because you mentioned Pog Champs. That was a, it was a traditional format, but untraditional in that it was a bunch of people you cared about even though they were bad at chess. And is there, is there something about what Fabiano is saying here, that there's a place still for all types of formats all the way to the longest, or is it just about the stakes being right and that you care about the people playing? I, I think there's absolutely room for everything because of the growth of chess. And I think that really helps motivate people that there's different ways that they can succeed in chess. You know, some people could be really good at blitz, rapid, um, classical, of course, we're talking about professional levels, but even for an amateur level player, the fact that you might be um, terrible at bullet, but you know, really good at bug house, right? Like, so that, I think that really allows really good at puzzles. You know, these, this idea that you could be a content creator, even if you're not that good at chess, just different ways to be good at chess, I think is really powerful. You know, chess boxing um, was, was all the rage this this fall, right? Yep. And uh, I remember one of my my own favorite creations, partly inspired by chess boxing, and I can't help but think of it now, is uh, hula chess, where we chained the uh, chessboard from the ceiling, and then we were hula hooping and playing chess at the same time. So I, I suggest we do that. We, we can we can rig it up here pretty easily, right, Daryl? Yeah, for sure. I, I wanted to ask you, Jennifer, the. It feels like one thing that might hold back the growth, because I present a very optimistic picture, is, and PogChamps is really, is like onboarding. Because I think a lot of people are intimidated. They're like, it's a, it's a male sport. It's a, it's a, that's, you know, not cool. Or that, like, that's the, you gotta be super smart. smart to you gotta be super smart, which has been shown to not be true, actually. That, you don't, you, know, you just need to be good at chess don't to be good at chess. Don't so don't tell, we're, we're oh, all you're, really like, we're, you're all using, <laughs> we're all living, you're all living off that illusion, I got you. But, but yeah, there's all these studies that if you're good at chess, it means you're good at chess, but it doesn't necessarily translate. So how do we, and maybe you can answer this because you've onboarded more people in the world, but like how do we onboard people? I moderate so I don't have to answer the question. Yeah, no, I'm, turn, I'm turning the lens I, I, back I, I, on to Dan. Carl, what do you think? What do we need to do to keep the chess boom going? Well, I mean, there, there's also the big element elephant in the room which isn't addressed which is the fact that you know when you talk about going mainstream with chess or success a lot of it has to do with what the prize funds are how much money people earn as professional players and so when you look at it from the the context of trying to bring more money into the game it's all about the audience and what does the audience want to see because in this modern world eyeballs drive everything um, so because of that I think that the formats that are relatively shorter are going to attract sponsors and the viewers much more than longer formats formats um, when you look at like Fabiano's match against Magnus Carlsen, the world champion, when you play 12 games and the games are going three to four hours every day and nobody wins, uh, that's not what the fans want to see. And then to have it decided with quicker games after that, it's just, it doesn't, doesn't feel right. Soccer so, fans love that. The so I was going to say. Yeah, but all the games aren't 0-0 <laughs> zero, zero at the end of the day. It's not all the Sorry. games are 0-0. Zero, zero. But I, I think certainly um, if you're looking at it from the perspective of bringing, bringing more, more eyeballs, more sponsors to the game and more money for the top players, the quicker formats are the future, and I, I think it's only going to keep moving in that direction. I mean, as Daryl mentioned, when people watch content on YouTube or Twitch or, frankly, TikTok or any, any site, it's, the attention spans are becoming less and less. So if you have, uh, you have shorter games and, or you have like, content that's shorter, you will end up, uh, more people will be interested in that. So I think we're yep. moving in that direction for sure. Is that another reason to maybe reconsider? I'm trying to get you to say, yes, classical chess needs to be faster. In case you, I'm just going to twist ending. That's what I'm trying to get you to say. Um, <laughs> but Hikaru talked about how the, the new generation or the, the, the fans that are exploding online are not only growing up watching faster time controls, they're also growing up playing much faster time controls. And the argument that it's intimidating to go from playing five and 10 minute chess on your phone to wait, you're t I gotta sit for six hours at this game, right? Is there, is, there a better, is there a better gateway drug for over the board chess to help make sure that these online audiences stick with the game and maybe make that leap to their chess club or, or tournament? Well, I think when we're talking about the casual chess fan playing, it's going to be mostly rapid and blitz chess. It's probably gonna be mostly blitz and it's gonna be mostly online. But in terms of what people want to watch, 
yeah, I think that probably most people would prefer to watch Rapid and Blitz, but there is that uh, element, that, that uh, faction of people, of chess fans, that want to watch classical chess. And I don't really see why we don't have room for both of it in, in chess. But from the perspective of a chess professional, of course I want to play Rapid and Blitz. There's so much less work involved. It's, it's so much easier. <laughs> like you don't have to prepare for hours and hours. And now that I'm That's playing That's only because you've done millions of hours of prep before that, though. I wouldn't. Playing your whole life, right? Yeah, of course. You, you still need to, to work a lot on chess. Yeah. But you don't have to do the sort of memorization. Yeah, that, which. Like hours argue, and hours of just cramming stuff into your head before a game. Would every top player want to get rid of that? Unless that's their edge, I suppose. But. I think most players don't mind well, not spending hours yes, memorizing exactly. before a game. Not only might they not mind, I mean, Jen, you know, you and uh, your brother Greg Shahadi, who's also a, a tournament organizer and a very big ambassador for the game, have been pushing kind of some different formats, faster time controls, I think, before it was cool to do that for yeah. a long time. And is there an argument to be made that the rapid time control is actually the better representation of where the sport has come? That it's not just what you remember from home, but it's also not so fast that it's bullet. It's the right balance of high level prep and the sporting elements of, of having to figure things out without six hours on the clock. Is that another argument that maybe rapid is the evolution because it should be? Yeah, I absolutely love commenting, watching, rapid chess, blitz chess. It's so much fun. I can see why it is the reason for the growth of the game. But I have to say as a player, all my success came from classical chess. And whenever I got into a, a blitz playoff, I always lost. So I do have a sweet spot for that classical chess, especially in this era of constant distraction. As like a player, it's kind of like I, this memory of just like completely losing yourself for a few hours. I'm not saying it has to be a six hour game. Maybe classical could be more like two hours each. That is a very special experience that I think is kind of seductive in an age of constant distraction. Yeah. Can we lean for a second into this? Like the world champion drives the most interest, but it, it probably is the worst structure of any world championship of any sport you could ever envision. Okay. Not only are we talking about the timing being wrong, right? No other sport like, you know, makes like every, like Golden State would have won like 12 straight titles because like it would be like everyone fights and then they only play Golden State. Like right. everyone should have, like, everyone should have to fight. Then you play 12 games. Everyone wants to see exciting right. things like three, I, I would never go to tw 12. Like 12 is bizarre. Like it's an sure even Pete's number. listening to this because I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean like the entire structure of the world championship is designed to make people less interested. Yeah. No, but I mean, seriously, let's double down on that because what... You should have a bracket. Everyone loves brackets. Knockout brackets. Or the, brackets. Uh, right? We did Carl, have that I mean, I, 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 Carl I, and Fabio yeah. get a bye. Sorry, go ahead. No, but I mean, I think the issue is, again, this is the thing. Chess is sort of, you, you have like this cultural thing where because you have this tradition of having a classical world champion with this format for, I mean, what, like 100 plus years now, they don't, people don't want to change or the governing bodies don't want to change that format. And so, right. again, it comes down to sort of the practical nature of looking at making changes versus keeping things the same. And I think at the end of the day, though, if you want the game to grow you want more people watching you also want the professionals to earn more money and therefore changes I mean should be happening what's the comparison I mean other sports have done this they've had tradition but they've adjusted the rules to favor absolutely playoff formats change now, all those things you know playoff formats change constantly yeah. different number of games different number of play teams like the only sports that win are the ones that are reacting to their audience and making changes to the rules, making changes to the structure such that it drives interest, drives revenue, which drives better players. It all becomes a virtuous cycle. And right now at the World Championship Classic level, they've got like a vicious cycle that's working in the anti way, yep. which is like, it's less interesting than every other format of chess. It's like, no one wants to do it. Like, right. And so, and so that now, now you have the best player not even wanting to play. Like, can you think of a bigger failure of a sport than you have the best player doesn't even want to play yeah. to try and win? That is I've great. never heard anything like that. It would be like Golden State, like, oh, oh we, won, we won four times. Ah, <laughs> next year, we'll just play FIBA. Yeah. You know, like, that'll we, be We don't need to speculate about uh, knockout format because we had the knockout format for years, and nobody liked it. We had world champions from I think 96 till 2004 in terms of the knockout format nobody and and nobody cared about who the champion was 
Because it didn't have the history, um, is my mm -hmm. guess. Maybe they didn't yeah. care so, at the did time, but the, the audience wasn't w what it was now. It also was never presented in the same way that the classical world championship match was, right? The classical match was still held up as, these are really the, the heavyweight boxers, and this is not really the right title. But the thing is, you, ha you have the rating system. So let's say you have a knockout format world championship tomorrow, and you have a winner like, which could be very likely, you have a winner like Abdusatarov, who could easily win a tournament like that. And then... Will people think he's the best in the world, or would they still think Magnus is the best in the world because he has the highest rating? Right. So how do you how do you there separate the rating system? Right. They have an injury, they win, they go like, ah, oh, this other team is better, but you know this. It is, is interesting though. It's not an apples to apples comparison. Yeah. You're, not, you're not wrong, and I think they did I, change I, their I format. They used to play over two days. It's true. <laughs> Which is ridiculous. But I think your point about reacting to the audience is the appropriate one, right? As the audience changes and as we learn what they want, you know, the game should be willing to adjust. Speaking of reacting to the audience, by the way, we have a lot of. Questions yeah. coming in. Keep using the hashtag if you're in if you're in here or outside. If you do that, we might get to some of these. Um, I don't know if we can flash the position real quick because one of the questions comes saying they want Fabi and uh, Fabi and Hikaru to throw down real quick. They're not going to throw down in a, in a in a game. But the puzzle that we're showing here um, was chosen by Daryl Morey, and so we'll officially say that the race is on for who can solve this first, either Fabiano or or uh, Hikaru. We can come back or to Jennifer, it. Jennifer, what? You already know, Danny. What you know the, the hell? Oh, I already know the answer. You just said five minutes. Jennifer's right Oh, there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I only said it because the question came in. I have said, no chance. The other three have. The no, question came you, in and you, said, can Fabi and Hikaru play? Right. So I know it, like yes. So then you have a chance. Well, yes. I can, see, I can see it. It could be our well, cheating scandal. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that, now that you guys are both thinking, we'll come to you when, when one of you thinks you have it. I, I want to go to one of the first questions we had, which is, because this might this lead to really a good clutch. discussion. This is really clutch. They're going to be analyzing a position while answering. I'm sure they will. They, they're, yeah. they're, now that I've told them that, they're both going to be thinking about it for the rest of the year. Uh, I think we've, we've already been thinking about it most likely. Okay, yeah. good, good. Oh, you, um, already have, you guys have it? I'm I don't 100% have it. Sure okay, I have okay. it. We're talking about the audience is growing, audience is changing. We had this chess boxing event in December. Can they oh, show the position for the audience? I think, I think they can see it, maybe. Can you guys see the position? No, no can you guys put the position up? Okay. Let the audience go along. There we go. Oh, there you go. All right. You guys just. Keep looking at that. It's white to play. Yeah. Um, yes. You feel like Price is right. They could start shouting moves the out. The B pawn <laughs> is about to queen for black. The B pawn is about to queen for black. So just so you know the board orientation. Now back to the panel. So the the question about the audience changing. We talked about this chess boxing event, which was the. Oh, can you explain that? Because that was a pretty cool event. Explain yeah. chess box. Or so Jennifer can explain. It. Go ahead. Explain, explain. Well, chess boxing is a beautiful format, which is. <laughs> <laughs> it's been around for a long time, actually. Yes, it is. Yeah. I did know the founder, Epe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's alternating rounds of four moves of chess, so four per player, and um, rounds of boxing, and you win by knockout or checkmate. And so this this <laughs> sport was invented actually by an artist, which is yep. a pretty cool, cool, cool kind of aspect to it. That the artist like did it as a performance piece, thinking like, what if you mix like the two most opposite things in the world? Um, how like visually stimulating that would be, and indeed the pictures were phenomenal, and it ended up becoming an art project that turned into like a real boxing association. Fabi, who do you want to chess box? Well, I, I don't know them. if I want to chess box anyone. No, you have to choose. <laughs> who do you want to chess box? Like I, I've said that I, I think in terms of weight categories, probably Anish is relatively within okay. my weight category, <laughs> yeah. so that would make make the most sense. Yeah. But. Well, like, who's the favorite in the, if it's Super GM chess boxing, who's the favorite? You, I don't know what the weight categories are, though. Okay, I, mean, just, I, th I think it's probably not both, I had to guess. Yeah. Seems let's like say, probably the most aggressive guy. Yeah. yeah. Is that, I, I was going to say Grishik. Maybe. I was going to say Grishik's huge, right? They're yeah. Tall. But, yeah um, but who would he fight? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, we're going off on a tangent right, here, but sorry. I wanted to get to the question. No, this is great. I, because one of the questions was, the game is growing. Audiences are showing up for live events like chess boxing, which is why I threw to it. And the question is, I don't know, sorry, I don't know your Twitter handle, but basically wants to ask hey, all, all three of you, when do we think chess is ready to sell out arenas and for chess events to, uh, to sell live tickets for fans? Hey, Karu, we'll start with you. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a very tough question. I think it involves the right personalities, certainly. Um, if we're talking at the professional level, I think we're still quite a ways off from that. I think we're going to have to see a new generation of kids rise to the top. Uh, if we're talking more like influencers, similar to like what happened with chess boxing, I think that could happen almost tomorrow um, yeah. with, the, with the right influencers for sure. So it just depends whether we're talking at the amateur level or whether we're talking about professionals. 
So if there's a new generation, is there going to be a senior tour of chess that you guys will dominate? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, chess, with, with the quicker format, certainly, I think as players, uh, since player, players are getting older, but players like myself, I could see myself playing in like 10 or 15 years if there is more rapid and blitz chess than as much classical as I used to play. So it depends on the formats. And again, I think also with the knowledge base that we have these days, players will be able to play at a higher level until they're older. Um, so I think there's some chance that there will be a senior tour or something like that. Back to the, the, the poker question, is there something about how chess is presented that would make it better for stadium? Do the, we need the fans screaming, you need headphones on. What are the thoughts about how chess would have to be presented in that format? Well, you were at the Chess Box Week event, right? And that was, yes. I mean, I, I was just watching online, but it was absolutely incredible. So I mean, yep. I think chess is just doing so many of the right moves in that respect. And I mean, think about how many arenas are getting sold out if you count all the online viewers. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you're, you're again chasing an old standard. So, like, you just want to tell me what you think I'm doing wrong here? I'm chasing an old standard. I'm just chasing an old standard. You're trying to sell out arenas. I mean, that's that's what that? the NBA does. Like, chess can dominate a, the new platform. That's like, true. Yeah, that's true. But there's also, you know, when you when you grow up as a kid, wishing that people cheered for you if you wanted. To <laughs> Maybe I just need to. This is your psychology. On the therapy gotcha. couch. Um, well, I mean, I think that's the big difference. Like for me specifically, is when I was growing up playing professionally, it's really all about myself. It's just myself against the other competitors. There aren't the fans that are watching in person. Even online, frankly, there there isn't really the fan base. So when when I stream now, it feels like there is a big community. It does almost feel like I'm I'm like competing, and I do have all the support from the fans in a way that never existed at any other time in my chess career. So for me, I, I think that that's why when you look at the future, uh, if you have fans, you have like 150,000 people watching Magnus and myself playing in the speed match in, last December, like that is, that, that is the future. And it's, that's much more important than selling out arenas. That's 10 arenas. That's true. That's 10 arenas. And when the chat's going crazy, it's like people are screaming in a stadium mm -hmm. anyway. So the, the next question I want to ask also comes in from uh, Twitter, because it's a counterpoint to what Hikaru said, but Fabio, I'll throw it to you. He said that chess, we talk about chess being evergreen. It's the same game now as it will be and has been for years. That makes it always accessible. People can come back. But should we ever worry about it being stale in that case? And I want to come back to the format question. Is, is there more of a future to things like Fisher Random and more formats? Or with the audience growing, is chess never going to be stale? Yeah, I think we've heard about the death of chess for decades. Yeah, it's been greatly and, exaggerated. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it hasn't happened. Yeah. Uh, I think we found that although computers got super strong and now can beat humans all the time, it doesn't really change the, the human element, which is what people really want to see. They want to see the mistakes. They don't want to see perfect chess. They want to see the clash of personalities as well. They want to see their favorite chess player, not just because it's the best chess player, but also because they like how that person talks or presents himself. And so it's not just about the, the chess playing. We, we really need to see personalities in chess. And I think that's yep. what, what has uh, developed in, yep. in recent years. So chess is one of the few, few deterministic games that hasn't been solved and will probably never be solved. It's too, but let's say, let's say some crazy quantum computer solved chess and said, you know, white wins or whatever. We're pretty sure it's a draw, but... but it wouldn't but change that, anything. That would not change no. anything for you. Okay. And I think that quantum computers could solve it if they actually put it to the test. I mean, it's a complete waste of resources, but... <laughs> <laughs> we should probably fold proteins. And, and yeah. th this is one of the issues now with, with analyzing chess, which is that very often you get an evaluation which shows 0, 0, 0, which means the position the computer assesses as objectively drawn. And this is completely unhelpful in analysis because it doesn't take into effect uh, into effect the human element and the psychological element and how people make mistakes. So it doesn't matter if the position is objectively won, lost, or drawn because it's more about the diff difficulty of the moves for both sides. And that's one of the more difficult sides of analyzing chess now, that you have these computers which have become a little bit too strong. I have a, a friend from poker who has like a 10,000 10, to 1 um, bet that black wins if the chess is ever solved. Well, that'll never be resolved. <laughs> exactly. But, so. but I mean, even, even if it were resolved and chess mm -hmm. is solved, nobody can memorize it. So even if you know on, say, move number five that this, this move loses, as humans, we can't memorize the sequences and, and all the different possible ways uh, for the game to end. So because of that, I don't think it changes anything whatsoever. Yeah, you see this in poker, that there are a lot of solutions, but it's not like anybody. Despite these solutions existing, nobody can play like that. Yeah. 
Well, we, we have a little bit of data on that in chess because all positions with seven pieces or less have, have been solved mm -hmm. mathematically. Yeah, and we have some positions where the computer might say it's a checkmate in 366 moves. <laughs> and for the human eye, if you go through these moves, it's, it's nonsense. It's like complete gibberish. It's, it's incomprehensible. It might be mathematically correct, but not only is it not uh, possible to memorize, as Hikaru said, it's also not possible to understand any sort of pattern or anything. Yeah. So it's a purely mathematical exercise. Chess Did is Magnus in one of your draws miss like some crazy... I, I missed a check on the like, yeah. like right. 60 something Sorry. moves. Yeah, it was like a 60 move. Thing. About that was, that was somewhat game comprehensible. Right now? Yeah, game. Yeah. Uh, no, I was going to throw game It was game, game eight, I think, right? Or, no, the, the one you missed the table base win was game six. Oh, okay. Game eight was. I don't even know my own game. Game eight was the special <laughs> cop. It was queen h5. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Damn it, <five. laughs> Only you had played queen h5. No, I'm kidding. Um, chess has been dealing with, you know, the undeniable truth that the data knows better than the humans longer than maybe any other sport, right? And, and it's found a way to sort of navigate that world and then ultimately kind of embrace it. We talked about in last year's panel how commentators kind of had to evolve the way they talked about chess instead of fighting against the engine. What would be a sports comparison where you have data, but James Harden just won't listen to you? Like, <laughs> how does that work? Where the data says they should do certain things, but they won't. And is, I, I'm, jokes aside, is there a... Is there a transition where at some point the, the, the data just needs to be trusted and you just need to do it? Well, that's some worry with a lot of, this is why leagues need to evolve the games because, you know, generally the best games have multiple win pass with strategic trade-offs and chess for sure has that and will always have that. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of games like, you know, for a while it was like worried. Everything's going to be an uppercut swing, a walk or a strikeout. Um, in baseball, not a lot of dynamics and they've made changes to try and address that. The NBA has become a very spacing, three heavy uh, game and it's, there's some worry that there are very limited paths to a winning strategy where you'd rather have there be different styles that could, that, that could win. Um, and so to me, like when you asked me that question, I think of like, there are these sort of solved games, not solved like chess or Connect Four recently solved. It's, it's more like solved in that, unfortunately, like there's not a whole lot of degrees of freedom on how to build a champion. Um, and so I have to think about, I have to think about that. I'm not sure I'd answer your question though. No, it's okay. I'm just wondering <laughs> if there's a, a moment when the data became undeniable for chess players and there was no longer a debate about whether the computer knew better. It was just how well you could either play like the computer or memorize it. I didn't know if there was a sports comparison on that level. Yeah, I, th I, th I think the comparison is that a lot of these sports, it seems to be narrowing into single paths to win, which is not really good for the fans. Yeah. Mm. Oh, interesting. Speaking of the fans, another good question. People want to know whether, whether the World Chess Championship coming up without Magnus will have a dramatic negative effect on not just viewership, but on the game. Hikaru? Um, I mean, it's definitely going to have a, a negative um, there's going to be a negative outcome in terms of the viewership for sure. For the game itself, I don't think it changes much. So many people are, are already familiar with the top names, and certainly the fact that there's so many events that players like myself, Magnus, Fabiano, and others are competing in. I think because of the awareness online, it won't really have that big of an, an impact. I, I think it's just it's not great for the game, but it won't change anything because everything is moving online at this point anyway. Okay. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. There's so many great things going for chess. Obviously, this is not one of them, but it will still be should be a fantastic match, and I think it's still going to get a lot of attention. Yeah, I don't think it will change much. I mean, there, there will be a lot less viewership for the match compared to, let's say, uh, the one between Magnus and, and Jan and Pamiyashi, but the game itself won't change. People won't lose interest because of it. And I think it will lead to a situation where people care less about the, the World Championship title but people can still see Magnus play online. People can still see Hikaru play online. So it doesn't change how chess is viewed. Yeah. You're still going to watch. Of course. Yeah. Only because you're commentating. Uh, actually, well, twist ending, I'm probably not. It's in Kazakhstan. I'm not waking up at 2 a.m. We're, we're a European-based crew, man. OK. So the position, have either of you guys solved it? I want to have time to show it for the fans. because I, I have some, some idea. I have some idea that it's something silly. but OK. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure either. I mean, it has I think to start. It's like, it's like King C6, Queen, and Rook G7, I think. It's something silly like that. I thought King C6, B1, Queen, Knight, D7 was... You want to move it? Well, I was waiting for them on the queue. So I'm going to... 
I'm gonna so I, no, don't give them the answer. Just show what they show, want to analyze. Show their yeah. moves they're, they're playing out. OK, well, this is your last Sorry, chance, fans, if anyone else wants to try to solve it. 57? I think Fleck is pretty uh, think it's, no, but They said King, King, there's a, King there's C6. C6. Now what? Ah, you knight B6, yeah. So I thought How are they doing, Daryl? Yeah, rookie they're, seven. They're rookie so, seven. Now, now the, what's right. the next move? Yeah. So knight D7 was, I thought, what it was. But because rookie seven, I couldn't figure out King A8 here. What yeah. to do there? Seven. Seven check might be six. Yeah. There was, one there one was thing that's your that chance to show am them. Am I allowed to? Know. Am I allowed? No, I don't. I don't <laughs> didn't know this at all. Am I allowed to embarrass Chess.com for a moment? Uh, always, always. Uh, Chess.com's computer doesn't see this solution. Yeah, except for rookie seven, you can move the rook. There's a complicated answer to that. It has to do with the cloud engine on like the app versus not. Okay, like just if you actually want to know, something? I will explain it. A3 and king b6 and queen g6, right? In that way? You mean rookie seven? seven. It's after rookie seven, yeah. Oh. He moves the rook to. Uh, rook a3, I thought, was mate. I there's some mate somewhere. Knight c5 and king b6? Knight b6 and rook e8, I thought. <laughs> Jen, you have an idea here? And king a5 yeah. and check and knight d5 is, is mate. Yeah, pro it's pro that's probably it, but not 100%. Can I get what do you say to the move? What's the move? Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was this, but. Sorry. Okay. But there's one thing I couldn't like 100% uh, figure out, which was which was. Well, crazy. he's already he's already confused, which means this isn't the answer. I'm <laughs> this isn't the answer. <laughs> yeah. But I don't have an engine. I wish there was, I wish there was an app that Robert, could tell me the answer. Robert, Robert, can you go up and help? Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. just gonna say. Oh, Robert, grab us. Robert Hess. Oh yeah, Rob, Robert Hess is here. He's got it. What is Black's answer here? I thought so Queen H1, E4, Queen H2 was like the only way to solve. Ah, uh, okay. And then I was. Yeah. Like, who knows? Looking at rook g7, but it was a bit vague. OK. You guys are on, on to the right idea, but wrong, wrong move order. So rook e7 first is? No, the, the, first, the first move here is e4 first <laughs> okay. to block the queen. Yeah. From the ah, okay. And the main idea, everybody, is that because the queen is taking the rook, you don't get to do the plan you'd like, which is to move the knight with a discovered check because of this. So you have to block the queen first. So e4, king a8, and king b6. If king a8, king b6, yes. right? So the move is queen g1. And then the final line ends with knight d7, knight b6. And on king a6, you put the knight on d5, threatening mate on b4. Mm. Nice. And the game's basically over from here. Yeah, we, was, could have, we could have taken 20 minutes and found it. Oh, that, that was too like, hard. I wanted to yeah. show him. We could even what do level puzzle questions. is that? Like 30,000? That's yeah, it's, tough. It was your idea, Daryl. This was like. We did it. And then rook a4, rook yeah, a8, rook h8 yeah. is actually like the final yeah. Yeah. solution. This okay. was like the equivalent of you making Robert Hess run a marathon. <laughs> yeah. a simul. For those who were at the first ever Sloan <laughs> chess panel we did, if you're an OG, you're awesome because we really messed up that year. We did a simul for Robert that was literally impossible for any human to do. <laughs> and he was sweating. He was sweating and you, running. Every, every other person of his level would have just given two birds and yeah. said, I'm out of this. I hate you, Danny. This was a bad idea. Right, um, nice. OK, well, I, we, we kind of answered this earlier, but I, wanted, I was planning on ending the panel with this and just talking about what, what chess needs to continue to do for the boom. And I've been lectured many times that I don't, we don't need to do anything differently. Mm. We don't need to try to sell out stadiums. That was your answer. I was just saying, don't, don't, need to don't try to chase get on the old, chase the new. That's but what saying. about your shirt? I, I got to agree with that shirt for, chess, for the, the future so we, of chess growth. We, we need more women, and it seems yep. to be happening, right? What do you, you have data on this, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Are, are, isn't your female games the, uh, played going up? Yeah, the female user base is. It's still under 30%, so we want to we wanna drastically increase that, but it's higher than it's ever been. That's why you need a PR person. Lead with the positive. Lead man. with the positive. I'm not very good at that. I, you, you already learned that during this whole, this whole scandal. But Bobby, any, any closing thoughts you have on what Chess needs to do to continue, continue the popular rise? I think it has its own momentum now, that yep. it might carry itself. I do think that there is, there is a space for, and similar to how chess boxing was presented, if you get the right people behind it, people that can bring those, those fans from other esports into chess, then you could get a really good live event going. And I think one of the things that chess had, which was started many years ago, is the glass box, mm -hmm. which keeps it quiet for the players, but keeps the, the uh, Spectacle that that all the I looked into viewers. those glass boxes though they're very expensive. Just FYI, so yeah. I, 
You have the money, Danny. <laughs> Chess.com is oh. going to invest in yeah, it. Yeah, but, but it... I mean, even when you think about that, that also that, that has been done in the past. When you look at the World Championship match, it was played in 95 at the World Trade Center between Kasparov and Anand. They actually did do that where yep. the spectators could look in, and it was, they, they were, it was basically like a glass room that like, no sound got in. So those things have happened already. It's just a matter of finding the right, sort of the right timing and, and like the right people and these sorts of things that I think will make the difference. I think the Carl's on broadening the base of money that comes in. There's been sort of a narrow set of sponsors, people who support chess, and it seems still need to need to have that broadened out so it's across all the categories. Watches, you know, like like the NBA has. We have we have a broad base of sponsors, TV money, everything that sort of perpetuates everything. Uh, and I had a question that's maybe a little personal, but to me, like you playing for the World Championship, uh, Fabiano. Uh, or say if Hikaru would make it in the future, any American, it felt like it should have been a bigger deal when it happened because, you know, obviously the first American to be playing for that and such. If that had happened now, do you think it would be different yeah. for you? Yeah, I think it would be bigger. Although at the time it was, it did get a lot of publicity, but now it would, it would explode in, a, you know, in an unprecedented way for sure. It would have been epic, yeah. And do you think some of it was like you needed to be a little more, I don't know, bombastic. I mean, like, you know, like there's like a whole personality angle to chess. So Fisher was obviously one of the greatest of all time, but a lot of like the attention was obviously the time, US versus USSR, but also like his personality being like. Yeah, why this. couldn't you like threaten Magnus more or get a face tattoo <laughs> or something? Maybe. Yeah, I think that would have been a huge mistake. You always need to be yourself because you get seen through if you're not yourself. I, yep. I think, but, yeah. But yeah, I think the, the times. Were, were really crucial for that match gaining so much popularity. We don't have something like that now. I mean, we, we could. We could if it was, uh, you know, U.S. versus. I guess Ding going against Ding, Loren, you know, my. Ding Loren versus Nepal Machine. Well, there is a, there's a bit of a U.S. China. Oh, yeah, but Russia against China? I'm not sure. What's that? It's not really a. <laughs> Over really the conversation we want to touch on right now. Well, yeah, um, you'll, I, I think there will be future um, world championships with U.S. players. That's going to be a huge boon. I also think you know it's great that it's great and really exciting and heartwarming to hear about all the um, percentages of females on Chess.com skyrocketing. But let's be honest, there's still a lot of underrepresentation of women, especially when it comes to leadership in chess, to chess coaches, to chess authors. So. I think if, you, if we improve that, like the numbers are going to explode. And that is one beautiful thing about chess, right? That it crosses gender and age boundaries, that yep. you can have people competing of all different types. And I think that we really need to lean into that more. I mean, LGBTQ plus representation in chess could certainly be improved a lot, especially at the international level, where sometimes events are held in places where there aren't good human rights for members of the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some areas I'd really love to see chess grow into. I mean, is it the only sport where the, a woman was a top 10 player in that sport in the world? I mean, I think. And, and that story and probably others, isn't but, told as much as it should be. Yeah. If you say that, I wonder how many people know exactly who you're talking about. How many people know that there was a top 10 woman? Or, and, and could name her, right? And, and that's can, they, can part, you name that's her? part of the problem. Right? Yeah, we, we got some hands Shout up Shout out here. the name. But I think that I think you're making a great point, Jen. Yes. I think it's over here. We got it. There you That's go. Right. Okay, Polgar, yes. you to Polgar. Which well, sister? The Queen's Gambit showed us that too, right? You had, you know, the, uh, you know, the protagonist was not the traditional chess character. I mean, that's been a big problem with the game. Is when you think of the game historically, you think of what is the logo of chess master? An old white guy holding a chess piece, and that's what chess has what been viewed as, right? And I think that the game is changing. I think the game is younger than ever. It's more diverse than ever, but. Those stories and also getting better representation is certainly really, we're only just starting to do that. So. And Anya Taylor Joy did tweet Queen's Gambit 2. It, it, apparently, her account was hacked, by people, the way. People said her account was hacked. Okay. okay. All right, last round of questions Nepo or Ding? I uh, answered this question recently. I, I think I'd give a slight nod to Nepo. Why? But a very slight. The experience on his team is probably a bit more. Professional, like we, we've seen Ding come to the candidates basically alone. I don't think that will happen for the World Championship, but I don't know if he has the same level of team around him. Uh, and also the experience, even if, if Jan lost the match, it still is very valuable experience of what he's getting into, especially for the first two games when you're when you have to get adjusted and and it really hits you like a truck when you're you're there under the spotlight for the first time. 
So those first games, and we've seen Ding struggle in the first games of tournaments, even in the last candidates. He lost to, to Jan, for example, with the white pieces. So we've seen Ding struggle at the start of tournaments. I think his advantage is that he generally comes, can make comebacks better than Jan can. So if things go well for him for the start, then he's probably a favorite. But yeah, I would still give maybe like slightly more than 50% to Jan, but only slightly more. And Carl, you're nodding along. Does that mean you? Um, I mean, I, I just think it's it's just not super important who wins really at the end of the day, and it, it really I love that it's going to come down to you know what changes happen so that the best player in the world will compete for what should be the most prestigious title in the game of chess. Well, you're making me have to read the next Twitter question because that was exactly the question: is if that's the case, what will be what will we be talking about in five years as the pinnacle of chess, or ten years? Will it be the world championship title? Will it be an, uh, a series of combo of the future of an online hybrid title? And you answered the question by saying the current world championship match doesn't matter. So what will matter in the future? Um, I mean, I, I think uh, most likely it's going to come down to online events. I mean, when you look at the ecosystem of where there is sponsorship, uh, online chess is where you do have big sponsors putting in serious money to have these competitions happening. And I think that's only going to keep growing because the, the base of people who watch chess, it's much bigger online than, than it ever has been, and it, it will keep growing. So I'm pretty optimistic that chess online is, is the future more so than over the board. Okay. Well, Nepo or Ding, Jen? I'll go Ding. I'll go, uh, I'm going to answer his question and say the future so at some point will be a huge prize pool, rapid 960 tournament will be the biggest thing. Okay, so chess. Nepo, Jen. I say Ding Ren. And Ding Ren literally doesn't care. Had to get it in. <laughs> <laughs> literally doesn't care and some I'm, I'm random gonna, answer. Yeah. I'll say, I'll say some I, random. I, also, I also think Nepo's a slight favorite. So there you go. But that's our panel, everybody. And I hope you enjoyed solving the chess position and hearing from <laughs> these... Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, Thanks, awesome chess Thanks. ambassadors. Question, man.